Story number two. Left our family vacation a day early because of the ghosts. August this past year, my family stayed at an Airbnb in Purcellville. This was in Virginia, ten minutes outside of Harper's Ferry. Look up the John Brown Raid, and about 40 mi- 45 minutes away from Gettysburg. The house itself is older than the town, built in 1752 and on a current working farm and vineyard. Here's the setup of the house. You enter into the oldest part of the home. You can see these two sections, kitchen and sitting room. They were the original cabin before past owners built on. Through the sitting room was a small library, another sitting area, and my parents' room. On the first floor, but off the ground outside. When you go up the stairs of the sitting room, there's a bathroom to the right, two doors in front of the stairs and a room to the left, over the kitchen. My husband and I stayed in this room over the kitchen as the bedroom sits directly in front of the stairs, and that gave me the creeps. It had the original fireplace in there. But something when I walked in just felt off. My sister and brother-in-law stayed on the floor above us, as that room has its own window AC unit. The house has no AC, just individual in-room units. We arrived on a sat- uh, excuse me. We arrived on a Sunday. Monday morning, my dad asked me about footsteps from the night prior. He said he was sitting at the kitchen table on his computer and could hear footsteps walking through the house above him. My dad had also been making jokes and tends to be a little bit theatrical with his humor. Leading up to vacation, he was calling it Ghost Central, so I told him our room is above the kitchen and I wouldn't think anything of it. It was probably just one of the getting ready for bed type deals. He then mentioned that he thought he saw a bright light shining outside of his window and was tempted to look, but thought better of it. Again, my dad also has a history of wild dreams and sleepwalking, so I just brushed it off. Randomly, my husband asked me to help him move the crib from the other side of our room to be next to our bed. I didn't think anything of it as he said it would just be quote unquote easier because our room was so big. It was half the full length of the original cabin with only our bed at the far end of the room, opposite from the crib and the bathroom. On Tuesday, my dad's birthday birthday, we sat in an old dining room for dinner. The room is a stunning picturesque old farmhouse dining room with big windows and this overlooked the field the shed, and the barn, with the mountains around us. It was still light outside, about 5 p.m., while we were eating, and I looked outside the window and noticed the shed door seemed slightly ajar. I didn't think anything of it, but the next time I looked up, it looked more open, but slightly enough that I thought it was just me overthinking it. This happened several times. The door was more open, more closed, etc. I didn't want to scare my already anxious dad, so I texted my husband. Can you go out and check the shed? The door keeps opening, I think. He checks his phone. When we both look up, we watch the shed door slowly open itself completely. And then just as slowly as it closed, it just closed itself shut. My husband went outside with my dad to check it out. No one was there. He locked the shed and said it shouldn't be open again. But it was weird that the door would both open and close itself like that. Wednesday, we were gone for the day in D.C. But on Thursday, we went to Gettysburg for the day. And my husband left after dinner to put the baby to bed. So I could do the ghost tour with my family. When we got home, my husband who is naturally very skeptical of ghosts, and hyper-logical about everything, said that he heard footsteps upstairs when he got in. Now, my dad and sister had met the groundskeeper on a walk along the property earlier in the week, and my husband said that he was worried the guy was a weirdo walking around the house and maybe snooping while we were gone. 
Another thing about the house, by the way. Sounds do not travel. Sitting in the kitchen, you didn't get an echo or had to speak very loud and clear to someone to be in the next room. No acoustics. So we checked every room and closet to make sure nobody was in fact in the house. That's how loud the steps were. And he was a little spooked, but we decided not to say anything. Because my family was making comments all week about the house. We didn't want to upset anyone. That night, I thought I was starting to get paranoid. I was hearing a knocking above my head and I thought I was smelling vanilla. On the ghost tour, he learned that the townspeople dealt with the smell of corpses for months. And they were just... Post-wear. I don't know what that means. The smell of corpses for months post-wear. Hmm. By dipping face masks in vanilla, lavender, and mint. I thought I was just spooked, and I did my best to sleep. When I woke up the next morning, always the first because I have my routine with our daughter, I noticed the kitchen cabinets were left open. I was confused, but just closed them. And while my daughter was taking a nap later that morning, I tapped the monitor and the camera rotated all the way down. I was really confused. Had I held it down? Am I overthinking it? My family decided to spend the day in Leesburg as our last full day before we left Saturday. At lunch, I mentioned the cabinets, and my dad said it might have been him. We got my mom a glass of water before bed, but we all just kind of went to bed after him. Then my sister mentioned that she woke up in a cold sweat at 3 a.m. She said she'd been having a really weird dream and thought she heard someone whisper into her ear, Don't move. She said that before bed, her and her husband were watching more videos about Gettysburg and saw a bright flash of light outside the window. She even checked the weather, thinking maybe there was a lightning storm on the way or something. Then I looked at my husband and said, Did you tell them about the footsteps? He hadn't. He shared his story, and then said that he also woke up at 3 a.m. in a cold sweat this morning. My sister also mentioned that she also hated the first bedroom. There was something about the fireplace that creeped her out the same way it gave me weird vibes. We all decided to keep that door shut all week without saying anything to each other about it. We were all stunned. My sister immediately started panicking, asking if we should leave. We were all on the fence about it. We were planning to leave Saturday at 6 a.m. regardless to get home and return to our rentals but weren't entirely convinced. We finished our day out, came home, and began to pack up what we needed, and then went to dinner with the plan to stay one more night. This is where everything got really weird. When we got home from dinner, the bedroom that we kept shut was cracked open and then air coming out of it was so cold it was like standing directly in front of the A.C. It was just my husband and I on the stairs. We looked at each other. We quickly shut it before my sister came up, so we didn't want her to freak out. We put the baby to bed and I headed downstairs, because we all talked about having one last fire pit outside. My husband stayed with the baby until she fell asleep. But when I came downstairs, my family was huddled together, saying, we need to go. My sister was really scared and didn't want to stay another night in their room. After some discussion, we all decided it would be best to leave, and we were all only about three hours from home, and we could sleep in our own beds before midnight. We got the cars loaded up relatively quickly, and I had to tell our daughter in our car seat, and was talking to my sister with the car door open, as the boys all did a final walk through the house. From the outside, you can see perfectly who's where in the house. I could see my dad walking into what was our room on the second floor with my husband, and I could see the flashlight scanning the top floor simultaneously where my sister and brother-in-law slept. My husband had his flashlight on when he went into the house, so I assumed it was him up there. After a few minutes, my dad throws out some final trash, and I see him half running and scuffling to the car and says, Okay, time to go. 
We start heading down the driveway and turn to my husband and ask why he didn't just turn the lights on upstairs when he checked it. He said that he wasn't up there, that it was my brother-in-law. My dad yelled up the stairs and asked if my brother-in-law was up there, and my husband heard, Yeah, I'm up here. At that point, my sister calls me. I asked her if the brother-in-law was upstairs to do a final sweep. He said no, he didn't go upstairs. And my dad, in their car, confirmed it. My dad said he yelled up the stairs, if he was there, and brother-in-law yelled from the first floor, No, I'm in the kitchen. When everyone asked why, I told them what I saw. It was like someone was walking around the third floor with a flashlight scanning the room. My dad mentioned that when he went into my room to check it, his flashlight started to die, and when he stepped into the hallway, it came back on. My husband agreed and shared that when he went into our room with my dad, he felt suddenly numb. And while my dad was locking the house up on the keypad, he started the four-digit code. The house locked itself on the second number, and when he went to throw out the last bag of trash, his flashlight started to die again. That's when we all saw him shuffling to the car. Oh, and when we tried to find any information on the house, it's so old and historical, it's got to be something, right? Well, we found nothing, except the 2020 Zillow listing from the last owner, who literally had six-packed paragraphs of information about the house. And under, quote, what the owner loves about the house is one sentence. The house was a Civil War field hospital, and then goes on to talk about the homes, 66 acres, and nearby locations. Needless to say, after all of that, we all felt better about coming home and not spending another night. Sometimes I wonder if ghosts just get comfortable and familiar and as more weird shit happened leading up to the night that we left, I wouldn't have been able to sleep that night. The owner texted my dad the next day to give checkout instructions, you could say. My dad said, We left last night. I'm sure we're not the first one to tell you this, but your place is haunted. The owners were surprised and said that we were the first to say so and asked what we experienced and that it was a Civil War field hospital, per Zillow. They simply said, Well, it definitely has its history, and asked us to leave a review. We didn't. Anyone have any interesting history on Purcellville during the Civil War? Story number one. The Third Floor. This story happened to me about 20 years ago when I was still a sophomore in high school. My aunt and uncle had a three-story condo that was always kind of off. It wasn't a particularly old or creepy looking building, in my recollection, but as soon as you set foot inside, there was something in the air that reeked of, quote unquote, something isn't right. For a little background, the condo's first floor held the living and dining areas, the kitchen and the back door that led to a small patio. The second story was the master bedroom, two guest rooms, a bathroom, and a little nook for the washer and dryer. The third floor was a game room with several old video game consoles like an Atari, Jaguar, and Sega. With my uncle's Star Trek collection in one corner, and a door that led to the attic crawl space. It also had a pull-out sofa sleeper for guests. This layout information will be important later. As I grew up, we visited the condo many times, and like I said, the entire building had an odd aura to it. But this all culminated on the third floor. When you walked over the final stair up to the third floor, the air just changed where on the second floor you could hear the sounds of family visiting downstairs and hear traffic outside. On the third floor was always completely silent. The air was heavy, thick. No sounds permeated here, and you always were left with the feeling of being stared at or watched, almost as if you were intruding there. 
Being kids, my cousin and I would often go up to the third floor to play video games. However, we never really went up there alone, and absolutely never went up there at night. It was just one of those places that felt like it was on a different plane of existence, its own pocket dimension of silence and gloom. My family had seen and heard things in that condo on multiple occasions. It was common sense that one could hear footsteps pacing up and down the stairs at night. You would see figures out of the corner of your eye. Doors would open and close despite being locked. Objects would move, that sort of thing. One morning I woke up before the adults to find a trail of pennies lying end to end from the third floor all the way down to the kitchen. I remember being a little bit unsettled by this, but not particularly afraid. I was more interested in free money and greedily put the pennies in my Ziploc baggie to take home. Because these goings-on were relatively benign in nature, my family assumed it to be the spirit of my late grandfather, who was the mischievous sort in life, watching over the house at night. Fast forward to my teenage years, my uncle died suddenly one year, and so a flood of tight-knit family descended on the condo to comfort my aunt and attend to my uncle's funeral. Because there were so many people staying in the condo, my mom, dad, and sister and I were relegated to sleeping upstairs on the third floor. I was creeped out, but figured, hey, how bad could it be? Boy, was I in for a surprise. The day of the funeral came and we all attended the wake, after which the family gathered outside to comfort my aunt, who was sobbing uncontrollably at the loss of her husband. I remember the sound being a gut-wrenching, heartbreaking cry of pure despair. It hurt to listen to. So I quickly retreated from the crowd of onlookers and went to find my cousins, until we were ready to leave. Little did I know that all hell was about to break loose. We got back to the condo and everyone wept and shared stories of my uncle. After some time we all grew tired and decided that it was time for bed. I slept on the sofa, while my mom, dad, and little sister all shared an air mattress down on the floor by the foot of the sofa. What I remember most about that night was the cold. I startled awake in the middle of the night, unsure of what had woken me up, only to be greeted by the most bone-biting, skin-saturating cold I had ever felt in my life. It permeated the entire third floor, soaking through my clothes and into my body. I shuddered and pulled the blanket tighter around me. I remember being puzzled by the cold, as the third floor usually got uncomfortably warm. I lay there, shivering for a few minutes, and then I heard it. The sound I heard is hard to describe, but it's probably best described as something trying its best to mimic my aunt's sobbing from earlier. It was a dry, raspy voice, crying and choking, and carrying on in a mocking tone. And it was extremely loud, I mean ear-splittingly loud. It was coming from the far corner of the room, over by the crawlspace door. I froze in terror. What on earth was going on? Was this some kind of an entity? I peeked over the edge of my blanket and gazed into the darkness at the corner of the room. Nothing, of course, was there. My mother, having had past experiences with paranormal things, had once told me that if anything scary ever happened like that, to ignore it and it would go away. So that's exactly what I tried to do. I squinted my eyes shut and pretended to be asleep. When that didn't work, I tried covering my head with the couch cushion to blot out the sound. That didn't work either. The sound stayed as loud as it had been, almost as if it were coming from inside my own head. I lay there for what seemed like minutes, but probably only about 45 seconds or so, when another noise grabbed my attention. The rustling of blankets. I peered out from underneath my own blanket to see my mother had bolted up on the air mattress. She looked left and right with a confused expression on her face, and then jumped up and ran down the stairs to the second floor. My father and sister were still sound asleep. This next part is what my mom told me happened after she ran down the stairs. 
Mom got to the second floor and immediately opened the master bedroom, thinking my aunt was awake and crying. Nope, sound asleep. Mom could still hear the wailing, so she checked all the other rooms on the second floor. Everyone was asleep. Confused, she stood at the bottom of the stairs, leading to the third floor, and listened to the wailing. Meanwhile, my fear had given way to curiosity, glancing cautiously over towards the corner where the sound was coming from. I leaned over the banister and gazed down to the second floor. I could see the hall light on downstairs, and Mom looking bewildered at the bottom of the steps. Mom! I called. She nearly jumped out of her skin, her head snapping up to look at me. Are you looking for that wailing sound? Mom's eyes widened. You hear it too? I nodded at this. Why isn't anyone else waking up? She called. I shrugged. She then turned away from me and headed toward the stairs, leading to the first floor. As she rounded the corner towards the first floor, she ran headlong into my little cousin, his eyes wide-eyed. In tears and shaking, Mom asked him what was going on wrong, and he said, He's coming to get me. Mom began to ask what was coming to get him. Then she saw it. A shadow, a humanoid, came lurching up the stairs toward them, blacker than darkness that surrounded it. As it approached, it began to morph, to grow into something monstrous. Now standing seven or eight feet tall, it began lunging up the remaining stairs at them, making a horrible sound as it came. Mom grabbed my cousin and began sprinting up the stairs, the shadow stomping just behind her. This cacophony caught my attention, and now, completely ignoring the wailing in the room with me, I craned my neck over the banister to see what was going on. I saw Mom sliding around the corner toward the third floor stairs, a flood of shade and darkness filling the hallway behind her. My little cousin was screaming and clutching at her neck as she ran, taking the stairs two at a time. Mom! I cried. Mom, it's right behind you! Run! She obliged and came flying up the final few steps to the third floor. As soon as she cleared the landing, the wailing completely stopped, cut off like someone pulling the plug on a speaker. She leapt into the air mattress with my cousin. I abandoned all pretenses of maturity and clambered onto the mattress with them. We all sat there, huddled in abject terror, staring into the darkness of the staircase. Nothing came, no shadow, no wailing, nothing. That's when the stomping started. Boom, 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 up and down the stairs it went over and over, rattling the knickknacks on the walls, vibrating the floors. Still, nobody woke up. After several minutes of this, the footsteps reached the third floor and stopped dead. The temperature in the room immediately started to plummet, and Mom clearly had enough. She started violently shaking my father awake. Wake up! Wake up! When Dad woke up, everything got quiet again. He was groggy and annoyed, and asked us what we were even doing. We explained what had happened. My cousin still crying in my mother's arms, and he looked at us skeptically but listened intently with us for any sounds in the house. Sounds never came for the rest of the night, but none of us really slept after that. In the morning, my cousin still visibly shaken explained to us what had happened to him before Mom found him. He said he heard a voice calling him from downstairs and thought his father, my late uncle, had returned. He was young, I don't think he understood the permanence of death. When he went down to investigate, he said he ran into the shadow, and that it was too big to be my daddy, end quote. I don't know what exactly happened that night. I've read about shadow people, about Jim, demons, but nothing quite matches the being that we saw that night. If anyone has a good answer, or has run into an entity like this, please feel free to let me know. Creepy Room in My Ancestral Village Home I am from India, the eastern part of the country precisely. I am a skeptic, tending to be a non-believer of the paranormal. 
But sometimes there are things which you just can't pass off with your skepticism. So my family from my mother's side were wealthy landowners once. I'm talking back about more than 200, 300 years ago till our independence. Most of the land and properties are gone following our independence, but what we still own is a large mansion from before that time. Now this is located in a village in rural Chodanagpur Plateau of the Indian subcontinent, and it's also the last house before land opens up to arid, sparsely vegetated landscape, along with some hillocks in the distance. This land still belongs to us, so it would be used for agriculture, but not anymore. Now being the last house itself is scary, and that too some 500 year old mansion, but when I was younger in the 90s our family used to visit the place every year in the winter. Summers are too hot and arid. And so did others in the family. My grandparents, three brothers and a sister, to have a reunion of sorts. I always enjoyed that place, being away from the hustle and bustle. But gradually the older generation passed away and our families became distant as we too started to grow up. Now the important part of the experience is the mansion. The property had three buildings, the mansion forming one side, a much recent building on the right making another perimeter, a cattle shed to the right making another perimeter, and lastly an entrance walled gate completed the perimeter with an open courtyard in the center. Now coming to the mansion it had ten rooms, huge ones with thirty foot even more high ceilings, similar sized rooms. Five in each floor, along with the toilet and corridor leading up to the rooms. Now the room in concern is on the first floor. It's the last room when one comes up through the stairs. I had always had a creepy feeling going into that room, be it day or night. But sometimes I had to go in, because the house just always assured me that I would go in running and come out running too. On the walls there were old photographs framed and particularly old, and one photo scared me most. It was of a girl in her teens, a black and white old photo. But the creepy thing being was that it always seemed to look at you no matter where you were in the room. The eyes seemed to move, and the photo felt alive. Now flash forward a few more years, in the summer of 2004, after my class 10 board exams, I decided to visit the place alone. I had always gone there with my parents. The members staying there at the time were my grandfather in his late 70s, an unmarried uncle and the longtime caretaker cook. Just three men in the property of over 20 rooms. Now coming to the rooms again, our building ended on both sides with round rooms. The one on the first floor was my grandfather's. The other was used as a guest room. The uncle, too, stayed on the first floor in another room. On the ground floor, the room was for the caretaker. And the others were kept locked. I don't know why. There was another room on the first floor that's kept underneath a lock. The room adjacent to the creepy room. I tried to peek inside of the locked room many times but only could see the old furniture and stuff dumped into it. But I could swear the room wasn't empty of presence, as many a time I heard strange noises coming out of that room, from moving furniture to groans. I hated going to the first floor alone for as long as I can remember. Now again coming back, so I was left with two rooms only on the first floor. The other building had the kitchen and the living room. The other rooms were locked too. One other room that overlooked the vast expanse of barren land from the windows that started a few inches above the floor to about 10 feet high. And many a time I had witnessed odd things on the land that I couldn't fathom at that age. And there were rumors in the village that witches used to gather on these lands at night to perform dark magic. The fires I would see at night, 
I attributed them to witches going by the legend. But it could have been, it was maybe a willow and willow the wisp. So I turned that room down as the fires were more etched into my memory. And with that, ended up staying in the creepy room. Not having gone there recently, most of the experience I had forgotten. So it wasn't a problem when I had been put up in the room. But the photo of the girl was still there and had a similar chill run down my spine as before. But I was older and much more rational. I quickly put the thought away. In villages, nightfall means an end to the day, and most families would go to bed by 7.30 or 8. Ours was no exception. Uncle, who owned a pharmacy there, would return by 6.30 or 7, and we would have our dinner by 8. Then off to bed. The room had a four-poster bed, which seemed as old as the house itself. There wasn't much furniture other than a table and an Almira, which had a huge lock on it. So I would get on the bed, but I couldn't sleep at the time, so I would spend my time reading. I love reading. Anything that I could get my hands on, too. But everything I would get immersed in, something would break my concentration. Can't put a finger to what exactly it was, but again it would take another 10 to 15 minutes before I could go back to reading. First couple of days went by very smoothly, except the reading part, and slowly I was falling into the early bed routine. I unconsciously started spending less and less time in the room apart from sleeping time. I would wander about the village, the moor-type landscape, taking the cattle to graze, but spend time in the house. Even the lazy afternoons were creepy, as I now think of it. But the things escalated after I started spending time away from that room. At night, I would hear weird noises coming from the adjacent locked room, which I always believed to be rats. But there was scratching sounds and the moving of furniture. Still, I didn't pay much heed. But after that, when I would put out the light and go to bed, weird feelings would grip me. Sorrow and despair would feel me out of nowhere. The weird part being the photo could be made out in the darkness. Thought I could even see the eyes fixed upon me. The bamboo forest behind the house didn't help either with the weird rustling and occasional hissing of snakes. But I would fall asleep but I would be woken up each night unexpectedly. Don't know why, but at the same hour between 2 and 2.30 in the morning, this was the time before I had my cell phone, so a torch and an alarm clock would be the only source of time and light that I had. But when I wake up, I could swear that it was someone that was with me in this room. Sometimes, even on the bed, if I was laying on a side, I would have this feeling that if I turn, I would see someone lying beside me. The hairs on your neck senses it. And I could never, not a single time, have the courage to turn and look. I seemed to get frozen, wide awake. This happened a couple of days more, then it escalated one more bit. This time I was woken to that same feeling, but the tube light, the fluorescent light, would flicker even when the light was switched off. I couldn't tell anyone, as I didn't want to get ridiculed, but kept on going through the same stuff for almost a fortnight before finally leaving for my home. During the stay, I checked the tube light, and it was working fine the other times, but that period. I would lay there till dawn, broke each day before I could go to sleep again. I kept numb about my experience for almost a decade before I told it to my girlfriend. Then during a family gathering, my girlfriend brought up the topic in front of my parents. They were taken back. It was then when I learned that I wasn't the only one feeling it. My mother's always felt it from when she was young. She would never go into that room hence. Later, my father too experienced the same we would always stay in the other round guest room. I also learned that day who the girl was in the photo. 
my grandfather had another sister who had died in her teens. In the 1950s, due to cholera, and the room was hers, even the bed too. It was the same bed where she breathed her last breath. Haven't gone back to that house since, not because of the encounter, but due to my life just taking me away from the city as a whole. Now I stay in a metropolitan city and could only dream of going back there, and seriously, I want to go back, to learn what the presence wanted to communicate, if not interact. But don't know whether my cynicism would help in the contact anymore, but would love to go back in general. My Paranormal Life The first time I remember something paranormal happening to me was when I was like three or four. My grandparents had come for a visit and were taking me and my younger brother shopping. Dad and Grandpa were a few steps ahead of me, Grandma and little brother. And that's when we stopped for a crosswalk. I had a vision of later that day. We were all sitting in my grandpa's parked car, and it was raining on half of it. I was brought out of that vision when my grandma chided me for daydreaming. Later that day, my dad was driving. He chose to park in the one spot that made the vision come true. So everyone but my granddad decided to get out on the dry side of the car. He made a fuss about not wanting to get out in the rain, so I asked why he just didn't slide into the driver's seat and get out. He said it was awkward to do so. Then after a look from Grandma, realized that he was being just obstinate and slid over. I continued to have such visions throughout my life, another of which I will share later, as I'm trying to keep things in chronological order. Chapter 2 In the spring of 84-85, when I was five or six, in a vision I was picked up by a pair of dream spirits. A black man and a doll-like girl approached me in a white void. They said they needed me to be next king of the Colorado area dreamland, as their old king had reached his limit of time that he could rule. As they continued, they explained it would only be a three-month reign, as they needed me to fill in until the next queen was old enough to handle it. Then the old king paraded out to meet me and hand over control. After the king had disappeared, I was led to a walled city called the City of Children's Dreams. It was a safe haven to keep adults' dreams from mixing with the dreams of children to keep the dreams pure. The two dream spirits started taking me on a tour, but I felt compelled to jump off a cliff and onto a four-poster bed. That fell to the ground from some quite height, awakening me just as it hit the ground. For the next three months, every night my dreams were of the same land which drew its strength to exist from me. Then I would feel compelled to jump off the same cliff every night and fall back to earth. As this went on for about three months, my strength began to falter, necessitating the city to shrink and shrink until only five houses remained. Then the girl that they had talked about took over from me. She was strong enough to last a year, year and a half, without the city shrinking truly believe it was some form of an astral plane of existence, and that the book Little Nemo in Dreamland was at least partly based on the writer's time as a king of Dreamland as a child. Chapter 3 The summer between my second and third grade, I had one of my visions as I slept. I saw everything I'm about to write in an overhead view. I was in a classroom and the teacher allowed the quarter of my class I was in to get their coats from a small side room that they were kept in. 
I anxiously watched as my future self tried not to run into the room until I rounded the corner taking three hurried steps. My teacher admonished me for running and told me to sit back down without getting my coat, then wait for the rest of the students to get there. Six months later as it happened, it felt like I had no control over the event, no matter how hard I tried to stop it. It unfolded just as I had seen it happen. Furthermore, I didn't see through my present self's eyes, but a third and future grown-up me, who was sitting in the corner with his back on the ceiling. This part of the vision has not yet come true, but I now recognize that I looked like I do now. Things like this happened off and on until puberty hit and I gained control of the events taking place such as what happened in Chapter 4. Chapter 4 Several families, including mine, were mad at the school board, as so they all met up in a church to discuss the matter. Thus, the parents had their meeting in the church's dining hall. The children played behind the pulpit. Except for me and my brother. I had a bad feeling the moment I had walked into that place so I told him to just sit with me in the back wall. For once, he listened, as everyone was getting ready to leave, an industrial-sized ceiling fan fell into the aisle between the first three rows of pews. No one was hurt, but it gave everyone quite the fright. Chapter 5 I was sound asleep in the passenger seat of my dad's truck, but I had a vision of a chain snapping on a semi in front of us, smashing the windshield, causing a bad accident, as both the truck and trailer would have been connected by this chain. I awoke just as we got to the trailer's back bumper. The chain did snap, but I physically caught it and threw the chain between my dad's truck and the trailer. I mistakenly let it drag down the side of the fender where it sort of chipped the paint, looking at the spot, always reminded me of that day. Chapter 6 I had a job painting and repairing apartments. One day a new tenant moved into an apartment that we had just freshly renovated. Every time I passed her in the hallway I felt a stabbing pain in one particular place of my skull. So after the fourth time I asked her if she had a headache. I pointed to the spot on my head. She asked how I knew. I told her I could feel it and that she was having a stroke. She brushed it off. Two weeks later she died in the back of an ambulance from said stroke. All I can say is that I warned her. Chapter 7 This one you can go ahead and see for yourself, even if you're not physically inclined as I am. In the heart of Detroit, there exists a pre-Civil War fort and army base called Fort Wayne, which has at least three ghosts, only two of which I can personally corroborate. The first belongs to the last base commander, who was an older gentleman with no family. Upon learning that the base was being decommissioned, decided to shoot himself instead of leaving his post. He now haunts the bedroom of the commander's home, dressed in his sleeping robe and cap. Frequently moving the curtains aside, looking at the base he once commanded. Visitors, including myself, have seen him peeking at them from the window. The other exists in one of the fort's gun bunkers. It was a hot day and I decided to take a break from bartending at an event held there. So I made my way into the bunker which was a lot cooler than outside. It was then that I felt him staring at me, demanding I get back to work. As he had done so many times to his soldiers, he's dressed in a sergeant's uniform from the war in 1812. He was see-through, and missing his legs from the knee. Floating there, he gave off a constant aura of disgust for my gold-breaking. In a heartbeat, I knew that I was dealing with, and I just laughed. It was a harmless photo ghost. 
Basically, the sergeant had chased his subordinates out of there, and he had imprinted his feelings and likeness on the very stone walls of that bunker. Later that day, I was looking through the local paranormal society books, and there was a picture of the same ghost I had just encountered. Chapter 8 I was going through an antique store that I had been to twice before, and every time I felt a faint sense of death and dread that I couldn't place. It was more than a place should have, but it also felt too weak to be from someone who actually died there. The place had several bank vaults that now played host to individual seller's booths. I had wanted something from a locked cabinet inside a vault. And as we walked back, she told me the history of the place, how the former bank was one of the oldest buildings in town. I asked her if they ever held furs and hides in the bank. She said no, then pointed to a newspaper clipping from the 1900s on the wall. Twelve people had died out at a logging camp during a blizzard. And as the back had the only place big enough to store the bodies, they had locked them inside one of the vaults until they could be sent home. With my questions about that place answered, I felt comfortable shopping there several more times. Story number one, The Grieving Spirits I Met at a Meditation Retreat in Northern California. I'm a 29-year-old female. I meditate regularly and abide by an Eastern philosophy that's quite similar to Buddhism. What tends to happen to people who meditate quite a bit is that we accidentally open up to the spirit realm been my experience that I've been able to hear and see spirits, although I opt to tune that stuff out and set boundaries between myself and the spiritual realm. In the summer of 2019, I joined my spiritual community for the three-day meditation retreat in Northern California, in a town somewhat close to Sacramento. The retreat was held at a small rustic ashram nestled in the wooded area. The property itself was quite unlike anything I had ever seen before, and it had a Native American history, as does most land in the Americas. The staff at the property were kind and gracious. I was assigned a room at the back of the property in a woman's cabin. I had a room to myself, and I shared the cabin with three other women, these were women that I traveled with. The minute I walked into the room where I was staying, I felt heavy, like an overwhelming sense of death. Hanging on the wall was a painting of St. Teresa of Avila. It seemed to stare right at me. The painting creeped me out to no end. So, I took it down and set it face toward the wall on the floor. I told myself I was psyching myself out good reason, went about my day. That evening I came back to retire for the night around 9.30 p.m. As we were out in the wooded area, there was absolutely no ambient noise. It was completely quiet. I tried to fall asleep, but I couldn't because I kept hearing the voice of a man try to speak to me. I couldn't make out what he was saying. But it was, without a doubt, the voice of a man. I became aware that this was something that was maybe I was picking it up from the spirit realm, so the voice sounded more like a fading radio transmission that seemed to cut in and out. I became terrified and picked up my phone, put on a Hindu mantra on repeat. I was raised in the Hindu tradition, and it is believed mantras can keep spirits at bay. However, I still couldn't fall asleep and ended up turning on the lights on as well. I felt quite strongly that there was something in the room with me, but I had no idea what to do. In the end, I didn't fall asleep until 2 a.m. 
I got up at 5 a.m. for the first meditation of the day. I was glad to be leaving my room. That day, I went about my activities, but I felt shaken at the prospect of having to return to my room in the evening. The second night, I experienced the same thing. The voice, the feeling of death and terror. Again, it took me until 2 a.m. to fall asleep. Lights on, mantra playing on my phone. The next day, I finally did reveal what was going on to a handful of my friends. Initially, I was scared to do so, because although we were a group that valued meditation, the vast majority of us tended to be more toward the logical and rational side. More than likely would have written off my experience as just my imagination. I doubted that many in my group would understand what it was like to see or hear a spirit realm. However, a small few sympathized came back with me to my room to gather my things and move them to another spot where I felt safer. When leaving the cabin, I explained to the woman who slept in the room next to mine that I could no longer stay if the room I was in was haunted. Typically, when sharing a story like this, I fully expect that the listener may not believe or understand. Indeed, I don't think she fully believed me, but she was kind about it and told me that she was glad that I had done what was right for me. After moving to another cabin, I slept peacefully for the third night, although I did feel uneasy. The next morning after meditation, this same woman ran up to me and pulled me aside excitedly. She told me that the previous night she had had the following dream. She found herself having gone underground, beneath the ashram property, and there she met a couple who looked Native American. The woman was weeping inconsolably, and the man had a much calmer presence. The man told her that their child was buried on the property, and that the body had been disturbed during the construction of the ashram. She asked him, How do you know that the body moved as your child's? He apparently answered, Do we not know, as parents, which body is that of a child? She was convinced that the dream explained what I had experienced in that room. I agreed. That day, the retreat ended and I packed my things, ready to head back home. Once home, I was glad to be back, but the second I entered my room, I still felt heavy. I told myself I was still experiencing the aftermath of that haunting and told myself I was safe now. That night, I slept peacefully, setting my alarm for 5.45 for my morning meditation. I woke at 5 a.m. instead of the sound of a woman chanting, now being Hindu, I'm familiar with the sound of Sanskrit chanting, but this was quite unlike anything I'd ever heard before. I was once again terrified. There was no way I was going back to sleep. So instead, I sat down for meditation a bit earlier than I normally would, determined to block out this experience. However, as soon as I closed my eyes within my mind's eye, I saw the face of the spirit. It was quite unlike anything I had seen before. Clearly, this thing had once been human, but its face now had bulging eyes and was contorted by the emotions of both deep fear and deep sorrow. It sat hunched, and I got the sense of it being bird-like. In that moment, deep down, I understood that these spirits that terrify us live on feelings of both sadness and fear on a level, if I'm being specific, I mean a much lower frequency, that the human body is unable to process, which is why we normally cannot see or hear these spirits unless we're physically open, psychically open. That morning, I accepted that the even meditation is not going to provide solace. As clearly, whatever was in this room had followed me home. I'm not entirely sure what connection the spirit I saw in my mind's eye had to the spirit seen in the woman's dream, 
or the man speaking to me in my room. I got in touch with a healer friend whose experience in these matters outweighed my own. And she told me that multiple entities had attached themselves to me and that she would perform a small exorcism. Apparently it worked, as neither heard from or saw those spirits again. The only explanation I have for the detachment is this. Two months prior to the retreat, I'd gone through a messy breakup and I was still processing feelings of sorrow and anger toward my ex. After a few weeks, I had been violently mugged, and I was still carrying feelings of fear and trauma around that incident. Perhaps this is why those spirits felt compelled to attach themselves to me, although, who knows. It was my first time having such an experience, and from then on I learned that it was necessary to set boundaries between myself and the spirit realm. I had a handful of visits, including one from a dead woman at another, the Pasanana, the Pasana Meditation Retreat, which was also located in the wooded area of Northern California. But now I always stay quite clear with meditation. If there's anything that would like to make contact, please know that you do not have my permission I found that spirits typically honor a strongly stated intention. Of course, being a spiritual person has always been quite rational and grounded as well. I've always vacillated when it comes to these experiences. Are they imagined? Am I crazy? To this day, I can't say with certainty, but I do know what it was that I experienced. Possible Mimics in Denver and Venice, California My boyfriend and I are travelers, and we live in our van. I'm from upstate New York, and he is from Manhattan. Me too. Not the Manhattan part. I've been living for pretty much like this for over five years now, and I've seen a lot. One of the best parts about this lifestyle is the people you get to meet from all walks of life all over the world. Needless to say, we have a lot of exposure to different people who aren't easily scared by strange behavior or differences. A lot of times we will camp in national forests, but there are also plenty of nights that we spend in Walmart parking lots and home depots, anywhere we can find with overnight street parking. The latter has brought us some sketchy areas where other homeless people camp in bum camps and all that kind of stuff, and obviously hardcore drug use in some of these areas is a real thing. With that being said, a few weeks ago we were kicking it in Denver and went downtown to the Rhino District, off of Laramar, I believe, and we were looking at murals and street art, taking pictures, generally just chilling. It was almost midnight, and we ended up in an alley behind an old Catholic church when we saw the feet and blankets of someone sleeping in a doorway. Now, as another person on the street, even though I don't live the exact same lifestyle as people who have to sleep in super public like that, I still empathize as much as possible and try to give them respect and privacy. Like, I don't grill them while they're laying there because I can imagine how uncomfortable and demeaning that would be to wake up to. So as we begin to pass this person, I keep it in the forefront of my mind not to stare, and I prepare myself that they might be asleep or they might be awake and looking at us and not to get startled. This person was laying in a maybe three-foot indent in front of an entrance to an old factory behind this Catholic church. No matter how I prepared, I tried to get myself. And no matter how much exposure I have to other people on the street, I couldn't help but get a surge of adrenaline and fear when we passed by this lady. As we got closer, I glanced over, and she was sitting up, slouched in the corner, looking right at us. To me, she looked like she could have been native or Hispanic, 
Her skin was a mix of brown and gray, and she had long, tangled black hair. But what I remembered most were her eyes. They were huge, bugged out. Seemed like they were painfully strained, and you could see her lips pulled back to show her teeth effortlessly. She had a blank expression on her face the whole time that we walked by. I feel like this is a good place to mention that after spending time on the West Coast, you get crazy accustomed to tweakers and general meth antics. You can usually always tell when somebody has lost themselves to meth. And it's a special kind of crazy, but crazy all the same. You can feel when someone's lost themselves to this drug and the decaying and neglect of their bodies is very apparent. With that being said, this woman did not give off druggy quote-unquote vibes. She didn't look ill and frail because of drug use, and she didn't seem to be fueled by drugs. She genuinely looked sick, like terminally ill type sick. The most fucked up part of this is what she said to us as we walked by though. Shane was on my left side, my little husky was clipped to me in between us, and the lady was on the ground to my right, and as we passed by I noticed she was making eye contact. I gave her a soft, gentle smile and looked down. Her a soft, gentle smile and looked down. Mm -hmm. I don't know what Shane did to her as far as facial expressions and acknowledgement goes. But as we started to pass her, she says in a soft, serious voice with no infliction at all, What is it called when you don't believe in God anymore? Shane quickly responded, I think that's agnostic. We just kept walking. As soon as we got out of earshot, I was like, Shane, what the fuck? Why did you scare me so much? He was like, you're okay. It was just a homeless person. It's no big deal. I had a feeling she was going to scare you though, but it was okay. We kept walking down the alley. At this point, I let Bobby, my husky, off her clip and she could walk on her own, and she just followed behind us quietly. She never barked throughout the entire ordeal or acted scared at all. And she is losing her eyesight a bit, but I've seen it heightened her in other senses. And she knows when things are fucked, you could say, or if someone wants to hurt us and will bark to go into defense mode. She went through this whole encounter with nothing. We leave the alley and we're in front of these old apartment buildings that remind us of something that you'd see in New York or even New Orleans. Totally project looking, almost shotgun houses, and completely out of place for a gentrified ass Denver. We saw them as we drove by before this happened and instantly felt drawn to them because they were so out of place. There was a kid's jungle gym type thing. And they could kind of crawl on place on top of a bush in front of the house which was distinct as fuck but we didn't mention it until later. There was the haze of a flashing TV screen and someone screaming in one of the houses through the open door. And this was all across the street from the old ominous Catholic church was just the dark alley, the lady, the creepy church, the foreign houses, the supposed presence of children, and the soft, hazy lighting from the streetlight above that was such a mindfuck that we felt like we weren't even in Denver anymore. Or I hate to be this guy, but like we weren't even in 2020 anymore. Later on that night, we got back to the van. Shane told me that that woman actually terrified him. That he knew I was scared, but had to act like everything was okay for me, so I didn't lose my shit. He said it was just an unnatural sort of feeling, as I felt, and he doesn't really think that we saw a person. When he said that, I flipped out, because that's exactly what I thought, too. It was unsettling how we both felt the same thing at the same time and didn't realize it until later on when we discussed the situation. And on to the Venice story. So last night we were sleeping in the van by the dog park near the boardwalk, and Shane was staying up doing some art stuff in the van. The 
the way our van is set up is on the left side we have a big long window, and then the driver's side window uncovered. Shane heard someone's feet shuffling and dragging and was curious which tweaker was walking by, looked out the window to see someone passing by, indeed. This was about 2 a.m., and he saw a lady wearing a black beach hat resting on top of her head. With really thin, balding hair, you could see her scalp underneath. She turned her head to the side and tried to look through the big side window, and it felt like she was seeing through the window, but not looking at anything in particular at the same time. Her eyes were really deep set and sunken in, and it seemed like she hadn't slept in a while. But she seemed too cognizant to be high. Her skin was pale white. She seemed to be in her 70s or so. She was really frail and was distressed to go to the beach. Which was strange, because it was so late at night. Dark and chilly for Venice at nighttime. It felt like she wanted people to think she was going to the beach. She was talking to herself, but it wasn't audible. There was no human language that we'd ever heard. It sounded like radio tuning or something. Like a strange frequency of radio tuning. She didn't notice him even though they were a few feet away from each other. She wasn't angry or anything like that. It just felt like she wasn't trying to deceive him. Or perhaps she was trying to deceive him. The craziest part is there's a plastic divider in between the two windows. And when she walked away from the big picture window, Shane could hear her footsteps, but she never passed by the front window. She didn't cross the street or go behind the van or anything. She walked straight, and he never saw her pass that second window. I'm glad I wasn't awake for this shit, because I would have lost it. As soon as I woke up in the middle of that night and he told me what happened, I instantly got the chills. Story number three, The Whisper. A little bit of background story about me. I don't like people touching me, hugging me, or sometimes going into people's houses. Why? Well, people, or when people touch me, I feel things that I can't describe in words. I feel that they did something bad, like they got into a really bad fight or even worse. When a guy has done something bad to a girl, use your imagination there. So when I walk into places that I don't know, I feel like when someone's died in the apartment and that kind of thing. I avoid hospitals because I can feel hands touching me and I get goosebumps and really bad headaches. For example, I was looking for an apartment, like a month ago with my mother. I like to hear input into things. My mother is my best friend. So we walked into the apartment and automatically I got a pain in my stomach, and I had a headache. My mother and I developed a language that only her and I can understand. I walked into the kitchen of the apartment and I told her, Mom, a lot of people died here and I can't live here. So my mom decided to tell the realtor no thank you to the apartment. It's too big for her. The guy decided to reply, Ma'am, this apartment is really cheap. The usual rent is 3000 and now it's 1600 I live in a New York City apartment. My mom. Yeah, I understand, but no thank you. We were walking downstairs and the lady that lived in one apartment below the apartment that we were looking at came out of her door and said to my mom in Spanish, don't move in there. The family had died in there a month ago. He's not going to tell you that. Good night. Close the door. The realtor said, What did she say? My mom replied, She said, Welcome to the building. If you have any packages, I'll pick them up for you. She lied. So the realtor looked kind of weird. As we walked home, I told my mom what I told you. I'm not crazy. Another story. My sister, when she was 15, had a horrible habit of inviting friends over and they would sleep on the couch. So having odd people in my apartment wasn't odd to me. So one night I went out drinking with friends, came back home, and as I was walking down the hallway, there was a guy that was standing up against the wall to let me pass to the bathroom. 
I said, yeah, excuse me, and good night. He replied with, sure, hon, go ahead. I went to the bathroom, closed the door, and as I was using the bathroom, I thought to myself, wait, no one is home. My sister's in Pennsylvania. My mom works overnight. Who the hell was that? I opened the door slowly and no one was there. I told my mom what happened next morning and of course she went to tell the neighbor next door. So the neighbors told my mother, the couple that lived there, the boyfriend stabbed the other guy because he was cheating on him. Then the other guy killed himself in your daughter's room, my room. Creepy. Where did all that happen? Yeah, it happened in the hallway. So you get the point that I feel things and sometimes even see things that I can't explain. In the apartment that I live in right now, there's a shadow that likes to sit at the foot of my bed and just likes to watch me sleep. The reason I'm moving, by the way. You feel the weight at the foot of the bed. It just like sits there and watches. The Salem Story I went to visit my little sister's best friend. I need to take a break from the pandemic bullshit. I went to Boston while I was still safe to visit. My friend picked me up from the airport, and that was nice of her. Anywho, since I arrived in Boston super early in the morning, she decided that it would be nice for me to visit Salem, a small town. Very cute, by the way. Backstory. My sister and I have a thing that we would get our palm read by a psychic, or our cards read. The lady that we used to go to, she was a nice old lady. About to lose her sight, she would tell me stuff. At some point, it would seem like it was all bull, but oddly enough, everything that she said did come true. The last time I saw her, she said, You have a good aura. You're so kind. You'd like to help people from your heart, and it's the biggest downfall. Don't worry. Other worldly people see that, and they love that about you. But back to the Salem story. So I went to this shop. Can't remember the name. It had a sort of witch stuff, dolls, potions, herbs, even candles to do some black magic. I don't believe in any of that stuff, personally. But to the people who do believe in it, I respect your beliefs. There was a sign that said, Card Reading. Please make an appointment. I looked around and there was an employee at the shop fixing some candles. He said, yeah, go to the cashier, make an appointment, and she can help you. I did make the appointment. The guy reads my cards. Says some odd stuff, but one thing that I can say that stood out is that he said that there's a lady that is with me at all times. I said, who? He replied that she said that she is the lady with the roses. Lots of roses. My grandmother had a thing with roses. She had three gardens filled with roses, yellow, red, pink, you name it, she would have them. I told the guy my grandmother's nickname. He said, yes. She's shaking her head up and down. Okay, odd. I'm not going to tell you the rest of the reading because that's personal. After I left the shop, I was drained. I told her to take me home. So, I got more about 1 p.m. or so, I need to sleep. And my sister's friend lives right across the cemetery. It looked really pretty and peaceful. In New York, the cemeteries look odd. And personally, I feel like all the dead people are piled up on top of each other like there's no walking space. So I left the store uneased had a migraine that came out of nowhere right after I left the shop. I told my friend I had a headache, and mentally I was so drained that I don't really know what happened in that shop. I felt like I worked 36 hours straight, so I fell asleep and woke up in the middle of the night. I woke up to someone whispering in my ear really fast. Like you know when the commercial people are trying to read you the TRRs, that fast. I woke up and I couldn't move at all. I was stiff on my friend's daughter's bed started to pray mentally because I couldn't even move my mouth. The whisper just kept on getting faster and faster, so I did what my mother had told me. Munchkin, when you feel like that, pray to your grandma. She's always with you, in your heart. 
So I prayed to my grandmother. I said, whoever's trying to communicate, stop it. The whisper stopped. I got up to get a drink of water downstairs. The house felt odd. I felt like someone was looking at me. I hate that feeling, so I ran up the stairs to get into bed again. Oddly enough, the shades started to move, like there's a wind coming into the bedroom. What the fuck? I felt cold. I fell asleep again, though, but this time wearing a hoodie. Socks, too. The fuzzy kind. In the morning, I woke up and told my friend what happened. She said something that was odd. That room is always odd. It's always cold. It would be 100 degrees outside, and it's always cold. We had one of those guys, that tech guys, you know, to come and check if there was a hole in the house or what. He said that the house is completely sealed. That the room shouldn't be that cold. I told her about the whisper, of course. She laughed it off. The next morning, I wanted to go back to the shop. I wanted to see the guy again. Because of the pandemic, there was a line, so a friend of mine just said that, wait a bit online. But it was taking way too long. So I passed by the shop, and since its shop has windows that are pretty big, I passed by, and all the employees in that shop turned their heads to look at me. The card guy, the cashier, and the herb lady. They didn't have any customers waiting either. I looked back at them and the card guy smiled, but it didn't seem normal. He looked really creepy and his teeth didn't look normal at all. So guess what? When my mother said to never walk into places that people like to drain you, meaning energy-wise. I always thought my mom was a little superstitious, but she hasn't been wrong so far. Munchkin, they feel your light, your love, and other people want that. People who cannot see. So the question is... What am I? My four paranormal experiences as a 25-year-old Australian indigenous man. So the first experience happened when I was seven or eight years old. We lived in a suburb called Molden in Darwin. Northern Territory. There were these aboriginals from a community called the Menangrida that lived up the road from us. And they were notorious for having a lot of domestic violence and always having cops and ambulances over their house. What happens when the families fight is they start doing black magic on each other and sending evil spirits and curses to each other. One night, the cats and the dogs in the neighborhood were extremely vocal. The dogs couldn't stop barking, and the cats were meowing and running from drain to drain, trying to find somewhere to hide. This went on for a good four hours, until about 12 or 1 a.m. Me and my mom were still sleeping. My sister came running into the house, saying, Get up, there's an alien ship outside. We get up and go outside. Fair enough, there's something that's silver-colored and shaped like a typical saucer, as you see in the movies, right above the aboriginal's house. I think I remember this story. Moving on. It had lights underneath, and it projected onto the ground, going in circles. They were a light blue color, and from the outside, going into the center. It was the biggest to smallest, and they were circular-shaped. The lights just kept twirling around, and I wish I took a video, but back then, phones weren't really common. And even if you did have a good phone, the camera quality was terrible in the early 2000s. It stayed there for a very long time, and then left. The next day, we heard of kids that had followed it on their BMX bikes from different suburbs away. This wasn't the only time it happened. It happened at least twice every single time it would start off with the dogs and cats in the neighborhood going crazy. I know it wasn't a fake prop because of the animals and at least seven to ten other witnesses that have seen it. I saw a video on YouTube of cats sensing earthquakes before they hit because they have supersonic hearing. 
and I've also heard that before a natural catastrophe like a flood happens, animals will seek high ground day before it happens. They know things that we don't, for sure. The second weird thing that I saw was that we had made a trip to Alice Springs. My sister was dating one of the boys that were from that house and that family. When we were in Alice Springs late at night, we happened to see another weird thing which very closely resembles the old PS2 startup screen with the colored balls twirling around each other. There was four lights. They were colored orange, green, blue, and red, just twirling around each other in a pattern, maybe 12 feet in the air. It was so strange for it to be so prominent and just stay there for that long and allowing us to see it. My sister told me 15 years later that the reason the lights were following us was because her boyfriend had a curse on him. He was an accessory to murder. He had given one of his relatives an axe to go and kill his wife, and the lights had followed us like 1,500 kilometers all the way from Darwin. The third time was at my property in Berry Springs, maybe 60 kilometers outside of Darwin City. A lot of people started telling us that they see lights on our property. And it's a rural property with lots of land because I'm a traditional owner. We thought it was thieves trying to come on our property with flashlights and steal stuff while we were sleeping. I was only around 11 or 12 years old when I saw the light for myself. It was late at night again and I was going down to the stairs because the toilet in the house was broken and I had to use the outside toilet. About 30 meters away, underneath a mango tree, I see a faint light, like an old torch when it loses its battery and it starts to turn brown. I was about to yell out because I thought I was about to catch the thief, but very quickly I realized that it was gliding and sort of bobbing up and down. And maybe it noticed that I saw it, so the light went from a dim brown to an immaculate gold color. I can't even describe the color, but if it was like a small piece of the sun right in front of me at night. It's like when you see a lightning strike and it lights up the entire area around it. Well, I saw it in a small compact ball the size of a basketball. There's no man-made thing in this world that can match the brightness that I saw that night. It was incredibly bright. It opened my brain to a whole new brightness that I've never seen in my life. It was kind of like a human spirit because it turned the corner as it was kind of like it was walking. It didn't go through the wall that was nearby and it stayed on the footpath. I would have stayed and stared at it heading in the opposite direction, but as soon as I seen it turn the corner, I immediately thought that it could easily turn back around and come charging straight at me. I got incredibly scared, ran back up the stairs. What made it worse was when I got home, I was alone and I couldn't go outside and pee. There's a common name for these lights called Min Min lights, but I'm not sure if that's what I saw that night because I've heard of people seeing the lights that were either green or red, but this one was a strange type of gold that I've never seen on this earth. The fourth time was when my uncle was dating an aboriginal woman from a community called the Boralula, and she had a niece whom my sister befriended. There are these things called hairy men. They are ugly little creatures that can pop into the spiritual realm and our realm. Kids are given these creatures as protectors, apparently, and they can hop into the owner's body and help them fight. My sister and her friend that lived with us was stupid enough to accept one of these creatures as a friend. And that's when a lot of crazy things started happening in that house. For example, as we were taking showers, we would hear little giggles and knocks on the door. My mom would fall asleep in the lounge and wake up in a whole different spot, usually by the front door. There was lots of other things that happened that I can't remember because this was at least 13 years ago. But we were eating dinner one night, and for some reason they loved coming out and tormenting us when it was a stormy night, and when it was raining heavily. 
while I happened to see one of its faces just peeking up from underneath the table looking at her food. I got a very quick glimpse of it. It had pale skin, a scar on its face going from top to bottom, and black hair that was very thin and horse-like. Immediately I got up and screamed and threw the ashtray at it, but it disappeared. We left the house that night, and the next day all of our plates had no food on it. We had to go into town and find some aboriginal men that knew how to get rid of these things through black magic. They came to the house and it was doing all kinds of chants and rituals. We even heard it in a bush nearby. One of the guys threw a rock at it. It made a dull thumping sound as if it hit flesh. And that was the last we ever sort of had of any paranormal experiences with them. When they were in our house before the men came, I experienced my fourth paranormal encounter. We all started sleeping together in the lounge room because we were too scared to sleep alone, for obvious reasons. I was the only one awake, and I couldn't help but feel there was a presence in the house. I stayed up for maybe four hours looking around the room because I felt like it could pop up out of nowhere and I would easily see it. Well, it didn't show itself to me that night, but what it did do is start slamming the cupboard doors violently at least six times. I literally didn't hear any footsteps in the house that night, but it was just on the other side of the wall, slamming the cupboards really hard like it was angry. And that was the most frightening experience of my life, because I was the only person experiencing this. It's true that your fear feeds evil entities, because I was scared that night and I was really focusing on it, giving it my energy, and it was really hard to go to sleep that night knowing that this thing had physical strength. But I did end up going to sleep that night out of pure exhaustion of staying up real late. All in all, these experiences have helped me build my faith in becoming a Christian man because I know for sure that demons exist. The Devil in the Van I was about 17 at the time at my boyfriend's house, watching a movie, we both fell asleep. Not like today with the Netflix and chill, quote unquote. We actually fell dead asleep by the time that I woke up. It was almost 3 a.m. My curfew was officially blown. This was pre-cell phone, so I had no way to call home and explain myself. I just had to drive home and face the music. If I knew my mom, she would be waiting up for me. My boyfriend walked me out. It was chilly on the skin, which was still warm with the sleep. He kissed me goodbye and told me to drive safe. I grew up in a suburb in Northern California. Safety was never really an issue. And the way home was familiar and well lit. I got in my sweet, sweet S10 and started on my way. I was thankful that my dad had reminded to gas up before I went to my boyfriend's house, because I could get straight home without stopping. My dad was, and still is, very type A. He had been on my case lately because I was doing very poor at vehicle maintenance. My tires recently had to be replaced because they were extremely worn and dangerous. My dad was mad that I didn't notice and was driving around when it was unsafe. Well, 17-year-old girl, sorry. So my penance was a lot of reminders about gas, oil changes, car washing, and the like. I was nervous and distracted because I knew I was in trouble. I just wanted to get home and get it over with. I got on the road between my house and my boyfriend's house, which ran east to west right through the city. I began to drive westbound home. I was about halfway up the long road when I stopped at a red light, just under an overpass. In my periphery, I saw a large van pull up next to me in the other lane. 
I wasn't really paying attention until I saw the driver, gesticulating wildly to get my attention. I looked over at the man. I felt my stomach contract and go liquid all at once. His eyes predatory, but not in an earthly way, if that makes sense. He wasn't a bunter, a kempter. He was more like one of those that whispered in those guys' ears and told them to do, you know, what and how. His eyes were blue, but they made me feel black. He motioned for me to roll down my window. Everything told me no, no, don't do that. But a different part of my brain told me that it was very important that he realize that I know about him. So I saw, not felt, my hand reach for the window. I reached for the crank, saw the window go down. He smiled and it made me feel sick to my stomach. He said, glad I caught you, your tire's flat. You should pull over and I can help you change it. Right up there, that gas station. Lost of light, so I can see what I'm doing. I'm sure. Lots of light. He offered a smile, but although it sounds trite, it didn't touch his eyes. It was like he was grinding his facial muscles into what he thought a smile should look like. No comfort there made my insides feel like cold jelly. I thought for a minute, flat tire. I didn't even feel the car shimmy once. And then I remember that my tires are no more than two weeks old. He was trying to catch me all right, but not to help me with a tire. And the gas station that he's pointed out was well lit, but it was also closed. There was no attendant standing guard. Just an empty station underneath lights. Anything could happen, even under the lights. Especially with this man thing. I quickly said, no, that's fine. I don't live far. Rolled up my window. I looked away, but then I could see him waving his arm at me again and I could hear muffled yelling. I glanced over out the side and my eyes and I could see that he was angry, beyond angry. He was screaming at me and spittle was flinging out of his mouth and landing on his windows. I could see him moving as to get out of the car and I decided to just gun it. It was 3 a.m. and there were few cars, if any at this point. I would welcome being pulled over by the cops. I scream out from under the overpass and up the street. I don't look back in the rear view, I'm too scared. Then headlights in my rear view, and honking, he's behind me. Instead of heading straight, I decided to turn left abruptly, taking an alternative route to my house. Also, my oldest brother lived that way, and worst case, I would just pull into his driveway and lay on the horn. Plus, don't want that thing to know the way I usually take home. My heart stopped as I saw the van behind me take the left two, no longer honking but still flashing the lights. I was on the precipice of hysteria when I saw my brother's house down the block. I pulled over in front of his driveway and started honking the horn. Damn the neighbors. The van pulled up behind me and stopped momentarily until the lights in my brother's living room went on. Then the van took off up the street passed under the last visible streetlight and disappeared into the dark. I stared at the dark place where the van vanished until I realized that my brother was shaking me. He's come around and opened my door to see if I was alright. He was yelling at me, asking what happened if I was okay. I started to cry. I couldn't speak. He took me inside to call my parents. When my parents arrived, I told them about how I fell asleep about how I was driving home and this man tried to make me pull over because he said I had a flat tire, how I got scared and took off up the street and about how he chased me. I didn't tell them that I didn't think that he was a man at all, just something from a dark hole in reality somewhere pretending to be a man. And he knew I knew. He knew it as soon as I sped away against the red light. That's why he was so angry. 
I had their audacity to know. I've long since moved away from my hometown, but I still think about that night. I hope I never see another being like that again. Edit. Hey, some of you have some valid questions which I'll try to answer here. What did my parents say? Well, they were angry and scared. Mad I fell asleep and that I was on the road at three, but relieved that I was okay. Even still, I got grounded. My mom never shied away from telling me all the ways in which the world is dangerous for women and girls. So all my life she's taught me to be smart and aware. I think she made me watch the Ted Bundy made for TV movie with Mark Harmon when I was like 10. She explained the whole way that even somebody who looks nice and normal, you still never trust them. Which kind of explains how I was able to think clearly enough to take the alternative route to my brother's. Honestly, he's my big brother. I just remember thinking if I got to his house, I would be safe. The not wanting the thing to follow me to my house was more like, you know, separate to that, safety first. Sounds like fiction. Well, I'm comfortably into my 40s now. I guess maybe I've had a lot of time to put flowery words to my experience. Also, I'm a lawyer, so words are what I do. Believe it or don't, it happened. I know it. Some of you know it now, too. Although I do admit to being a big fan of Stephen King, and the man in the black suit is one of my favorites. That story came out long after my experience, though. Also, the man-thing in my story wasn't an overtly devilish-looking thing. Thank God I wasn't close enough to smell him, so I don't know about the sulfur. My First Hand Ghost Experience This all begins about 19 years ago. The house that my parents first moved into was originally an old church, but was remodeled into being a house. Not much of the old church was left in the house, minus the wood flooring in the den. Now apparently my parents had heard choir music, the sounds of boots on hardwood floors, and had even seen a shadow figure once. But as for what happened to me, my parents were trying to move me from the sleeping that in their bedroom to my own bedroom, but for some reason I wouldn't do it. My only reason being, I was scared to. So my mom asked me, why do you sleep scared in your own room? Do you need a nightlight maybe? And apparently I said, and I quote, because of the tall dark man in the corner over there. Then apparently I pointed over to the corner of the room where surprise, surprise, no one was. A few other things happened in that house, but none to me personally. If there is interest, I can make a separate post on it though. Fast forward a few years and we're at our second house. Now, this is where shit starts to get crazy. I feel like I should preface this by saying that there is a room in my house. We'll just call it the den. Since day one of being in this house, I never liked that room. I felt like I was being watched every time I was alone in there. So I did everything in my power to stay out of that room. I still do, even to this day. The first incident was when I was no older than 9 or 10. It was the last day of school for me and my little brother Mark. Me, my mom, and Mark were at our house. Mark realized he left his towel at school and needed to go back and get it. My mom then turns to me and said, Are you okay staying at the house for 10 minutes while we go back up to the school and get it? I said I was. The school is less than a mile from where we were at. A few minutes after they left, I was sitting in the living room and I start to hear my mom and Mark talking to my mother in their bathroom. Even though I'm completely home alone, I then hear them start to laugh, then it stops, and everything's quiet. 
A few minutes later, my mom and Mark walked back into the house. However, ten-year-old me didn't even bother to mention it for some reason. A few years go by until the next incident. Now, before we keep going, I need to explain two things, dear reader. First thing, I need to tell you that personally, I am very much a night owl. Staying up to three or four in the morning is nothing new to me. The second thing, in my house, there's a hallway. At one end is the front door, and at the other end is the back door. Now, this hallway has four doorways and entryways. The den, the office, the kitchen, and my parents' room. The kitchen has a bar, so you're able to see the whole living room and into my parents' room, if their door is open. And then, further up next to the front door is the den. This next story takes place a few months ago, around two-ish at night. I'm standing in the kitchen washing dishes. And as I'm doing so, I hear two things crystal fucking clear coming from the den down the hallway. I hear an old man go, shh, followed by a little girl giggling. I freeze in the middle of what I'm doing. I'm the only person awake right now, and I don't have a little sister. And both Mark and my dad are asleep. I am the only person awake. Now at this point, I'm panicking on the inside. However, I'm trying to keep my composure on the outside, turn off the water in the sink and walk to my parents' bedroom. I then shake my dad awake and say, Is there anyone else in this house besides me, you and Mark? He simply said, No, there isn't, and just falls back asleep. Annoyed, I walked out of my parents' room and immediately looking down the hallway, right towards the den, and there's nothing at all, just like there should be. I sigh, and I go back to doing dishes, because ghost or no ghost, I still have chores that need to be done. The next night, again, same story. I'm doing dishes. Now, something to note. I had just stood up, and in my shorts slipped a bit, and I pulled them back up. So now the front half of my shirt is untucked, while the back half of my shirt is tucked into my shorts. As I'm washing dishes, I feel something grab the back of my shirt and pop it. Very similar to the way your mom would grab you and fix your shirt by popping and pulling it out of your pants and shorts. And surprise, surprise, that's just what the fucking ghost did. Untucked my shirt from the back of my shorts. I just simply ignore it and keep doing dishes. But again, inside, I'm extremely terrified. One other incident I forgot to mention. Next to the den, there's a room. We just simply call it the office, like I said above. There's a few things in this room. Two recliners, the family computer, a mini fridge, and most importantly of all, the router. Now again, it's about one-ish at night, and the Wi-Fi is being extremely slow for some reason. I groan, get up, and head into the office. Now again, the office and the den are right next to each other, so I never like to go in the office alone, or especially at night. But tonight, I had to. So I go into the office, go to the router, press the reset button, and then sit down on one of the two recliners that we have in there while I'm waiting for the Wi-Fi to reset. Now the office door, usually a twin set of doors, that both open the same way, by the way, so there's a small gap between them, and where does that small gap look into? Right into that damn den. So I'm sitting there, and I can't shake this feeling that I'm being stared at, like two eyes are looking at me and burrowing into my very soul. I shake my head and try to ignore the feeling. After the Wi-Fi box resets, I head back to my room and lay down on my bed. And that's when I feel it, a red-hot burning pain on my hand. I look down at my hand and there are three bright red scratch marks on it. Fast forward a few months. Nothing happens. Just the same old feeling that you're being watched. Wherever you go. Until one night, the metaphorical damn final burst. I'm heading to bed. Now this involves making sure that the front and back door are both locked. So first thing I check the front door. It's locked, 
So I walk down the hallway, reach the back door, and then lock it. I then turn around and I see half a person walking into my den. The lower half. It cuts off right at the waist. Now this person was completely see-through and sort of gray. Like the ghost in the Harry Potter movies. So I stand there for a few seconds in pure disbelief at what I just was seeing. I then very quickly walk to my room and shut the door behind me. Because everyone clearly knows that ghosts can't follow you into your room, right? The most recent incident was last month. This time, I was not the only person awake. However, I was the only person in the house. My dad was out in the garage working. So, I'm standing in the kitchen, eating a sandwich. It's important to note as well, my parents' door was open in this story. So I look up from my food for a second, and I see again half a person standing in my parents' room. But this time, it's the top half. I look back down at my food. It's only about a half of a second that my brain processed what the hell I just saw. I then quickly look back up and into my parents' room, and there's nothing. No one was there. Now, here we are. In the present day. Nothing new has happened as of late. However, the feeling of being watched at night grows stronger by the day. It's actually gotten to the point where I don't like to be out in the kitchen or anything at night. Also, before anyone asks, no, I am not the only person who's experienced stuff. But my parents and Mark, they have as well. Anyways... Story number 14. My paranormal experiences as a 25-year-old Australian indigenous man. So the first experience happened when I was 7 or 8 years old. We lived in a suburb called Molden in Darwin, the Northern Territory. There were these aboriginals from a community called Menangrida that lived up the road from us and they were notorious for having a lot of domestic violence and always having cops and ambulances over their house. What happens when the families fight is that they start doing black magic on each other and sending evil spirits and curses to each other. One night, the cat and the dogs in the neighborhood were extremely vocal. The dogs couldn't stop barking and the cats were meowing and running from drain to drain trying to find somewhere to hide. This went on for a good four hours until about 12 to 1 a.m. Me and my mom were sleeping, and my sister came running in the house, saying, Get up, there's an alien ship outside. We get up and go outside, and fair enough, there is something that's silver-colored and shaped like a typical saucer that you see in movies, right above the aboriginal's house. It had lights underneath it projecting onto the ground, going in circles. There was a light blue color and from the outside going into the center. It was biggest to smallest, and they were actually circular shaped. The lights just kept twirling around, and I wish I took a video, but back then phones weren't very common. And even if you did have a good phone, the camera quality was terrible back in the early 2000s. It stayed there for a very long time and then left. The next day, we heard of kids that had followed it on their BMX bikes from different suburbs away. This wasn't the only time it happened. It happened at least twice, and every single time it would start off with the dogs and the cats in the neighborhood going crazy. I know it wasn't a fake prop because of the animals and at least 7 to 10 other witnesses that seen it. I seen a video on YouTube of cats sensing earthquakes before they hit because they have supersonic hearing. And I've also heard that before a natural catastrophe, like a flood, animals will seek high ground a day before it happens. They know things that we don't, for sure. The second weird thing that I seen was when we made a trip to Alice Springs. My sister was dating one of the boys that were from that house, and that family. When we were in Alice Springs late at night, we happened to see another weird thing which very closely resembles the old PS2 startup screen with the colored balls twirling around each other. 
There was four lights, colored orange, green, blue, and red, just twirling around each other in a pattern maybe 12 feet in the air. It was so strange for it to be so prominent and just stay there for a long time doing it and allowing us to see it. My sister told me 15 years later that the reason the lights were following us was because her boyfriend had a curse on him. He was an accessory to murder. He had given one of his relatives an axe to go and kill his wife, and the lights had followed us 1,500 kilometers all the way from Darwin. The third time was at my property in Berry Springs, maybe 60 kilometers out of Darwin. A lot of people started telling us that they see lights on our property, and it's a rural property with lots of land because I'm a traditional owner. We thought it was thieves trying to come on our property with flashlights and steal stuff while we were sleeping. I was around 11 to 12 years old when I saw the light for myself. It was late at night again, and I was going down the stairs because the toilet in the house was broken, and I had to use the outside toilet. About 30 meters away underneath a mango tree, I see a faint light like an old torch when it loses its battery and it starts to turn brown. I was about to yell out because I thought I was going to catch a thief basically, but very quickly I realized that it was gliding and sort of bobbing up and down, and maybe it noticed that I saw it, so the light went from a dim brown color to an immaculate gold color. I can't even describe the color, but it was like a small piece of the sun right in front of me at night. It's like when you see lightning strike at night and it lights up the entire area around it. Well, I saw it in a small compact ball the size of a basketball. There is no man-made thing in this world that could match the brightness that I saw that night. It was incredibly bright. It opened my brain up to the whole new brightness that I've never seen. It was kind of like a human spirit, because it turned the corner as if it was walking. I didn't go through the wall, but it was nearby and it stayed on this footpath. I would have stayed and stared at it heading into the opposite direction, but as soon as I seen it, it turned the corner. I immediately thought that I could easily just turn back around and come charging straight at me. I got incredibly scared and it ran back up the stairs. Or I ran back up the stairs, I'm sure. And what made it worse, or worser, was I was home alone and I couldn't go outside and pee. There's a common name for these lights called Min Min Lights. But I'm not sure if that's what I'd seen that night, because I've heard of people seeing the lights that were either green or red. But this one was a strange type of golden that I've never seen on this earth. The fourth time was when my uncle was dating an aboriginal woman from a community called the Boralula. She had a niece whom my sister befriended. There are these things called hairy men. They are ugly little creatures that can pop into the spiritual realm and our realm. Kids are given these creatures as protectors, apparently. They can hop into the owner's body and help them fight. My sister and her friend that lived with us was stupid enough to accept one of these creatures as a friend, and that's when a lot of crazy things started happening in the house. For example, as we were taking showers, we would hear little giggles and knocks on the door. My mom would fall asleep on the lounge and wake up in a whole different spot at the front door. There were lots of other things that happened that I can't remember because this was at least 13 years ago. We were eating dinner one night. For some reason, they loved coming out and tormenting us when it was a stormy night with raining. Well, with a heavy rain. Well, I happened to see one of its faces just peeking up from underneath the table looking at her food. I got a very quick glimpse of it. It had pale skin, a scar on its face going from top to bottom, and black hair that was very thin and horse-like. I immediately got up and screamed and threw the ashtray at it, but it disappeared. We left the house that night, and the next day all of our plates had no food on them. We had to go into town and find some aboriginal men that knew how to get rid of these things through black magic. They came to the house and were doing all kinds of chants and rituals and we had never heard in a bush or nearby. And one of the guys threw a rock at it 
and it made a dull thumping sound as if it hit flesh. And that was the last that we ever had any paranormal experiences from them. When they were in our house before the men came, I experienced my fourth paranormal encounter. We all started sleeping together in the lounge room because we were too scared to sleep alone for obvious reasons. I was the only one awake, and I couldn't help but feel there was a presence in the house. I stayed up for maybe four hours looking around the room because I felt like it could pop up out of nowhere and I would easily see it. Well, it didn't show itself to me that night, but what it did do is start slamming the cupboard doors violently at least six times. I literally didn't hear any footsteps, but it was like it was on the other side of the wall, slamming the cupboards really hard like it was angry. And that was kind of the most frightening experience of my life, because I was the only person experiencing it. It's true that your fear feeds evil entities, because I was scared that night and I was really focusing on it, giving it my energy. And it was really hard to go to sleep that night too, knowing that this thing had physical strength. But I did end up going to sleep that night out of pure exhaustion of staying up really late. All in all, these experiences have helped me build my faith in becoming a Christian man, because I know for sure that demons exist. I lived in a haunted apartment for 14 years. As the title says, I lived in an apartment with at least one ghost in it for 14 years. I still don't know exactly what it was, but I'm fairly certain it wasn't my guardian angel, since I've lived there for most of my life, from age 7 to 21. I have a lot of experiences to share, and because of this, I'll only share the big ones for this post. The apartment was fairly small. A small entrance area, one bathroom, one kitchen, one living room and one bedroom, and a small hallway that connected the living room and bedroom with a closet in it. My mother, sister, and I lived there, and we all shared the bedroom and had our own beds. Most of these happened while I was home alone, though, because why wouldn't they? seven years old the first time I encountered it, but I still remember it like it was yesterday. I was up early for school at 6 a.m., got dressed, and decided to take a quick nap on the living room couch before I left. I laid on the couch, my back facing out to the living room. I fell asleep. I woke up and rolled over, face outwards toward the living room, sat up, stretched and yawned, then opened my eyes to look at the clock. 6.42 a.m. I then looked towards the doorway leading to the kitchen, and the entire world stopped for me. In the doorway was a silhouette of a man. He, or rather it, was as tall as the doorway, and was the deepest and most pure black I've ever seen. He stared at me with glowing red eyes, his gaze full of hate and malice. You may think being paralyzed with fear is just a horror trope, but it is a very real experience. Couldn't move, I couldn't breathe. I wanted to scream, yet I couldn't. I couldn't even form tears. I was staring into his eyes, his into mine. He kept this gaze for what felt like hours. In reality, it must have been a few seconds. I managed to blink, and just like that, he was gone. Every conceivable emotion after seeing that came flooding in all at once. I didn't know what that was, but I knew I needed to get out. Of course, I had to run through the exact doorway to leave, but I sprinted through it, down the stairs, and out the building. I remember getting in trouble that day because I left my bag and no one believed me when I told them what happened. My family didn't believe me, and after a few more happenings, they said to stop talking about it because it wasn't real. My next experience happened in fifth grade, so I was about 11. 
This one happened in the bedroom. My bed was positioned so that you could see most of it, while the small hallway quite possibly was the worst place for it to be, considering what happened. I woke up randomly in the middle of the night. Nothing felt particularly off, but I was pretty thirsty. I turned over and I was about to get out of my bed to get a glass of water. And take a guess at who was standing in the hallway. I could still see his silhouette clearly, despite the entire house being pitch black. His red eyes glowed even brighter than before, and he was staring directly at me. I started breathing and sweating heavily. My chest felt tight, and I couldn't even make a sound. I remembered the other time I saw him, and I remembered that he went away after I blinked. So I blinked. But this time, he didn't go away. He got closer. He was halfway in the hallway before, but now he was in the doorway. I felt like I was going to throw up my whole stomach. I blinked again. He got closer, maybe six feet from me, staring at me the whole time. I blinked one more time and he was gone. I was relieved until I heard footsteps. The house was old, so the floors creaked when anyone walked on them. I heard creaking from where he was, and I heard steps leading up to my bed, each step paired with the creak of the floorboards. Couldn't take my eyes off the floor. They'd reached the side of my bed and stopped. One more step, and he would have been right in front of my face. Something in my head was screaming at me not to look up, or to get out of bed. I still can't explain it. But I just knew something would happen if I did the wrong move. I decided to act like I didn't just see a shadow teleport across my room and ignored it. I kept my gaze down, rolled over, hid underneath the covers. I didn't sleep that night, nor did I hear any more footsteps. Last one for this post. And this one stuck with me the most. This one happened in December after I graduated high school in 2016. By this time, I know I've had ghosts in my house. I kind of got used to their shenanigans. They still spooked me, but nothing too bad. Want to point out there, I might have also been a little girl. I would sometimes smell rose perfume, and I thought I saw someone with pigtails out of the corner of my eye once. For this one, I was in the kitchen getting ready to go to work. I put the little cup into the Keurig and went to sit at the table to eat my toast. I was watching Dashy on YouTube with the earbud in my left ear in. That morning it was very windy and the whole building swayed a bit with heavy gusts of wind. The first two big gusts shook up the house as normal. The third gust is when it happened. The house shook as normal and from the living room clear as day I heard a little girl scream. This wasn't some scream you'd hear when kids play. This girl was screaming bloody murder. It sounded almost exactly like it does in movies. I stopped mid-bite of my toast, had tears rolling down my face, wanted to get out of that house as quickly as I could. But I only had pants on. My clothes were in the room, so I had to fucking walk through that goddamn living room twice. I gathered my thoughts and decided I'd briskly walk through with my phone in my face and headphones in, grab my clothes in my room and get out. After a quick pep talk, a string of obscenities, I went to the living room. As I walked through the living room, I saw someone sitting on my couch out of the corner of my eye. It took everything in me to not lose my shit or look out of curiosity. I got into the room and picked up whatever clothes my hand touched walked swiftly back to get out. In my second trek through the living room, they moved from the couch to standing right by the side of the hallway entrance. I still had my phone right up to my face, but my goddamn peripheral vision saw their face looking right up at me. There was no language that could describe the feelings I had in that moment. They said something. I don't know what the scary cunt said, but I ignored whatever it was and bolted out flew down the stairs. Sorry for the C word, guys. 
I changed outside and went to work. I stayed at my friend's house that week. Thankfully, we moved two years ago. I haven't had anything like that happen here. It's one thing, but mostly unrelated. As I said earlier, I have a lot more tales to tell, but these were definitely in the top five. I'll share more if you guys want. I just didn't want to post a novel. I think it was a shade individual. I don't like saying the actual word for it, but I'd love to know more. Anytime I would look into it, I got that feeling of being watched, stopped. I haven't had the urge to research it since then. Story number seven. My first-hand ghost experience, part two. This first story takes place over 20 years ago. Back whenever I was only a newborn, my mom was laying in one of our recliners. I was on her chest. As she was laying there, she suddenly felt something very, very heavy start pushing her downwards into the recliner, making it so she couldn't breathe. My dad at the time was at work, so she was the only one home. My mom, being a woman of religion, began in her head to call out to God, begging for him to protect me. As soon as she did, it stopped. She then quickly got up, took me, and left the house. During the next few years, a small, well, I guess a series of small things happened. That being my mom and dad both hearing choir music as well as loud, heavy boot footsteps coming from outside their bedroom. Again, this happened multiple times. One other small thing that happened. My mom was doing laundry. Now, this is probably around 2006. I'm up the road hanging out with a friend of mine. Mark hasn't been born yet, and my dad is at work. Our dryer had this little sort of piece of metal sticking out of it. The point of this was so the dryer door would stay shut. There's no way to open that drawer without forcefully pulling on it to open. My mom, who was once again home alone by herself, realized that her dryer was done. So she stops whatever she was doing at the time and goes to get the clothes out of the dryer. Only to then see the dryer door is hanging wide open. Something opened it. My mom's in the heat of the moment and just said, I'm not making this up. Well, the least you could have done was fold the damn things before quickly leaving the house. The next big thing that happened, it was late at night, probably around 11 or 12 a.m. Midnight. My dad was going to bed, and as he was laying down in bed, he saw a dark, shadowy figure standing at the foot. This was at the foot of he and my mom's bed. According to my dad... He then proceeded to run around and roundhouse kick the box fan that he had into the bathroom and grabbed his handgun and pointed it where the figure was. However, by the time that he had the gun pointed at where the figure was, it was gone. And this all happened within five seconds. My poor mother, who was asleep at this time, woke up to the sound of a box fan flying into the bathroom and a gun being cocked. The house was then put up for sale a week later. The last thing of interest that happened in that house, I told in my other post. However, I'm going to tell it here again. My parents were trying to move me from sleeping in their bedroom to my own bedroom, but for some reason I wouldn't do it. My only reason being that I was scared to. So my mom asked me, why are you scared to sleep in your own room? Do you need a nightlight, maybe? And apparently I said, and I quote, because the tall, dark man in the corner over there. Then apparently I pointed over to the corner of my room where, a surprise, surprise, no one was. Fast forward once again, and we're in the current house I live at. Sorry, guys, I'm abbreviating, because this seems like a repeat. I have a question for you, dear reader. Have you ever walked into an empty room? The second that you walked in, you knew something was just off. I can't explain what it is other than a feeling of being watched. I ask only because this is a room that's just in my current house, and we'll call it the den. I remember the very first day I was in the house, I felt like I was being watched. Like there was someone just out of sight staring at me, 
Even to this day, over ten years later, I still get this feeling. I avoid the room at all costs, and I hate stepping foot in there. Yada, yada, yada. This is a direct repeat. I'm so sorry, people who are listening. Scrolling down. The first story from this house is about five months ago. I was standing in the kitchen doing dishes and cleaning the counters. It's probably two in the morning. As I am in the middle of doing the dishes, I suddenly hear two very loud bangings coming from right behind me in the den. It was as if a grown man took his fist and hit them against the wall full force. After a few seconds, it starts up again. However, this time, much closer. It's in the central hallway right next to me, and again, it sounds like someone is just banging on the walls over and over with their fist as hard as they can. It's so forceful, I'm able to take a few pictures that we have on the wall shaking. I very quickly grab my phone and I run full speed into my bedroom, closing the door behind me. All the while, the banging is still going on. A few days later, once again, I'm in the kitchen doing my chores. And suddenly, there is a low, deep growling sound coming from the den. It was deeper than any human could ever make. After the growl, there was one loud bang on the wall next to me. I quickly went back to my room, and as I'm in there, I hear stuff very clearly being knocked down in the kitchen where I was just at. After a few minutes, the noise finally stops. A few minutes later, I stepped out of my room and looked toward the kitchen, where I saw two pans laying on the kitchen floor, as well as multiple kitchen drawers having been opened that were previously shut, as well as the pantry door, which was previously open, is also now shut. This will be the final story that personally happened to me. However, it's something that's definitely happened multiple times. One night, I'm laying in bed, when I suddenly feel something get into the bed with me. Now, my first thought is, oh, it's just my cat. Then I remember, wait, no, the cats are outside. Plus, that was far too heavy to be a cat. I very quickly grab my phone, turn on the flashlight, and look to where I felt the bed move at. Where there is nothing. I shrug it off as maybe it's just me being too tired. Maybe I'm imagining things. At least that's what I thought. Until it happened again a few minutes later. This time, when I shined my flashlight, I actually saw the bed sinking down a little bit, like a person was sitting on the edge of my bed. Right as I noticed it, it went back to normal, as if the person just got up and left the bed. Fast forward to the next night. Same thing. I'm in bed by myself, and I feel like something's about to crawl into bed next to me. I turn and look, and again, nothing. This happened for multiple nights in a row. This also didn't happen to just me. My mom and dad have both experienced the same thing. An experience where it's as if someone is trying to sit on their bed, even though they were alone at the time. Speaking of my mom, these last two stories focus on her. These are very short stories, too. One day, as she was sitting in the living room by herself, she set down her reading glasses to grab a stronger pair. As she was in the middle of putting on her new glasses, the ones she just set down on the table go flying across the living room. She described it like someone swatted them off the table and across the living room. This last story takes place almost a year ago. My mom came home from work one night. Everyone was asleep, and she heard a female voice come from me and Mark's bathroom. The voice just said, Hello? She stopped, said hello back, and asked who was in there. When there was no reply, she turned on the bathroom light to find that there was no one in there. House Sitting at Aunt's Mansion My aunt and uncle went out of town for two weeks for an anniversary or a vacation. They had a chocolate lab at the time named Lola. Instead of taking her to a kennel any time they would leave, which was pretty often, 
they would ask me to take care of Lola and house it. It's a huge house, nearly 20,000 square feet, and it's in a very rich area and neighborhood. The home was actually designed custom by my uncle about 15 years before my experience. Since their neighbor down the street was robbed when they were on vacation, they wanted me to make sure that no one would try breaking in. Every time I would house or dog sit, I would have weird feelings, but I chalked it up to being alone in a huge house because I'm used to a very small house that you can almost see everywhere from the living room. However, nothing that noticeable would happen. I would hear noises like creaks and bumps, but I logically concluded that it was just the house making noises. Or maybe an HVAC system. Or the water heater. So I never paid too close attention to it, even though at the time it was startling. This was for about one week, and a few long weekends here and there over a nine month period. However, right after the holidays, they went on their two-week vacation when all this happened. I would always stay over, just so I can let Lola out late at night before bed. And right when I woke up, I also would deter any possible break-ins. I had a system that would make it look like I'm there, or more than one person was there at least. I would routinely switch lights on and off upstairs on the main floor, basement, different bedrooms, and hallway lights. I would always keep track of which ones I had on, since I would choose two different ones everything every time I left. I was in a community college at the time too, and I had a big social life, so I would be in and out most of the day into the evening. The first few days the normal noises happened, but as they have in the past, put me on edge, but didn't necessarily scare me. After the first few days, I started to notice some strange things. Certain lights I knew I left on were then turned off and others on. To be honest, I thought I was just stressed out. It's a big house and it's not really a big deal, right? Until one night, I left almost every light on on the main floor went out to pick some pizza up for dinner. When I came back to the house, every single light was then turned off. And since this was winter in northern Illinois, when I got back around six, it had already been dark for over an hour. So no lights being on is very noticeable. This is when I started getting genuinely creeped out. I grabbed a baseball bat and searched everywhere in the house down to even the safe rooms in the back of their closets to make sure that there was no intruder. Lola would follow me around the house, but I could tell by her body language and actions that she too was stressed. After searching the house and finding absolutely nothing, I watched TV, ate pizza, and then went to bed. I would always sleep in their sunroom on a, on a lounge because it was in a secluded corner of the house. I felt way too weird to sleep in any other of my cousin's beds, so I would always sleep in that sunroom. That night is when Lola started growling. She would look through the doorway. It was a glass door and a growl. I would try to get her to stop and see if she needed anything, but she never did. The preceding few nights, Lola's behavior changed. She was very anxious, and at about five or two, or at about night five in a two-week stay, I started hearing footsteps. Lola would of course growl or bark when she heard this. I went straight to thinking that it was an intruder and searched the whole house again. Nothing. Wanted to call the cops, but I didn't want any word to come back to my aunt, my uncle, because they would have to pay a ton of money to do this for them while they were away. And, as a broke college student, I would do just about anything. This continued to the next few nights and the footsteps went from one footstep, second, five seconds worth. With a couple nights remaining, activity started to escalate. 
more noises than usual, including footsteps. They all culminated on the very last night. I came back from classes around 7 p.m. and it was pitch black outside. I walked in from the side door over pristine white tile and weirdly, Lola did not greet me at the door like she always does. I went to look for her. She was shaking in her dog bed. I had a super eerie feeling and I just wanted to leave. I was just going to take Lola back home with me and drop her off the next morning before my aunt and uncle returned. However, before leaving, I had to go downstairs to feed their cat and change its litter box. The cat always stayed down there because Lola would scare the crap out of the poor thing. They have a baby gate with a white wire mesh in the middle separating the upstairs and downstairs at a landing halfway down the stairs. While cleaning the litter box, I hear the baby gate fall and distinctly hear the sound of the mesh rattling back and forth. If you've ever had one of these gates, I'm sure you know the sound that I'm talking about. My heart felt like it sank to my stomach. I was filled with dread. At this time, I hear loud footsteps upstairs and then hear Lola bark and run. And that's when I just called it and was out of there. I headed upstairs, and when I got to the baby gate, it was still standing up against the wall, but definitely not where I left it. I got Lola, and I went towards the mudroom where the white tile is that I walked through when coming in the house from the side door, and the first thing I noticed was muddy boot prints. It was something that you couldn't miss because it was one and a half inch thick mud clumps in the shape of huge boots, far bigger than my size 12 gym shoes. These boot prints were coming from the garage entrance to this room, not the side entrance. Added to this, it was January, and well below freezing with a few inches of snow on the ground. There was no mud anywhere. Everything was covered in snow. I freaked out since they were coming back the next day. I cleaned up the footprints, got Lola, and left. I didn't check the house, and I didn't call the police. Looking back, I know I should have, but... I didn't want my aunt and uncle to think that I was crazy. Never let me house it again, and I'd lose all that money. Nothing was missing when they came home. They both claimed to have not had any experiences. I only know this because years after this happened, I didn't watch their house since that time and brought this up over a family dinner. My cousins both have had experiences. One said she saw figures at the end of the long hallway leading to a room. The other said she woke up a few times to dozens of people standing around her bed and then breaking her lamp by slamming it into the wall. My uncle thought she was acting out because she was a young teenager at the time, but she swears up and down that it was people standing around her that did it. Something strange was going on in my childhood home. Some strange things happened in my childhood home. It wasn't a particularly old house. It was built in the mid-80s, and as far as I know, no one had died there. And by the time these things started to happen, at least. Nonetheless, it was a very old part of town in a part where very dark things happened in the times when Spain governed our country. Just one block away from my house, there was once a former lake that dried and was filled a long time ago, where the colonial authorities threw the bodies of a group of Senegalese slaves that were executed for trying to return to their homes. I don't know if any of you believe in spiritual senses of the word energies, but I certainly do. And I believe this is a good explanation of the things that happened in my house. Some time before I was born, my parents were having dinner with my brother and other cousins, who at the time were living in our house because they were in a university in our city and were just temporarily staying here. My dad had made pichanga and all were having a good time making chatter, when suddenly they all heard the same thing the strident cry of a baby coming from my brother's bedroom. My mom recalls that it was loud and short, just one single cry that got everybody out of the loop, and as soon as it appeared, the sound was away. 
The weird thing is, there was no baby in our neighborhood at the time. Our neighborhood consisted of self semi-detached houses, so it's not as far of a shot to theorize that it could have been a baby that stayed the night in one of our neighbor's houses, but the walls were very well insulated. Also, everybody remembers that the cry wasn't muffled. It clearly sounded as if it was inside of our house. Old TVs tended to turn off by themselves. Also, things used to get lost pretty often, and then they'd reappear in the most obvious of places, usually in the places that had been searched previously to the point of exhaustion. My brother blamed the gnomes. A more shocking experience happened to me when I was about seven to nine years old. My brother threw a party in our house with a couple of friends from university. I was on our old family computer, probably playing RuneScape in the same room where the party was going on, and then I heard a woman screaming. It was a friend of my brother's former girlfriend. For anonymity's sake, let's just call her Carla. She stood below the arch that leads, or, <laughs> excuse me, she stood below the arch that leads to the living room, just in front of the stairs, staring with horror and yelling at an empty space on the wall. She began to cry and Carla tried to calm her down, but it was in vain. She insisted on leaving. Whatever she saw had disturbed her deeply. My brother says that once she was once a bit more calm, she claimed that she saw a man standing on the stairs, staring at her with wrath. It was wearing a long trench coat and a cowboy hat, and everyone seemed to ignore his presence. Everyone but her. The thing that scared the fuck out of her were his eyes. She claimed that she sensed some kind of ineffable anger in his gaze, and that she was too scared to be in that house. Understandably, she never came back to our house. But there is one thing, one particular encounter I remember the most, as it is the most unbelievable, unexplainable, illogical, and baffling thing, not just of these stories I've told you, but of my entire life. One night not so distant from the other story, my mom wasn't at home for reasons I don't remember anymore and my brother had just left for a party at Carla's house. I remember him wearing a black trench coat and a brown leather hat. And so, my dad and I were home alone for the night. We were on the couch watching History Channel as usual. In those years, when it was still half about history and half about aliens, antiquities, and trying to catch Bigfoot only to find nothing at all, but all of a sudden we heard the front door slam shut, we naturally turned our heads and there he was, a man in a leather trench coat and leather hat. His clothing seemed anachronistic, out of time. At the moment, I couldn't get a glance of his eyes as the rim of his cowboy-like hat was tilted down, but I remember he had a three-day stubble beard and a sharp face complexion. He was dressed almost exactly like my brother, and he had the exact same beard style. I remember thinking, oh, my brother's home early. Also, thinking he was my brother, my father tried to talk to him, but he went directly upstairs, ignoring us completely. In that moment, I could get a glance of his eyes. They felt soulless, inhuman. I could not sense any evilness in his eyes, like Carla's friend claimed it did. I remember how he stomped up the steps with haste, almost with anger. I also remember thinking that the man wasn't my brother. His face wasn't similar at all. My dad, skeptic and stubborn as he was, was still thinking that it was my brother and said to himself, this fucker came back home drunk again, or something along those lines. After pondering on the strangeness of the situation, my dad asked if I remembered hearing the door being opened, but can't recall if I did. And also, I'd be lying if I said I remember what I answered, because I probably just shrugged. My dad then tried to make me go upstairs to check on my brother's bedroom. But I was scared shitless, and I refused to go there alone. Finally, we both went upstairs, and we entered my brother's bedroom. Behind the threshold, there was nothing but darkness. The lights were off, the windows were closed shut, and there was no sign of anybody being there. 
My dad checked on the closets, checked the windows, and then checked on the other bedrooms. We were all alone. There was no trail of this... They spelled this wrong. There was no trail of this man. I think they meant anachronistic man. We went back downstairs to continue watching our show, trying to forget what had just happened. But it simply wasn't possible. The absurdity of the situation didn't make that possible. Shortly after, my brother came back home. My dad questioned him about the whole situation, asking him if he had jumped out of the window or something. My brother denied doing such a thing with an expression of bewilderment on his face. And that was that. We didn't touch the matter and we moved on with our lives. Some days we remember while watching a horror movie and say, Hey, remember that hat man? And time passed and so on and so forth. At a time I even had forgotten the whole situation for years. And then it simply went back to my head. I remembered the hat man just out of the blue. According to Chilean rural folklore, the hat man is an angel of death. To some others, he is the devil, and his presence is nothing but the promise of loss and misfortune. That makes sense because my dad's life was cut short by an anaphylactic shock when I was 12 years old. My life hasn't been the same since his death, both economically and emotionally. After my dad's passing, we eventually moved away from that house. To this day, I still wonder, will I see the hat man again? Something is in the forests of Lake Tahoe. I've lived in Southern California my entire life. If you know anything about California, it's very diverse. Up north is filled with mountains and leaves, and the south is a lot more, well, city-like. This summer I decided to take a trip to the lake, Lake Tahoe. It's a beautiful place, my first time being upstate. I'm going to chop this story up into segments to make it an easy read. Day 1 I settled into the cabin at around 5 p.m. After an eight-hour drive, I was very tired. I went and laid down in bed that was in the loft. It was quiet. It was like being in a different world. I was so used to cars zooming by and people talking right outside my house. But it was quiet. I fell asleep fairly quickly. Around four hours into my sleep, I jerked up from my sleep. I looked around for a bit before hearing strange tapping. I looked around to see where it was coming from, but to no avail. It sounded like someone was tapping on the window part of the back door. I figured I was just paranoid, so I fell back asleep. Day 2 Nothing happened this day, and I slept fine. Day 3 I woke up early in the morning, maybe four. I heard a crash coming from the attic ladder. That was placed conveniently right behind the couch I was sleeping on. I didn't move. I heard a few footsteps. You know that feeling you get when you feel someone staring at you? That's how I felt. I was on my side staring straight ahead. Suddenly I felt somebody or something crawl over me. I felt their two hands on either sides of me, and I knew their face was inches away from mine. Like I said, I was facing straight ahead, and I wasn't going to turn my face to see who it was. They stayed there for what felt like forever, until I felt them crawl backwards, and then off the couch. I heard the dog let out a muffled bark, in which someone shushed her. Then let out a good, you know, a good girl. The presence stayed there for what felt like an eternity till I heard footsteps going out the back door. Still, I didn't move. I was paralyzed with fear. Needless to say, I didn't go back to sleep. I checked on my friends a bit later when I felt the coast was clear. 
None of them left their rooms that night. I told them my experience, and they said that I was being paranoid. I halfway agreed with them. And our day went on as planned. Day three, later that day. After a day at the lake with my friends, we came back to a quiet and cozy cabin. The caretakers of the cabin told us that there was a river a bit farther back into the woods, about a 15 minute walk. My friends decided to stay back and rest, so I took some bug spray and a small backpack with snacks and my phone. It was a pretty straightforward trail. There was tall grass on either side of the trail. It was a thin path, but pretty easy to navigate. When I got to the riverbank, there were two picnic tables. I didn't want to get eaten by mosquitoes, but I stupidly wore sandals. I put my bag on the table and started my walk back to the cabin. For some odd reason, the path seemed distorted. What was once a straightforward trail was now covered in rough terrain. I noticed the tall grass on the side of the path had been disturbed. It was as if something huge, and I mean gigantic, had walked across the long grass. At first I thought maybe it was a bear, since the locals had told us that bears were a problem this time of year. But the sheer size of it made me second guess that. I was a bit taken aback by this. However, I continued and made it back to the cabin, then back to the river. I was a little frightened now, kept telling myself I was just freaking myself out and I should enjoy the nature. I sat down at one of the tables and watched the river. After a while, I felt there was something staring at me. I looked around, assuming one of my friends was on their way to prank me, but there was no one. Across the river, I noticed a bit of brush that was shaken up. There was a clearing in the bushes. It was fenced off by two logs and an X shape. The longer I sat in that spot, the more worried I got. Couldn't help but feel like there's something behind the thick brush that I couldn't see. I went down the river, hoping to come across some kind of life. But nothing. No fish, no frogs, no roads. Just mosquitoes, and a bunch of them at that. Disappointed with the lack of anything, really I went to sit back at the table. And that's when I heard it. It was a noise I can't really describe. It was a scream, but not really, but more like a gurgle. As if whatever it was had a mouth full of water. It was inhuman. I froze. In the moment, I should have been running for my life, but I just froze. I heard rustling in the bushes behind me, the ones I was worried about earlier. Then again, the scream. It was the loudest thing I have ever heard. Run! So I did. I sprinted my ass through the forest. What should have been a quick trip back to the cabin was anything but. About ten minutes of sprinting. I noticed I was lost. I stopped for a few moments, frantic to see if I could find anything that looked familiar. I saw a bridge that I'd crossed on my way there, and I started sprinting again. Thought to myself, why didn't that damn thing kill me? I had stopped for a good minute, but I could hear it chasing me. It was a fucking game for the damn thing. Every time I stopped, it would as well finally made it back to my cabin and instead of going inside, I stood on the porch. I faced the forest and I cried. I couldn't see anything out of the ordinary, but I knew it was still out there. I didn't want to turn my back to it, so I sat there for hours, silently crying, occasionally checking my phone and, well, writing this. I don't know what the hell that thing was. The only thing I can even compare it to is Wendigo. All I know is that I will not be going back to that river ever again. If you could please, please shed some insight on what or who might have been out there, I would more than appreciate it. These past two days have 
just been too weird not to be connected. Possible Demonic Experience, a Retrospective When I was approximately 14 to 15 years old, circa 1988-89, myself and my family had two summer holidays in the Algarve in Portugal. The first holiday included myself, my older sister, mom and dad, and an uncle and an aunt. The second holiday the following summer was the same people except my sister who stayed at home. Both holidays were in the same location, and both times we stayed in the same villa, which was owned by a business associate of my uncle. As such, I believe in the accommodation being free, and that's why it was a great holiday option for us all. The villa was situated about a 15-minute walk outside of a well-known Algarve town named Cavoyero. Carvoero. One of those, maybe. The first holiday where my sister was also present was event free, and nothing unexplained happened at all. The second holiday was where I alone experienced an absolutely terrifying paranormal event which has stayed with me to this day. The villa we stayed in was an all on one level, like most villas are, and had a pretty standard layout. The main door at the front led straight into a kitchen, and that led into the main lounge area. Off to the left and to the right of the main lounge was two and suite bedrooms where my parents and aunt uncle slept. I slept on a fold-out bed in the lounge area, and out in the back of the property was a small swimming pool. From memory, it was a very nice, spacious villa and probably worth quite a bit of money. Nothing happened for the entire two-week period that we were there, except for the final night of the holiday. I often say thank god we flew home the next morning because I don't think I could have stayed there another night. On this final evening everybody had just gone to bed and closed their doors, and I had just finished setting up my bed, and finally turned out the lights and got into bed. No longer than 30 seconds after getting into bed I started to hear tapping on one of the walls. I laid there trying to guess what, what it might be and I just figured it was probably one of my parents or uncle or aunt doing something in their rooms, so I ignored it. I then heard the same tapping again, but louder. I sat up in the bed and tried to pinpoint where it was coming from, and this is how I know it wasn't sleep paralysis as some people have often suggested to me. Peering across the dimly lit lounge room, it was then that the tapping started to spin around the room as if knocking in a circular pattern around me as I sat there. This was naturally pretty unnerving, and I struggled to rationalize what was really happening. It was at this point that the tapping stopped, and immediately a wooden chair from the lounge room dining room table made a scraping sound against wood parquet floor that it was resting on. The sort of scraping noise a chair would make if you pulled it from underneath the table to sit on it. At this point, I didn't know what was really going on, and being as young as I was, I think the fear got the better of me and I shot down into the bed, turned around and pulled the sheets up underneath my chin and closed my eyes. But unfortunately it didn't end there. Next I heard more scraping as dining room chairs were being moved, followed by a very quiet but distinct shuffling noise, which sounded like shuffling footsteps. These footsteps got louder as whatever it was started to approach me in the room. As it approached, I then heard this mumbling in what sounded like a guttural low-key talking but in a language I didn't understand. It certainly wasn't Portuguese. On top of this mumbling, I suddenly began to hear this terrifying rasping breathing in and out in a very rhythmic fashion. The sort of rasping that someone with severe breathing difficulty would make. This breathing got louder and louder until it was right behind me, right next to my head, on the pillow rasping loudly into my right ear. Petrified doesn't even cut it. It was simply frozen with fear. I don't think that I could have turned around even if I wanted to. This loud, heavy breathing continued for what seemed like a lifetime, but in reality it was probably about 30 or 40 seconds. And then it slowly faded away and into the next room. I was left in silence. I laid in the bed for about another hour, unable to sleep, and listening intently for anything else. But there was nothing. 
Eventually, I fall asleep, though. Probably through nerves, exhaustion, and when I next woke up, it was 6 a.m. and daylight filled the room, and I remember the sheer feeling of relief. The first thing I did was get up and look at the dining room table area, and sure enough, the two chairs had been moved away from their normal resting positions underneath the table. And not just by a small amount, but significantly so. I also checked the rest of the communal area in the villa to see if any doors or windows had been left open, but there was nothing. When my family got up, I told them all what happened, and ultimately I was met with mainly skepticism which I found a little bit upsetting at the time. To be honest, I think the experience affected me to a degree where I probably needed to form a counseling to really process it and help get over it, but the whole thing was like nothing was available at the time. I've often tried to rationalize or debunk this. Did a wild animal get into the property and then prowl around doing these things? Possibly, but that wouldn't explain how it would have left again if the property was secure, or even more importantly, wouldn't explain the circle tapping and the mumbling dialect. <clears throat> Was it one of my family members sleepwalking? I thought about this a lot too and concluded that it wasn't possible as I would have heard them opening their bedroom doors which were heavy and wooden very loud. Plus, there simply wouldn't have been enough time for them to fall asleep as this happened very quickly after they all retired to their rooms. A few people I've shared this story with have suggested that it could have been something demonic in nature, but I'm not sure if that would be true or not. An interesting fact to end this years later, fairly recently actually, I discussed this with my sister who told me that when she was with us during the first holiday she always felt extremely uneasy sleeping in the villa lounge and often would get up and sleep with my parents in their room. She also told me that she was informed by my parents and uncle that the property which was built on an old former wasteland was actually on the grounds of a former mass grave and burial site. This was something they decided to keep from telling me as I was the youngest at the time. I thought that was interesting, and depending on what your beliefs are, could maybe go on some way to explaining the strange events that took place. As a result of this experience, I've always been extremely open-minded about the paranormal, and if I'm honest, I've always had a very inquisitive interest in it. I think this is how it goes for most people who've experienced something. And I know they often say that everybody's a skeptic until you experience something yourself. When you do, it changes everything. It certainly did for me. I'm not expecting any, it was definitely this type of response here. But I'd be very curious and interested to hear what other people think, and your input and insights would be very gratefully received. Story number five, The Lake House. For as long as I can remember, I've had issues with sleeping. I would cry and scream as a young child about not wanting to sleep, which sounds pretty typical to every other kid, so that didn't faze me too much. But as I got older, the nightmares and fear of sleeping got worse. In the fourth grade or so, I vividly remember two night terrors that left me sleeping two hours a night afterwards. Only once the sun came up around 5 a.m. was I able to get some rest. But that's not the point of this story. Eventually, I was diagnosed with a sleep disorder. Things got much better. Still had some nights where I'd have so much fear of sleeping that I'd lay in my bed covered in sweat and shaking. But for the most part, all was normal. I didn't have the night terrors or utter fear of falling asleep for a long time. A few years ago, I was in a university doing my undergraduate degree in a beautiful city on the lake. I had decided to take a few summer courses, given that it's mainly a resort town during those months. The rent everywhere was ridiculously high. Luckily, my second cousins offered me their summer home right on the lake for a few months while I completed my classes, free of charge. I was beyond excited. The house was on the other side of the lake from the university down a winding dirt road off the single lane highway. I had one neighbor to my right and three to my left, but during the first few weeks of summer most of them hadn't arrived for vacation yet. 
At the time, my boyfriend, now an ex, thank God, moved in with me because I was already uneasy about staying in a large house alone in a pretty isolated area. Looking back at my childhood, I think I was pretty in tune with my senses, maybe hyper aware of, as my mother would say, things that go bump in the night. I always got an eerie feeling going into the basement alone because it was one of those walkouts that opened straight onto a porch and just a glass sliding door that separated the inside from the outside. My first thought seeing that was, oh great, this is the first house I'd pick to break into. That's some shitty humor that I used to try to alleviate my fears. It didn't work though. The first few weeks were uneventful. Nothing odd happened at all. When I was home alone or up late studying after my boyfriend had already gone to bed, I increasingly started to feel more and more uncomfortable, like something was watching me. I was hearing doors shutting, footsteps, and random noises at all times of the day. But since I had such similar experiences as a kid, I didn't dwell on it too much. I mean, the house was older anyway. The night that shit really hit the fan was when the feeling of being watched turned into feeling like something terrible was going to happen to me. A very dark and very threatening presence. Anyway, my boyfriend had already gotten to bed, and I was studying in the living room around 10.30pm. The feeling became so overwhelming that I basically said nope and went straight to bed and locked the door behind me. I couldn't fall asleep for an hour. My heart was racing and I felt like someone was in the house. It wasn't until I heard knocking on the front door that I decided to wake my boyfriend up. And in a hushed voice, I asked him if he heard anything. He groggily woke up and said, No, it's okay, just go back to sleep. So I sucked it up, threw my head underneath the covers, and tried my best to fall asleep. The next thing I know, my boyfriend is shaking me and whispering, Wake up. What's the address to the house? I'm on the phone with the police and I need to know. Well, if that isn't a way to wake up, I don't know what is. So I quickly recited the address and whispering what's going on to my boyfriend while he stays on the phone with the police. They proceed to tell him that the police would be there in 25 minutes. The station is on the other side of the lake. But to call back if we hear anything else. Those 25 minutes were the longest 25 minutes of my life. I sat there, shaking uncontrollably as my boyfriend began to tell me what had happened. About 30 minutes after, he dozed back off from me waking him up. He jolted out of his sleep to hear what sounded like three hard knocks on the garage door. He then heard a door open and heavy footsteps moved into the kitchen. That's when he decided to call. By no means was he an irrational person. Little noises and things that gave me the chills never bothered him too much. So when I found out that he had called the cops, my blood ran cold. The police came and proceeded to move through the house and check every room, finding nothing. They said there wasn't any sign of forced entry, and suggested that it could have just been a bear. We both knew it was inaccurate, but at this point we were feeling pretty stupid and didn't say much. They left, and we were wide awake, lying in bed, both still feeling uneasy. That's when my boyfriend told me that it was the first time in his life that he thought there was no way to protect us. That really worried me because this guy made me feel very safe despite many poor qualities. He was six foot three and pretty jacked. We didn't sleep for the rest of that night. The next day we were both pretty shook up, but he went to work and I went to school. When we both got home, he brought up the night before, saying he still doesn't think that it was a bear. What kind of bear makes three distinct knocks that can open a door? We tried to rationalize the situation by saying maybe it was just kids screwing around. But we both knew it wasn't. The feeling in the house was still heavy and dark. I had been having nightmares for about a week of an older man missing teeth climbing up the stairs and smiling in a sinister way prior to the night before that. That's why this next part pushed me to my breaking point and I never slept in that house ever again. 
My boyfriend said that he kept picturing a man crawling, exorcist-like, with a smile when he awoke to the knocks. He felt that the man wanted to hurt us. I was shocked. His description, missing teeth and all lined up, that went white. He told me that we needed to pack up an overnight bag and go to a friend's place. The next time we returned to the house, the feeling was there, but darker. We decided to move out instantly. The only time I returned was when my mom and grandma came to help me clean up the house before giving the keys back to my cousins. I never mentioned it to them. However, I did search online to see if there were any incidents within that area. Couldn't come up with anything. Didn't bring it up to my cousins because I didn't want to come across as ungrateful for a place to stay. But even today, I can still picture that man smiling and remember that feeling of dread and overpowering worry that I was in danger. Please help. Followed home from cemetery. I've always been somewhat in tune with the spiritual world or realm. And I've been like this for my whole life. I don't communicate with spirits with words, but I am able to sense their presence and oftentimes identify the emotions that come with said presence. I believe myself to have felt and identified sorrow, confusion, dread, anger, and aggression. I've found that it's uncommon for earthbound, bodiless spirits to be exuding positive emotions. I'm also an empath and I'm capable of perceiving human emotions that are not verbally or physically expressed. This includes what's presented in real time, as well as the energy that's absorbed into walls, structures, and soil. Some houses just feel like they hold like a history of abuse in them, if that makes sense. Walls listen, and walls talk. I'm capable of making the distinction between a presence that comes from an existing body and a presence that exists without a human body. I feel bodiless entities in my chest and torso, and especially in my forearms. It's difficult to explain, but it's kind of like the feeling you get when you know you're not alone. Static in my veins. Almost like my arm falls asleep. Despite my understanding that many, if not most, earthbound spirits exude negativity, I still feel very welcomed and safe in cemeteries. I love cemeteries. I feel like they're places where people typically don't go with bad intentions, and while they frequently carry sorrow onto the grounds, I do believe grief to simply be a form of unreciprocated love. When I go to a cemetery, I feel a lot of heavy, thick sorrow, but also an air of love and longing. It fluctuates throughout the grounds and feels almost like a sea of waves to walk through. When I visit cemeteries, I usually just pop in for a few minutes and breathe it all in, turn the car off, and listen with my body. I've taken to doing this as a way of honing my skills with connectivity, to just stop relying on my five primary senses to see the world around me and give my soul a chance to listen. I typically don't do any video or voice recording, nor do I take pictures. I used to when I was younger, but now I just stop to feel the energies and presence of whatever or whomever might make itself apparent to me. At the Cemetery Recently we, which is myself and my roommate, discovered Mount Olivet Cemetery in Fort Worth, Texas, which is modeled after the original in Tennessee. Olivet is not a typo, by the way. O-L-I-V-E-T. 180 acres, over a dozen lots, multiple statues, a variety of headstones, laser etched marble, a lake, crypts, urns, fantastic cemetery all around, filled with trees, too. Upon first finding this place, we spend an hour just driving around and around looking at it all, taking it in, marveling at the evidence of beautiful, unique forms of grieving that one might find in a cemetery. We then left to get coffee and food and returned just as the sun set and the grounds were considered closed. 
there were still others there, a few mourners and a group of kids that looked to possibly be doing some form of ghost hunting. So we decided to get out and wander on foot. It got too cold for this, so we eventually went back to the car and just began driving around like we did before. We were probably there for an hour after dark. And about 15 minutes in, I feel compelled to do some recording. I started with voice, then switched to video. Didn't even think to take pictures. And I want to say that we have about half an hour of audio, and possibly an accumulative 15 minutes of video. But they're on my roommate's phone and she's out right now. I'll update these times soon. We'll also share the videos and audio if I can. Nothing noteworthy occurred during recording in Walking in the Grounds. We did hear an anguished cry, but I firmly believe it was a mourner struggling with loss. I felt not much more than I typically do at cemeteries. Except at one point, I got very nervous. I assumed it was just jitters and shoved it down. Roommate got nervous too, so he left. Second Cemetery after making the drive back home from Olivet, I stopped at the local cemetery. Not comfortable sharing my location, but it's small, like two to three acres. As it's the one that I visit most frequently, and I just like the vibe there. The most negativity I felt there was severe confusion and anguish that seemed localized to a cement bench that my roommate felt too. We both opened our mouths to say something about it at the same time. Very cool, because she doesn't have a history with stuff like this like I do. But it wasn't directed at us and stayed where we quote-unquote found it. Every time I visited, the energies just kind of revolve around themselves or stick to their part of the cemetery. They kind of do their own thing and at most just seem to notice me. But this time was weirdly different. I go into the cemetery. My roommate is like on off asleep at this point and it's super late because I drove around for a long time before heading home. When I drive into the cemetery and turn the car off, it wakes her up. She asks where we are, and I say such and such cemetery, and she says that she wants to go home and appears kind of restless about it. As soon as she says that, I feel something in the field behind us. When you enter the cemetery, there's a fence to your right with a field opposite it. So when you turn to face the graves at the end of the driveway, your back is to this empty field. I've never felt anything in the field before. Not happy, not welcoming, directed at us. Get out, get out fast. Not threatening exactly, but firm. As though it didn't, or if I didn't listen, it would become threatening. Difficult to explain. I do a three-point turn because the drive is small and this feeling gets louder and more adamant as I take even longer to get the fuck out. I finally repositioned the car and sped off, almost hit one of those cement benches driving out, which would have been a total tragedy for the car. I just have never once felt that borderline threat, I'm giving you to the count of three kind of energy directed at me at the cemetery, let alone my local one. So it's usually so welcoming and soft in there, it's kind of strange. We get home within three minutes and I feel fine just confused as to why I felt something angry in that field. We try to review our recordings in the car before going inside, but my roommate falls asleep. This is normal. She's borderline narcoleptic. I watch one video and listen to five minutes of audio, then save the rest for later. Pretty Long Game 20 years ago, I dated a guy, Mick, for almost a year. I thought he was the sun and the stars, and while I was very devoted to him, he wasn't a very good boyfriend to me. He strung me on and played with my emotions in an almost sadistic way. He cheated on me and always talked me into talking him back. Taking him back. I was a very young, single mom without any place to belong, so I guess I was desperate and tolerated far too much. The night my grandpa got sick and passed away was the first family death I'd experienced. I wasn't on good terms with my family at the time. 
I needed to be with somebody that I thought cared about me and would just let me cry and work through it. Mick lived about an hour away from me as a roommate to my best friend and her husband, so naturally it was the place that I went. I spoke, or I spoke to him off and on all day. After my grandpa was taken away by the funeral home and things were done for the day, I let him and my friend know that I was coming, and I needed to be with the people that cared. They all knew I was coming, and he disappeared without telling anybody that he was leaving. It was ghosting before ghosting was a thing. I found out later that he had another girlfriend for about three months and was playing games with us both. He stopped answering my calls and never came back that night. I cried until I fell asleep on their couch, just waiting on him to show up. After a few hours of sleep, I gave up and drove the hour back home on, to my own apartment. We only had one other conversation. The next week after the funeral, an obligatory family thing, I gathered all of his stuff and asked my friend to gather up mine. I took him the box of his belongings and exchanged it while he was at work. There was one item I kept, a sweatshirt with his fraternity on the front and some snarky bullshit about his big brother on the back. I only kept it because he repeatedly said how important it was to him. That was a shitty, spiteful move, but all was fair and all that. I was a very young, immature, scorned, heartbroken girl. Our conversation was brief and consisted of him begging for his sweatshirt, while I laughed, saying I didn't have to, and I didn't even have it, and I had no idea where it could be. Since we were still connected to some of the same social circles, I got to hear through the grapevine that he was still mad and ranting about that sweatshirt for several years. For a while, that small bit of petty bitterness would be tickled, and I would get satisfaction from knowing that he was still salty. Over a sweatshirt. Eventually that bitterness all disappeared and those memories were stored in the back corner of my mind. As it does, life went on. Careers and family grew and changed. Kids grew up and moved away. Before you know it, 20 years have passed you by. This is the first Christmas in a decade that my husband and I are not traveling. As dusk approached on Christmas Eve night, I got a weird feeling. I felt like something supernatural was going on in my normally quiet house. I had weird feelings of being watched, catching things move and just things in the corner of my eye. Cold spots. You know what I mean. You could just feel it. I blessed the house, lit a candle, said a prayer, did my best to set things right in my house and in my head. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, right? After midnight, I was... After midnight, I was nestled in bed, listening to my meditation podcast, trying to fall asleep, but I kept feeling something on my feet. It felt like a cat moving on the end of the bed, but he was right next to me. After the third instance, I shot straight up in bed. I sleep with a dim light on so I could see there was nothing in my room or on my bed. Now I was spooked. And on high alert. I know something touched my feet. I listened for a while, and just when I started falling back to sleep, I hear two very loud knocks on my closet door. The cat even heard it. We both had hair standing on end. Then from inside the closet, it sounded like something crashed. Something heavy. Not going to be like that. Assuming the closet collapsed from the weight of my fabulous shit. I mustered my courage, got up, turned on every light in the bedroom, and opened the closet. All of my sweaters and folded clothes from the very top shelf had been swept off and were lying in the floor on top of my shoes. The shit I never wear or look at, mostly expensive sweaters that are a decade out of style but too valuable to get rid of. They were still folded, so I picked them up and got the step stool and put them all back up on the top shelf. I washed my face, got a drink of water, 
saged the bedroom, went back to bed, where I quickly fell back asleep. On Christmas Day, I received a phone call from my best friend. We chatted briefly about the kids and Christmas when she actually called to tell me that Mick passed away from aggressive pancreatic cancer the evening before. I let her talk for a while before I interrupted her to ask, Wait, Mick who? She confirmed, and I just shook my head in disbelief. How could this be? We're all in our early 40s, way too young for cancer. She explained that she would be going back home for his graveside service, and I was welcome to go with her if I wanted. I politely declined because of how things ended back then, how uncomfortable it would be to see his family after all this time. I wished them peace, but it wasn't my place to give them comfort. Before I could finish my sentence and end our conversation, there were two loud knocks on my closet door again. I found the clothes in the exact same position as the night before, swept off the top shelf, laying in a neatly folded stack on the floor. Just like the night before, right on top of the stack was Mick's old faded fraternity sweatshirt. I've since folded the shirt and tied it with a decorative ribbon. My friend will pick it up on her way out of town to give it to his mother at the graveside. Until then, I can only hope that giving it back will finally set the universe right, and I will patiently wait for the knocking to stop. Story number 10. What is a skinwalker? Trigger warning slash death. Firstly enough, they aren't cryptids, they are witches. Cryptids are just unidentified animals, whereas skinwalkers are paranormal and human in origin at that. Also kind of want to address some of the arguments I've heard about. Of someone seeing a skinwalker in a region not inhabited by the Navajo. And some else that uses a location difference as the end, end all, end all to disprove them. I'm going to say this one time and one time only, so pay attention. Just because skinwalkers originate in the Southwest doesn't mean they are limited to the Southwest. Like how just because I'm born from Florida, that doesn't mean that I just can't move to Colorado. They were human in origin like us. And as humans, we like to travel. Same goes for witches and shamans who can shape-shift into animals that can move around much more easily and much quicker over terrain like birds or deer. I'm not saying anything unusual, or everything unusual, that's a creature that you encounter in Florida all the way to Canada, it's a skinwalker, but the skinwalker would be even more rare around northern parts, but just know that it's not impossible. As for the cursed skinwalker ranch argument, that curse didn't create skinwalkers, it simply attracted the ones to that area also would like to address the taboo name thing. Taboo to speak of them, but only in a more frivolous manner, not really in an educational manner. Though the use of the nickname is debatable, Skinwalker is a nickname in and of itself. A Skinwalker is a witch or shaman that practices bad medicine, or as we call it, black magic. They're capable of shape-shifting, voice mimicry, astral projection, possession, and have extensive knowledge of curses, hexes, and jinxes. One of the most notable of these being a graveyard bone powder that they blow at people to curse. Poison, perhaps even asphyxiate them, as to how they were granted with such abilities and knowledge are murky at best, at least to the general population. But what we do know is that they have to initiate themselves with the darkest of spirits and witches with one of the steps being the willful sacrificial murder of a loved one. Friend or family isn't clear. In some cases, cannibalism is also part of this process. Another relatively unknown ability that they have is when they shapeshift into an animal, fully or partially. They're said to be resistant to normal bullets and injury, 
which if you look at the Sherman family's first Skinwalker Ranch encounter, kind of supports this as they saw an unusually large wolf, and I mean this wolf could look eye to eye with a six foot tall man. This wolf was unusually friendly, went right up to let the family members pet it. Then it attacked a calf. Terry Sherman, the father, had hit the beast with an axe handle and was kicking it. He then had his son fetch him his three fifty seven Magnum and he fired into the wolf's abdomen, but the wolf kept going. It didn't react to the fact that it had just been shot in its gut. Terry fired again and yet the gun had no effect. He shot it again and finally the wolf backed off. The most shocking part about this was the fact that there was no blood or open wounds on the wolf. It had been shot point blank three times, and yet it had no effect, not even a drop. Terry then shot the animal's heart, only for it to just back off 30 feet instead of falling down and, you know, dying. It just backed off for a nonchalant look on its face. Terry then got a 38 6 rifle, took aim, and the wolf remained perfectly still as Terry fired into it. The wolf stood there without a concern for the world. Then backed off again, though. Terry fired again, and finally a chunk of flesh fell from the beast, and it simply fucked off to the woods. Terry and his son gave chase. Long story short, they came back to the little flesh pile, only for it to look like it had been rotting out in the sun for a week or two. Let me rephrase this all for y'all. This wolf took a beating from a handle of an axe and took six shots, some of which were to vital parts like the heart and it walked off into the woods as if it had gotten bored with its toy. So the thing about them being unharmed in animal form holds a bit more weight. They do have weaknesses. Firstly, it's white ash, which can be coated onto bladed weapons or bullets. And how do you beat a magic user? Well, be a magic user yourself. Shamans and medicine men are certainly capable of handling skinwalkers. It's also stated that if you know the name of the skinwalking individual in question, then you should say it, and that saying it will kill the skinwalker in question. Once they completed the initiation process and gained their abilities, they become vile tricksters who will go out of their way to torment or maim whoever they come across. The level of depravity they hold is almost unmatched only rivaled by the worst of monsters, both in the literal and metaphorical sense. They are not to be confused with the Wendigo of the Algonquin tribes. The Wendigo is actually a spirit of the cold and starvation that possesses those who are either greedy or gutless to starving and desperate, turning them into tall, pale, corpse-like cannibals who are skinny and in some cases have their organs spill out with the only similarity being voice mimicry. Unlike other paranormal creatures, they were people, meaning that they can be anyone you or me. Smiley face. They are characterized by the fact that they are often seen wearing animal pelts. As for why, well, it's believed that wearing part of the animal allows them to shapeshift fully into or partially into the animal in question. In fact, I believe this is one of the reasons as to why the pelts of the predatory animals are often forbidden in Navajo-speaking tribes. After all, a deer or a goat can't do much damage as a bear or a cougar. They seem to favor these forms of coyotes, crows, wolves, foxes, deer, and dogs as often told in legends, and even sightings today. Whilst partially or fully in these forms they can use the physiological abilities of animals, Flight from birds, agility of a cat, and the brawn of a bear. Another notable, excuse me, another notable thing that I alluded to earlier about them is if you speak of skinwalkers in their Navajo name, you'll risk catching the attention of he who walks on all fours. The Walmart Ghost Chronicles, Part 2 This Walmart in southern Colorado is known for more than its toilet paper outages and minor COVID-19 outbreaks. It also has a ghost. In this bit, I will recount three experiences. 
I will go in chronological order for these experiences, just for the sake of text flow. People at my store have worked there for ages, so of course they've had encounters with our suicide ghost, which I will henceforth refer to as Sam for reasons that will be revealed later. Sam isn't normally too active when the store is bustling with activity. He's antisocial in nature, tending to act out when his peace is disturbed by an employee later at night, or so I assume from the time when encounters and experiences have occurred. One of my co-workers' name is Cindy. She happened to work back in the HBA in cosmetics at the time of this happening. She's a taller woman with a thin frame and tends to be quiet when on duty. She and Sam didn't get along very well. On this particular night, Cindy was stocking and zoning the lotion wall in our box of cosmetics center. She was very much so alone and thought nothing of it as she remembered this fact very clearly. She had told me that the music was off because the overheads were having maintenance done and it was eerily quiet. As she stocked a bottle of lotion from the top shelf, dropped two shelves to her right, the loud thud scared her and echoed through the empty area. She simply restocked the item, thinking that she bumped something. That was until one fell from the top shelf where she had just come from. She shook her unease off as maybe it being a typical nighttime jitter thing. Nothing else occurred for a while, but when it did, it was nothing to be sneezed at. Hands full of freight and at least a foot from the wall searching for a spot for her lotion, she freezes when the whole top shelf starts falling onto the floor. Freight simply sliding forward from wall to wall simultaneously, as if being pushed from behind with a very long stick. The moment the first bottle falls, she drops her stuff and runs. She later told me when recounting the tale that she was crying and actually left work early. She's never worked back in that cosmetics that late at night ever again. As at the time I was start back to be in the area for closing shifts, she warned me to always greet Sam and when he throws something to apologize. My father was involved heavily in this next encounter, and I actually didn't notice the happenings at all until a member of security questioned him and showed him video feed. This night my father was putting up large signs which were to hang from the beams above our gondolas, the shelves on which freight sits. He was on one of our electric risers. The risers are anything but quiet, and we are, or when you're upon them they sway with each step. These risers are already pretty nerve-wracking, so I don't blame him for not noticing. If you've read about my first encounter, you know Sam manipulated the electric doors. In this case, he did the same, but for hours rather than moments. Any time my father passed from the shelving area into the flat, the doors would open. He would assume the doors were active and unlocked. However, when the security associate... Or, sir, yeah. However, when the security associate checked the doors, they were off and locked, according to all recorded logs. They were locked at 9 p.m. and remained locked all night as my father had not touched them and was the only associate present until 2 a.m. This whole ordeal spooked security more than it did my dad. The gentleman had watched the doors open and close at varying speeds. If you know anything of these doors, they are set at one speed. Safe to say, security was unnerved. The last experience was mine. As I seemed to be my own hotbed of paranormal activity, Sam decided he was pissed off and didn't want me anywhere near his favorite spot at all. I happened to be zoning the HBA shelves and had just started, meaning I was in the shampoo aisles. I am very comfortable in this area because I enjoy matching everything up. Something about the uniformity of everything by the end is simply satisfying. So as I began zoning, customers trickled from the area, leaving me quiet alone and I was humming to myself. I did have my headphones in at this point, and my audio started crackling, which has never happened before with this headset and caused me to pause, reset the connection. Quite suddenly they were dead, completely drained of power. 
I didn't even have a suspicion that Sam was around. He wasn't a thought in my mind, to be honest. I assumed I hadn't placed the earbuds back into the case properly. Putting them away, I nearly jumped out of my skin as a shelf to my left jiggled by itself, the whole shelf. It knocked my bottles over and they hit the floor with loud bangs. I assumed someone on the other side had bumped something, but only one shelf had moved. At this point, I had an inkling that I was being messed with by Sam. I put everything back nice and neat. I backed up to double check the wall when several shelves, all in different places on the wall, shook. This time, bottles didn't just fall, several came flying off at me. Obviously, I was upset by this, and I yelled, Sam! Abruptly, it all stopped. Broken bottles broke upon the floor, and me in Sam's fit. I spent a good deal of time cleaning up this mess, and also spent the entire time scolding him for his horrible temper. I had many, many bruises after this encounter, and was rather cross with the entity and his temper tantrums. I remember scolding him for days afterwards. Sam garnered his name from a manager I disliked. This manager had a temper and an ego. Quite like our resident ghost. All will be well until suddenly he decides to throw a hissy fit. To this day he remains. And for every moment after, his name will always be Sam. Many say that it's not good to name an entity because it solidifies their presence. However, this fucker is going nowhere. Till next time. Encounter with a Shadow Stranger I only very recently recalled this memory. This is the only time in my life that I experienced something like this. I've never ever hallucinated before either. Perhaps it can, or perhaps it can be explained, but I haven't been able to figure out how. Maybe you will. I live in Hawaii, on the island of Kauai and I'm a 28-year-old female. Approximately 20 years ago, I was on the island of Oahu, visiting family on my father's side. I stayed at my auntie's house with a rather large Samoan boyfriend. She was about five foot tall and on the chunky side. She has a daughter, my cousin, who was the same age as me and standing at an average eight-year-old girl's height. You'll see why this information matters later. They lived in this neighborhood called Wilhelmina Rise, on the bottom floor of a two-story house. It was set up almost like a fairly spacious studio, where the only room was the bathroom. Otherwise, you could see everything in the studio in its entirety, no matter where you were standing. There were two queen-sized beds, several feet from each other, one closest to the TV and the other closest to the back wall. I was sleeping in the bed furthest from the TV on the inside, having the wall closest to me, and my cousin was sleeping next to me on the outside. My auntie and her boyfriend were, of course, sleeping in the other bed. I want to say it was somewhere between 1 a.m. and 2 a.m. when I suddenly woke up. I don't know if I had to use the bathroom or if something disrupted my sleep, but I could see the kitchen when I opened my eyes. I propped myself up onto my elbow to see over my peacefully slumbering cousin was puzzled at first as something caught my eye. I thought, I'm just imagining things, as I began to rub my eyes, hoping to be rid of whatever was causing this potential illusion. I look up from my hands, knowing it'd be gone, because the explanation was that my eyes were likely just blurry, causing me to see imaginary things, right? That's what everyone else would expect when something like this happens to someone, isn't it? But that isn't what happened. Not in this universe. After rubbing the sleep from my eyes, I look up again and it's the same spot. Or it's in the same spot as it had been. The next step is to pinch yourself, right? That's exactly what I did. Pinch, pinch, pinch on my forearm as hard as I could. To where I had to rub the pain away. Definitely awake and that is definitely there. Standing. 
My eight-year-old mind was trying to make sense of what was playing out, but it couldn't. I can't explain the confusion that I felt. Knowing things weren't adding up when they should be. This doesn't actually happen, except it was happening and there was no explanation. Towering in the kitchen was what looked to be a male on the slimmer side. If you took notice to the description of anyone staying in the apartment earlier, you'll understand why it was such a brain twister for me. Who is that? I asked myself. It stood with its back towards me at the kitchen sink. I stared at it trying to make out any sort of detail that should have been illuminated by the dim stove light that was left on. The longer I looked at it, the less sense that it made. I began to realize that aside from it being in my kitchen, something was off about it. Why couldn't I see any details? Why can't I even see the clothing that it's wearing, or the color of its skin? It was as if it were encompassed by a deep, dark, shadowy black. It was a silhouette. What does that even mean? My eight-year-old mind had no idea. I didn't know that shadow people were a thing back then. I wasn't even thinking about ghosts and paranormal things at that time. I was clueless and didn't know what I was dealing with until very recently. The weirdest thing is that when I first looked at it, within that second, my half-asleep brain recognized it as my grandma, until I looked harder and made sense of where I actually was. That didn't make sense for a lot of reasons, the main two being, one, she's my mom's mom, therefore having no relation to anyone here except me. She was still alive and well on my home island at that time. She didn't pass away until about a decade after this incident. After I glanced over at my auntie and her enormous boyfriend sleeping where they're supposed to be, I glanced at the front door thinking maybe someone broke in. From where I was, I could see the chain was still on the door. So was the heavy-duty padlock, meaning the only way that locked doors opening is from the inside. The only window in her place was still intact as well. My heart was pounding at this point and the figure still hadn't moved at all. I rubbed my eyes and pinched myself one last time, hoping I was dreaming. Please, I thought to myself, as I slowly started to lower my body back onto the mattress, keeping my eyes on whatever it was that refused to go away. Please keep us safe and don't let anyone see anything. I stealthily flipped on my other side of my face to the wall, pulled the covers over my head the whole deal. I didn't care how hot it was. I was not going to see the face on this thing, nor was I going to feel, hear, or witness anything that it ends up doing. I silently prayed more to my parents. God and had so much fear and adrenaline coursing through me, thought I would never end up falling asleep. I genuinely had it in my mind that something was about to happen to me. Miracles do happen, as after a millennia passed, I did indeed fall asleep through the rest of the night without any further disturbances. I don't recall what happened the following day, but all I know is nothing was out of place, no evidence of someone MacGyvering their way into the house, and no one else mentioned anything about what I saw. I did tell my dad's mom about this recently, and she genuinely believes that I'm sensitive to anything spiritual or paranormal. She has her reasons, but that's another story. For some reason, I haven't been able to find it in me to agree with her about being sensitive. Maybe it's because I fear these type of encounters, so I consciously shut this stuff out. Maybe because I'm just too skeptical. All I do know is I'd like to never experience seeing a spooky spectral stranger in the middle of the night ever again. Flick the switch, numb, wake up. I was eight years old when it happened. It was Thursday. When at night at 1 a.m. I lay awake on my bed crying, as I usually did. Thursday had been hard because in the morning at school, the kids threw my bag out of the window, cut my hair, slapped me, 
and my quote-unquote personal bully had kicked me in the stomach. At home, my sister was grumpy and had glitter all over her face and eyebrows, so it was hard to wash it off because she was whining and not wanting to bathe. She didn't eat the food I cooked, and she wouldn't sit down and do her homework with my aid or let me do the homework. I went to my English class without finishing my homework and my performance was very poor and I got yelled at for it. Then when I returned home, mom was waiting for me to go to physiotherapy. She suffered from lupus. And it was after surgeries back to back that lasted for three years. And now she was on the road of recovery. When we returned home, she was disappointed with how she has gone so much and just started yelling at me for how incompetent of a daughter I was and how much of a disappointment I was. That left me crying in my room. So at night, as always, I sobbed while shoving my covers in my mouth so I won't wake anybody up. When thoughts of how everybody would be happier if I died, and I started to imagine my death and I started to imagine my funeral. But the mental image of my baby sister holding her teddy bear crying over my grave made me stop thinking about it. The only thought that kept circling my head was, and I'm quoting and translating, Please, God, take away my pain. Make me numb so I can take it. That's what was circling around in my head as sleep took me over. The next day I woke up at 7 a.m. as usual and complete my routine in autopilot. It was when I was standing outside, and our building was waiting for best friends that Nikki and Polly come to meet us. So we start to leave our younger siblings to the schools, as usual, when I noticed how it was apathetic and numb. I just shrugged and went on with my day, until I was made fun of after a failed match of volleyball when it happened. It was my personal bully hitting me in the head calling me stupid when I jumped up and pushed him away from me. Then I left the class. When I returned for class, everything was okay. When the bell rang and it signals for the break. When my personal bully and I were left alone in the room and he turned and he said that I was stupid and I had had it. I jumped up and grabbed the school's desk. Mind you, the desks aren't that heavy, so you can lift them with two hands easily. But I got so angry with my bully's anger that it drove me madder than I usually was, and I threw it at him. The desk didn't fly, but it fell in front of him. And I got madder that it didn't hit him, so I picked up a chair and threw it at him, and I hit him in the end of his eyebrow. He looked scared of me, left me alone. When he left me, I suddenly felt calm again. That sudden flicker of emotions. I went from feeling nothing to immense anger. That will continue for years. I was 13 when I was in school and I was walking with my two best friends, Nikki and Polly. And they were talking about a guy both girls liked when I felt a pain in my head and chest. And my heartbeat got faster and I grew hotter. The girls saw my discomfort and walked up to me and asked me if I was all right. When I tried to look at them, I felt the sun behind them blinding me. I said that I'm just going to go back to class. When I went back to class and sat down, I don't remember what happened next, but I blink and I'm in the middle of class and I don't recall the sound of the bell or anything. I asked, just confused, to my best friend Nikki and she told me that we talked about her afternoon get-together and watched the Vampire Diaries on our TVs. I pretended to remember and I shut up. Still can't recall what happened in the blank memory. Throughout my second year of junior high, I was getting into so many fights, mostly because they were bullying me, but I was using all the self-defense my dad was teaching me since I was four years old. And most fights are blank in my mind, but I know three or four of them. An accident that worries me now that I'm thinking about is this. My then best friend Nikki was saying something along the lines of how she didn't believe me, that I knew self-defense when I suddenly got very, very angry that suddenly I was choking her. She was sitting on top of the desk when I started to choke her. 
I had forcefully made her lie down on the desk. I don't remember how I pulled away from her, but, or really what happened after that, but I know that after that, Nikki was avoiding me. I apologized to her about me choking her, and she accepted my apology, and our friendship was continuing. After the second junior high year, we moved back to my mom's hometown. The first half of my third year of junior high felt as if I was sleepwalking. It was when one day a girl was bullying me, but had no idea because I had my headphones on. But she ripped them out of my ears and slapped me angrily that I was ignoring her. I was reading a very well-written fanfiction, and I was listening to Bastille. Those things were far from important than her bullying me, when the feeling of numbness was replaced by this very hot wave of anger. I slapped her and then walked away. I was so angry, yet I knew I shouldn't be. I was walking inside the building when I saw another student. He laughed at me knowing what was going on in the playground. I punched him and my hand crashed into the aluminum door. My hand should have hurt, but it didn't. That day I was returning from school and I was walking through the streets, and I felt this sudden shift in me, and suddenly I started to cry, sobbing. After that, I felt everything. I was so emotional that it made me feel as if I was drowning. I didn't understand why suddenly I was so emotional, why I was so emotionless prior to it. Then I was sleeping one day when I was awakened by a memory. A memory of eight-year-old me wishing to be numb. Something may have followed my dad, and now it's here to stay. I live in a fairly new home that my family and I moved into nearly a decade ago in a relatively small city of less than 15,000. We're the first residents of the home, and it's built in a cushy neighborhood. The first couple of years went by without an issue. Nothing seemed off about the place. But I could have been naive, since I had only just started middle school in the year that we moved in. But going into high school, I started to notice things. They were small, but I definitely noticed them. Things like hearing somebody walk around upstairs when I was home alone and downstairs. Now when walking upstairs, the floor will pop, as her home was built in a rush. And there are things in the home that weren't properly built. Even nine years later, the carpeted floor still pops and creaks the same as it did all those years ago. There were also events of closet doors being left open, either my brother or I, as I'm not sure if it happened to my parents. One of us would wake up in the morning, and our closets would be open. I always chalked events like this up to my imagination, so I never attempted to investigate further. That was until my mom told me about the things that my dad saw. My dad's religious, a Mormon, and so he had gone on a mission to Bolivia in the 80s, where he lived for two years. The country at the time was extremely poor, and it was hard to receive any sort of proper medical treatment, too. My dad ended up catching many diseases he somehow survived, though. Malaria, dengue, which is a disease given by mosquitoes, both of which, and some others that I can't quite remember at the moment. My mom explained to me that my dad actually had pronounced, or was pronounced, dead at one point, but had then come back. My dad had never actually lied to me or anyone else in my family before. Perhaps when I was a kid and small fibs about Santa being real, or the tooth fairy sure, but never actually lied to me or anyone else in my family. My dad's respectable and any time that he would see a friend or co-worker in public, they had nothing but good things to say about him. Even now, being as sick as he is, his friends still come and visit him often. So when I heard about my dad's troubles in South America, I had no doubt that he was telling my mom the truth. And she explained to me that since that day, he could see things. 
he would see apparitions at the end of his bed at night, dark figures, following him around work as if he worked in a coal mine deep underground. These things immensely trouble him, and he doesn't like talking about them. I myself have only seen two dodgy figures. Once I was with my brother and my mom in the living room, my door being right next to it, and a wall that blocks the view of the hallway to the other bedrooms, including my parents' room. The three of us were on our phones, fairly distant from each other, when out of the corner of my eye I saw a shadow-like figure dart from behind the wall in the hallway into my room. It was so clear that I looked up, and so did my brother and my mom. We then all looked at each other, and my mom asked, Did you see that too? I've also had two dogs, both at separate times, act unnaturally. The first dog would often lift her head up, watching towards the hallway, even sometimes chasing something unseen. The dog we have now does the same thing, and recently, as of last week, she was sitting on my lap, looking to the mirror in my room at an angle, growling and barking a little. For context, she never barks. Even when we invite people into our home, she doesn't bark at them. She's a friendly dog. She often looks at herself in the mirror as my mom has a body mirror that sits on the ground. And when she was a puppy, she barked at herself a few times, but since then she hasn't barked at herself, or seeing any of us in the mirror. She kept turning her head to look behind her, to see who had been in the mirror, but couldn't see anything there, so kept returning her focus to the mirror. There will occasionally be nights where I sit with my dad in the living room, just the two of us, and we're having a conversation, when all of a sudden he looks down the hallway, and I ask him, Do you see something? He nods, but I continued the conversation we were having, as to ignore whatever's there. As I said, my dad is currently ill, terminally, unfortunately due to the neuropathy. By the way, he also has neuropathy, and had pulmonary embolisms at one point, causing it to damage his lungs, as well as a medication that he's been taking for far too long is damaging his body over time. And him now having two, or type 2 diabetes on top of all these things. When he had the pulmonary embolism, he refused to go to the hospital for nearly a week and was sleeping all the time, only waking to use the bathroom or have something small to eat. He finally asked my brother, and I called an ambulance for him while my mom was away. Later I found out that when he woke up, multiple dark figures would stand at his bed. And earlier before the embolism, when we had the virus, I'm sure you guys can connect the dots, I'm unsure if I'm allowed to say the C word, he'd also see many dark figures standing at the end of his bed. He was hit the worst by the virus due to his autoimmune disease, causing permanent damage to his lungs. My mom's gotten members of her church to come and bless my dad and the house, but had been downstairs while doing it. And no, they didn't bring a Bible and a cross to the house. They just folded their arms, dipped their heads, and said a few words to hopefully banish whatever was there. But it kind of never left, whatever they are. And now I'm left wondering what the next steps are. I've convinced my mom to let me buy some sage so I can go through the entire house and sage it. But what if that doesn't work either? I want to make a comfortable life for what years my dad has left, and when the time comes, I don't want him to be in fear if these things hover around him and what to do about them during his near death. Story number 22 Three paranormal things happened in the span of 30 minutes. Let me start off by saying a couple of things. I am autistic, and I have a hard time narrowing down a story to a couple of lines. So this may be longer than it needs to be. Me and my mom are both believers. We have had plenty of experience with the paranormal in the past, and I have been open to the paranormal since a young age. 
whether that be shadow people, relatives that have passed on to come visit us, possessions, you name it, we've probably had some sort of an experience with it. I work as a delivery person. I deliver papers and ads in my city. I use a metal wagon cart to pull the papers and stuff them in and so that I can take more with me in one trip. I pull this behind me. It's kind of important to the story. I like to do this work in the evening because I like how quiet it is and the fact that not many people are outside so I can do my work in peace and to avoid talking to people. And this all happened in the span of 30 minutes, by the way. So, on to the encounters. The first paranormal thing that happened was a cold hand touched me on my right shoulder. It felt like a right hand. The hand was not icy cold, but as cold as a corpse, if that makes sense. It didn't put a lot of pressure on me. It was more as like to get my attention. Say you're walking behind someone and want their attention. I was pulling my cart behind me so this simply wouldn't be possible for someone to touch my right shoulder with their right hand like that. I looked around in confusion, thinking to myself, Okay, that's weird. I didn't see anyone or anything around me. The nearest people near me were across the parking lot. The second paranormal thing happened maybe two minutes after on the same street as the first encounter. Just a little further away. I think they're related, but I'm not sure. There's a restaurant at the corner of my street in my town with automatic doors that you have to come closer to so that they'll open. You have to be within one to two meters of the door to register that it's a person and then, in fact, open. I was walking five meters away from the door and the doors open. I looked inside, didn't see anyone in the hallway. All I saw was the person at the register cleaning the counter. I walked past, not really thinking anything of it. I left my car at the corner of the street and crossed the street to deliver a few papers. I came back, grabbed another one for said restaurant, and went to put it in the mailbox. I turn to go, you know, walk towards the mailbox, and I see the door opening again from quite far away. This time, I was a good seven meters away from the sensor, and behind a pillar that's in front of the restaurant, so I couldn't have triggered it. I walked around the pillar and felt something shoving and kicking me in the butt. It wasn't hard, and it also didn't hurt, but it was enough to make me stumble and force me to take another step. I look around me and again there was no one there. I thought maybe it was those people I saw in the parking lot earlier, but they were quite far away by then. I wasn't scared as much as I was unnerved. Those two things happened so close together. I called my mom right as this happened and told her what I was you know, kind of going through. And while on the phone with her, I continued to walk my route, and everything was fine. I moved on to the next section without anything else really happening, and I hung up. The third thing happened in the next section of my route, and completely freaked me out. One of the streets I have to deliver on is a cul-de-sac type of street. It goes downhill for a little bit, and it wraps around some other houses and comes out on the other side of them. There is a lamp post shining its light into the street where the cul-de-sac begins. I entered the first part of the street that goes down and put my cart down so I could deliver some more houses. I was halfway down the street when I saw the train of a dress fly by around the corner where I just came from, up by the beginning of the cul-de-sac. I don't mean flying as if a person was hovering off the ground, I mean flying in the sense of a person was running past and the train was following behind them. Think of a typical scary movie where a ghost runs around the corner and you just catch a glimpse of them. It wasn't an actual person because the light didn't get obstructed, but I just saw that dress. I quickly finished the street, grabbed my cart, and stood underneath the lamppost where I felt safe and called my mom. She told me that she was on her way already, 
since our last call. She said that I sounded really scared and I sounded freaked out. And hearing me now, I was almost hyperventilating. I told her it wasn't necessary, and I'd stay in the street lights, and in parts that were lit well. I would do them tomorrow during the day. She then came to me anyways, and came with me as I finished the rest of my route. I was mostly done anyways, so it wasn't too long. When we came home, we looked some things up about it, and we tried a few things to protect me from the paranormal entities. I'm wearing my crystal bracelets again, and I will not be taking them off for a week. I personally think the first two incidents are related. Maybe the cold hand was trying to warn me for the push and kick I would receive a little later. Or they were trying to get my attention with their hand when I didn't respond and gave me a shove to get my attention further. For the third thing, though, I don't know. It really just freaked me out and I can't connect them. I am freaked out and I'm still quite anxious about the whole thing. For now, I will not be doing my work during the evening, and I'll be doing it during the day. That's the end of tonight's stories. As usual, hope that you guys drop a comment and help us along with growing this channel. And I'll see you later. See ya. Story number eight. World War II Filipino Soldier. I have a grandfather who served during World War II in the Philippines. Whenever we meet up in his house, he always serves us hot cocoa and told stories about the war. The best of his old memory can remember anyway. One time we were there with my cousins. Someone asked him what was the most unforgettable memory that he'll never forget about the war. And the story goes like this. My father is Antonio Miguel Jalima, currently 97 years old, but is still very healthy for a 97-year-old. He was in the Philippine Army back in World War II and is deployed on September 1st, 1941 by General MacArthur. He was still in his teenage years to early 20s back then, and he was assigned as an office clerk for the Army. Nothing memorable happened back then until the night of March 27, 1942, where he was assigned as a reinforcement for the Battle of Bataan. Everyone was surprised, but they all knew that this was bound to happen because of the outcome of the defense of the Filipino soldiers and American soldiers were facing. With actual terror from their faces, they accepted their fate. A lot of officers are boosting their morale by giving packs of cigarettes, polishing or cleaning their boots or helmets for free. And when it's time to go, my grandfather rode it in the truck, and it was packed with soldiers. Everyone is singing the Philippine hymn, and until you know it, it still brings chills to my grandfather. As they get closer and closer to the battlefield, bombs and mortar fire can be heard. He always highlights how heavy the smoke is in the forest and how vulnerable Mount Samat was to the Japanese below and to the Japanese Navy planes. It's very difficult to go up Mount Samat to begin with because it's surrounded by Japanese, but fellow locals sneak companies of soldiers up every night to bring support and supplies to the soldiers holding above. My grandfather couldn't believe that he was climbing up a mountain surrounded by enemy troops. Whenever he thinks of it now, he brags of how much, basically how lucky he was that he survived. A couple of days passed with intense bombardment from the Japanese Navy, planes, mortars, and battleship artillery. They are intensely degrading the morale of every soldier up on the mountain. There is a time where there are some soldiers shooting themselves just to escape the intense nature that they were in. My grandfather was assigned as a sniper back then, but he wasn't very good because he didn't have proper training. 
He remembers that there were too many enemy troops that can be seen below. Whenever you pop your head up from cover, it's a sure hit because of the amount of bullets flying up the mountain. His fellow snipermen make makeshift dummies to lure bullets in just for them to sneak out from the bush and just get a little bit of a shot. A week almost passed when their food supply ran out, and a lot are dying from hunger and disease. A lot are also being shot and amputated by mortar shells, bullets, and everything you can imagine. They were really surrounded from land to air. They can't do anything about it. The horses they used to carry supplies were eaten to the bone. Some even chew the bone to pieces just for themselves to have the gratification of eating. Some eat grass, some eat plants, some eat worms. They eat their leather garments and their fingernails. Everyone's hope came down when the Japanese propaganda threw pamphlets on the mountain, saying the U.S. and Philippine Army surrendered, and that if they didn't surrender now, they won't survive. Even with no hope and in starvation, a lot of them still chose to defend the mountaintop. With death slowly approaching them, some unleashes their bravery by running while shooting and shouting at the enemy, who's almost at the top of with them. They did this to death. Ammo supplies are at a low. They don't have anything to defend themselves but boulders and stones in which they roll down the mountain or throw so enemy troops can't go up at ease. Every day hundreds of men are lost. And when the day came that they were taken over by the Japanese forces, my grandfather pretended to be dead. He covered himself in blood from his friend's dead bodies slid a huge line in his arm so it looked like he was bleeding. So he was one of the lucky ones who made it through because Japanese troops tend to shoot dead bodies or stab them to see if they were really dead, and there were a few who died because of that. He was soon taken as a POW, which is short for prisoner of war, by the way. And when he was taken, he saw countless bodies of his friends, headless, bodiless. Some are literally in pieces, some are even crucified by the Japanese. Some are still alive, but hung upside down with barbed wire. Some are fighting for their life while their toes being sliced slowly for fun. He remembers seeing white smoke coming from the bodies, thinking that it was the soul leaving the body. You can't hear a sound from the forest down below. Even a single cricket. None as if time was paused and the silent screams, too, were making the place feel sacred, as if there's an invisible parade where souls are marching. Imagine the terror and horror my grandfather had to face. Can't imagine myself being in that situation. If anyone's curious, just search Battle of Bataan and Mount Samat. Because of that, I have deep respect to our veterans who fought the war and experienced this, and lived through it and his description of the spirits always stuck with me. Hopefully, they all get what they deserve. I keep thinking about this one experience. This happened to me, male 30, and a friend, male 31, four years ago. And while I've shared it with some close friends, it never got treated seriously among them. This experience disturbed me deeply, and more importantly, set me out to get a better understanding of what's out there that we can't explain. Before I tell my story, you should know that I consider myself an agnostic, a pragmatist, science-first kind of guy. I never believed in ghosts, voodoo, or anything paranormal for that matter. Reddit as well as this sub is a new space for me, so bear with me if I'm breaking any unwritten rules. I've come across this sub and read some paranormal stories which were received with understanding and curiosity, which motivated me to finally put this into words. My friend and I came back to my home after a night of partying. It must have been past 7 a.m. because it was starting to get light outside. 
We drank and took some lines of coke earlier that night, so we were still in a chatty mood. I'll bet. We were having a snack and rehydrating ourselves with water to prepare for bedtime. I want to make clear at this point that while we were pretty tired, we were in no way tripping or fatigued on a level where you would consider to have hallucinations. I've done mushrooms and LSD before, and I can tell the difference. What happened next was 100% happening, and we both experienced it in the same way. There was no doubt in either of our minds. My friend was sitting on the left side of the couch, and I was sitting in the chair, as depicted below. At some point while my friend was talking, I clearly noticed that the standing lamp was slightly wobbling. I didn't see when or how it started, and when I noticed and I told it to my friend, he looked over his shoulder and noticed it too. It was a light wobble, like something had gently pushed it. It naturally lost its momentum and stopped wobbling. I found it quite strange as this never happened before. Even if you're close to the lamp and jump around or make sudden moves, it's not that unstable to start moving. We were sitting in a relaxed position and weren't really moving or using our hands frantically. My friend waved it off. We moved out pretty quickly. We continued talking and about 20 minutes later we both heard a clear and rapid knocking on the wall's cupboard's door. It sounded like it was coming from the inside of the wall cabinet. It was five rapid knocks which sounded like someone using their nails to knock. The sound was just a bit louder than our voices, so it immediately grabbed our attention. We were both dumbfounded and looked at each other as we were holding our breath. It took us a moment to say anything. We quickly concluded that it really happened, as we were trying to figure out if the sound was real. We clearly started to feel more uneasy about the whole thing. It took us about 20 more minutes before we found the courage to open the cupboard. Now you should know that this is a very shallow cupboard, around 30 centimeters. It doesn't have shelves, and only some cables coming from the ground floor, more on the first floor. I mostly used it to store my internet modem, and on top of it I stored a thin topping mattress in there. In other words, this cabinet was mostly filled with soft mattresses, no other hard materials that could have made the sound. At the other side of that wall is the building's stairway. There are two floors above me, and I was in a good relationship with them. The sound of going up or down those stairs is nothing like the knocking sound that we heard. Knocking from the other side of the wall wouldn't give a hollow knocking sound like what we just heard. I also concluded that I couldn't have been my neighbors knocking because they were being loud, for example. I'd never done that. They would rather text me. And we also didn't hear anything after the knocking, like footsteps walking away. We basically freaked out and tried to pretend that it didn't even happen and go back to what we were talking about earlier. Unfortunately, we couldn't shake this eerie feeling of being watched or being haunted. We made some jokes here and there, but let's say the fun was off and we called it a night. The next day, we talked about it with a clear mind, but we were both still perplexed. We still couldn't find any logical explanations. Rat running through the walls, stuff moving in the cabinets, us pushing the lamp accidentally. None of it made sense. The most likely explanation would be someone in the stairway knocking somewhere. We tried to reproduce the sound, but the walls were too thick. I asked my upstairs neighbor if he were, maybe he was awake that morning, around the time, and he said that he did not get it, or jumbled words. He said that he didn't get out of bed until before 10. If you came this far with the reading, I first want to say that I appreciate your time and interest in my story. Perhaps it's not the most wild thing that you've read on the sub, but it was enough for me to start looking into the paranormal. It's a wide spectrum, and I have no idea where to place this encounter particularly. To me, it feels like a ghost encounter, but you could call it a spirit or some kind of energy. Can't tell you because this was just the second time something unexplainable happened to me. Perhaps I'll share the first one later. 
and I don't lean into any of this stuff anyway. Soon after this experience, I moved out of that apartment, for unrelated reasons, so I never got to further investigate it. So my lack of knowledge and belief in any of those things made me a bad judge. My question to you, dear reader, is, or dear listener in this case, what do you think of this? Am I crazy? Was I just tripping? Did I witness something extraordinary? I'd love to hear your thoughts, questions, or similar experiences. Story number two. My first formal posting here. I had just graduated from college, year of 2005, moved into an older duplex in northeast Minneapolis with my then boyfriend, now ex-husband. I'm very sensitive, so pick up energy like a sponge. From the moment I entered that house, I knew it was bad news. At that time, I wasn't certain if it was active or residual. Turned out to be both. I remember one of my nights there. My then boyfriend had to head out for Colorado for a wedding. Family friend. I wasn't invited since we've only been together for less than a year. I was organizing DVDs. We had a lot of them. Mostly horror movies. I remember coming to the movie The Grudge. I hated that movie. Me too. I verbally announced that I hated that movie out loud and set it aside in the living room. I came to the end of my organizing and wanted to place the grudge at the end of the alphabetized horror DVD order. It was now gone. It was literally about a foot away from me when I set it aside. I then began to freak out a bit as I literally recognized something is fucking with me. Spend a good 30 minutes searching this tiny home Guess where it was? Top shelf of the bedroom closet. The rest of that night sucked. Didn't sleep a wink out of the feeling of being watched, and the energy was just flat out ugly. Following day, I left for his apartment, as I couldn't deal with whatever the hell was in the house by myself. Don't return until he gets home two days later. More time passes, and I decided to buy a kitten behind his back. He hated cats, but loved this three-pound kitten. This detail is crucial further into the story. Well, more weird stuff happened over the next few months. Mainly objects moving around, corner basement light being turned on after we turned it off. Mostly harmless stuff. My ex played it off. He wasn't 100% on ghosts, demons, beings, etc. like I was, yet. The real weird stuff starts happening six to eight months in. He never allowed the kitten to sleep with us. He'd bite our feet as he was teething. He was super playful. You know how these little ones can be. I had made him a beautiful area in the living room. A pet bed, a cat tree, and toys. It wasn't after long that he would start body slamming our bedroom door to let him get in. Whatever the hell was in that house was clearly tormenting him. Still... My ex was not allowing that little guy in. He wrote it up as an obnoxious kitten, not a potentially harassing being. A little more time passes, and I decide to return to school to study at the Aveda Institute, which was literally ten minutes from us. I was getting ready one morning, and I could hear my ex talking to himself. The bathroom was literally by my bedroom. I go into the bedroom, and he was all confused. He thought I had been in our room as someone woke him up with a shoulder massage. It wasn't me or the cat. Let's fast forward a bit more. There was this particular night, the night before I started practical training for my aesthetic studies. This means you are hands on. We went to bed just around 10. I had absolutely terrible night terrors that night. I was basically being chased down the street by some individual with a butcher knife. I woke up from my ex screaming. He was apparently having the identical dream. He was screaming, stop, stop. We were both startled by this, chatted, then tried to get back to sleep just before one. Most fucked up thing happens next. 
We both manage to fall back asleep, but I'm physically attacked by something on my face. All I remember is that I felt something like a match on my lower eyelid, and I was awoken by something super bright while my eyes were shut. I scream and wake him up. It's exactly 3 a.m. Sure as day, a huge welt on my lower eyelid. He finally admits he's starting to believe something is severely wrong here. I treat my eye. Thank God I didn't have to go to the ER. Who'd believe this? I then do the prayer of St. Michael. I'm not religious, but I do believe words hold power. I'd like to include the detail that my practice partner at Aveda saw this and asked what happened the next day. I lied and I said it was a cigarette burn. She was a good friend of mine, but this was way too weird to share. Shortly after that burn incident, my ex and I were discussing moving. We were in our bedroom during this discussion. I had a dresser with two larger mirrors that I placed perfume on, probably about 40-some bottles total. Please keep in mind, I was and am a pretty girly. Hard for me to say that, sorry guys. So, having a million bottles of perfume isn't out of the ordinary. However, this is. We were discussing this pain in the ass entity, and next thing you know, both mirror trays of bottles were literally tossed off the dresser. It's like some unseen force had literally taken its long ass arm and whipped them off. That was pretty much it. He was finally a full believer. You can't unsee that shit. We moved shortly after. Evil freaking house. Other things happened there, but I'm also a skeptic as well as a believer. You've gotta be. I'd also like to add that we didn't use drugs. He didn't drink, and I only did social things on weekends. Over the years, I feel that I've gained a greater understanding of the unknown, and realize a lot of these entities are truly energy parasites. I'd like to say that humanity is a lot stronger than it knows. Please seek truth, guys. Enjoy your journey. The Little Red-Headed Girl I was seven when I first went to sleep away camp. Naturally, the camp had a lot of ghost stories. I've always been a believer in the supernatural and saw strange things when I was younger. The story I'm about to tell happened when I was 15 one summer night at camp. The camp used to be an all-boys boarding school, but is now a co-ed marine-based camp sitting in the valley. As I mentioned before, when I was seven I heard stories of ghosts who haunted the camp. These stories always scared me, but it didn't stop me from coming back to camp five times. I went when I was seven to ten, and then fifteen to sixteen. One particular story has always been very popular, which is the story of the little red-headed girl. It goes as follows. The headmaster of the boarding school would fly over the second school every year on his son's birthday and drop candy for the students from his airplane. One year he took his young daughter and someone up else in the plane, I don't remember who exactly, but tragically the plane flew too low and clipped a eucalyptus tree and exploded in a fiery crash up in the canyon. Apparently, both bodies of the adults were found burned, and evidence showed that they died upon impact of the plane hitting the ground. But the body of the little girl was never found. To this day, stories of the people seeing and even talking to the little redhead girl are passed between campers. Apparently, she's known to walk the perimeter road of the camp, asking for her mommy and wanting to play. You know, the usual ghost kid stuff. The girl's quad is a rectangular building surrounding a dirt patch in the middle. Once grassy, but drought killed most of it. This particular year, I was in a cabin, and it was known as the Owl. Owl's one whole side of the rectangle, and had a cement patio out back with clotheslines for campers to hang their wet swimsuits and towels. Owl also shared a large communal bathroom with a couple of stalls and sinks. My cabin consisted of ten girls in total, 
We all slept in bunk beds in one room. I chose a bottom bunk because I knew from previous years that the room would get very hot and the lower you were to the ground, the cooler you would be while sleeping. Unfortunately, I wasn't the first in the room, so I ended up with the only bed in the room that didn't back up to a wall on more than one side. Basically, the bed was in the middle of the room and was directly next to the door leading to the back patio. I've always felt more comfortable sleeping next to a wall that I can back up against, but I wasn't too upset because I felt safe in a room with so many other people. One night I woke up because I had to pee. I got up and stumbled my way out of the cabin and out onto the front patio on the quad side and walked to the bathroom. There was a small clock hung on a wooden pillar in the quad and I remember it displaying that it was sometime between 3 and 4 in the morning. I stepped into the cold tiled bathroom and turned on the bright white fluorescent lights, which were accompanied by a loud whirring fan sound. I sat down on the toilet and was snapped out of my groggy state by the cold toilet seat. I did my business and began walking back to my room. At this point, I was just excited to crawl back into my sleeping bag and wasn't really thinking about anything scary possibly happening. As I opened the door to my cabin, my eyes were adjusting to the darkness of the room and I could only see the windows. The curtains were always open so the breeze could blow through, and so the only light in the room at night was from the moonlight. Sorry if my storytelling skills are really bad, even thinking about this still creeps me out though and what I saw made me freeze out of pure fear. In the window, I saw a short figure with small hands with fingers that ended up in a spike, pressing its hands and face up toward the window. I couldn't move for what felt like a minute, but in reality, I quickly got into my bed as my heart was racing and tears began to well up in my eyes. I told myself it must be a prank. Maybe the counselors or some boys had cut out a piece of paper and stuck it into the window. After five minutes of sitting in bed, wondering what I should do, I saw one of my cabin mates, who I'm going to call Nikki, turn over in her top bunk bed. Quietly, I whispered, Nikki, you wake. Yeah, she responded. There's someone in the window, I whispered. Nikki was confused and asked me what I was even talking about. I told her to look at the window next to Ellen's bed. She said there was nothing there. At this point, I started to cry out of the realization that this most likely wasn't a prank and began to spiral into a full-blown panic attack. Other girls in the cabin started to wake up due to the commotion and asked what happened. What happened after that wasn't super important, but I ended up sleeping in my friend Patricia's bed with her for the rest of the night. In the morning, I explained to the rest of the girls what happened, with some believing me and some not. They didn't think I was lying, they just didn't believe the story had happened, as I described it. I told my counselor and other counselors, and it wasn't until then that I was reminded of the story. I also went outside to look for any evidence of some being being there, or maybe some dust being wiped away on a dirty screen, but nothing. I also determined that the height of that person standing in the window would have had to have been around the waist to chest level on me. I didn't experience anything for the rest of my camp experience, but for the rest of the time I tried to avoid getting up at night, and when I entered the room after sunset, I would purposely not look at the window out of fear that whoever or whatever I saw would come back. I'm from the Seneca Reservation, and this is my story with a supernatural white wolf or dog. Seneca Indian Reservation, Salamanca, New York, white dog wolf before 2003. I was 10 years old or younger when this took place. I had seen this being on three separate occasions over a span of a few months, I'd say. The first time I saw this dog, I was riding with my aunt. We passed a triangle fork in the road that split the road between ways. 
on the right side of the road was the base of a really large hill. Right at the tip of the triangle patch of grass, there was a white wolf or dog thing standing there, staring up at the mountain. My aunt and I saw it and commented on it, and she pulled over to the side of the road and told me to go get it. I laughed. I thought she was joking. She raised her voice to me and her eyes looked different to me. She told me, go get the dog. I was reluctant but didn't want to get into trouble. I figured it was safe if she told me to, and I go out of the car and slowly approach the dog. You would think a quote-unquote normal dog would turn around and stare at the car that stopped, listen to the door being opened and either greet the person approaching him or run away, right? While this dog stood frozen in place staring up at the hill. As I got closer, I saw that his fur was all white, and he looked like a short-haired husky, or a German shepherd, or a wolf, I suppose, for lack of a better word. His coat was short and dirty, and he didn't have a collar, or seem like a pet at all. He also didn't seem like a regular goofy or aggressive res dog that I'd seen my whole life growing up. One of the weirdest things about him was that he had this wild-looking animal look. But he didn't have a tail. Not even a little stump like somebody clipped it. It was just smooth all the way down his tailbone. I walked right up into this dog. He didn't respond at all until I reached my hand out to pet him. I was about two inches from his body when he turned around, and I saw that he had one blue and one brown eye. He just we wound up looking at each other, and then he walked off. I really felt like I was seeing something I wasn't supposed to. At the time, I just felt unnatural, and it was just didn't make sense. I got back to the car, and my aunt didn't say anything to me the rest of the ride. To this day, she doesn't remember this event happening, and won't even talk about it. The second time I saw this creature was long enough later that I had forgotten about the initial encounter, more or less, if that makes sense. Probably a few months or so, I'd say. My house was about two or so miles from where I saw that dog, and I had the front bedroom on the second floor that faced the empty residential street that we lived on. And it was always lit up by streetlights. They had a TV in my room, and I remember staying up late watching it. Remember, I'm about 10 years old, so at that time. It was around 3 a.m. when I decided to shut it off and go to bed. For some reason, I looked out of the sheer curtains before I went to sleep, and that same exact dog, without a tail, was standing in the middle of the, in the, middle of the street in front of my house under a street light, and it was staring up at the road at a hill. He didn't look at me once, or face my house once, from what I remember. But it was that situation where I would walk away, lay down, close my eyes, then look back out, and he's still there. This happened a few times, and eventually when I checked again, he left. This is a small neighborhood, and this dog did not belong to anybody there. He most definitely was not one of my neighbor's pets. I only saw this creature one final time, and I hate to say it was anticlimactic. There's another fork in the road about a mile from my house, and it's in the opposite direction. One day I was riding in my parents' car with them and my little brother on my way to my friend's house. He was just standing there on the sidewalk, behind the guardrail on a little hill. He looked at me as we drove past, and I yelled, There he is, that's the dog that I told you about. And my parents were just like, what dog? Darn, we didn't see him. And just carried on about their conversation like nothing happened. I never saw him again after this. I know most people will try to explain this away as a dream, but this happened on three separate occasions. And I can still remember feeling his presence in front of me, for lack of a better word. It still gives me literal chills to remember this whole situation. I don't recall if someone died shortly after these encounters. 
not even sure if a white wolf dog is an omen for trouble like owls are. And the Seneca and Iroquois in general don't necessarily have stories about skinwalkers. But a lot of our cosmology and tradition relied around stories of witches and them being shapeshifters. Not that I think that's what this is, but there was something so unnatural about that creature not having a tail and the color of his eyes. His eyes felt human and like something more than a dog was looking at me. I have a husky mixed res dog now. She has one brown eye and one that's half blue and half brown. She's my best friend and protector. I can't imagine life without her. It wasn't the abnormal color of this creature's eyes, but what lay behind them that really scared me. Mysterious Explosions and Unexplained Noises To start, I live on and off at my dad's farm, located in rural southern Brazil. The farm is located on what used to be a limestone quarry some 30-odd years ago. A few remnants of that still remain strewn about the farm, such as an old minecart and its tracks, a huge brick limestone furnace thing, some overgrown dirt paths where trucks used to drive, and some factory walls and equipment. The nearest town is about a five-minute drive away, and has around 10,000 people in it, consisting mostly of nice, simple country folk. Most of the farm is a big forest area, because it's a fazenda de reflorestamento, meaning that we sell trees and plant them again and such. The following events are in chronological order, although I can't pinpoint the exact day and month where some stuff took place. Before I moved back here this year, I'd spent the first half of 2022 here and moved back to my hometown for the later half of my final year of high school. My mom and brother lived with me back in her hometown as she was waiting for my brother to finish that year of middle school and for me to finish high school to move to the farm and join my dad and my older sister, who were already living there full time. It was a cold night in early November of last year when my dad told me that he and his sister were woken up by two large explosions in the woods behind our house. My dad was having, or my dad, having been a gun odor, ugh, this is written crazy. My dad, having been a gun owner, is well aware of the noise that weapons can make, and said that this was nowhere near a gunshot and more along the realm of some sort of explosive detonation. The whole house seemed to be shaking and to be vibrating, and the windows also shook in a very intense way. Our guard dogs were woken up and started barking like crazy at the direction where the noise was coming from, but they did not move. At first, I was quite skeptical of what my father and sister had been believing or been telling me. Believing it was nothing more than a bit of a tell-tale to scare me, my brother who was just moving into town, and by that, the farm. Until a couple of months later, in early 2023, when my mom, my brother, and I, my sister had to go back to her house for a bit and my dad was traveling for work, were woken up by those same explosions that my father had described. I was laying in bed preparing to fall asleep when it happened and it seemed like someone had blown up a gas tank a couple of meters from the house. The window shook and I desperately tried grabbing my phone to record some sound if there was another explosion. But in the pitch darkness of my room and the desperation of not knowing what was going on made me forget I had left it plugged at the outlet and it was across the room from my bed. The second explosion and once again the walls and windows shake. I exited my room just to find my brother and mom had done the same thing, both standing in the living room. My brother, who's 14, was visibly frightened by what had just happened and was telling everyone to be quiet just in case whatever had made that explosion could hear us. Me, being the paranormal and extraterrestrial fanatic, really wanting to look out the back window to see what made that noise, but instead did what I thought would be the safest option closed every window and curtain in the house that was still opened. I did not want to see whatever made that noise, my mind trailing off into stories of aliens and skinwalkers and such, 
so I decided that it would be better off not looking than accidentally catching a glimpse of what if anything was out there in the pitch black darkness of the woods behind my house. While closing one of the blinds, I caught a glimpse of one of the guard dogs just sitting in the front garden, looking up as if over the house to something in a tree canopy behind it. It was quite difficult to go back to sleep that night, but nothing more happened that day. Talking to my dad about what I had experienced, he said the explosions that we had heard were just the same as the ones that he had heard in November. Nothing weird has happened for a while, when one day, late at night, my mother was woken up by a very loud jet engine-like noise. By the way, we don't live near any major airports, and the planes that do fly over us are very high up, so we can't really hear them. And it seemed to be coming from the top of our house, and only seemed to be getting louder and louder until it ceased instantly. Curiously, no one else was woken up that night. I also had one of these experiences with the loud jet engine noise myself. It was around 2 a.m. and I was laying down in the living room couch, playing Fallout New Vegas, doing the Boomer Quest line. When I start hearing what I can only describe as if a plane was flying past your house but never actually went anywhere so all you heard was the same noise and it wouldn't stop. I was wearing headphones so firstly I thought it was coming from the in-game. But when I removed them, I could still hear it, and it sounded like it was coming from on top of the house. Freaked out by this, I saved my game and turned off all the lights and went to my room, to be safe or something along those lines, when it suddenly stopped. We've had some other experiences at this farm, like my parents and seemingly our dogs, seeing a quote-unquote ghost kid run past the house and disappear into the forest. Our neighbor telling us about how she and her dad found some sort of Brazilian folklore beast called the Corpo Seco, which is basically a zombie, dead body sort of being that wanders around the forest. Along with some creepy stories from people that have lived around this area for longer than I have. Me and some of my family members have had some other paranormal experiences happen to us, but so far, those are the only ones that happened since we moved here. Story number one, Thoughts About the Paranormal. Point zero zero three five percent That's how much a human eye can see from the entire electromagnetic spectrum. What is left, human brain fills that up on the information that it gets, including smell, taste, or sound. Speaking of sound, our hearing is also on the lower end, only from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. 1600 hertz, if you're an adult. Everything below or above that that we basically just can't hear or experience. The world is full of colors, sounds, and smells that we cannot comprehend as a human species. What lies beyond our senses? Invisible forms? Energy? Spirits, paranormal. Thinking about paranormal, it strikes me weirdly that if the spectrum of our senses are so low, then can we even see if there is something? What is the usual evidence people brought up when talking about the paranormal? EVP sounds, pictures, stories, personal experiences? Think about this for a moment. If beyond our sense lies something that we cannot understand, or even have a clear idea about, how can we know about it? This fraction of reality we usually bring up when we try and say that I experienced something paranormal, or I saw something paranormal, or I heard something that I cannot explain. It all has to operate in the spectrum that we're capable of understanding and experiencing. Nothing can go beyond that. Why am I so keen to find something in the field? what basically is less than 1% of the reality that I do experience. How do I go deeper or break boundaries? Is it even possible? I'm not saying or suggesting that there's nothing beyond that, because quite the opposite. 
I believe everything is beyond this realm, which we perceive so little of. Sadly, the fact is that I, we, live in a reality that we can experience next to nothing. There is one place, though, where I can break reality, and that is in my dreams. People all around the world have experienced stuff in their dreams. This is not always just dreams that tell you the future, not dead relatives, no ghosts or time travelers, but ideas, inspirations, answers, and revelations. Dreams may be one of the most underrated places where we're doing our hunt for the paranormal. Maybe it is because we have been so used to the idea that dreams do not equal reality. We cannot bring anything from dreams to this world, aside from the vague memories that we got. What if the technology advances so that we can now document our dreams? Would you take it? Would I take it? There are reasons why nightmares stay inside of our head, and not so often carry out into the real world. Ones that do usually haunt me for months. Thought that by some futuristic dream capturing machine I can bottle up that nightmare and look at it. Same time it terrifies me, at the same time the idea is sort of enchanting. What could I find from my dreams if I'd remembered them to be, you know, the finest of details? Another way I can experience something beyond my natural senses are to scramble up my brain via drugs. Psychedelic experiences are one of the most common subjects. Whenever I talk about anything paranormal or experiences beyond our natural spectrum. There is a catch, though. Because the brain is tricky, it shows something there that is not. I was a kid when last time had a wicked fever so bad that I saw things. I saw a bunch of toys cleaning up my room. Not much of an astounding paranormal experience, thinking back. What is real in reality? What is paranormal in normal? I remember my friend who used all kinds of drugs when he was a young adult, and I always remember him telling me about his most traumatic experience. I won't go into details, but I can tell you about the aftermath. I remember him saying that he locked himself in his room at his school campus, and he wouldn't come out because he wasn't sure what was real and what was not. He said that the most horrifying thought about tripping balls was that the line between reality and not reality was suddenly gone. How could he, in the sound, sight, smells, disassociate? and tell apart what was not real, because it all felt like living, breathing reality to him. He waited for a week for his brains to calm down, and then he could somehow tell what in fact was real and what was not. So maybe there's a part of my thoughts each day. Everything I can get out in English, because it's not my native language, so my ways of telling and explaining my experiences, thoughts, or ideas are sadly limited. Like our senses. Happy Halloween month, everybody. Stay safe, stay interested, stay in touch with reality, no matter how small it is for us. I like this guy. I want to read more from him. Story number 16. Experiences throughout my life. My earliest experience that I can remember is when I was only about 10. My mother was a neighborhood mom to all, and that means all the kids. Although we weren't well off, she managed to make every child feel like, you know, taken care of, of which included giving some sort of a place to stay if they needed it. My brother had a friend whose mom had passed away. He was always at her house. Even though his grandmother lived a block down, he slept there, ate there, and he was in a nutshell just another member of our home. Me being young and knowing nothing of his mother, 
not who she was, what she looked like, or her name. I asked him why he was always there. He told me his mom had passed away from being sick, and that her house was his home away from home. We made him feel like family. As time went on, he pretty much permanently lived there. Even when my blood older siblings moved out, he was still there. One night I had a dream. In the dream, I was sitting on the couch playing N64. It had just come out. There was a knock on the door. I was the only one home and knew better than to answer it. But for whatever reason, I did. There was a woman. She was short, had black hair with bangs sunken in face. But you could tell she had high cheeks, not the best of teeth. She just had a really sad look to her eyes. Is he here? I was unsure of the he, because there were three males in my house. I asked who. She replied, My son, I haven't seen him in a long time, and I know he's here a lot, and I miss him. Although I was dreaming, even in my dream, not knowing who this was, I just knew who she was referring to. I said, No, he's not here. Do you want me to tell him to go to his grandma's house if he comes here? She replied, No, I'll make sure to find him soon. If he comes here, tell me. I miss him and I love him. I'm sorry there's so much missing, so much no one knows. I woke up abruptly. I had this overwhelming sense of sadness. I just remember thinking, what the hell just happened? I've never had a dream like that. I didn't know how to make sense of it. Eventually, my adopted without the court siblings came home. Hey, do you have a picture of your mom? He looked at me with a confused look on his face. No, I don't. Mom wasn't around much, and I hadn't seen her in a long time. Why? Why are you asking that? I told him I had a dream about a woman. I think it was her. The look on his face has always sat with me. What did she look like? I sat quiet for a minute, and asked again that time, more like a tell-me-right-now sort of a tone. She was short, black, shorter hair, sunken in eyes. Her teeth were kind of dirty. The look on his face told me everything. I needed to know. This was real. He immediately started asking questions. What'd she say? What'd she do? Where'd the dream take place? I said, she said that she misses you. She hasn't seen you in a long, long time, and that she's sorry there's so much missing that no one knows. What does that mean? The stuff missing and the no one knows. He cried, and when I say cried, he cried hard. He said, I don't know, I don't know, but if you dream about her again, tell me. Tell her to visit me at mine, please. Tell her see me in my dreams. And if she can't, please, please tell her I miss her. I never dreamt of her again, though. He never spoke on this again, either. Years later, I'm reading a news article on a serial killer that was never caught. I'm choosing not to state what the name of the killer was for my own personal reasons, but I assure you it can be found on Google with a very quick search. As I'm skimming the article, I see the woman. It was her. She didn't have the same last name, though, so this being about 20 years back and me needing clarification who else I would call but my mother, of course. My mother explains some things and says that there was a serial killer that killed a specific group of women. This woman's body was never found, but they suspected due to her background and who she was affiliated with that she was in fact a victim of this killing spree. I now understood that there's so much no one knows and so much missing part. I then told my mother the conversation which I had never done before and also explained what he had said that his mother was sick and how that she passed. Her only response was, would you want to tell everybody about the lifestyle your mother lived? After that dream, I've had many more throughout my life. Things of this nature, dreaming of things that were going to happen and that absolutely did. 
That first experience left me wide open to so many more experiences in my future. I've always tried to embrace it. The only person I've been 100% open with telling my experience to is my now boyfriend of two years. Since our first weeks together, he's always told me I've had a gift, and to learn to use it, embrace it harder. I see things. I hear things. I speak things into existence. The Things I Can't Explain I had just come to a new country with my friend and try to find jobs and stay, start a new life and escape my country's crisis. And this was in 2016. On the third day of being here, I went out with my friend to familiarize herself with the city and explore around. We were walking downtown and I saw a young man entering a building. For no reason or at least one that I can explain. I touched the building like tap, tap, tap. As I tell my friend, I'm going to go work in a place like this. That nobody knows what they do and what secrets they have. You know what? I'll work exactly here. We laugh and continue walking. A little while after that, we take the bus to go back to where we were staying. When we're on the bus, I get a phone call. Hey, Elefante Guero. We got your CV and wanted to talk to you. I had applied online to a few jobs that day before, and as soon as I got a SIM card, she invites me for an interview and gives me the address. When I got off the phone, I tell my friend that I had an interview, and we Google the address that she gave me. It was the building I had touched just a while earlier, and we freaked out. I ended up getting the job, too. They sponsored my visa. They said it was the first time for them attempting to sponsor someone's visa, but they'd try for me. I met my husband there, and even though I had some awful times there, I recognized how much it helped me and made my immigration process pretty easy. I worked there for over two years and then moved to another city. After I moved, they changed the company's name and some people were arrested because they had some money laundering going on. So not only did I guess that I was going to work exactly there, but they had some secrets most people didn't know about. It was a legitimate call center for a USA phone carrier for all I knew. When I said that, I didn't know why I said it. I just saw some guy going in. I saw a building with big dark glass windows and I just said it. When I did, we were walking on a sidewalk next to it. And from there, I couldn't see the company name until we turned the corner. I had no idea it was one of the companies I had applied to. It was my first time ever walking that street in the city. We still talk about it sometimes, and my friend calls me a witch. A couple of years after, something similar happened, although this time the odds of it happening were bigger. I still felt very weird, though. I lost my access card to the coworker building. I was at an office, and I noticed I had lost it, so I went to the bathroom that I normally used and the kitchen area, as those were the only two places other than my office I'd been at that day. I didn't find it. I called the front desk and you usually would leave any lost card you found there, but they said they hadn't seen it or received it. I continued my work day accepting I'd probably have to pay for a new card, but before I left, I went again to that bathroom and walked through some hallways, perhaps trying to trigger a memory or something. And I saw a group of women. I thought, this is stupid, hundreds of people work at this floor, asking around won't help but still felt the urge to ask one for help. So I stop her and I say, Hey, by any chance, do you know of a lost access card? And she says, Oh, it's yours. I was about to drop it at the front desk. Sorry, I didn't have the time to leave it earlier. And who told you I had it? I could only shrug and thank her. Although it's not as crazy as the first one, it was still very weird. She was the only person I asked other than the front desk people, and she had it. I can remember in my childhood my cousins calling me Boca de Sapo, which in my country is used to refer to somebody who says something and it comes true. Usually negative stuff. But I don't remember exactly what things I had guessed in those times. 
but those two events are very fresh on my memory as they happened just a few years ago. Honestly, if my friend had not been with me on the first one, I would have convinced myself that I had just imagined it or misremembered it. I've also had instances of my husband reading my mind. For example, once I was looking for something in his closet, and I felt an object in a shirt's pocket. I thought, but didn't say it, I just thought, oh my god, what if someone slid a cursed object in his pocket to do some witchcraft on him? I don't believe much in witchcraft, as I've met so many frauds and fake witch con artists, but... <laughs> witch con artists. But I guess the idea came from stories people have told me. Anyway, it wasn't anything weird, but from the bed I still see my husband sleeping. And he says, What witchcraft? Are you doing witchcraft to me? He then laughs and continues sleeping. On another occasion I'd woken up and I was laying in bed next to him. I was thinking about where we would put an aquarium in our apartment. We had talked about getting one in previous weeks before, but not super recently, like the day before. Also, I had just woken up just a while before, and he hadn't even woken up. Well, in his sleep, he tells me something about the aquarium and goes on sleeping. In both cases, he said he doesn't remember saying anything. I've asked him for us to experiment and try to recreate it, but he says that he doesn't want to get involved with any weird stuff. Story number two. Ask Reddit. Last winter I was driving down the freeway at night, going between suburbs of a large metropolitan area, kind of a thing. So there were plenty of cars around, but it was maybe around midnight or so, and it had been snowing when it isn't always white during winter here. I saw a car pulled over on the shoulder of the freeway with a guy standing next to it, clearly in need of some existence. I saw them as I was driving past, but since it was later at night and it was cold out, I figured I might as well take the next exit, loop around and see if the guy still needed help at that point. So I get there, and it's a middle-aged working class type of guy standing outside of his pickup. He's wearing blue overalls, slender, slightly balding, and puts off what I can only describe as a weird vibe. Couldn't put my finger on it, but it was one of those weird gut feelings that you aren't sure why you feel them. He says that he's been having car troubles. He's from about two hours out of town, and that his alternator is shot, and that his battery needs a boost. I've owned a car with a shot alternator, and know that when the battery dies, you need to boost it for a little while if you're going to get it, you know, running again. I tell him it's no problem, commiserate with him for a minute, pop my hood, and he says he's going to go and grab his cables. When he comes back, I notice in his hand that he has some sort of concealed metal object. No clue what it was. I saw it for just a brief moment, and saw that it wasn't a knife but that it was metal and a little shorter than the length of his hand. And he was clearly trying to keep it concealed from my view. This all happens so fast and I'm immediately on high alert. I see it for a split second as he's bringing the cables to me that I can hook up to my battery. I instantly take a step back to put some distance between us and tell him that he can hook up my battery and I'll wait in the car. All the while, in an instantaneous full fight or flight, getting ready to just block an attack if he were to lunge at me. He doesn't, and starts connecting the cables to my car as I'm sitting in my car. I start to wonder if I was imagining things as he connects the battery, and we both wait for the battery to charge. Maybe it was just something that was bundled in with the cables that he just had in his hand. Maybe I misread the situation as dangerous. After a few minutes, he goes to start his car, shouts that it isn't working, and then walks back towards my car where he waits in front of it. After a few minutes of waiting, he puts his head back underneath the hood of my car to fiddle with the cables. 
All the while, I'm of course watching him intently to make sure that he doesn't come to the car window. Because I was still spooked. He shouts some things about how it isn't working, asks me to come out and take a look. I open my window a bit, casually tell him not to worry. That's probably just going to take some time. Luckily, I can just barely see my battery in the dark through the gap underneath the popped hood of my car through the windshield directly in front of me. I see him then fiddle with the cables and hear him shout again that it isn't working and for me to come out. Then I see him slip out the metal object I had seen earlier, and I see him touch it to my battery terminal as sparks shoot out from where he touched it. He starts yelling and jumps back. I immediately jump out of my car and I tell him that something came up and that I needed to go now. I honestly don't remember much of what else he was trying to say as I cut him off, or exactly what I said. Outside of that, I needed to get the fuck out without taking my eyes off him for even a half a second. I don't even remember how the cables came off my battery. Did I pull them? Were they already off? But I slammed the hood shut, jumped in my car, and drove off. I still have no idea what his plan was. No clue what he was trying to do or what on earth he was trying to make happen. But I do know for a fact that what I saw him do is in no way what he was telling me he was doing. But as I left him there and drove off, I was practically pinching myself trying to make heads or tails of what the hell just happened. And I cannot stress this enough, that the guy just gave off the weirdest vibes, like the hills have eyes kind of weird vibes. Maybe he was planning on trying to short my battery so that I was stuck there too. But still to this day, I wonder if I encountered some sort of mass murderer who had been planning on kidnapping somebody at the side of the freeway as they stopped to help. Who knows? But either way, it was weird as fuck. And it right spooked me, and I noped the hell away from that dude as fast as it was humanly possible. I still wish that I'd gotten a license plate or something to give to the cops. But in that moment, the only thing going through my mind was just to remove myself from that situation as fast as humanly possible. The Lady in the Purple Dress When I was about four or five years old, my grandmother from my father's side took me to a relative's house in the countryside, where a family reunion would take place. I remember it being a very elegant yet antique structure, with a cobblestone base and a tall mahogany wall. To be honest, everything seemed tall at that time, because it was indeed taller than me. The house itself was built next to a lake, which was so deep in certain spots that the water looked like a portal to a void, black, seemingly empty. I, who was always excited at the sight of a body of water and the possibilities of being able to play in it, stared deeply at that lake. Ignoring the scary-looking water, I immediately started to get ready to go for a swim. I think I was the first one ready, actually. As the rest of my family got ready, I ran towards the lake shore and slowly dipped my foot into the water. To this day, I still remember the way it felt. In contrast to the ever-hot tropical weather, this lake felt like a tundra. It didn't just feel like the cold feeling of a breezy winter night. It was the type of cold that one feels when in a state of absolute terror. The feeling crawled up my legs and up into my spine and I slowly walked into the lake water enveloping me. As I walked, I could feel the wet, slimy rocks beneath my feet, threatening to betray my step at any moment. When the water hit my waist, their threats became a promise, and I slipped and full fell into the water. Oops. Fell fully into the water. I panicked as water went into my mouth and nose and quickly opened my eyes underneath the water to process what had just happened. The panic increased as my lungs started to fill with water. I swallowed what seemed to be a gallon of water before I felt a hand grab me and firmly pull me up. My grandmother stared back at me with a mix of fright, shock, and relief at the same time. 
She scolded me for trying to act grown and not waiting for the adults to accompany me. I coughed up water as she carried me out of the lake and into the house. We went inside a random room that had a bathroom attached, and she set me down on a tall sink counter, which was situated right in front of the bathtub. Still scolding me, she told me to stay still and left me all by myself for a moment. I heard her exit the room and close the door. Tears started pouring from my eyes from the scare of almost drowning and my even bigger fright of disappointing my grandmother. How unlucky was I to almost drown in waist-deep water and risk a spanking on top of that? Not very, not in the least. My luck deteriorated even further when the weight of me leaning forward to wipe my tears and rub my eyes made me fall from the counter. Even at that age, I knew I would either die or be seriously injured. Time slowed down to a crawl as I saw the edge of the bathtub get closer and closer. My head was an egg about to get cracked open. I closed my eyes waiting for the impact. But it never came. The smell of fresh lavender emerged suddenly like a soft mist. The feeling of soft satin fabric pressing against me feeling comforting. The touch of a woman's delicate hand made my eyes open in surprise. Her mocha-colored face was detailed beautifully by wrinkles. Her dark eyes were kind and motherly. She felt cold, but a comfortable kind of cold, like the cool side of a pillow. We stared into each other's eyes for what seemed like a lifetime. I could sense something was wrong with her, though. Despite being pressed against her torso, I never felt it rise nor fall. I never felt a heartbeat. Despite our faces being so close together, I never felt the gentle air of her exhale. Now that I think about it, she looked more like a wax figure than a person. The same expression locked on her face even after I said thank you. Slowly, she kneeled and set me down on the floor on my rear. And just as suddenly as she was there, she disappeared. I stayed still on the floor, still looking in the place that she was. When my grandmother came back and saw me on the floor, she freaked out. There was no way I would have been able to hop off the counter without injuring myself in some way. With a smile, I explained to her what happened. I told her about the nice lady and how she saved me. I could sense her confusion and watched her purse her lips, getting ready to say something, and then pausing. After composing herself a bit, she said, There's nobody wearing a purple dress in the house. Then I learned the reason why we went to the lake house in the first place. A remembrance ceremony. Among the bouquets of lavender flowers, I saw a picture that made me freeze. It was the lady in the purple dress. She had been dead for ten years. She drowned in the lake, and her favorite flowers were lavender. They buried her in her favorite purple dress. The third tunnel at the DMZ is haunted. In 2018, I went on a semester abroad in Korea, and one of our weekend trips was to visit the demilitarized zone, the DMZ, between North and South Korea. I wanted to go because I thought it was important for me to understand the place. I was in better than just a short academic visitation, too. We drove up in a tour bus and spent almost the whole day going there, being there and coming back. Visiting the actual border of the DMZ wasn't that unnerving. The folks stationed there were very nice, and even though they warned us to mind our P's and Q's, I was still at a relative ease. I knew I had to be very respectful of this space, and tried not to goof off around or take pictures of too many things. It was really educational and enlightening. Here's where the weird stuff begins. We got back on the bus, drove up the road, and we were invited to walk down the actual excavated third tunnel under the DMZ. 
There were virtually no animals anywhere around. No birds, no bugs, no wildlife at all. The area is like a grassland with some trees, so I expected there to be some birds or squirrels or even mosquitoes since it was going into spring. But there was literally nothing except the people who worked there and our tour group. They started to make me uncomfortable because even at the actual border there were some pigeons and crows. It immediately had my hackles up. There was supposed to be a shuttle that goes all the way down to the armistice clock, but it was being repaired, so we had to walk. The further we walked down the tunnel, I felt like I was walking through rising water. It started at my ankles, then up to my knees, my waist, and by the time we got close to the armistice clock, I felt like it was all the way up to my neck. I started walking on the balls of my feet with my chin up on reflex because I had the physical sensation that I was trying to wade through neck deep water. I didn't notice until my friend asked me why I was walking funny. When I walked normal, I felt the water was over my head and I couldn't breathe. When I got to the armistice clock, I felt dizzy. My vision was getting spotty and I wanted to turn back. I couldn't move my feet from where I was standing felt like something was pushing at my chest, and all of a sudden it felt like I wasn't myself. It felt like I was someone else. I looked down and felt like I was wearing the wrong clothes. I remember thinking, I'm out of my uniform. I kept trying to push the thoughts away and leave, but I couldn't move. I felt frozen. I was staring at the wall behind the clock. A wall that was supposed to be a barrier to keep people from using the tunnel to move between the north and the south. Even though I couldn't actually see anything but the wall, my brain felt like I was looking at a woman and her son. I don't know how to describe it. I guess it's like you're not looking at something, but your brain is receiving some information telling you that you are. I felt like I knew them. And the longer I stood there, the more people I thought were there. I remember thinking, there's 12 of them kept stepping closer and closer until one of my friends asked me what I was doing. I didn't even realize I was moving from where I was originally standing, which was about three or four feet back from the clock. I couldn't snap out of it until my other friend tapped my shoulder and said that we have to go back up and get to the bus. Then I turned around, looked at my friend, and I didn't recognize her. When I turned around to leave, I remember hearing the woman say, Wait, where are you going? When I kept walking, I heard her say, please don't leave us down here. I wanted to cry. I didn't start feeling like myself until I got back on the bus and dropped off my backpack and stopped at the gift shop before we went back to campus. Apparently I looked terrified. The cashier asked me if I was okay, and when I said I was, she kind of gave me a funny look. I eventually got over it until my friend went to Korea on a semester abroad last fall. They went to the DMZ again, and I asked him if anything weird happened. He told me that he felt the feeling of rising water, and even the weirdest out-of-body feeling at the end of the tunnel. The tunnel doesn't end, you're just past the border, but the end that we stopped at was the clock and the wall. If you go further, like right to the wall, you get in huge trouble and I wasn't going to risk that after already feeling strange. He told me that there was this film that they watched after the tunnel that documented its history, like when the tunnel was completely flooded to keep people from using it to move between countries. I missed the film because it took me forever to get up the ramp for some reason. I mean, I knew I was out of shape, but I felt like I got hit by a freight train for some reason. So I walked around the museum looking at some photos of the Peace Talk complex construction and the different complexes that are around the DMC, like the housing for people stationed there, and for workers at the Kaesong Industrial Complex, which has been decommissioned for a long time now. I never knew the language, but this word came to my mind and I saw how it was written when instinctively I closed my eyes a second later. Not the first time it happened. Some things about me before I start in order to understand. 
For generations, both sides of my family, maternal and paternal, have been able to do weird things according to stories and experiences that I've heard. And it's especially in women. It's stronger on my mom's side, though. My dad's side, not so much. Also, there's schizophrenia running in that side, so many things I've heard could be that illness. I grew up with my dad's sister showing schizophrenia, and as a child, I was unofficially seen by a psychiatrist, just because he was there for my aunt. And I had seen her breakdown, so my dad worried about my mental health. One of those times I heard the psychiatrist warn my dad about possibly having depression and anxiety, which I have been battling since I was eight. I'm in a better place with no medication for that. Yet, women on my mom's side of the family can and could see the dead in their sleep. They had astral projected and saw car accidents and last moments of loved ones. Saw entire days in the dreams. And we were raised to respect our ancestors just as much as the Orthodox Christian saints, the faith I was raised in. As for my dad's side of the family, there are claims of seeing precognitive dreams and the dead. I do believe in precognitive dreams because I and my sister have them, but the dead, I'm sure, it was the schizophrenia. Now things get weird with me. I started showing signs, a ten-year-old child, but no one noticed besides some grand-aunts and my grandmas who warned me not to stand upon this and keep using my normal senses. They never taught me how to control or really what it was. It was a known secret in my family, though. I was always told that I acted older than I was, then started acting weird, asking weird questions, saying things before I could stop myself, and they later came true. The déjà vu, the precognitive dreams, the déjà revi, or reve, predicting that a woman I had merely days known was three weeks pregnant before she even knew it herself. I was many times told to be careful what I said, and when people learned I was born on Saturday, they would say that I too should be careful. In Greece, being born on Saturday is maybe a gift or a curse to others, or at least that's what I was told when I was pressed for more answers about grandmother of a classmate. They started to curse my name and family in Pontiac dialect. The moment she learned what day I was born, and almost kicked me out of my friend's house. Then I learned that I was born dead and revived 20 minutes later, and on the same day at the same time in the other side of Greece, my mom's dead suffered a stroke. I think they mean my mom's dad suffered a stroke and flatlined for the exact amount of time, and the first words he spoke before falling into a coma were, I saved her now. Now she has to fight to my aunt, his oldest daughter. When I learned that being born dead on Saturday was far worse according to my grand aunt, I stopped liking my birthday. Now on to the main reason for posting. A couple of minutes ago I was watching a YouTube video of Trey Kennedy, a comedian of sorts, when the word mob came to my mind, but pronounced Mombe. Yet, I saw it being written M-O-B-E. I instantly Google translated, and the language that put me in was Sana. So I Googled the language, which is Cyprusian Arabic language, if I translate it correctly from Greek to English. Never heard of that language before in my life, and according to Google Translate, Mob, or Mobi, or Mombe, means bad. And mumbe, with the E at the end, means cow. It's the third time something like this has happened, but the second time with a word of a language that I never heard before. The first one being the word sitma, which according to Google Translate, it means in the seat in Gujarati, an Indian language, according to my research. I still remember my dad's look when I said sitma, just before I opened the kitchen cupboard. And you know what we were talking about? He had asked me where his folded clothes were, and soon enough, they were in the seat behind him. He looked confused and asked me what I had said. 
I turned and told him that I didn't know that it just came out, and then pointed to the clothes and said in Greek, They're in the seat behind you. The third time was the word aboriginals, and I don't know why. What's happening, and what is that? Why does it happen? Does anyone on here know what this is? If any of you on here could help me with this, it would be life-changing. This has caused me extreme distress, and I would do anything to finally fix it. I started meditating about five years ago. I had done it before, but not as deep as I was going now. I don't know if it was the technique or what, but the method I was doing was training me to go longer and longer without a single thought. It was simply sit down, feel your body, and that was it. If you have a thought, let it go, and focus on the feeling of your body. So longer and longer I would go without a thought over the coming months. I did this for sleep. I've always had insomnia since I was in middle school. And it worked. I was finally beginning to get to sleep on my own. Usually I had to take an over-the-counter sleeping pill. But something started to happen the longer this would go on. Over time, and I swear this was real and I'm not making this up, and it has caused me extreme distress. Over time, as I would often meditate, I would start to hear sounds. The TV would start clicking. Almost as if it was like it was cold and then it got hot. You know, like it was settling. Same with the knocks on the walls. The knocks would sound like an old house readjusting to different temperatures. That's what the sound sounded like. Okay, no big deal, just a click in the TV or a creak in the walls. But the more I meditated, day after day, the more these sounds would pick up an activity, and I noticed that I wasn't hearing them when I wasn't meditating. Maybe once a day I would hear the sounds. So the sounds seemed to be related to my meditations themselves. But I kept meditating. It was weird, but it wasn't anything distressing. But as the days went by, I would put myself into such a deep state that when I heard a sound, I would jump out of my state real quick like you would if somebody was to jump scare you. They seemed to be getting louder, too. Around this time, a new phenomenon started happening started having involuntary movements. Now, when I was in that state of no thought, I had sound activity picking up to jump scare me, and now my arms and legs would randomly jerk. And again, it seemed to only happen when I meditated. And at first, the involuntary movement was light, but as time would go on, my arms, legs, and head would jerk more and more violently. The weird thing was, all this stuff would affect my meditation, and immediately take me out of that state that I had cultivated. Yet, I still meditated daily. The next thing that started happening was I would start to realize the knocks on the wall weren't the only sounds I was hearing. I was hearing furniture moving in the other room. And now this activity was not only happening when I meditated, but all the time when I was alone in my house. It got so bad that one day I was taking a shower and I thought I heard someone break into my house. It sounded like somebody kicking in my front door. And I'd get out of the shower and look around and there was nothing. It got to the point where I was hearing all these noises all the time that I couldn't tell if somebody else was in the house or not. Worst of all, the scariest part, was it would also pick up its activity when I would read would make a noise the exact time I would quote-unquote get into the book, effectively preventing me from being able to read. It felt extremely creepy, like there was a ghost deliberately tormenting me that was able to tell when my mind would get into a sort of state. It felt like a conscious entity that was sent to torment me and prevent me from going any further or any deeper into a meditative state. 
It also seemed to be purposefully trying to make me feel like somebody was in the house when I was alone. There was an incident where I heard this super strange noise in the middle of the living room. My cat jumped almost out of her skin, she got so spooked. This activity never happened when I had someone else in the house with me. This caused me so much despair and distress that I began to drink as alcohol is the only thing that made it kind of stop. It's been five years since all of that, and I'm now sober for a month. First time being sober since this happened. When I started drinking because of all this, I began to drink every night so I could sleep and at least had a couple of hours every day to be free from the torment. But I'm ready to start practicing spiritually again and meditating, but I have to know what all that activity and torment was all about. What it was, what caused it, and how to prevent it. Great Grandfather's Friend This story has haunted my family for four generations. I visited my great-grandparents frequently as a small boy. My great-grandfather was a tall man with a sense of humor of a teenager. We genuinely connected, despite our obvious age gap. One day my grandparents left with me and him in the air, and it was kind of different in the house that day, you could say. He was more somber, and sat and appeared almost callous in his rocking chair. I was young, but I knew he was disturbed by something, and I just had to know what. So without thinking, I asked him rather bluntly, What's got you all upset, old man? I usually called him old man as a joke, and some part of me was hoping for a verbal jab might lighten the mood. Thankfully, this did seem to pull him from whatever mental ocean he was pondering. He grinned at me and said in a rather low voice, What do you think? I was crazy if I told you a ghost story. This was a weird and uncharacteristic thing for him, so I nearly stepped back. Some part of me thought that he was beginning to slip mentally even though he had never shown any other signs. No, I wouldn't think you were crazy. I wasn't actually sure if I believed this, to be honest. Part of me was scared that he might do something uncharacteristic. Something about older people going insane scared me a lot as a kid. I remember being freaked out by a Ben 10 episode with old people attacking the main characters. But he smirked at me and told me this. I grew up with a man named Jeremiah. He was my neighbor in the house beside this one when I was a kid. We played together when we were very young and were best friends throughout high school. I joined the military and he went to college. However, when I finally came home after being stationed in Japan for about six years, we reconnected. One weekend, we decided to go hunting together. We planned the trip and were packing up the night before. When that morning came for us to leave, something in my stomach felt off. I felt nervous and I wasn't really sure why. The whole time driving, I couldn't settle my nerves and nearly called the whole thing off, thinking I had some kind of breakdown. However, I was finally able to swallow it and got us to where we needed to go. I parked the truck and Jeremiah parked next to my truck. He mentioned he was having some kind of motion sickness on the way to our spot. I mentioned I had similar symptoms and we shrugged it off thinking maybe it was the road. Walking through the woods I came across a clearing. I didn't remember when I originally set up the spot. The air felt light and it felt like every instinct I had told me to turn around and go home. I pushed through. And about halfway through the clearing, I realized I had heard footsteps and breathing right behind me. The wind seemed to spiral around the clearing and my nerves finally broke and I wanted to leave. I told Jeremiah to step back a bit, but when I looked back, he wasn't there. I called for him a bit and used the whistle I packed, hoping he would hear it and say something or whistle back. When he didn't, I ran towards where we were parked until I made it back to my truck. His truck was gone and I immediately got upset that he just dumped me in the woods without saying anything. I drove back pissed and went to his house to figure out what was going on. When I got there, his parents were there, 
They passed the house on to him when he turned 20 and hadn't lived there in a few years. When I asked them about when Jeremiah would be back, they looked at me shocked, saying that they never had a son named Jeremiah. I was very confused by this and eventually started asking everyone else. Nobody had ever heard of him. He wasn't in our yearbooks or school pictures. The only evidence that he ever existed was the list of things that we packed for the camping trip that I still have. It's worn and old now, but it has his name and what he was expecting to bring. He looked a little downtrodden when he finished the story and I didn't really know what to say. I remember hugging him and hoping that he wasn't losing it. When my grandfather picked me up to go back home, since I was raised by my grandparents, I told my grandfather that I thought his dad may be starting to need more help being looked after and started to tell him the story that I was told before he cut me off. He isn't beginning to lose it just yet. He's been telling that story with that paper in his wallet since I was a kid. He told it to your dad when he was growing up as well. I believe him, or at least that he truly believes it. I didn't know how to take this since my grandfather didn't believe in ghosts, aliens, or cryptids. I still think about it sometimes since my great-grandfather has passed, and I still have the packing list for the hunting trip him and Jeremiah were supposed to go on. Story number 10, The Pocono Mountain Skinwalker. Every summer since I was six, starting in 2012, I've gone to a sleepaway camp up in the Poconos. The camp was around 5,000 kids at the time and had a relatively good reputation. This previous summer, being 2022, I encountered what I believe was a skinwalker or something of that type. For some backstory, many really bad things have happened at that camp in the past five years. My skate instructor got kicked out and was sent to an asylum for going quote-unquote insane. The owner saw something in the street and crashed into a tree where he cracked his entire skull in half. There were also demonic symbols carved into the burn pit. They weren't able to figure out who did it, but just assumed it was kids trying to be edgy or counselors trying to mess with each other. But basically, aside from these creepy things, it's a normal camp. Kids do dumb shit like smoke weed, sneak out, hook up, whatever. But a pretty normal experience. So it was my final summer at camp, so I decided to make it worth it. I was going to sneak out as much as possible. So most people just wanted to sleep, so the first few nights I would just sneak out alone and go to this tiny pavilion at the top of the camp for phone reception. There was a tiny path through the woods behind my cabin that was basically abandoned, but it was a really quick way up to the upper field, and I wouldn't have to worry about getting caught, since it's above main camp. For three nights in a row I walked up there, and the best way to explain the feeling of walking in the wooded part every night was an impending feeling of doom. I just felt like I was being watched and like I was going to die, but being the rational person that I try to be, I would say to myself, of course it feels like you're being watched, there's animals and bears, all that. So I continued, and on the third night as I was walking, I genuinely felt a sense that I was going to die. I got up to the pavilion, which is on a flat field, and stayed there with my flashlight on. That was until sunrise, and eventually made my way back down to the cabin. The next night, these two guys invited my friend and I to go smoke, so it's 2.30 a.m. and we got ready and headed out. I felt much better having a friend with me, and as we were joking around and overall excited, I thought I was just being paranoid. We make our way down to the canteen, which is just a large, wide, empty hallway with booths lining one side and arcade machines lining the other. It is pitch black, and since we don't have any service, we assumed that they may be in the bathroom, which is located at the back of the corridor. As we make our way back, we see a black figure at the end of the hallway, which is an open half wall to the outside. 
We scream half jokingly and the figure just stays put. We start yelling. Who is it? Come on. Assuming that it was the counselor or the guys. We move closer, maybe seven-ish feet now, and shine our flashlights on the figure and it runs into the bathroom. We wait outside the bathroom for ten minutes confused as to why we haven't heard a toilet flush or giggling. Trying to figure out who's in there and why they're being so secretive about it. Note, the bathroom has no windows and no way out, other than the door that we're now standing outside of. So we wait as we're holding our breath, trying to hear any sound of life, like breathing footsteps. But there's nothing. Eventually, after 15 minutes, we count down from three and tell them to pull their pants up, jokingly, because we're coming in. We go in and there's no one in there. No sign that anyone could have been there. My friend and I look at each other, obviously weirded out, not wanting to say anything, and my friend, who's the furthest from believing any sort of supernatural stuff, just told me to run and not look back. When we get back up to the cabin, we go to the bathroom and close the door. I ask her why we had to run and joke about how someone was just probably trying to mess with us. She looks at me more scared than I ever would have thought. And to see her... And she says, if we put her flashlights on it, why is it still pitch black? I couldn't see any clothing or features or anything other than just the outline of a person. I think about this too and smile and say, we should have probably just head to bed. I wasn't able to sleep all night and all I could think about was that it better have been my mind playing tricks on me whether from being in the dark or from being tired. Like how you see shadows out of the corner of your eye when you haven't slept in a while. Story number 13. We saw Bigfoot. Back in 1989, I was with my boyfriend, Eddie, his best friend, my older sister, Angie, and about six other people. We had spent the entire day mudding in the Royal Palm mud flats in Royal Palm Beach, Florida, otherwise known as part of Palm Beach County. I grew up in West Palm Beach. I'd never seen anything like this before or since. After mudding all day, we decided to call it a night and leave. Almost everyone was gone by then, so we were all piled into Eddie's truck and left. Eddie saw a small mud hole and drove through it as one last hurrah for the night. We got stuck. That small hole was deceptive. When I say we got stuck, I mean we were stuck for hours. I was pregnant with my first, so I was steering as the other guys were pushing. That truck didn't budge. We had no choice but to wait until morning for someone to come and pull us out as we were now on our own. At about 5 a.m., we decided that we should just relax and try to sleep until someone comes through. Eddie, I, and his bestie were in the front. My sister and the other six, who were still friends with this pretty much to this day, piled into the back, started to settle down. We were still making noise when I heard a sound. It was a rumbling growl. I knew immediately that it was some type of animal told everyone to hush and listen. Then we all heard it. It was getting louder and more aggressive sounding. Eddie has a KC light behind his seat. He popped out, grabbed it, plugged it in, and lit the night up. That's when our world changed. Ten of us had our world rocked in a way that we never expected. This thing ducked down and moved. Everyone was starting to freak out because it was clearly there. But what was it? Then it got pissed. This thing stood straight up, let out a roar that I can still hear 31 years later. Leapt the large bush that it was standing behind and charged us. You could feel the earth literally shake with every running step that it took. It was easily eight to nine feet tall and it was broad. It looked like an extremely large man with hair, not fur. It had hair and lots of it. The KC lit it up and you could see the clumping of the hair. The 
smell was rotten and sour. Being pregnant, I was extremely sensitive to smells, and it was bad. We spent hours, we're talking five plus hours, trying to push this truck out. They say that adrenaline, well, it just gives you super strength. And they're right. Eddie turned on his truck and started pushing on his door frame. His bestie leapt out of side and did the same. My sister and the other six let out screams as they piled out, and then all you heard was this thing running and roaring. Everyone else was dead silent as they put everything they had into pushing this truck out. With a sucking pop that I can also still hear, we were out, and they were throwing themselves into the back of Eddie, and his bestie just jumped in and floored it. This is woods with tight turns, and we flew around those turns. It felt like the devil himself was chasing us. After we got out and onto the main road, we headed for a gas station to calm down and call our families. When we got there, we all got out, sat with our backs to the wall, and that was it. We never said a word to each other, just silence. I think we were too raw, scared and in complete shock over what happened. This was lore. This wasn't real, they don't exist. Yet, there it was. After we all called our parents, we basically went home, one by one being dropped off, not a word spoken. My sister and I didn't discuss this until about five years ago. We finally opened up about that night and have slowly talked to the others. 25 years after the fact, and every single one of us that have spoken about it have the same exact story and memory forever burned into their minds. It wasn't cool. It was scary. I think the reason we couldn't talk about it for so long was because our brains were in denial at first, and then we didn't know how to open up about it. Now I can look back and say, holy crap, we saw freaking Bigfoot. Whatever lived there did not like me. Stories from an estate agent. I've been working as a property agent in the UK for the past eight years, selling and renting all sorts of property. And over the years, I've had quite a few experiences that I couldn't quite explain, and I thought I'd share one of them. This story happened around November of 2018. I remember because earlier that day, a colleague and I had started filming that year's Christmas videos to go on our company's social media. Each year we'd recreate a scene of a Christmas movie, and that year was the dance scene from Love Actually. Anyway, I'd been asked by my manager to go and take photos of a house that we'd just been given the go-ahead to go on and rent. The house was a three-bedroom grade two listed mid-terraced from around the 16th century. For anyone not knowing, a grade 2 listed property basically means it's old and has a lot of original features that can't be changed without special permissions. This was the first time we'd let the property for the landlord. And the tenant before we later found out had left the property whilst still in contract within the first six months. I knew something wasn't right as soon as I set foot in the property. Everyone gets times when the vibes are off, and I'm not someone who claims to be in touch with their spiritual side. But the atmosphere when I went in was downright hostile. I was already a little spooked, but damn it, I had a job to do, so I opened the playlist on Spotify, hit shuffle, and started turning lights on. I have a system when photographing a property. Lights on, photograph, measure the room, lights off. The house was your standard layout. Living room, kitchen, dining room downstairs, three bedrooms, bathroom upstairs with another flight of stairs up to the loft, attic for my American friends. The downstairs I did just fine, 
trying to ignore the bad vibes by singing along to probably ABBA or something that I don't remember. What I do remember, though, is my trip upstairs. As soon as my foot hit the first step, this overwhelming urge that something was wrong surged through my body. I started singing louder, trying to distract myself. And another few steps up, wham, another huge surge of fear. I tell myself that the upstairs must have been in some sort of dead zone, because it was at this stage that my phone decided that the songs had no problem playing ten minutes ago suddenly needed buffering, meaning my ABBA was now playing in fits and starts. I fought against my body to get to the top of the stairs. When I did, my eyes were drawn to the door to the attic stairs, which lay ajar, and as soon as I did, I was done for. The room beyond the doorway was cloaked in darkness due to the lack of lights being turned on, and the fear that was pulsing through my body took me over. I stood there paralyzed. Couldn't even blink or take my eyes off the shadows that lay beyond the doorway. My lungs became like cement as I struggled to catch my breath. My words, breathless. I stood there for what felt like an hour before my phone started to ring. It was the office. We have office protocol to check in if we've been gone longer than expected. I fumbled to find the answer button, eyes still fixed to the darkness. I hit answer and managed to struggle out a help. This house was walking distance to the office, so it wasn't long before my colleague arrived to check up on me. As soon as I heard his voice call out my name, I felt the weight lift immediately and I cried out his name in response. I ran downstairs to meet him and the music returned far too loud, which gave us both a shock. We both got the hell out of there, not even checking if the door was locked properly. It was one of those Yale locks that auto-lock when you pull them, so it was probably fine. We head back to the office. On the walk back, I noticed a pain shooting across my back. When we got back to the office itself, I checked to see three long scratches running diagonally across my back. I explained what had happened to the others in the office. My manager told us that she had had a similar feeling when she met the landlord. Maybe because she was with someone that wasn't as scary, but after that we made sure that whenever we visited that property we were always accompanied. I'm not sure what happened to the house in the end. Surprise, surprise, we struggled to find people who could live in that bad vibe house and the landlord gave it to another agent to try to sell. Not long after, I moved to another company as well, and on to other properties. Third Eye Pulsing During Telepathic Experience This happened years ago, but I can't sleep, and I just remembered it as I'm scrolling through posts. So for context, sometimes when I meet somebody, I get these weird kind of pulses of information that I describe as a pressure on my third eye. Then it's like a flood of memories from the future, I guess. Nothing specific, just like an overwhelming sense about where things are headed. It's only happened to me three times. Each time with someone that played a very emotional and distinct part of my life. I never thought much of it, but I did always feel like the information came from something higher than me. And something good. I always thought of it like my guardian angel or spirit guide, I don't know. Anyway, the second time it happened was meeting with a guy. We'll call him Carl at a bar. I instantly received the pulse and a warning. Not against Carl that he was a bad person, more like a warning that my life was taking a very dark and much more challenging turn if I pursued him. And I was about to get into it, basically it just deep over my head. But I liked him and I felt drawn to him, so I ignored it and told myself that I could handle it. Anyway, he's clearly in a deep depression, very lonely. Suffering from very recent trauma and combat zone experiences, things like that. Cut to a week or so later and I'm at his place. He starts to get real loopy. I figure out that he had taken a painkiller since he just had surgery on his back a few days ago. 
He mixed that with liquor and now is talking about the crew. I was annoyed by his state and wanted to leave, but I had walked there and it was a little too late for me to walk back safely. I figured even if he was talking about people that weren't in the room, he wasn't dangerous, so I would stay. This is where the telepathic experience happened. I turned my back to him, ignoring him and planning to sleep and talk when he's, con you know, coherent. He stops rambling and I feel an intense pressure on my third eye. Comes with this information telling me to leave, that I shouldn't be involved with him and that he's only going to make my life miserable and bring me down to his state of depression. But this time it felt distinctly like a message from him. I opened my eyes while this is happening and from the mirror I can see him half staring at me in a stupor. It only lasts a moment before the pulsating ends and he says aloud, Did you get the message? I was feeling stubborn, I guess, and I was already annoyed with him for being so out of it, at least in this conversation. And it went something like this. What message? Carl, the message in the fourth dimension. Me. I don't know. Carl. Yeah, you got it. So what are you going to do? Me. Yeah, I got the message, and I forgot it. Carl. Well, that ruins the whole point. You're supposed to remember the message so you can act. Cue his rambling belligerence. I remember being annoyed that he was telling me what to do with my life, and let alone in a weird context with information that I already was aware of, and he had decided to ignore the first time. I never brought it up again until a few months later when he was leaving town. I was helping him pack, we were both drinking, and I mentioned something about the crew, quote-unquote. He looks at me confused, asked how I knew about the crew, I told him he was talking about them aloud the night that he was super fucked up, and told me about the fourth dimension that I should leave him. His face dropped, and his only reply was, You smug little C-word, not gonna say it. I knew you got the message. I reconnected with him a few years of him having basically no contact. Good news is he's doing much better now with his drinking and sobriety. Not perfect, but 10% of what he was back then. I did try to ask him about those two moments again, and he claims to have no idea what I'm even talking about. I got very defensive when I mentioned the crew, so I just dropped it. I think he got very defensive. I always thought of it as being odd, because while he was on drugs when it happened, I wasn't. Yet, I'm the only one with a distinct memory of it happening. Or at least, the only one who admits to remembering it happen. Story number nine. I feel like I'm losing my mind. Okay, so I have three kids. Four years old, three years old, and one year old. We moved in August, but in our old apartment, my three-year-old son had said on two occasions that there was a man in the closet. I had noticed little things that were weird, but no proof, and I was able to brush it off. So I'm still unaware if that was even real, but we moved in August, so new place. And it was cool, didn't feel any weird things or anything, at least when we moved in. In the last maybe two weeks, I feel like things have changed. Husband has been wanting home security cameras for a while, so I went ahead and bought them, totally unrelated. We set them up in our room, kitchen, living room, doorbell, backyard, front, all that. One night we heard a door open, and we're both like, damn, the kids are up, but waited for them to come to our room. No one came, so I had to go check, and they were sleeping. Two. TV was playing by itself all of a sudden in my bedroom. No one was in there. 3. Kitchen Google Hub started playing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. Full song then shut off when the song ended and went back to home screen immediately. So I called my husband and he tells the electronics are faulty sometimes. Fine. He's not a believer. So, whatever he tells me needs kind of hard proof. 
Four. Two to three weeks ago, my oldest daughter kept waking up at night and coming into our room crying and scared. It became a thing for a couple of nights, so the last night she did, and she brought her sister into our room and quickly turned around into the hallway. Her sister called out for her, and she came back in with her hands on her thighs and walked straight to the camera and stared at it for a second. Then came to lay down. It was weird as shit, because she didn't smile or make a silly face. Just completely blank. So after that, I decided I needed to know why she was waking up and just why she was waking up so much. She became afraid to go to sleep. I mean, she would do it, but she was afraid. The first night I put the camera, I saw her legs moving all around. Husband says kids sleep crazy, but I swear it looked like her legs were being pulled in the middle of the night. At first, it was just her and everyone was telling me restless legs. I thought, okay, that's logical, but I'm still a little scared. I decided to move the kids into a different room after a couple of nights of seeing her legs move every night to see if the same would continue. Two nights, nothing normal. Just everything regular, regular kid movement when sleeping. So I thought, okay, I'm crazy. Well, third night of the kids sleeping in a different room, there goes the legs again, but this time it would switch between the two older toddlers. One-year-old sleeps in my room. I saw my daughter being flipped over. Her legs went up in the air and her upper body was limp and her arms flopped onto the bed. And to me, that doesn't happen. Her husband obviously says kids move all kinds of ways sleeping. But in that same night, I saw my daughter being held down as she was trying to get up. It looked like her hair was being held down. And when she finally got up, she went to pull the covers, and I swear to God, it looked like there was a pullback from the blanket. I feel like no matter what my husband sees, he'll never believe it. That same night, the two of them had a jump scare in their sleep. I don't know, could have been dreaming, but... I had also started to point out the camera towards our bed when we sleep, and noticed my one-year-old will start to cry and I won't wake up fast enough. And it looks like their legs are being pulled too. And all of their toes look like they're being curled and flexed when it's happening. So terrified. I stayed up that night, brought the kids into our room, and had non-stop panic attacks and repeated the Our Father over and over again and prayed to God because I have had things happen in my life, but short, quick instances, and then it was done. This isn't letting up. And I'm also second-guessing myself because no one believes me. And God, I want to be so wrong so bad. Because if this is real, I don't know what the hell's going to, what the hell I'm going to do and what the hell's even going to happen. I am not going to burn sage because I've heard that angers them. I'm at a loss. I'm so fucking scared. And I'm trying to be super brave for my kids and trying not to let it feed any of their energy. Weird Experience at a Hotel This is from 2013. I travel a lot for work. I mean, before COVID. And when I do, I stay at hotels. Sleeping in a different bed doesn't bother me, as I'm mostly a sound sleeper and I'm used to it, given that I've been doing this for a while. This was a hotel in the suburbs of Chicago, a city in the U.S. for non-American listeners. From the time I checked in to the room, I think it was maybe room for 413, I think. I've never felt such a sense of dread, despair, and claustrophobia. I am a rational person, no history of depression. So I explained it to myself that maybe the 13 in the room number was messing with me. But I've stayed in other hotels with the 13 in my assigned room. I had also stayed at this same property every week over the last few months. But I had never felt this. I pondered lying in bed if I should call the front desk, ask for another room. I don't know what excuse I'd give to the front desk. Everything was great with the room, the shower was great, room was spotless, the toilet had no issues. A boring, predictable, clinically consistent room like any other Marriott property. No complaints on the Wi-Fi. 
couldn't bring myself to lie to the front desk and ask to be changed to another room. So I told myself I was a rational man, a husband, a father, and a protector. I recall the monologue I had in my head. Don't be a whiny little bitch, be a man. I decided I was going to stay put. The uneasiness didn't lessen, so I turned on every light in the room, took out all the Bibles from the bedstand, and set them next to me. I'm not of Christian faith, and not a very religious person either. But I felt that I kind of needed all the protection I could, so I played chants on a loop on YouTube from my own religion all night at a low volume and went to sleep. I woke up in the morning, worked out, showered. Went to work the night's experience. Felt like a fleeting memory during the day. I had a really fun rental that week. A Mustang GT. It was so much fun. The night's memory felt imaginary. Came back from work that evening, feeling a little bit silly about the night before. Went back to the room. And in an instant, the same sense of unexplained dread and claustrophobia came flooding back. What the the fuck? I just couldn't rationally explain it. So I went back to the routine from the night before. Lights on, chanting on, Bible, Marriott Mormon Bible, all by the bed. Next evening, I spoke with the bartender and asked him if he had heard any weird complaints. He said he hadn't, but he'd ask around. When I came back the next week, I got a different room. Woo! but I checked in with the bartender. He said he had done a little digging over the weekend and picked up on gossip from other hotel staff that some of the cleaning ladies didn't like that room, and even that corner of the whole fourth floor. He was intrigued enough that he brought along a sensitive quote-unquote friend from his Episcopalian church, and he said that when she opened the door and had barely taken a step inside, she just about made a 180 degree and came right out. She couldn't even go inside the room. She said it felt heavy. The bartender said that that was enough to spook him. He said he just stood in the corridor and wouldn't go in himself. Kind of had a laugh about it, but deduced to Google. So he Googled up the property address to see if there were any documented murders, suicides, things like that. Didn't come across anything. The property that changed hands a few times it was a nearby fire with some deaths, but nothing notable in the Google searches. I didn't think much of it. But I've stayed at more than 2,000 nights in hotels since the fall of 2013, and I'm yet to experience that fear ever again. I continue to rethink about the memory of my experience, trying to recount details about the room, that week, maybe even my mood at work, just so I could find something rational to explain what I felt. And I have been unable to. I came across the subreddit and figured I'd post if you had any insights into what might have been happening that I was experiencing. Been hearing footsteps every night for the past three weeks. This entire thing started nearly three weeks ago. I was in bed trying to fall asleep when I start to feel footsteps walk in the hallway, right outside my room. Normally I would think this is my dad, so I brushed it off, but they didn't stop. I was able to hear each individual thump and felt the vibrations of the footsteps down at my feet. I can tell when my dad or someone else is walking down the hallway, and based on the vibrations of their footsteps, I know who it is and if they're walking towards my room or not. So I'm hearing and feeling these footsteps. So I eventually got to sleep, woke up, told my dad, he didn't think much of it. Next night, nothing happened. Second night, the footsteps started again when I got in bed, and I was trying to fall asleep, of course. This time I was trying to think of some reasoning or logic behind why this is happening. So I turn off my box fan. Footsteps are still there. Is it my dog? No, she's in my room tonight, sleeping. 
Could it be my heart pumping blood to my feet? So I changed positions and even stood up. Nope, still there. Maybe the AC unit or pipes in the house. But the pipes and AC and water heater all have individual sound, which I know what they sound like. This, however, sounded exactly like someone walking up and down the hallway, pacing back and forth constantly. The first couple of nights, I was absolutely panicked, like crazy when all this was happening. I threw the blanket over my head, and I could feel my heart beating as loud as the one in Edgar Allan's poems. A week went by and everything, it was just the same thing. I'd get in bed, and moments later, or even half an hour later, I would hear footsteps and feel the vibrations in my bed. This thing is pacing back and forth, jumping up and down, running, going up the stairs, but it never comes inside my room. More days go by and it starts to become a nuisance rather than scary. I just wanted to sleep, that was all. But shit got real when two nights ago I got in bed and entered my room, which it had never done before. It was running, making loud thumps on the floor, even pacing back and forth right in front of my bed. Now I was scared. I believe at one point it even tried getting into my bed. I jumped, ran the fuck out of there. Later that night I tried to sleep with the lights on, fan on full blast, and try to sleep with the headband type of a thing. But nope, it still continued. Of course, I couldn't see anything with the lights on, because nothing is ever there. But I tried a couple of tests. One, I found out if I leave my fan on, this entity will go nuts and won't shut the hell up. But as soon as I turn the fan off, and try to pull out my video recorder on my phone, it goes almost silent. I can still slightly hear it, but my phone can't. The other test is that I learned that if I'm sleeping and I just ignore it, it'll just walk away. But it was weird, because every time I would move or change positions in my bed, it would run back up to my bed, and then eventually walk away again. I told my dad this next morning, and he said, This is not normal. You may have a ghost, or a demon following you, or Satan simply teasing you. Then he suggested I make a doctor's appointment. So that's what I did. I set one up for Monday, because this issue is now out of control. My siblings believe I have schizophrenia, because auditory hallucinations is a symptom. But this is not a hallucination, because they're as real as anyone else walking down the hallway, and I can feel the footsteps with my own feet. I don't think schizophrenia could do that. I'm out of ideas, and I desperately need help. I pray and pray and pray, but these footsteps continue. Story number 10. Never play with things that you don't understand. I was once at a friend's house a long while ago. You couldn't really call it a party, but there were a few people there and it was a social setting. A gathering may be a better term. I'm not good at these things and never have been. But the effort I have to go to to maintain my social graces is quite exhausting for me the majority of time, so I tend to avoid them. I would have been around 19 at the time. There were around 8, maybe 9 people there, and it was a mixture of men and women. I guess we've all been to them at one time or another. One of the women that was there was kind of new agey, believed in the goddess, crystal healing, all that stuff. Which I'm not rubbishing, but in the 90s to some of this was a fad, you know. So as the night wound on, she suggested that we did a Ouija board. 
Now, I may or may not have mentioned this before, but I'm third-generation Romani, and I was brought up in a family that respected the old ways. Now, if you know that you kind of know what I'm talking about with that, so in this kind of situation, I'm heading for the door. My friend whose party it was stopped me and kind of placated me, told me that I was being silly, and he actually did rubbish this woman and what she believed in and said that it was a joke. So I stayed. It was as it turned out, kind of being a big mistake, all around in a lot of respects. I was sat at a distance from the table where they were, you know, convened. She was sat with the planchette, asking if there was anyone there. People were smirking and generally just disrespecting the entire thing. She kept asking for signs or if anybody was there. That's when I started feeling uncomfortable. You ever get that feeling you're being watched or followed? It's like that. Like an itch behind your eyes. Your scalp tingles and you get a feeling that you need to be moving. Right now. It's an instinct bred and hardwired into you over thousands and thousands of years and generations. And then the planchette starts moving and she's smiling and all happy that it works. She doesn't look like a clown. So then they start asking simple questions. Will I be rich? Will I be famous? Answers are all no. Nothing unexpected. Till a guy asks if he will be married. Then it spells out never. So he asks why. It spells out die young. All of a sudden things take a turn. I tell her to put it down and send it back. She didn't understand what I was telling her to do and the damn thing is spelling car accident. He laughs it all off and goes and stands in the kitchen and in the meantime one of the women asks if she will have kids. It spells out never again. Now my instinct is telling me to leave and I'm listening to it. I go and grab my coat and as I'm leaving the woman that's doing the board calls out. Your granddad has a message for you. I stopped, walked back in and calmly said to her, You have no idea what you're doing. You're a child with a box of matches, and whatever's talking to you is not my granddad. I smashed the board off the table and stormed out. In the years that passed, that guy was killed in a car accident with three other people. He was 23. The woman never did have children, and some of the other things, mainly the malicious shit, did come to pass. I don't know what it was. That stupid woman called in, right? To that. But I will say, don't play with things that call out to the dead. And if you do, make sure that what you call was human once, because you never can be too careful. That message from my granddad, I never did hear it. And the woman that did the board, never did see her again. My encounter with what I think might have been a demon. Back a couple of years ago, I was into a pretty bad garden. I keep saying bag. A pretty bad argument with a friend. Sorry guys, my bird is going nuts. Got into a pretty bad argument with a friend. In short, I'd been keeping a secret and had come clean about it. She was really mad and I went to bed feeling like shit. Of course, I'll admit I've had some issues with mental health like depression. My family doesn't have a good track record with mental health either but I'd never experienced anything like this before. About halfway through the night, I woke up. I think it was a dream. Again, I think. I was sitting upright in my bed, holding a specific knife I actually owned in my hand. I looked around and my room was illuminated by particularly bright moonlight. This was odd since my curtains were closed, but it didn't feel off. I looked at a part of my wall that the light was illuminating quite brightly and saw words written in some kind of paint. 
I don't want to say blood because that sounds cheesy, but that's honestly what it looked like. The words were, kill yourself, written in what looked like blood. Sounds stupid, but that's what it looked like. As dumb as it sounds, I feel that those are common demonic tropes for a reason. The trope had to start somewhere, right? I should add, I'd never once self-harmed or even really considered suicide at that point, despite my depression. Anyway, when I read those words, it all felt like it clicked. I held the knife up to my wrists, and I was about to start cutting, when something caught my eye in a dark corner of my room. I squinted to get a better look. I realized it was somewhat humanoid. It looked absolutely terrifying. It had these eyes and teeth that looked like those of a deep sea fish. Think Gollum mixed with a human and an anglerfish's mouth. Not pleasant. When I saw it, the light in the room suddenly went from moonlight to flickering orange as if there was a fire behind me illuminating my room. I ended up bolting upright a few minutes before my alarm in a cold sweat. I figured that's just a creepy nightmare, so I just got up went to school. My skin was crawling the whole drive there. I get out my first class and I start getting anxious, so I reach up to touch my cross necklace. As I do, a voice that isn't mine speaks in my head and says, God won't save you. For the next few months, I had these incidents where basically it would feel like some outside force would jump on me and want me to kill myself at the slightest negative happening. I tried to face this feeling by picking up the knife to prove I could resist, but the instant, or the instant that I picked up the knife, it felt like I couldn't put it down. Eventually, I managed to put it back in my drawer, and I didn't touch it until I had an accident in a while. The incident stopped after I went outside during one family was in the house and firmly told the demon it would leave. By the power of Jesus, it would leave. I honestly feel like I'm lucky that I remembered that part of the Bible because I think it worked. That was my last incident. And it sort of ended after I told the demon to fuck off. I don't know if that's what made it go away or if it just lost interest after I wouldn't kill myself. So yeah, that's my demon story. I actually went looking online a while back to see what I was dealing with, and I found an East Asian demon that seemed like it fit the description. A human goblin thing with sharp teeth that finds people at low points, tries to convince them to kill themselves. Honestly, if it weren't for the fact that I saw this thing illuminated in what looked like hellfire, I would just assume it was the depression. But whatever it is, it's gone now. I haven't had a single incident in like, it's got to be over three years at this point. I was 17, and I'm 20 now. My guardian angel? A few years ago, I was out drinking with a friend. Long story short, Afterwards, I traveled back via train late in the night because there was a train station only one kilometer down from my house. About 400 meters into my walk home, there were three guys looking for trouble. Their faces were half covered with shirts and pieces of clothing. They were shouting out, Where are you from? Mind you, I was a bit tipsy and in no mood for looking for any sort of trouble. I continued to walk toward them with the mindset that if they wanted a fist fight, then I'll fight them back, or at least try to. One of them shouted, Get him! Stab the cunt! Excuse my language. And they all ran towards me, yielding what looked to be some sharp weapons. Steel poles, sticks, knives, couldn't quite tell. But I wasn't ready to find out, so I sprinted 500 meters through a dark field toward my house. I could hear one, I assumed one, of the guys keeping up with me as I slowed down. The others I assumed were far and couldn't keep up. The adrenaline pushed me for a bit, even while under the influence of alcohol. Near the end of my sprint, I was dragging myself slightly uphill towards some light. 
Just over that hill was an open road with a roundabout where it was lit up with street lights. I thought this would be safer to have a face off with this guy chasing me who was right behind me. Onto the road and to the roundabout I went. But out of nowhere there was a random girl on the other side of this roundabout. Just standing there calling out to me. Keep running, this is your life, go, go. Her voice had tones of desperation and hope. She made me think, yeah, I could die tonight. I hesitated because I didn't expect her. It was so random. Also, because I didn't want her to get hurt, so I turned around to face the guy chasing me. We made eye contact. At this point, I could see what he was holding, as the road lights were helping me to see. I could only see his eyes. He had this look of hesitation which spoke. This guy's not what I imagined him to look like. Should I stab him? He held up what seemed to be a sharpened piece of wood and thrusted it towards me. I caught his forearm which stopped any contact. We both tired from sprinting that 500 meters and awkwardly had our guards up. Again, this girl yells out, Run! Now! Go! Go! So I turned around and ran but only for about five meters because I thought, wait, what about you? I thought the guy might go up to her and stab her, so I turned back around. When I did, to my surprise, she was gone. The guy was just standing there looking at me. He started walking back, exhausted but swiftly, the same way he chased me. This road was lit up, so I had a good view of all directions. I watched the guy leave the scene, but I had no idea where the random girl went. She couldn't have run anywhere in a few seconds and be gone from the scene completely. It was quite open, well lit. It was as if she had disappeared. I've always found it strange that she was by herself late at night and instantly told me to run for my life as soon as I appeared over the hill onto that road especially since she'd be making herself a target by yelling that. It was as if she was expecting me. It was as if only I could see and hear her. To be honest, when I think about it, I don't think I would have run if she hadn't told me to. I would have given up out of exhaustion and tried to fight the guy trying to stab me. I could have turned out pretty bad. Who knows? All I know is that I don't know who or what she was, but I listened to her and I got home safely. Maybe she was my guardian angel. Story number 12. Pocono Mountain Skinwalker, Part 3. Sadly... These encounters didn't end. It almost became a normal thing, as mentally toiling as it was for me and my friend. Two boys that had just made it clear that night that we must stay in lighted areas and never be in a group of less than three people. Even so, we still saw it. When Ben and Tyrell were out with another boy, they all saw it. Of course, Ben told me, and I asked the other guy about it, happy to know that I wasn't just going insane. He started crying, saying that it was just his imagination and stopped turning into a big thing. He didn't go out at that, or rather he didn't go out at night at all after that. All the sightings at any point past the first two nights seemed to blend together. I would just walk quickly inside if I saw it and make sure to stay facing it. The boy Ben brought a switch blade, and another night as we were out stargazing where there was a street lamp center camp. We saw it again. He pulled out the switchblade, which I thought was idiotic, and the spring that made it like flip out broke, and it wouldn't come out. And it was just staring at us again. At this point, I knew that I should not be going out at night, but in a really childish way, I was thinking of it as a mystery, like I needed to solve it, like I was chosen. So I went out alone, even though every bone in my body was telling me not to. And I went into the woods with my flashlight, a cross, not even religious, and was hoping to get answers. 
Maybe, or if I didn't see it, maybe even after everything I would be able to brush it off. But sadly, I did see it. After waiting in the forest that I originally walked through with my flashlight and yelling to keep away bears, I turned my flashlight off, said a prayer I remembered from when I was younger and went silent. Five minutes went by, nothing. At this point, I was about to piss myself as I reached for my flashlight. I saw it again, black figure piercing white eyes, not doing anything or really even moving, just watching. I walked back to the cabin saying the prayers and although I know for a fact that it was following me for some time since I could sense it, I realized I sound crazy, but if you were there, you would know, and eventually the feeling wore off. Ben claims to have seen it with red eyes at one point as he was playing Alpha, or whatever it could be, as if it could be a physical thing he could fight with adrenaline. He's an aspiring boxer, apparently, but never had any physical encounters, only that feeling of death. The camp often mocks Native American culture, and from my research is located on Lenape land. I have no idea as to if any of this stuff is related but it also is the closest camp to the Delaware River, which a lot of skinwalker stories stem from. I know this sounds kind of fake, but truly, I am just trying to process it so I can forget it. I called the boy Ben many times, begging to him to talk about it, but he refused and wouldn't let me bring it up. I'm almost about to call one of those paranormal investigation shows, but I don't want to seem crazy. The amount of people that ended up seeing it, even with no knowledge of Ben and I's experiences, proves to me something has been going on there. Something else worth mentioning, though, is that one of the senior staff members, a 30-year-old man, heard about what happened, and he brought us sea salt and told us to line our cabins and to not go out, specifically at night, ever again, and unless he's on night watch, he has a gun. I really want to justify it as mass hysteria, lack of sleep, or something like that, but I know that couldn't have been it. If anyone has any other information on what could have happened, please contact me on here and I'll send you my info. I don't understand what it was, why it didn't attack us, kill us, why none of the other groups came across it other than ours and some adults. It just messes with my head terribly. Haunted Boarding School I was 16 years old and already at boarding school for roughly five years. My boarding school was situated in a building that was originally used as a convent for priests and also used as a graveyard in the Middle Ages. It's now been around for around 170 years as a school. Going through two world wars during which it was used as a field hospital by the German army, now the thing you should know about the boarding school is that it was located in two large buildings separated by a large playground. The boarding school itself was located on the top floor of each building separated by three floors to reach the ground floor. I didn't have good grades that year and I was moved over to the other building of the boarding school, but the junior years to be under stricter routine and longer study hours. We always had about 1 hour and 15 minutes every evening to relax and spend time with friends after studying. For that, there is a large basement with a small TV and a bar and a gigantic room with pool tables and kicker tables. The thing about this gigantic excuse me, the thing about this gigantic room was that it only had a single light switch and it was connected to the school's theater and dancing room of which the doors are always locked. Its lights always closed. Besides that, there was also a door that was always locked and supposedly connected the two buildings on the school's premises with a tunnel. Now that evening I went down to the basement directly after studying, taking along my phone charger. It was a pretty uneventful night and at the end of it I went up the stairs going three floors finally reaching my room. All of a sudden I realized that I forgot my charger in the basement, ran up to the supervisor who gave me the keys so I could go down to the basement. Once I was descending this three floors, reaching the basement, I started to get this eerie feeling of being watched. The feeling got even worse once I realized that if I would scream, nobody would hear me as there were three empty floors between myself and the boarding school. 
Once I reached the basement level, I was calm again, unlocking the first door and opening the second one. As I slowly opened the second door, it felt as if the darkness of the gigantic room was extremely thick, as if it would swallow me. I know it sounds weird, but that's how it felt. Switched on the lights and started making my way past the ping pong tables toward the back of the gigantic room, roughly 30 meters away from the door and the only light switch. As I made my way to the back, I was suddenly taken back by the massive sense of danger and terror. I felt as if I was being ambushed or led into a trap. My heart rate skyrocketed. I quickly turned around and sped walked back up the door when suddenly all the ping pong tables were making extremely loud noises as if the people were slamming on them with their fists to stir up a fight. I started sprinting to the door and feared that someone might switch off the lights or close the door on me. While I was getting closer to the door, the noise got louder and louder. Once I finally reached it, I switched off the light and slammed the door shut, and as quickly as the door shut, the noise stopped. I quickly locked the door and ran up as fast as I could, as if the light was dependent on it, no pun intended, crashing into one of the supervisors making his way home at the end of the night. He asked me what was going on as I was pale, sweaty, and shaking, and I told him what I experienced. Instead of trying to rationalize what happened, the first thing he said is that he experienced some scary things as well when he had to lock up the basement alone. He also told me to check with another supervisor to make sure nobody was down there. The other supervisor and I went down to the basement again and stopped at the locked door trying to hear if someone was down there or if any student was messing around. We listened quietly and heard someone walking around. As soon as we opened the door, the noise stopped and we opened the lights but nobody was there. Nevertheless, the back doors of the dancing room theater were wide open. To this day, I get chills thinking about this experience. Nobody could have been down there with me without me noticing it, nor can I explain away the slamming noises coming from the pool tables. It's an experience that never left me, and although I try to rationalize it, it's haunting me in a way. What could it have been? What am I wondering now? Story number 13, The Asylum Adventures. My boyfriend reminded me today of an encounter I had told him a few years ago that I completely forgot about. This story happened about 10 years ago when I was still in high school. Growing up, my family always watched paranormal shows from Ghost Hunters to Paranormal State. My brothers were really into the paranormal and would drive past this old cemetery and take pictures. Both my brother and, well, both of my brothers are older, so they decided to find a new place to see. This happened to be an old asylum. I won't say where because we were trespassing on the property. One night my brother invited me to go along and I said yes. There were only four of us that went along this time. My brother, his boyfriend, their friend Kim, and me. I did not know what I was getting myself into. There was a long winding road in order to get to the asylum, which had multiple buildings and tunnels connecting each building. The first building we went into was the theater. This building had the roof collapse at some point in time, so we could only stand in the entranceway. My brother's boyfriend brought a tape recorder to see if we could record anything. We had asked a bunch of questions, but didn't hear anything a while when we were there. We listened to the tape. That was when we got home, and we heard a little girl say hello. It was one of the creepiest things I had ever heard. After the theater, we were just walking around the grounds, and I kept seeing this white figure following the pathway. My thoughts were, I'm hoping to see a ghost, so my mind thinks I'm seeing one. I just kept my mouth shut and didn't say anything until my brother's friend, Kim, said, Do you see that white thing over there? Then I told her that I've been seeing this for a while now, and I just thought it was in my head or in my mind, and that it was playing tricks on me. We didn't really experience much more that night. I was thinking it was such a creepy place where horrible things happened to the patients there. The second time I went there was a few months after my first time. We wanted to go at least one more time before the renovations were completed for the haunting attraction of the asylum. This would be the final time I would go. 
the moon was full, or almost full, because we didn't really need a flashlight to see. This particular night was a cold, windy fall night. We couldn't park our car in the usual spots. So we decided to park somewhere different and walk through the woods. This should have been the turn around and go home sign. I felt very uneasy as we started to get closer to the asylum. We started to walk the long walkways and realized that it was that windy the doors to the building were wide open. My brother kept insisting, let's go in and travel the tunnels. I said, I don't think that's a good idea since I was feeling uneasy and that it felt like we weren't wanted there. My brother's boyfriend and Kim wanted to go in the most haunted building. This building is where the teeth were pulled out of the patients as if they bit the staff too many times. I stayed at the walkway with my brother. In about five minutes, they came running back, stating that we need to leave now. There was a dark, shadowy figure on the walkway between buildings, and they had no idea what it was. By the looks on their faces, I believed them. This is not the scary part for me, though. We had returned home, and for about a month, I had the same recurring dream. I was a mentally ill patient, and my grandfather was feeding me. In my mind, I knew what I wanted to say, but it came out as a babble, and no one could understand me. I got frustrated, and I would cry. I would then wake up and think that one of the most horrible feelings in the world would happen. I also would wonder if what would some of the mentally challenged people face on a daily basis. I don't know if energy followed me home. As I'm getting older, I'm starting to think I'm sensitive to things. I had some odd experiences in my life and still do to this day. Story number 11. Pocono Mountain Skinwalker, Part 2. Hoping this was an isolated incident, I go around camp joking that last night my friend and I saw a skinwalker. Everyone brushed it off, except for the senior staff members. People who've probably been there ten plus years, and the owner. They just looked at me, but not like I was crazy, or smoking too much pot like the other people, but like they were genuinely scared. This brings me back to another aspect. When I was younger, people would go treasure hunting in the woods, with metal detectors, shovels, you name it. Mark, the owner of the camp, claims back in the 80s a kid took something that had belonged to the camp since the 50s and locked it in a little black box, and that if anyone can locate the box, he will give them $5,000 as a prize. I always thought it was a myth that he entertains to see everybody mess around, but that was disproven. My hopes that the sighting would be an isolated incident were also wrong. Weird shit kept happening. I started to begin a sort of romance with the guy, and as we were stargazing, we heard just genuinely unexplainable noises and little flashes of light in the sky above us. Not too weird, though. But then one night, when we were on our way back from the upper fields, as we crossed a flat plain of land that ends with maybe a six-foot drop, as we were walking, we saw a black figure with white eyes, head and shoulders looking at us from the drop. The boy, who we will call Ben, dropped to the ground and brought me down with him. He had us lay flat in the field and we both were just terrified. This is when I knew that it wasn't a delusion or anything like that because how could we both possibly react to something at the same time? We looked up and see it hiding behind a bush, about a foot away from where we had just seen it. We stood up after about 30 seconds and moved forward, hoping to see a person, or even a bear, that would be more comforting. We run down the same hill that we saw it, and continue to run the same direction. He turns to it, attempting to assert dominance or something dumb from a movie, and of course, I turn around with him. The creature is about seven feet tall, just like pure black, no features whatsoever. It stares directly back at us with white eyes, not piercing, almost just like they were little holes poked in a black sheet. 
At this point, I start sobbing and saying, we're gonna die, we're gonna die, this is not human, we're gonna die. We continue to speed walk backwards while facing the creature, and the creature bends down where there's a little black shadow box and just goes in and poof, it's gone. My theory is it's the same box that the owner has hunt down for, but that could be a stretch. But basically, with still a terrible feeling of impending doom and I'm sobbing, Ben comforts me, just repeating, It was just a bunny, it was just a bunny, it was just a bunny. This went on for a long time. And it seemed like he was saying it was more to himself than me. I tried to say, there's no way it was a bunny. But every time I started the sentence, he would look at me and say, I know, but we have to just keep walking. He came back to our cabin since he didn't want to walk alone after this and slept in the bathroom until the sun came up and ran back to his cabin without being caught. The morning after, I tried talking to him, and he was just so out of it. I talked to the friend that he had come to camp with, and he said that they had a similar experience to the first one I had, but they also brushed it off. As it was my last year at the camp, I decided it makes more sense to rationalize the impossible than to spend every night while at my cabin, while they're out having fun thinking about this. There's something evil about this city. Anderson, Indiana. There's something evil about this city. Just ask any person that visits Anderson, Indiana. There are numerous haunted locations in the city, and the people that live here, well, they are odd. There are spiritual doorways all over the city if you believe in that kind of thing. The story may be far-fetched to some, but for others, you may find it rather intriguing. It's going to be difficult for me to piece this together, but I'm going to do my best. I will always cite my sources for you so you can see where I got my info from. I'm going to touch on a brief history of this city and my personal experience. Anderson, a city located just north of Indianapolis, is considered to be the capital of spiritualists' movements, which followers dive into the occult practices. Just outside city limits lies a large compound called Camp Chesterfield. At this location, they would perform seances and rituals to contact the dead. Ironically, Camp Chesterfield is located right next to Native American sacred ground. 10,000 years ago, Native Americans declared the land that is now Anderson, Indianapolis, or Indiana, to be holy ground, and they created religious earthworks, approximately 2,000 years old. They deemed the site too sacred to actually live upon, they would only visit in large gatherings. They would sacrifice their young here to appease the spirits. While doing these rituals, I believe they opened up doorways to another dimension. For thousands of years, the natives would see otherworldly beings at these earthworks. These doorways to the other world would be left open. Thousands of years later, the white settlers moved in and lived on these religious sites, and I believe these spirits are fully awake. The spiritists moved in the area, and I believe that they have reopened these doorways and have anchored at these ancient spirits. Presently, Anderson is a hotbed for spiritists, witches, necromancers, and wizards. They are now the conduits of this evil energy and are under demonic influence. End quote. Presently, one such location, just a stone's throw away, is declared one of the most haunted locations in Anderson. The Cry Baby Bridge, located on a country, has a dark history. Legend has it a mother threw her baby off the bridge there, and you can hear the cries of this supposed quote-unquote ghost baby. That being said, there's also an abandoned cemetery 
that's located right next to the bridge where the Satanists perform satanic rituals, allegedly. Currently, this location is a hotspot for ghost hunters and thrill seekers. My cousin and I decided to travel here one night and attempted to contact the spirits there. Well, they were sort of chased, followed by a man in a white truck. He tried to run us over and attempted to run us off the road. We caught this all on film here. We also highlight the history of this bridge. I believe this haunted bridge is one of the spiritual doorways to another world. The locals here in Anderson do not want visitors visiting these places. Visitors have been chased off and even have been threatened with physical violence. Story number 17. Out of the back room. I moved out of my mom's when I was 16. I found out I was pregnant and I thought I was grown. Fast forward a few years and lo and behold, reality slapped me just as it does any young parent. And after some trials and tribulations, found myself back home with my mom at the age of 19. I'll preface this with, the apartment my mother lived in was a nursing home converted into six apartments. Three on the first floor, two on the second, and my mother's apartment being the only one on the third floor. We always heard things. Footsteps coming up long staircase leading to my mother's door. Never anyone there. The back door was a huge fire door, banged when it shut very distinctive sound. We would hear footsteps, hear the door open and close and expect someone. There was never anyone there. When we walked through the back door, it was a short hallway, two doors to the left, bedrooms, and one doorway ahead in the kitchen. My bed was positioned to face my bedroom doorway. My mother worked overnights. She's a nurse so it was always my two-going-on-three-year-old son, I always home alone at night. can't explain the feeling I got walking past the first of the two doors to the left, but I just couldn't walk past them, so I ran every time. I just ran. My first experience ever in the apartment was my scariest one to date, from when I was younger to now being in my thirties. One night, I'm laying in bed. I'm on the phone very late. It's maybe 1 to 2 a.m., and as I'm laying there just talking, I heard pitter-patter across the short hallway, and a short, toddler-sized shadow ran across my doorway. I saw the shadow clearly. It had shape. It had mass. It was solid. I immediately yell out to my son, Hey, what are you doing? Come here. No response. So again, him being little and me knowing his games, I call out to him again. Hey, bub, come here and lay with mama. Then it hit me. He wouldn't be in that part of the apartment. That came from the corner bedroom. He was sleeping on the couch. I got up as quickly as I think I ever have and run through the kitchen and into the living room. There he was, my toddler sleeping on the couch. I scooped him up and hightailed it to my room. I shut the door behind me, lock it, and crash! Something hit the kitchen floor and sounded like it shattered. I did not leave my room all night. Eventually, early hours hit, and I finally fell asleep with my baby in bed with me. Fast forward, and it's now 7.30 a.m. My mother is knocking at the bedroom door. What the fuck happened in the kitchen? The entire distrator's on the floor. There's glass everywhere. I was hesitant to even answer. My mom did not like to speak on these things. She says she's a non-believer, but no way in hell she could be living here. I explained what happened, and she only said, help me clean it up. From there on out, so many things happened. Every day there was an occurrence. Voices, sounds. Things that looked like people in the house that we would quickly realize weren't. 
or who we thought it was. I never slept comfortably in that house again, and very quickly made my way out of that place into my own. But without fail, every visit I had my mother consisted of someone from the other side making their presence known one way or another. Story number 17. I saw and experienced things no one in the house did. When I was about 8 to 11, 2012 to 2015, my family had moved to Dubai for my dad's work. We had moved into this villa sort of neighborhood and our house was directly across from a mosque. I'm not sure if that could have impacted what has happened in this house. Anyways, I shared a room with my sister, and the room was quite big, probably the size of my current living room and kitchen. So very big, and there was a long air vent up high on the wall directly above me. There was a balcony connecting my parents to our room. For the first year, nothing much happened besides me seeing dark figures in my peripheral vision, especially when walking past the stairs. I told my mom about it since she's very spiritual, but I didn't think much of it. Just kind of blamed it on my imagination. Another thing that had happened while living there was that I had a friend pass away in a freak accident at the age of nine. I can't exactly remember if it was before or after what I'm about to tell you, but it was definitely around that time. Anyways, back to that vent I was talking about earlier. When going to sleep, I constantly felt something look at me. For some reason, I had come to the conclusion that there were two spirits in the house. Not sure how I decided that, but because I felt spooked out, my mom would light incense before I'd go to sleep, and I'd sleep with my fingers covering my ears, with the blankets covering my face, with a small hole where my mouth and nose were, so, or else I'd freak out about breathing. As time went by, I was starting to refuse to even be upstairs at all, or alone, because I didn't feel safe. And that's when the first encounter happened. I had this makeup bag filled with Halloween makeup and some kitty makeup I was given, and I was in the bathroom alone, just having fun and messing around until that said bag started to vigorously shake. I froze for a second, not knowing what to do, till I ran downstairs straight to my mom. To this day, I try to convince myself that it was just my imagination, yet I can still hear and see that bag shaking from what I think about it. Fast forward a couple of weeks, nothing really happened besides the black figures and feeling of being watched, till I was cleaning my room with my mom. She had left the room to go downstairs since we had finished, and I was about to follow her down after I closed the curtains, which I did, and as I was leaving the room I heard them swing open. I didn't have the courage to actually look, I just bolted down the stairs. I'm so sorry about how long this is and how horrible I am at telling this, but I had one last experience that I will never forget. One night, not long before moving back to Australia, earlier than expected, I had this nightmare. Not much happened in said nightmare, but it stuck with me after nearly nine years, and it was my room with the lights off, with this girl who looked exactly like the girl from The Ring. I'd never seen or heard of the movie when this happened, by the way. And she was holding an oval-shaped mirror, and all the dream was, was my body quickly moving closer and closer to her. And as I got to her, I woke up and the dream ended. To say the least, I was very grateful that we moved after that. I feared to know what would have happened if we stayed just a couple more months like originally planned. Thanks to anybody who's still awake and listening. As usual, see you later. I feel like I'm being watched, and I'm intrigued. So for starters, I'm a Muslim, 
which means I believe that it's a jinn. It isn't uncommon for people, at least in my family, to have experiences with these guys. Both of these incidents happened at night when I was trying to sleep. Also, they started by the time my grandmother died. Before that, I never experienced anything like this. The first incident. I was visiting cousins and sleeping in the same room as them. It was the middle of the night, and, being an insomniac, I couldn't sleep at all. I heard someone, hey, 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 a loud whisper, sounded like a boy my age. At first I thought it was my cousin, but she was asleep. Or, supposing they mean he, says she. I asked her the next morning what her dream was about and if she had said anything like that, to which she answered no. The second incident. I was in bed and it was the middle of the night. I couldn't sleep again. This time it went from 5 to 50 real quick. I was lying down on my left side and felt something sit and lean on my torso. And I felt elbows digging into my skin so much so that it hurt. I still haven't opened my eyes, which now that I think about it was pretty much me having no sense of danger. But I felt something come closer to my ear, and I hear it loud and clear. Visit. As if the boy was growing up with me, I replied, Who's there? Then I opened my eyes, but no one was there, and it was pitch black. You bet I didn't sleep that night. But when I did get a few Z's, it was something on my stomach, like crawlers killing me. White skin, empty eyes, long limbs. I get told that I shouldn't try to communicate with Jin because I think that once you do, they don't leave you alone until you force them to hit the road. Now this is a bit late since this actually happened a few weeks back. It was at night again. I was wide awake. It was around 10 or 11 p.m. I was laying in bed trying to fall asleep. The lights were off. My sister, who I shared the room with, was also asleep. I was just in the complete dark, aside from the moonlight coming from the window. I was looking around the room, pondering about anime and whatnot, until I saw a woman at the foot of my bed. It's the typical ghost-like woman. Average height, white dress, long black hair. With, it was kind of parted from the back and covered most of her face and swooped forward, long enough to reach her waist. I remember her skin being a dull grayish blue. The moonlight was what allowed me to notice her features. It was so vivid that I thought there was an actual person in my room. In my last experiences, I saw no one, and this was the first time I saw something like this. She was giggling, her voice sounded like a little girl. She then asked me, Why didn't you visit? As she was giggling, and then I fell asleep, despite not being sleepy at all. If you read my last post, you'll know what I meant by that question. To summarize my last experience, I was again trying to sleep but couldn't. My eyes were closed, but I wasn't tired. I felt someone sitting on my bed beside me and lean onto my torso. I felt elbows digging into my skin, and it hurt. Then I felt someone lean towards my ear and whisper, Visit. I still don't know why I wasn't scared. Just like last time. Story number nine. Walking by the canal. There's stretches by the canal where I used to live that my grandfather always told me to stay away from. We used to walk on the old towpath to get to the city center when I was young, and he would always tell me stories of something, quote-unquote, that would pull me down to the bottom. He would never say, never get too close to the edge, she'll pull you down and keep you. And whenever I asked who he would say it was best, I didn't know. I would always sense his unease at times, as I spent a lot of time with him, you know. And he was always earnest about me staying away from the edge of the canal bank. 
He'd tell me of the people who swam in it that drowned, or people that nearly drowned that he knew. And they all said that something at some stage had them just tried to pull them down. Whether that was true or not is my granddad's way of keeping me away from the edge of the canal and instilling a healthy fear of drowning in it. I don't know. But years later, something strange did happen on that towpath that stayed with me. It was the early hours of Saturday morning. My pal and I were walking back from a night spot, as usual. We spent all of our money and had no cab fare. The moon was up and lit the towpath well enough for us to walk down it and find our way to the footpath that would lead us home. So you'd be talking like a mile, maybe a mile and a half. We were dawdling as you do when you've had a few too many, kicking stones into the canal as we walked down. There's something serene about the moon on the still waters of the canal. It's like black glass, and it shows a lot of what's going on, so even the ripples from the stones could be seen. My friend was being silly as he walked. We were still charged and had energy to burn as we walked down, and kept asking me why I'd gone quiet. Now, as silly as it sounds, drunk or not, I realized we'd reached the spot near where my grandfather has always warned me not to go near. So I told my friend to stop messing about, and we'd end up in the water. And as I said that, I sort of retreated a bit to the other side of the towpath, so I was as far away as I could be from the edge and still be able to walk. My friend asked what the problem was again, and I shrugged and said that this part of the towpath puts me about. Something about it, I suppose. It was around that time that my friend decided that it would be funny to fake throw me in. You know, like, I saved your life by shoving and catching you. Some silly bullshit that's probably got people in trouble somewhere, but seemed like a good idea at the time. As he did that, I think I must have had a, I guess a couple of seconds where I was either hyper aware or really, really wide eyed. Because as he shoved me forward, I lurched toward the canal and looked straight down into it. And I saw what looked like an arm, bone white in the water, and the side of a head and maybe even an eye. Again, all bone white. As he pulled me back, he stopped laughing. He asked me what was wrong, aside from you nearly killing me, nothing. I dream about that sometimes. Don't know if it was because I was drunk or maybe tired or maybe something that does in fact live in that canal. I do know that there are some places you should be very careful about, you know, walking through. The voice my sister and I heard when we were playing at my dad's co-worker's house. This happened years ago, when I was about nine. My little sister would have been about five. My whole family, my mom, my dad, my older sister, my older brother, myself, my younger sister, and my younger brother were at my dad's co-worker's house, outside of town. Because we were pretty young, my parents had us be outside for most of the day. The family had this playground in their backyard that we were playing in, but their kids were grown, adults, and out of the house too, so it was a bit run down. The playground has wooden stairs that led up to there, it was a square walkway, all the way around to the top, and in the center was an enclosure that had windows all around it and a door that locked from the outside. It was full of a bunch of seemingly random junk to us kids, but it was still interesting. At one point in the day, my older brother had locked me in it. I flipped out because I'm extremely claustrophobic. Even though this enclosure was full of windows, I only mention being locked in because it's important for the main part of this experience. Mind you, there were no houses close by, 
The yard was fenced in, a chain-link fence, so you could see everything, and a single tree between the house and the playground. The yard was huge and bare otherwise, as far as I can remember. When my older brother and sister had gone inside after some time, it was just me and my younger sister at the playground. My little brother was like a year old, so he had been inside with my parents the whole time. I was at the bottom of the stairs that led up to the enclosure, and my little sister was standing outside the enclosure by the door. She wanted to go into it, but since my brother had locked me in it previously, she looked over at the railing at me and said, Don't lock me in. And I was gonna say, I won't. But some voice that sounded like a really loud whisper coming from all around me beat me to it and said, I won't. But some voice that sounded like a really loud whisper. I've said that before. My sister's eyes got wide, freaked out, and I ran inside crying. I quickly followed suit and ran away towards the house. I reached the only tree in the yard on the way back to the house and turned around to see if anyone else was there and yelled, Who is that? Who said that? I still don't see anybody, but the voice answered, I did. It was the same voice, and it still sounded like it was coming from all around me like it was whispering into both my ears at the same time. I ran inside to find my whole family and the owners of the house sitting on the couch in the living room, and my little sister was hiding underneath the coffee table crying. My parents were initially mad at me for scarring her, perhaps scaring, but she kept telling them that it wasn't me, and we both told them what happened. My parents insisted that everybody had been inside with them when it happened. The owners of the house and my parents spent a large part of the day trying to figure out what had happened. But ultimately we never did. We never went near that playground again though. My sister and I still bring it up from time to time. She doesn't like talking about it, but definitely still remembers it. It was one of the creepiest things I've ever experienced. The moving chair with an old man sitting on it. This experience happened to my little sister, a female, 16 years old, when she was three years old. I learned of it yesterday after my dad, her, and I sat in the living room of our late maternal granddaunt Eugenia's home. We were reminiscing about the old times. The old times when most of our grandparents were alive and living in this three-apartment building and how fun it was to meet for lunch and breakfast with them, and in general having them and my cousins from Australia around. Those were the best family summers in me and my sister's memories. And slowly the conversation shifted into the paranormal. Sightings our family's gone through since the women in both sides of the family have some sort of gift. Dad started sharing his ghost sightings, when my sister hesitantly shared this. Please note that the time of the event it was late in the afternoon and I was present, but I was eight years old and I did notice that my sister was behaving weirdly, but I was too busy eating ice cream. The experience goes like this. She was three years old and she was too bored to walk on her feet, so she started to crawl and pretend to be a dog, barking at her grandma's. When she met them in the hallway towards the first kitchen, yeah, we had two kitchens and two bathrooms, when my sister grabbed some water and then stole some pie from the fridge, that's when the second kitchen comes into play, which is where she grabs a plate. As she was eating, she saw Grand Aunt Eugenia, and she was scolded for eating the dessert before dinner. Defeated, my sister returns to the living room and joins us in the dining room and she saw the rocking chair by the second terrace's door, and it was moving, and an old man dressed in a tuxedo and smoking a cigar, sitting on it, rocking back and forth while smoking. My sister recalls that she had crawled to him, 
and she barked at him, which caused him to laugh at her and motioned for her to sit next to him. My sister then asked him who he was. He says that he was Grand Uncle Tacus, and he was just watching his siblings and his nieces and nephews, and now grandnieces and grandnephews. She sat by him for a while, and she played with some leaves that had been blown in the open windows and terrace doors all around the house when she was asking. Well, she asked him why none of our grandparents introduce him to us. He said that he didn't need to be introduced. He knew all of us, and that he'd been watching us. Then my sister stood up and said goodbye to him because she wanted to come outside to play with me. She then says that she looked for him around the house but didn't find him. She asked around about Grand Uncle Tacus and everyone ignored her, or said that there was no one by that name. Flash forward to last year when my sister and our mom were going through some old documents and photos, when my sister found a photo taken in 1957. It apparently showed that he was the oldest son of the maternal great-grandma, and he had died from cancer in that very same chair in 1958. And his real name was Christophorus Thomas Bozinakis. Bozinakis? B-O-Z-I-N-E-K-I-S. And he was granduncle Themios. Actual name was Athemios, the male equivalent to the name Eva, older twin brother. All my life I felt very uncomfortable sitting in that chair because I felt as if I was intruding. Now I think I know why. Story number 18. Lifelong recurring dream connects. I met my dead brother. I've had a lot of strange and often reoccurring dreams throughout my childhood. I've always struggled with what they mean. Some were horrifying. People I've never met causing me harm. Some were obviously unrealistic nightmares, but some were weirdly realistic. Not I wake up in bed and go, oh, that was a dream realistic. It's like I'm doing something, then I black out and wake up in my bed. Those. And I wake from incredibly confused and genuine and having to consider whether it's actually happened or if it was in fact a dream. One particular dream that I've always sporadically had for the past 15 years was meeting up with my siblings and my father at the Santa Monica Pier. It would start with my siblings and I being just getting out of the car at the beach and we would meet up with our father, and it would be strained, but we would enjoy the day together. The dream would always end with me getting on a roller coaster, strapping in, the car would start up, and I would immediately wake up. I think I had this dream a handful of times. There would be long enough periods in between, years, that I would completely forget about it, and then it would happen again, and I would be confused all over again, especially when I became an adult. I went into foster care as a teenager and I never spoke to my father. My brother disowned me and I never got to see my sister. As an adult, I moved out of my home state and I was on my own. Until I moved back to my home state, my siblings and I reconnected in March of 2022. I fed ducks at the park with my sister and took my brother to Knott's to meet his nephews. The morning of August 5th, 2022. I had the dream again, except it started differently this time. It was my brother, sister, and me, and one other person that I didn't recognize, standing around in a circle. We were all just as grown as we are today, late twenties, and in the middle of the conversation about meeting up with our father at the pier, the man I didn't know seemed to mainly be taking charge of the conversation, essentially setting expectations for the day because of how hard it is to see our father who abused us as children. The conversation ended with the man drawing us all into a group hug and telling us that he loved us. Then we headed to our cars to meet up in Santa Monica, and he took his own car. Then the original dream played out, only it ended with me getting on the roller coaster, strapping in, and the car starting up the track. 
but the man in the seat beside me was... Oh no, I woke up, staring at the ceiling with tears streaming from my eyes. I was raised with two siblings, but I had an older brother who was murdered at the age of four when I was six months old. I have two pictures of him, red hair with a slight wavy curl, light eyes and smiling. The man in my dreams was as tall and handsome as my older brother, as built as my father, had my sister's hair color and complexion, red, fair, and freckled, and my mischievous grin. It only took a few waking moments to realize that the man in my dreams was a grown version of my dead older brother. December 1st, 1996. My siblings and I were attacked by our foster mom. We were immediately hospitalized, but my older brother died the next day, a week after his fourth birthday. I was six months old. For a period of time, every night, my mattress would shake as if someone were under the bed, jabbing at it in different places. I could hear the sound of the mattress being tapped, and I could feel the bed shake slightly. I was wide awake when it happened. I used to sleep in a room that my grandfather used before he passed away. He moved into my house the last two years of his life because he was left alone after my grandmother passed away and needed help being taken care of. Before that, I slept in a garage converted to a room, but we ended up needing the place for storage. After my grandfather passed and his room was available, I moved into his room. When the bed shaking first started happening, I took my mattress off and flipped the bed over thinking that rodents had somehow got inside the mattress and I was feeling them run around inside of it. That's somewhat what it sounded like, but light but rapid tapping of the mattress at many different spots underneath me. I inspected every inch of the bed and mattress but found nothing, nothing on the floor either, no trace of any animal. It would always start happening when I had shut off the lights, and as soon as I sat up in bed it would stop. When I'd lay back down, it would start up again after a minute or two. It got to the point where it would wake me up after falling asleep. I ended up being very sleep-deprived for as long as it lasted. This went on for about three months. After the first month, I got rid of my mattress and bought a new one, but the problem persisted. Sometimes, out of frustration, I would slam my fist into the mattress in hopes that if there were mice or some type of living creature that somehow had gotten into my mattress, that hitting the bed very hard a few times would maybe make it stop, but it wouldn't stop. I would also place my hand between my body and the mattress to check to see if I was having some type of muscle spasm at different parts of my body. No spasms. I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what was causing it. When I would sleep on the sofa in the living room, I didn't experience the issue, but the sofa just wasn't comfortable to sleep on and I would only sleep in there on occasion where I was so exhausted from sleep deprivation that I was able to fall asleep while being uncomfortable. It got to the point where I was afraid to go to sleep. I was a grown man who doesn't believe in the paranormal, but I was afraid for whatever reason. I guess it's because it's so bizarre and I couldn't find an explanation after all this time spent trying to figure it out. At one point I went out of town with my brother and stayed with my aunt for the weekend, and it was really refreshing. The bed didn't shake and I slept very well. I talked to my brother and told him the issue I was having at home, but he never had any issues like what I was experiencing. It changed from just an annoying occurrence into something that was scary after I stayed the weekend at my aunt's. Normally when I would sit up in bed it would stop, but it changed to where it would keep going after I sat up. And I could really feel the bed shake and I could hear the bed creaking as it shook. Below my bed was just an empty space. The floor was about six inches below the bottom of the bed. Then one day it just stopped. Never felt anything out of the ordinary just after one random day that it stopped. But for weeks after I was still afraid when I went to bed. This happened several years ago and I still sleep in the same room. I'm wondering if anybody else has had or heard anything like this happening or to somebody else. 
I am 100% certain that it wasn't my imagination. I clearly felt it and heard it for a period of weeks every single night, and I was wide awake when it happened. So weird when I think about it. I took a very scientific approach to try to understand what was happening, but came up empty in finding an explanation. Skeptic here, but I have a reason to think I may be living in a haunted house. How can I confirm? Last May I moved into an old six-bedroom house in the Navarte neighborhood of Mexico City. The house has been shared among a group of friends and colleagues for a couple of years. It's a bit of a revolving door as far as the tenants and roommates go. Several of these people have shared creepy stories about the house. Most of the stories lacked any meaningful details, i.e. the window rattled, you know. I didn't take anyone seriously. I thought they were all paranoid until last Friday night. It seems somewhat worth noting that most of these stories happen on or adjacent to our back patio. No idea why. So on Friday night, myself, one roommate, Diego, and his girlfriend were all sitting at a table on the patio talking. It was already after dark, so we had the patio light turned on. Our sliding glass patio door was open. At roughly 8.15, somebody turned off the patio light on us and slammed the sliding glass door shut. For context, the patio light switch is located inside the house, so we couldn't see who flipped the switch. Diego commented, Well, that was rude. It was abrupt, but not that strange. Our other roommates, Armando and Carly, lived upstairs, and they're sometimes sensitive about sound. I assumed that maybe they heard us and got annoyed. Or maybe they didn't hear us and simply thought that we left the light on and the door open when we left. I stood up and went inside, turned the light back on, and this time when I returned to the patio, I slid the glass door closed. The next afternoon, I talked to Armando, and he said that he and Carly, their boyfriend and girlfriend, had left the house around 7.30 p.m. Friday to visit the mall and see Diablo's baseball game. They weren't home when the light shuddered and the door closed. I was surprised. That same Saturday afternoon at the same patio table we were sitting at the evening before, Diego and three friends were having a beer. There was one empty chair at the table. Suddenly, the empty chair, or someone sitting in the empty chair, whistled at everyone. Everybody paused and looked at each other. On Monday, yesterday, I ran into Bito, a friend of the company who used to live in the house. I told him about the weekend and he said, wait until you see the girl. This was the second, possibly third time I'd heard of a little girl in the house. Another instance was by the manager of our company, Yolo who also said that she saw a little girl in the house. This is nearly impossible as almost no one here has a child and none of the parents we know have ever brought their kids to the house. Now I understand that they're all fairly minor instances and maybe they could be explained away. Maybe one or more of our friends are tricksters, but it's starting to feel like that's not the case. Other slightly off occurrences are as follows. Someone, in quotes, randomly threw straws out of the window at our friend while they sat on the patio and no one was home. Julian saw someone move inside Diego's bedroom through the window. Diego wasn't home. Armando heard voices directly outside his bedroom door as if someone was in the hall. No one was home. This particular case is the only one where we thought the voices may have just been carried from outside because the house is big and kind of echoey. The Walmart Ghost Chronicles I work at a Walmart that's closer to a supercenter than a store. I had an experience with our store ghost and have had several more since the first. I've never been a skeptic but I still rely on practical evidence to base any claims or beliefs on. 
Since I was much smaller, I've always been sensitive to paranormal activity and creatures. I have a knack for it, I suppose. In any case, I digress. For background information, I think I need to explain how I know there could be an entity in the building to begin with. My father has worked at this store for over 20 years now. Farther back in his career as a Walmart employee, he and the whole staff were present for a dramatic death. An employee had been going through a rough breakup with an abusive boyfriend. She had even gone so far as to request an escort for her car every night for fear over her ex. This woman came to work and her ex showed up. When she refused to return home with him, he drew a gun. Not on her, but rather on himself. There in the parking lot, he shot himself, died instantly. This event was disturbing enough that most of the staff took a mental health day. My father did not. Now, as I work more during the nights than any other time, I find myself alone fairly often. Most of my work after hours is monotonous and tedious, making the shelves look nice for the following day. My first experience was when I was putting things away in the garden center. After 9 p.m., they dim the lights in this area. It's the only place in the store that is left without tile flooring. It is also completed with metal racks instead of an abundance of shelving. Basically, it's already an uncomfortable space to be in by yourself. Now, there are two pairs of electric doors, one that leads outside to the back of the building and one that leads to our greenhouse. Both are locked after 9 p.m., just as the lights are turned off. Under normal circumstances, they do not open. Not at this time. Or rather, save for this time, so not this time. I'm walking aisle to aisle in my effort to put away returns. This night I have no headphones, so I'm just listening to music over the loudspeaker. My footsteps echo against the concrete floor, and every item I place on the shelves rattles. It's some time during this back and forth that I hear the door slide open. Thinking a co-worker had opened it to put away some mulch, I walked out and looked around, ready to greet them. No one. I look about and even check the door to find the button still in the locked position. Annoyed rather than unnerved, I go back to my work. On a trip to the cart, I froze. Behind me, the door slides open. I slowly turn around to see no one. Now, I'm uncomfortable and not wanting to linger for any longer than I have to. I switch from a slow walk to an almost jog. I'm putting stuff away as quickly as possible when it decides to open and close much more rapidly than it should. I simply take off telling myself I'm just tired. Turns out, they caught it all on camera and inquired about it. The parking lot suicide man struck the first time and many times after. Grand Aunt or Grandma Eugenia Let's call my Grand Aunt Eugenia my Grandmother Eugenia. My Grandma Eugenia died when my little sister was around one years old and I was six years old. My actual grandma, my mom's mom, took it especially hard since Eugenia was, I think, the youngest sibling of the nine siblings my grandma's family had. I remember holding my baby sister in my arms as my mom, newly out of one of the surgeries that she had, was holding her... Well, there's a picture here, but it looks like a... I don't know, a vertical rectangle with the bottom missing... Anyhow, they're using the shape to describe the crutches. While she was holding on to her crutches in her arms and begging her mom to unlock her room's door. It's the first and only time I heard my mom calling my grandma mommy and crying. I remember being taken to the middle room and forced to watch cartoons, only for me to change the channel to space documentaries and playing in the local channel. 
I had a very weird feeling. I can't describe it, but maybe the closest I can describe it to is kind of like the discomfort that I was having looking around me, worrying, and I was holding my sister in an iron hug. So much that my sister bit my arm in order to let her roam the room. I don't remember if I saw anything, though. Until I became 12 years old, I caused my grandma to break her hip because I was throwing a temper tantrum before and throughout the church service. And after communion, I ran out of the building and my grandma had to run after me, dragging my six-year-old sister with her. She tripped over the new floor. It was marble. Broke her hip. My sister ran to me and told me about grandma. I was taken by an old student of my grandma's and we went to the ER. I was hungry and thirsty, but I suddenly, mid-sentence, jumped up. I said I was sorry and started walking towards an empty room. I felt as if I should see someone, but I didn't. Dizzy and nauseous, I returned to my seat. Two months later, I grounded for my causing of my grandma's injury, you know. And as I was eating some homemade ice cream my dad made and watching TV, my punishment was not allowed to go outside when suddenly at 18.05 p.m., on the dot, shut down with my new spoon of ice cream when I got my first anxiety attack. And one of the worst I ever suffered, I fainted from the pain in my chest. That's when I saw it. I was in a hospital room. Everything was hazy and white. And there, Grandma Eugenia was there, dressed in a white hospital gown and sitting next to my grandma's bed and crying. I apologized for harming my grandma, and she said that I should apologize to my grandma if she survives her heart attack. I looked afraid at my unconscious grandma, and she's pale white. Then I ran out of the room, crying only to find myself lost in corridors in a hospital. Then I felt my chest being in pain, and I regained my senses and my ice cream spilled on the couch and the floor, and the bowl was broken on the floor. In my hand, I held the spoon, though. Then the phone rang, and it was my Aunt Helena, telling me that Grandma had a heart attack just before she entered another hip reconstruction surgery, and instead of that surgery, she got a pacemaker in her heart. Ask Reddit. I come from a pretty middle class family, all wholesome. I have BPD, and in my teens I smoked weed, drank, took a lot of shrooms, hung out with the guys that stole cars, shoplifted. I used to hitchhike a lot as we lived pretty rurally. My first real took my virginity girlfriend was a pretty hectic chick from Ukraine who grew up in Russia. Long story short, she suddenly ghosted me, but eventually I found out she was seeing someone else, and obviously I saw red and had to find out. So I hitched into town to her house at about midnight. The guy who picked me up was around 40 or so, and he asked what I was doing on the highway hitchhiking. He was worried, because he had a daughter the same age, 17. He asked advice on how to deal with her better, and he listened. I felt a huge respect from him. He asked why I was hitchhiking at midnight. I told him why. All he said was, Be careful, this could be a big moment in your life. The ride I got home was the big one, though. So I get to her house, and long story short, cops were called. I sprinted through backyards and through drains and alleys to get back to my hitching spot at the start of the highway. As I'm running down to the road, I see a car. A miracle, as it's 3 a.m. now. The car actually stopped. I open the door, and it's the nicest smelling car, and the driver is a lovely, probably 70-year-old lady, and she says, 
are you going to rob me? And I laughed and I said, only if you don't rob me. And I hopped in. We rode in mostly silence, but toward the end she said, You remind me of someone I lost long ago. I know things will get better for you soon. And eventually I got home. I had a little granny flat away from the house, so I snuck in and jumped into bed. Literally 20 seconds later, I hear my stepdad walking from the house to my room on the phone saying, Think you got the wrong person. He barges in and is like, Something 213. You here? Yeah, why? The police are on the phone. They're looking for you. And hands me the phone. Here's the cop talking. Blah, 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 blah. Ex-girlfriend says you smashed her window and blah, 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 blah. Me. Been here all night. Cop again. Where's that? Me. Small town, 20 minutes drive from her house. Cop. Okay. Good night. If that car hadn't pulled up, why the fuck was an old lady driving around at 3 a.m.? I'd been put away, and my life fucked in that process. I cleaned my shit up after high school, and I'm doing very well now. But my whole life would have been very different if it weren't for that otherworldly old lady. Story number five. Was it really there? So I was in the ninth grade when this thing happened. Usually after our school ended, I used to go to tuition with my two friends. Our tuition class was situated in a small jungle area. We would come to class exactly at 6 p.m., Actually, it was a haunted place because of some people had experienced really creepy incidents there. Even our teacher had said to us that it was really dangerous. Also, she had an unusual experience there as well. There were just two streetlights there because of all this remoteness. It used to be too dark when we had to go get back home. But we didn't experience such things there because we friends used to have... Fun, playing, talking, and all that. And one day this happens. A junior friend of mine wanted to go to the washroom badly, so he went outside the class to the compound to pee. We all usually used to go outside only. So when he was peeing, he turns his face to the right side. There was a small house which was empty, and nobody lives there. Its windows were broken. We can see inside of everything. There was no light in it. It was fully dark in there. When he turned his face to the right, he saw a figure of an adult kid whose face was too creepy, and only the head, the hand, were visible when he was watching. There was a figure, and it was calling my friend by gesturing from his hand. My friend was shivering, and he came running to our teacher and said everything that had just happened to him. He didn't come to class for two days that he had. He had a fever, I guess, because of that accident. After that, me and my bestie were st just saying that he might have hallucinated because we were teenagers at that time and we didn't really care much about these things and both me and my bestie decided to have a tour around that haunted house. A friend of mine had a phone and he said for us to record the whole thing. We said okay and we went on for it. It was 8 p.m. We both were recording everything in the house from the outside, making fun of it, saying, Hey, ghost, where are you? We're here to see you. We walked around the house, recorded everything. It was fully dark and our flashlight was on. Lastly, we go back out of the house and I felt something went like a flash when I saw the camera. But I ignored it. And from back there, we could see our remaining friends standing there, just outside the class compound. At the end of the tour, when we were calling our friends from the back of the house, 
saying that we needed to see something in here, and were also whistling while at the end of the video recording. Then we came back to class, ready to watch the video. We both remembered that the video was about eight to nine minutes. But when we saw the video, the video ended in just two minutes while we were heading toward the back of the house, as I had said, felt something flashed in the camera. And as the flash came, the video was ended there itself. And also we both started to notice that the video had a short and checked it twice if the video recording's on or not, so we don't have any doubt about if we started the video or not. Sorry guys, this is a confusing post. Till now we talk about that day and still have felt creepy about it. Now we do feel it was really there. Story number 13, yet another with the title of Story. This next encounter would be the last for that house as we eventually moved away. I had been woken up and out of my sleep hearing the stomping that my mom would hear. The TV in my room was on, so I had a bit of a light. I opened the door and I saw that was what was making this noise and I got my answer. The old man except for the fact that he looked rotten. As he were an extra from the walking dead amount of rotten. His eyes were cloudy, he looked bloated, and some of his organs were out for me to see. I screamed as I ran to my mother's bedroom and started banging on her door. She quickly opened the door, wondering why I was so shook up. I tell her, there's an ugly man inside, thinking someone had actually broke in. She picked me up in one hand and grabbed a bat with the other and ran around every light and just cursing like a crazy lady. After a while of searching and calming everyone down, we noticed that there was no sign of anybody breaking in. No broken or open windows, no open doors, nothing out of the ordinary. We ended up moving out after that. Fast forward to my early teens, I learned about my mother's involvement with witchery and magic. I and my sister decided to get involved with that. This was 2018 to 2019 when I had learned about her being a witch. I decided to also become a witch, looking through all the books, later learning and researching more about the existence of gods and the spirits of the polytheistic origins. Learning how to read and use runes and dipping my toes into the satyrs. Seder magic, shamanistic and folk magic practices, nah. folk magic practices, both of both the Americas and Europe's, and even black magic. I decided to put this into use. One night I had a nosebleed. Being young and filled with ambition, I had used that blood to finger paint a sigil in my floor, hoping for something. Well, I got what I hoped for. Mind you, my room has a window that leads to the fenced-off backyard, so I wait until I hear screeching out in my backyard, and it sounded like a chimera between a pig and a young lady being stabbed. I stand there, wondering what the hell that was until my sister comes out of her room. I follow her asking if she heard the screams. She says no. Then she told me that she saw something in her room. Turns out that while I was waiting, my sister was chilling in her bed until she noticed a naked old lady in the corner of her room, right next to her closet. She described the lady as being slim, but with large wrinkles and folds of skin, being as tall as her older brother, who's six foot two at that time. She also said it looked like the lady had sunken in eyes, and she could tell the lady was as pale as the walls that she stood next to. The lady took a step towards her until she flashed her phone at the woman, making the old lady disappear. Needless to say, she didn't get much sleep. The next morning, I got up to take out the trash, and as I entered the backyard, I see a small circle of sticks tied to each other with the skin and bones of a squirrel wrapped around it. I showed my mother, and she just kicked it into the dirt, told me to ignore it.
Looks like we have a ghost again. Story number nine. Around two years ago, when we had just moved into our house, strange things started happening. And this went on for about a month. I won't go into much detail as it's unrelated, but it all stopped a week or so after the police discovered our downstairs neighbor, who had been dead for weeks in his flat. And no one knew. Poor guy. May he rest in peace. Anyway, let's jump to the most recent events. It all started last Tuesday. It's in the evening, when our vacuum window cleaner starts randomly turning on. At first, it's every, you know, 10 to 15 minutes, but the time span gets shorter and shorter. Anyways, my girlfriend and I are watching a movie, and we're too lazy to deal with it, so we just keep it close to and just turn it off every time. Then we start getting ready to go to bed and wondering whether to put the vacuum cleaner in the living room or straighten the bins outside. But as we're discussing, we realize it had not turned on recently. So we just cross our fingers, hoping it won't scare us shitless in the middle of the night. We go to bed. On Wednesday, I wake up first, and it's all quiet. But as soon as my girlfriend opened her eyes, it starts all over again. We wait for the battery to die and put it into the closet. On Thursday, which was also my girlfriend's birthday, about 4 a.m. I have a very vivid dream how I walk in our bedroom and see one of the bedside tables tossed to the other side of the room and the other one shaking with the drawers being opened and slammed shut constantly. I wake up feeling uneasy, but don't think too much of it. Then I notice the fairy lights above our heads are on, but so dim you could barely see them. I'm surprised as I had just put new ones two weeks prior. We hadn't used them since, but whatever. Thought we might have turned them on and forgot them so the batteries are running out. Girlfriend wakes up around five. I show her the lights which at that point started flickering and we decide that we'll let the batteries die and change them later. In the evening, we had a nice dinner with a glass of wine. I drank white, she drinks red. Cleaned the table, went to bed. Around lunchtime on Friday, our, our housemate jokingly asks if we started drinking in the morning, because there's a few drops of red on the counter, and they're fresh. Like not dry or anything, but like someone spilled it just now. We cleaned it and moved on, not making any connection between those three events. And why would we? So yesterday, I remembered to change the batteries out of the fairy lights. I'm about... I am about to, when I noticed the switch was off. But we did leave them on that night, or so we thought at least. I asked my girlfriend. She says that she hasn't touched it. I switched them on, and they're as bright as they could be. So I start freaking out a bit, and my girlfriend's like, Maybe my mom's hanging around. Her mom passed away about three months ago, so I start freaking out more because she didn't know her daughter had a girlfriend, and I didn't think she'd be very thrilled. Anyway, I calmed down after thinking about it a lot. I realized all of those events were somewhat connected to my girlfriend and not me. Maybe it was a, just a wishing for a happy birthday or something. Nothing else happened since. Story number two, saw something crawling in the streets. This experience happened two years ago, mid-2018. So I used to almost every weekend on Saturdays go to one of my friend's houses, or have them in mind. We alternate the houses a lot, just to hang out, play games, and drink. We're a big group. Every meeting got about 10 to 15 people, and these meetings used to last until 3 or 4 a.m. on Sunday. I don't do this anymore because I'm working on another city, rather in, since 2019. After one of these hangouts in a friend's house, we spent the day playing video games, like FIFA, Tekken, whatever. I left the place around 2 to 3 a.m., don't remember the exact time, 
pretty far from my home, so I have to drive around 30 minutes to get near where I used to live. On the way home, there's this main street. I have to take a sharp turn to the right to go home. On the right side of this main street is some military forest area with walls and barbed wire. Those kind of things. The turn that I need to take is just at the end of this walked area. The main street continues while I take a turn to the right. While I was doing the turn to the right, I did a glance to the left with the corner of my eye, and I saw something crawling in the middle of the street. I'm getting goosebumps while writing this. I had four members like a person couldn't be a person. The angle of the articulations was totally not human. It reminded me of like a cricket's leg. I don't know. But I didn't stop the car. I did the turn a bit slow, looking at it, while it was moving. It was moving in a weird way. A bit slow and like it was learning to walk. I don't know how to explain it. It wasn't naked. It had some rags that looked like torn old fabric covering the body. It was about 50 to 60 meters away from me. I had a very strange feeling. To this day, I've never had this kind of feeling twice in my life. Just that day, very bad. It was like I was going to die. It stopped moving like it saw me. I can't tell if it did in fact see me. I couldn't see the face. It had a head, not an animal head with a snout. It was a rounded head, like a human or a monkey. And I'm talking about seconds. The visual contact lasted for like five, six seconds. I don't know. It didn't stop. After the turn, I accelerated the car. I was in shock, almost crying. I looked back a few times until I got home. I stopped the car to open the gate, almost in panic, looking back all the time. Almost dropped the keys. It was late, empty streets all the way, not a single person. I parked the car and got inside home, rushed the stairs, went to my bedroom, sat on the bed for some time. That image was in my head. It took long to sleep. I still can remember it. I still can see it in my mind. Story number 12, Encounter in the Park Told by a Friend. I was 14 years old, and I was about to set off to school. Before I left, my mom asked me if I had any weird dreams that night. I told her no, I didn't, not thinking anything about it, and then went on, just went on my way. Fast forward to getting home. My chore was to walk the dog, a large German shepherd. She was a very calm, a protective dog. I set off with the dog down my usual route, which was across the road into a wooded park area, with a river running through the middle. It was a wet autumnal day, leaves everywhere in the ground sodden. While we were walking through the woods and down the path, we get to the bridge. The bridge is wide enough for two people side by side to cross, and made of timber to help you envisage it. My dog starts growling all of a sudden as we start crossing this bridge. I look around to see nobody around, and I tell her to, come on, stop being silly. She continues to growl and stops in the middle of the bridge. I look down at her again, and she's looking behind us. As I look up in the direction she's facing, there's a girl standing there right in my face, literally nearly nose to nose. This girl startled me, making me jump. My dog was now barking and growling. I asked this girl if she was okay, but she just stared at me, just staring with a white, pale, gaunt face, all curly red hair down to her shoulders. I got nervous, turned, and walked away with my dog, still looking behind, growling. I thought it was strange as I didn't hear this girl approach us on the dead leaves or the wooden bridge. 
What scared me even more was that she continued to follow us. She maintained distance, but continued down the path that we were on. At this point, I was fearing for my life slightly, decided to cut through the wooded swampy area to my left to reach an exit of the park faster. As I cut through this area, I thought I wouldn't be followed due to the ground. To my horror, we were followed, and this girl continued through the swampy ground toward the exit. Once my dog and I got to the exit, we left the park and ran across the road immediately. I turned and noticed the red-haired girl stopped at the gate, then proceeded to turn around and head back into the woods. I went home and told my mom about this experience immediately, to which she replied, Did the girl have red hair? I was stunned, and I told her yes. My mom then said she dreamt about a red-haired girl last night. I never walked the dog through those woods again. So after reading this encounter, probably not told as well as my best friend, what do you wonderful people think this was? A spirit that maybe passed in the woods? A girl playing a prank to scare people? My friend and I can't wait to hear your thoughts on this. Strange how he didn't hear the girl approach and that the dog wasn't happy usually not growling at any stranger during walks. Also the fact that his mom dreamt of the same girl the night before. Let's answer this fine lady. What do you guys think that was? That's a pretty vivid account on my watch. Story number seven. Ask Reddit, too. Many years ago, my now ex-husband and I purchased what used to be an old farmhouse. It was a unique old house that had been added on to many times over the years. We started updating it room by room and had been living there about a year before we began to work on finishing the basement. I had three boys from my previous marriage, who were 9, 11, and 14, that lived with us but visited their dad every weekend, who lives about a mile away. The first project in the basement we planned on doing was to convert one of the good-sized storage rooms into a walk-in closet for seasonal clothing, sports equipment, things like that. The previous owners had left several cheap metal shelving units behind in this room. We'd never really moved them, but they weren't part of the new design. The night before I was set to start on the project, the boys and I rented videos and watched Stir of Echoes with Kevin Bacon. From what I remember, the movie was about a dad character, Kevin Bacon, having dreams or visions about a young girl who had died and was trying to get him to find her and solve her murder. It wasn't too intense, but had a few suspenseful parts with jump scares and special effects. I recall the end being something about him digging in the basement, trying to find the dead girl breaking through a blocked wall and discovering her behind some thick plastic sheeting or something like that. Predictable, but we all enjoyed it, especially my 11-year-old who loved scary movies. The next morning, the boys all went to their dad's. New Hubs goes to work, and I start on the storage room project. The walls in this room are covered in thin paneling. I start moving the metal shelving out so I can begin work when I see that the paneling on one of the walls behind the shelving unit isn't snug against the walls like the rest. It's kind of gapping a bit at the bottom. I take a closer look and see a very small slide lock, like a miniature deadbolt cut into the paneling and a distinct cutout like door. What the fuck? We have a secret room? How cool! Can't keep this discovery all to myself so I run upstairs to call the boys at their dad's Eric, and the 11-year-old answers the phone. I tell him what I found in the basement. Both of his brothers are at a friend's house, but he is super excited to check it out with me, jumps on his bike, and zooms home all sweaty from pedaling so fast. This is exactly the kind of thing Eric loves. We go back to the basement, a slide, the lock, and pry the door open with a screwdriver. The first thing we see is a thick sheet of plastic, just like in the movie we'd watched the night before. Holy shit, 
We slam it shut and start laughing. He says, we gotta be brave, Mom. So I find a razor knife and slice through the plastic. Inside is a small room with sandy dirt floor that's got several old TV sets and buckets of old glass tubes and an old desk with old newspapers in it. No dead body or Kevin Bacon to be found, but we sure had fun going through the desk and laughing about the secret room that was called the Stir of Echoes room from that point on. My father-in-law said that this was an old-fashioned root cellar that was used to store root veggies and potatoes back in the day. What a strange coincidence that we had watched that stupid movie the night before. Story number three. We both saw the lady with no face. This took place when my sister and I were younger, her being eight and I ten. We used to live in a two-bed, two-bath apartment. I remember always feeling uneasy and just seeing things from the corner of my eye. We watched a lot of Ghost Whisperer, a family of three back then as well. Well, one night I remember abruptly waking up from my sleep and shooting straight up in bed. It took some time for my eyes to adjust, but I vividly remember seeing this all-white figure. It was shaped like a woman, and a bit transparent as well. And from what I could tell, she wore an old Victorian-style dress. The ones that made the butt look more pronounced. And she had an umbrella that looked to have a lace on the trimmings. It was such a vivid sight that I still think about it every now and then. But anyways, I see her gliding to my sister's part of the bed. And she had bent down so slowly it almost was barely noticeable. Now, she was face to face with my sleeping sister. I remember fixating on her empty face. There was nothing. As I'm trying to find even a slight facial feature, I just felt like she wasn't even looking at my sister at that point, but me. She stayed in that position, not budging even the slightest. I remember feeling panicked, almost like I wasn't supposed to witness what I've been seeing. I remember feeling as if time had stopped, whilst I was trying my best to go unnoticed and laying back down. And once I was, I immediately pulled the covers over my head, just in case she planned to be face to face with me as well. I didn't want to wake up seeing that. So once the morning came around, I wanted to ask my sister if she heard or saw anything, at least that night before. I was really conflicted with her being so young. I didn't want to scare her, but I had to know. I said something along the lines of, Did you wake up in the middle of the night too? And I shit you not. She told me she was scared to tell me that there was a woman who was just staring at me. I had asked her to describe the woman and she gave me the same description. All white, puffy bum dress with an umbrella. And of course, no face. I had asked her to tell me as much as she remembered. She told me she woke up shooting straight up in bed and looking at my side and seeing that this woman was already bent down face to face with me. She said she felt the woman was nice because she felt in no harm for me or her. So she simply just turned over, simply turned over and went back to sleep. Of course, I was freaked out by what my eight-year-old sister had told me because up until then I really was thinking it was because of a ghost show that we were constantly watching together. We spoke about it a while ago, and she says that she still remembers how she looks as well. The Little Girl with the Stuffed Bear I've always been in tune with spirits since childhood, mainly seeing apparitions or feeling energies and silhouettes. 
this encounter was when I was in my third year of university. I moved into a new student rental, the basement of the building. The house was nice, new and in a quaint neighborhood a distance away from the university. Shortly after moving in, I felt like I was being watched. My room was in a corner of the basement, adjacent to two hallways, one that led to the living space and the other that led to the entrance and furnace area. I didn't feel threatened. Over time, I would see an apparition of a little girl. She wore a white dress, had shoulder-length hair, but her bangs covered her face, which I couldn't see well. Sometimes I'd see her with a stuffed bear. Normally, the encounters would be, I might walk from my bedroom to the bathroom to see her silhouette move from one room to another, as if she was curiously watching me. Fast forward about three months. One weekend, I'm back in my hometown visiting my family. My mom, who is very in tune with spirits, pulls me aside to talk to me. She said that she knows I'm being followed and that the spirit is passing by, quote unquote, but is attracted to my energy. I already felt no harm, so I thought that was kind of cool. My mom suggested one night I try and talk to her to see if, you know, what she was all about. While I returned to my student place, I started talking aloud before going to bed. She was the most active, by the way. Saying if she feels comfortable, she can come out, and I won't be harmful or anything. Another month goes by, and one night I'm studying for a math exam the next day. It was getting late, so I head to bed. Now, I've always heard that if you awake between three or four, it tends to be the dead hour. Fast forward, it's around four, I wake up, which is normally unusual for me, but it was different tonight. When I awoke, I was on my side and my vision was aligned with the wall beside my bed. I left the lamp on, since I was just too exhausted to turn everything off from studying, so I saw a shadow cast on the wall, clear as day as if someone was standing behind me. Now I had roommates but I wasn't close. They were grad students, and it was the summer, so I was usually alone in the house when I was there. I turn around and I see the girl. But this time, she's fully realized she wasn't a transparent apparition. It was as if she was living and breathing, just a girl. I saw her white dress, her teddy bear held in her left hand, and she was looking at me. A peaceful smile. I saw her face for the first time. She was indeed a young girl. She quickly disappeared as soon as I awoke. It was my first time seeing a spirit to this intensity and being up so close with one. I screamed, not out of fright, but out of being startled. After that, I never saw her again. I suspect I may have scared her off since she was timid to begin with. I felt really bad since I wanted to explore this more, but she was nice company for the time that she was around. My Boyfriend's Parent's House I'm looking for advice about a few occurrences that my boyfriend's parents are experiencing. Now I've heard stories for a few years about their house, and I experienced a few things there. They think it's a grandma hanging around, but I don't since instances happened before grandma had passed away. I apologize for how long this is. I also changed the names of the people in my story to keep their identities hidden. The first big experience was when my boyfriend's mom, Nancy, came downstairs after getting ready for the day, found all the cabinets in the kitchen wide open. My boyfriend was living with his parents at the time, so she blamed him, but he was also upstairs and had to come down pretty much that whole day. Not at all. Now I must say, Nancy is very short and would not be able to reach the higher cabinets, which are also wide open. My boyfriend's father, Tom, was upstairs in his office painting and didn't know what was going on. This story was shrugged off as a friendly ghost playing games. 
I had an experience where the Anna Lee dolls that were facing forward on a high shelf when I arrived. We all sat down for dinner and they were all facing away from us. My boyfriend pointed it out because when I had looked at all of them when we first arrived there, no one had touched them, so we kind of assumed there was a child spirit being playful there. I also had the cabinet experience and witnessed it within seconds. I had been sitting at the kitchen table, talking to Nancy, and she was initially standing in the kitchen. She walked into the living room, and she was going to do something, and I followed her because we were still talking. Within five minutes or less, she walked back into the kitchen, and most of the cabinets were open. Like wide open, not halfway. We both looked at each other and said, well, the ghost is at it again. Now fast forward a year or so. My boyfriend and I are now living together, and he occasionally goes to watch his parents' dogs when they go on vacation. He usually spends the night. About three weeks ago, he had stayed there and heard what sounded like a knock on the front door at 2 a.m. He said he looked outside and saw no one was there, so he went back to bed told me the story in the morning and I told him I knew that I was going, or I knew it was going on prior because his parents had told me that it happens to them at night. He was a bit freaked out because he had one more night to stay there. I told him do not open the door for anything because you may invite something unwanted in. Last weekend my boyfriend's father told me that they were watching a scary movie about a haunted house and one of the pumpkin decorations flew off the fireplace mantle. I asked him if it just fell off, and he said, nope, it was like it was thrown off the mantle. Well, this weekend, my boyfriend's dad says he now hears scratching at night. I looked at my boyfriend and told him, usually, that is the sign of something evil from what I've heard and from what I've read. Something weird that happened last night while helping out a friend get home. Haven't used Reddit in a while. Mainly use Twitter nowadays for my social media urges. But I didn't really know where else to put this, so I'm making a return. Last night I got a call from a military buddy. He was looking for a ride home from a bar. Didn't want to spend $30 on an Uber ride. I said sure. I was hung over myself and figured it would help to drive with the windows down and get some air. It was probably 12.30 a.m. and I was driving around my neighborhood trying to take an alternative route that I hadn't taken before, but I did know about. Basically one that went through residential areas and stayed off the bigger, more populated routes. I didn't really want to fight traffic the entire way getting downtown. So as I'm driving, everything was normal. I was listening to some random podcast about World War II. Then as I'm passing this one random house, a couple streets down from mine, there's a kid standing in the front yard right on the edge of the road. To be honest, this doesn't sound that weird. But looking back, it was past midnight and this kid was maybe 10 or 11 years old. He had on a red shirt, tan shorts, and sneakers with a blonde bowl cut totally normal looking kid. So as I'm coming up to this kid, I get to a speed bump and had to slow down, so I was able to get a better look at him. He wasn't playing, he wasn't running around, no other kids were with him. He was just standing completely still and meeting my gaze as I'm going past. Like the entire way down the street, he doesn't stop staring. And after I had passed him, I keep looking at my rearview mirror and he still doesn't stop looking. He doesn't cross the street or go back to playing around. He just keeps standing there, staring at my truck. On the drive back, I told my friend after picking him up about the kid. He was interested, so I took him back the same way where I saw the kid and he wasn't there. Fast forward to when me and my friend get back to my place sitting in my living room shooting the shit watching YouTube and we hear this super fast quiet knocking at the door. 
like so quiet my AC almost completely smothered the sound. It's like 1.30 a.m. at this point, and both my roommates are out of town for a long weekend. So I was kind of wary of answering the door. I peek out the window next to the front door and I see no one there. Honestly, this could have been a tree limb hitting the roof near the front door, but in that moment, it was like I was having a heart attack thinking I'd see that kid there. Later when I was in bed just lying there, I heard a few more random knocks in different places. My bedroom is right next to the front door and goes out onto the patio that the front door connects to. These knocks could have been at the front door or just in the same random spot in the house. At this point, I was so tired I really didn't care to worry about it, and I passed out. Waking up this morning thinking about those knocks creeped me out a bit more, but just doing a walkthrough in my front patio. Nothing was out of the regular, so there's not much else to go on. The Ghost Sighting That Made Me a Believer This incident occurred sometime in 1982, before I joined the U.S. Air Force. Around 1982, I was in college, and we were living in a rented bottom apartment in Bag... Ooh, this is hard to say. It's a city in the Philippines, so bear with me. Baguio City. We had one bathroom near the entranceway. My bed was facing the door, which faced down the hallway where the bathroom is. On occasion, I would get up in the middle of the night and use the bathroom. And this night was one of those nights. Just as I was about to get up and go to the bathroom, I see my mom in her nightgown pass by my door. She goes down the hallway to the bathroom. I was sure it was my mom because it looked like the nightgown that she wears, and she had short hair exactly like my mom's. I didn't see the face, only the back of her head. My first thought was, Oh great, I gotta pee and now I gotta wait for mom. After a few minutes, mom had not left the bathroom. And I was getting impatient because I had to pee. Finally, I called out, Mom, can you hurry it up? I gotta go pee. No response. I called out again and still no response. Just great. So... I got up and walked down the hallway to the bathroom and saw that the bathroom door was open. I ask, Mom, you there? You okay? No response. I open the door and no one is in there at all. I'm confused at this point because there's no way that she could have left the bathroom and gone back to bed without me seeing. And I'm also freaked out, but I still have to go pee. I go back to bed and can't get back to sleep. I asked my mom in the morning if she had gone to the bathroom last night. She said that she didn't. I later found out that the owner's niece had killed herself upstairs, and they showed me her picture, and it looked exactly like the figure I had seen. But this wasn't the only incident to happen in that house. One night I was woken by three loud steps on the side of the dresser that was next to my bed. I mean, they were loud slaps. I was confused. This was before I had the sighting. I tried to replicate how hard you'd have to slap the dresser to get that sound. I found out that I had to slap that dresser very hard to replicate the slaps that happened literally a few inches from my head. The only other incident also happened while I was in college. I was taking engineering and I was working on my plate for my mechanical drawing class. It was late at night but I was busy, and for some reason I looked up for my drawing to look at a shoe in front of me on the floor. The shoe suddenly moved by itself across the floor about four feet. I freaked out and ran out of the bathroom. I didn't bother finishing my project. Crap. But those were the only three incidents that I can remember from that house. Years later, my brother and sister would tell me that they would hear footsteps in the kitchen as well. Story number 11. 
had a weird experience that basically broke me mentally for a bit. I'm currently staying in some friend's garage made into a temporary apartment until I get back on my feet. Right off the bat of moving in, I got weird vibes. For the first couple of weeks, I kept having intense nightmares that were partially sleep paralysis where some one or some thing is in the garage with me, hiding in the corners, watching me, then slithering around and peeking at me from below the side of my bed or something coming up behind me and grabbing me. One specific window in the garage creeps me out the most. It's not covered with anything, so if anyone was outside, they could look in. But I can't see out due to the lights I have on inside. My cat will often sit on the window and scratch at it if she's trying to get to something outside of it, which is weird for her because she's freaked out by going outside at all. Kind of a big, wimpy, indoor, pampered baby. So the only conclusion I have is that there's something out there that she's trying to get at. One day a couple of weeks ago, I was listening to music on my headphones. I had my laptop open. I had nothing but the main screen on it. I was dancing around, vibing to music, when I suddenly heard a weird deep sound somewhere in the garage with me when the song I had on was ending, and I could slightly hear my surroundings again. I turned around, and on my laptop, the screen was suddenly jumbled and glitchy. It was kind of started to have a flash and a shadow these weird symbols that didn't look familiar at all. I ripped my headphones off and this terrifying sound was playing from my laptop, like a deep demonic voice that sounded like it was speaking backwards. That's what was playing. It was the scariest thing I'd ever heard in my life, and I love spooky stuff. But this was like the type of evil voice that I've only heard in my absolute worst of nightmares. It resembled the song Masked Ball from the Eyes Wide Shut soundtrack, but way deeper and way more evil and creepy sounding. The strange glitchy symbols kept flashing and changing on the screen, while this weird backwards voice was speaking through my laptop. I tried to shut it off or hit escape, but nothing was working. Finally slammed it shut and immediately had a really bad panic attack. I ran inside to my friend's house and told them what happened, while I had an absolute meltdown. I made them go back into the garage with me and inspect the laptop, and the plugs, everything. They tried to explain why it did that. We couldn't find an answer. What's even weirder is that we all noticed that my laptop was actually still on mute from when I muted it a couple of days earlier making it even more strange that I was hearing this coming from my laptop speakers. It shouldn't have been possible. I still have no idea what happened or why. I'd love to chalk it up to some weird technological glitch, but I don't know. There was absolutely nothing opened on my laptop at all, and it was muted. I don't have schizophrenia, and I'm not crazy or anything. Like, I swear on my life this happened, and it wasn't a hallucination or something. Story number 13, Florida has a lot of native hauntings. I live in Palm Beach County, and I will not say my friends and I have experienced a lot, but I'll tell a few stories of things that we have experienced. Our first ever encounter was when three of us decided to go on a trail at night. The trail is near a native battleground from the Seminole War. I don't know how to pronounce that. Maybe you guys can tell me. S-E-M-I-N-O-L-E. -E. Seminole? From the Seminole War, near the Tree of Tears. Being a couple of dumb teenagers, we went on a trail at around 7 p.m. when it was getting dark in the summer. We walked down the canal, because most of the trails were either flooded or we'd sink in the mud. Us being dumb, we decided to whistle as we laughed throughout the whole time. When we saw a bum, or a, excuse me, when we saw a berm that we could climb over, we did, and decided to head toward the wooded area. We turned to right and realized how dark it was. We got to another turn and turned right again, because 
left was blocked by a fallen tree. As we approached a fork in the road, we weren't sure which way to go as we were talking until we heard the most deep and aggressive growl come from above us. We freaked out and ran back to the path that we were on, and we were deciding if we should go straight through the blocked path or go back the way we came. We decided to head back, but then we went right instead of going to the berm because we wanted to still have fun. As we stopped because of flashlight dying, we heard the same exact growl come from in front of us. We ran to the berm and got to the canal. As we were walking back to the car, we heard a, Hey! And as we looked over, an owl soared over us and screeched. We ran back to the car and didn't say anything the whole drive back. Another was when we were all staying the night at a friend's house, partying. We were all tired. So we decided to go to bed. My friend and I got to sleep on the couches in the living room near the sliding door. The sliding door was always open because it was broken, so after my friend and I made jokes, we decided to sleep. Thirty minutes after, we heard a shotgun rack at the door and we both shot up and got to cover, because our friend's brother was a felon and is known to break in and steal things. We called a friend and we searched the whole property but never saw a thing. A final one was my friend's story. He was out at the canal and camping spot with his girlfriend, quote-unquote, having fun in his car, when he noticed something staring at him from the other side of the canal. He got out and flashed his flashlight to see it pushing down on the palmetto bushes, bushes, staring at him. He shoved his girlfriend in the car and he drove away. Saw another one start to walk out the trees towards his car. He's convinced that it was a skunk ape. Donkey. Story number eight. That one shift too many. Through the early 2000s, I guess I worked a lot, usually seven days a week, sometimes 12 hours and above. I think the longest run was seven weeks working seven days without a real rest. It's that particular run that I'm writing about. So for anyone that's read my previous post about the cat lady, I mentioned some sightings that happened in the place that I worked. Here's my own. I was coming to the end of a particularly long stint of working overtime. I'd been going for seven weeks, and it was Sunday. It was getting late. I was doing shutdown and locking up, making sure everything was safe before leaving. This usually meant I was the last man standing and the last man out. I went through my usual routine, which was kind of like a circuit. First sign of things being off was a movement I caught on the edge of my peripheral vision. I turned to see what had caught my attention. Nothing there. My first reaction was that something was, I guess, just amiss. So I did what any 23-year-old guy does and picked something large and heavy up. I shouted a couple of times that I would phone the cops, try to scare the guy if there was a guy. Adrenaline was high. No reply. So, I carried on shutting down. Going about getting home. Then I saw him. Just stood there. 30, maybe 40 yards away. Tall, black jacket, bald head, just stood there. Only problem was he had no face, no nose, no eyes, no mouth. Now I'm super tired at this rate, so even though I'm blind, just panicking, I screwed my eyes shut, rubbed them hard, shook my head, because that isn't possible, right? But he's still there, so I turned and walked the other way. I didn't run, but I was walking quick enough to maybe break into a run if I needed to. I got down the stairs pretty quickly, grabbed my coat and bag, set the alarm, and just out I went. I locked the door and I went home. Now I know what you think. He was tired, working too many hours, and was seeing stuff. 
I don't feel threatened by it, just to be clear. But it wasn't friendly, and it definitely didn't want me around. Now fast forward three months. Old colleague of mine walking down the stairs from the canteen one early morning. Just me and him there, as we were usually first in. He's white as a sheet, stuttering. I looked at him and just said, black coat, bald head, quite tall. He nods, and we go outside to our coffees and I calm him down. There were a few sightings of whatever it was after that, mainly when people were on their own, mainly getting a feeling of unease. I'm glad I'm not there anymore, as it wasn't the last time that I saw him either. Mangoes. Monday morning, I started having a mild allergic reaction to something because my eyes were itching when I was sneezing the entire day. Dad says he's planning to buy dried mangoes to add to our cereals. And this was around October just for fun if the price isn't too high. Monday late evening, I'm at evening night school sitting in programming, theory class while also working on a year-long essay about AI on my school computer, while my eyes are just feeling terrible since stepping foot on the school grounds at 8 p.m., and it was now 10 p.m. My eyes are starting to water, and they're so red, so I turn to open Facebook to ask my mom if I could do something to alleviate this pain. When my computer gets an alert, Hi, pollen in your area. 75% take caution, beware of allergic reactions. I press the alert for more information because I'm slowly panicking. I've been allergic to pollen since I was a baby. It's an allergy that's stuck by me for 24 years. My town is in the red and orange part, and my area is surrounded by farms. I checked and mango and grass pollen is on the rise. Mango pollen is at 70% and grass at 5%. I text my mom and she advises me that when I return home I should wash my eyes, so I do that. Tuesday morning, 7 a.m., I wake up from the feeling of my eyes being on fire. I go to the bathroom to see the white part of the iris being pink and red. And my under eyelid was also red. I wash my face and put some eye drops and I go back to bed. I dream about mangoes again, and this time I'm cutting pieces to feed my dream daughter. Throughout Tuesday, the word mangoes and the fruit appeared on my TikTok at least seven times. My sister's best friend visited, and one of them were eating Greek yogurt with mango pieces in it. While my sister, as she was getting ready, she asked for lip balm, and her other friend had one, you guessed it, mango-flavored. After they left, I went to spend some time with my aunt, who was watching a trivia game on TV. Huh, and the word was mango. We also played a trivia game, and mangoes came up twice. Painting my nails while hanging out with her, and I want to put on some hand cream, and she gives me one that had a mango scent. It's Wednesday today, and I heard the word mangoes three times before 6 p.m. I'm in class again, and I decided to check the pollen levels because my eyes are still itchy and sore. Still in the 75% range, but now you can add ambrosia, the plant to the mix that's responsible for the pollen levels. Annoyed, I decided to Google ambrosia plant farms and mango farms in my area. That's what came up, with a big fat nothing. None of those are native to my country or area. I've had a few times in my life mangoes, but mostly the dried and sugar-added ones. Not a huge fan to say that I've been craving them. Why am I hearing about mangoes so much? Is the universe trying to tell me something? Or is it just a coincidence? I haven't heard a word this much in my life. Thoughts? My thought is, is now I want mangoes. Things that, as a skeptic, I can't explain. I'm a male living in the UK and I'm an atheist, and I feel that I apply as an appropriate level of skepticism about all things in life. I strongly believe that everything must meet its burden of proof before it's to be accepted. Based on how extraordinary something is and how well it fits into the real world, can observe and test it. 
That being said, there's a great many stories that if you were to ask if they saw a ghost or something paranormal, they would say no. But then after thinking on it for a while, would say actually there is something or things that I can't explain. Something that I wouldn't jump up to the conclusion about, but still nonetheless would be unable to explain. I have a few small things that fall into this category. That when put together might be worthwhile saying. Starting with my mom telling me this as a baby, I'd look over her shoulder behind and grin at something, which really gave her the creeps as this apparently coincided with some other weird things happening like stuff being moved. As a young kid, maybe around six, my mom, brother, and I traveled to stay with our grandmother who lived a few hours away. She was widowed in the 60s and never remarried. My brother would take a spare room and I'd sleep in my grand's bed. One morning I woke up to something digging into my sides. Just like when something digs their two fingers on either side of your ribs to make you jump. I opened my eyes and nobody else was in the room. My grandmother was already up and downstairs. I didn't know what to make of it. I kind of brushed it off and closed my eyes again. But then as I did it, it happened again. This time I shot up and decided that whatever this was, it was trying to get up. Being so young, I didn't tell anyone. I just didn't know what to make of it. I'd never had this happen before and it's never happened since. When I was a few years older, I had a few experiences where my name would be shouted at me or slowly whispered as if dozing off and I'd jump awake freaked out wondering who was responsible. There's a condition called exploding head syndrome. Not nearly as terrible as it sounds, it's more like you're going to sleep and your brain starts to work and you get in these experiences which, at least for this, I feel like I can kind of put down but still I can't be sure. One time at school, while walking in the busy corridor to my next lesson, somebody's hand bent my shoulder from behind, and as they were trying to walk by, immediately somebody's face jumped into my mind. That moment I turned, and I saw that it was the same kid. I don't know this kid or have ever spoken to him. I just knew his face from seeing him around the school occasionally. That I can't really explain, as I was facing the other way the whole time. Finally, fast forward to the age of about 18 or 19. My girlfriend at the time was staying over at my house. We had to get up early and drive into the city through country roads and I could drop her back off at her house and head back to work for the early Saturday shift. I lived out of town and I was kind of a key holder at work so I had to get going around 5.30 and it was still dark. Still driving on the country road, there was some white smoke or fog in the middle of the road and it was kind of the shape of the size of a person, but there was no fog or anything else. Just localized right in the middle of the road. It looked very out of place, like I've never seen fog that way before. It happened all too quick and we drove right through it. We freaked out because she didn't want to leave for work and then when I got to hers, but she had to. I do think that if anybody really thinks carefully enough, more often than not, they will come up with something that they just can't explain. That's why I find these kinds of things fascinating. As requested, the time I think I sensed an angry, godlike being. So it was about a year ago or so that this happened. I worked at Walmart. I lived about 45 minutes away from my store. It was out in the boonies. I still live there, but I don't work right now. One night I was coming home from work around 11. I finally pulled up to my gate. My house is far from the road and it has a long winding driveway that takes you through some trees, but it starts out as a big open spot at the roadside. So like any other night, I got out of my car to get the gate, but for some reason the instant I did, I felt my skin crawling like crazy. For some reason, something in the back of my mind was telling me that I was being watched. I tried to dismiss it as I unlocked and opened the gate. But then when I got back into my car, I felt safe again. By this point, I was dreading getting back out, but I had to close the gate behind me, so I did. But I looked around at everything, every bit of fence, every bush, every nearby tree. Nothing. By this point, I was full on freaking out. Something was watching me, and I didn't know what the hell it was. As I finished closing the gate, I got a weird thought that whatever it was, was above me, which was stupid, since above me there was nothing but clear night sky. I could see all the way across the pasture with nothing but moonlight, and there was nothing above me. 
But just to try to quell that doubt, I looked up to see if anything was there and see if anything seemed off. For some reason, my eyes were drawn to a certain point in the sky. There was nothing there, not even a constellation, not a plane, nothing. But for some reason, the instant I saw this patch of sky, every alarm bell in my head went off. I looked away from it, but I could still feel whatever it was staring at me from above. Stop it, birds. The best way I can describe it is that staring at that point in the sky felt the same way as falling into water that you can't see the bottom of. It was huge. Only whatever it was, it did not seem happy that I could feel it. I just felt this intense hate coming from that point in the sky, and every single red flag in my brain was raised, as if I was in mortal danger. So I did what any sensible person would do, got in my car, drove down the driveway and sprinted into the house where I felt safe again. I don't know if my life was in danger that night, but whatever this thing was, felt as if God himself was staring me directly in the eyes, and he wanted me gone. Thankfully, I haven't felt it since. So yeah, I won't be answering any questions about what I think it was. To be honest, after the warnings I've gotten, I don't want to know anymore. Some things are better left unnamed and unseen, but I think this is one of those things. Pag Pag, a Filipino tradition. Here in the Philippines, there's a tradition called Pag Pag, wherein after you visit a wake, you need to stop over any place and stay there for a couple of minutes before going home. This is because it's believed that the soul of the person you attended the wake goes with you, and stopping over in a place before going home makes the ghost lost, or makes the ghost just Stay there and not follow you home. There was a time back when I'm just 10 or 12 years old. A relative died, and to pay respect, my family and I attended his wake in the province. We stayed there and gave our condolences for about six hours, where my parents just comfort the family of the dead and listen to the stories of his family. As a child, the Pag Pag tradition is what I look forward to. Because for me, it's guaranteed a free McDonald's meal or any food before we go home. We left the wake past midnight. Rain is pouring like crazy. My parents agreed to just head straight home this time because of the rain. So that we can make it home before the flood takes over the area. Disappointed, I pretended to see my uncle, the one who died, at the back of our car. My parents laughed at me knowing it's one of my desperate attempts to get a free meal, you know, from this pag pag. Failed to catch their attention. I sat down and I accepted it. I slept almost the entire duration of our travel. It took almost one hour and a half for us to really reach our house. My mother carried me to our house when we arrived. Awoken by the sudden movements of my mother carrying me, I opened my eyes to see my dead uncle waving at me inside our car as we walked slowly to our house. Surprised, I said it to my mother right away. She just patted me and said, go back to sleep. I got too scared to even leave my bedroom because of this, and it took months just for me to, I don't know, just stop caring about it. Now that I'm over 20, I recall to tell this to my parents again and said that I wasn't lying. I really saw our dead uncle in our car that night. I was surprised when both my mother and my father said they saw him too. Ever since I quote-unquote pretended initially that I saw him, they saw him that moment. I was asleep where they prayed and asked my uncle's ghost to not be with us to our house. They said they always see him in our car every time we or they use it to the point that they agreed to just sell our car a year after that incident. The car was sold to one of my father's friends, and lately I found out that that car got a major accident on the highway, which resulted to my father's friend being half-paralyzed his whole rest of his life, 
And to make it more unsettling, my uncle died because of a road accident too. I still believe that my uncle respected our request to not follow us home that night. That's why he only stayed inside of our car. Rest in peace, uncle. I predicted my stepbrother's death, and he is haunting my family. Back in June, my stepbrother passed away while on assignment with the Air Force. He was only 21, and a few weeks away from 22. He wasn't sick or anything, and we still don't know much about his death. My experiences. Ever since the first day he joined, he left for boot camp, and it was when the dreams of his death started. They weren't common until I got a job at a restaurant that he used to work at, and about three months before his death. I quit the job in April, and the dream stopped until June 2nd, and on June 3rd. Since then, I don't have any dreams anymore. I just fall asleep and just wake up. Now, the dreams were pretty different except for one detail. I always learned about his death on the news. Now, on the morning of June 3rd, I was on Reddit. Scrolling through my page there, there was a post about an airman found dead in his room. I felt like I knew it was him, but the post didn't give any names, so I shrugged it off until my mom called to share the news herself. It was him. Now, all of my dreams always shared the fact that I learned it from a news source followed by my mom calling me. I haven't had a single dream since, until last week where I'm dreaming about my cousin dying. My family. My mom's always been a believer of the afterlife and spirits. She swore that she saw angels and spirits physically watching over me when I was in the ER several times. It all started three weeks after he died. We were having issues bringing his body back due to the fact that he was overseas and the government was in COVID lockdown. They couldn't send a coroner up to check on the body. My mom was woken up at 3 a.m. to loud knocking from her room. Something that never happens in our house. It's less than 10 years old. She looks and sees her phone is ringing on silent. It's the Air Force saying that they're sending him home despite the local government saying no and his autopsy is going to take place in the same hospital where my stepdad was born. After she hung up the phone, she asked, stepbrother's name, was that you? And one soft but noticeable knock was heard from right behind her. She wasn't the only one hearing the knock. On the week of the funeral, we had a family come up and stay with us, and every family member who stayed the night at that house heard some form of knocking near their beds. On top of that, my mom and stepdad would keep hearing my stepbrother's old room door slam and drums playing, his favorite instrument to play, even though the drums are in a storage unit. I since moved out shortly before he passed, so I haven't experienced anything other than my last post here. Story number 13. I used to work at a locally famous haunted hotel. Small town hotel in England. The place has a lot of important local history, but no one would know if it had, if they had lived in the town. Locally famous, but the hotel was old, really in need of a refurbation, and most rooms giving off an 80s vibe. I worked in the kitchen and the bar during my time, and it was common knowledge among staff that the hotel has multiple ghosts. I'm not going to get into details of all the supposed hauntings, but keep this focused on one event that I was present for. I need to make it clear that I did not ever witness anything at the hotel, but I was there and the first person to assist someone who did see something. I was working in the kitchen alone late, cleaning after kitchen closing, 
This was around 11.30 p.m., and the staff was bare bones at this point. Upon arriving every day, you would go to the uniform storage area and get blue checkered trousers, aprons, and other protective gear for your shift. This was stored in a narrow hallway-style utility room, where the walk-in fridge was located and at the end of the hall. A room with washing machines and cleaning storage. A little window at the end of this room and hallway let in the eerie glow of the moonlight. Or on a dark, moonless night, the yellow glow of a Victorian-esque lamppost outside. This room was famously haunted, well known amongst staff. I suppose knowing this information would make it more likely for someone to think that they had seen something in there. It was immensely eerie, too, and the light switch was located halfway down the hallway, nearest to the washing machine section. So you'd have to walk in the glow of the moon or lamppost outside to the light switch. I'm sure this wasn't too healthy in the safety code, but... It was what it was. In my three years working there, I never saw anything in this room. But that night I was working the late night block, and I heard a blood howling scream, followed by one of the young service girls, excuse me, service, I wrote that wrong, one of the young service girls who had been working there very long, rushing into the kitchen where I stood aloof. The manager was quite quick to come in to see what was happening. She was crying and trying to explain that she walked into the dark hallway and saw a giant shadow figure stood by the light of the window that she said started moving toward her. The imagery gives me chills to this day. She may have been influenced by the stories amongst the staff and the local reputation of the hotel, but the absolute genuine fear I saw in her makes me believe that she did actually see the ghost that is said to lurk in the darkness of that hallway. I think my apartment is haunted. I recently moved to a new city about five months ago and therefore moved into a new apartment. For a bit of a backstory on my apartment building, it used to be a factory that was converted to apartments around 20 years ago. In our little village, there are 10 apartment buildings in total, only two of which were part of the factory and the rest were built afterwards. There was always kind of a weird vibe in our unit. You always feel like there's someone watching you. Both my partner and I have thought that we've been seeing things out of the corners of our eyes only for it to be gone when we turn to look. My cat has also been acting strange since we moved here. He was never a whiny cat before, and we hardly ever heard him meow, but now he does it constantly. He'll sometimes look like he's chasing something that's not even there, and will go to a certain corner in our living room and stare for sometimes 20 minutes at a time. With us being on the third floor of the apartment and the tenants below us having their temperature set high, we have a fan on most nights to keep ourselves cool in the bedroom. My fan does have a timer option, but we never use it. One night it wasn't too hot in our apartment, so we weren't going to bother turning it on, but as I was laying in bed scrolling through Reddit, I heard the sound that it makes when it turns on and was blasted with cool air. I thought it was a bit strange, but didn't want to move to turn it back off. After five minutes after turning it on, it shut itself off again. This has happened three times since then. We've also had our TV turn itself on and off and our tall lamp in the living room as well. I've had doors that I could swear were closed to be open when waking up, and our cupboards and drawers open as well. We have had instances where things have gone missing only to show up in the weirdest places. For example, I use a plastic cover that clips on top of my cat's cans of wet food to keep them from getting crusty in the fridge. After taking it off the can, I give it to my cat. I could only find it afterwards. I didn't search too hard to find it as I didn't need it that night because he had ate the rest of the can anyways. 
The next morning, I was getting ready for work, and I found it underneath the bathroom sink in the cupboard of the vanity. My cat's room is across the hall, and I would have no reason to store it in my bathroom. We've also had instances of pictures and decorations falling off the wall or off shelves, and have also heard some questionable noises that weren't my cat, as he would be in bed with us. I know it's not just me overthinking as my boyfriend's been witness to some of the strange occurrences, which helps me feel a little bit less insane. If anyone has any theories to debunk these events, or could just help me with understanding what's going on, that'd be great. If it's something paranormal, it doesn't seem to be harmful at all, just a bit frightening and annoying at times. Speaking and singing in tongues. So this occurrence happened in 2013. I had just started an SSRI that sent me over the moon that I went into my first real experience of psychosis. There were so many strange things that happened, but let me focus on just one. My neighbor had to take me to a hospital where eventually I was placed on a bed in the lobby area because they didn't know what else to do with me, I guess. Someone, either a nurse or something in my head, can't remember, told me to start reading things around me. Maybe to calm me down, I don't know, but I did. Started looking around and eventually all the texts I could see around me. Eventually I looked to my right and saw in the column two safety warnings. One in English and one in Spanish. I read the English one, mumbling, I think, and then I started reading the Spanish one. I don't speak Spanish and I've never learned it so I was just guessing what the words sounded like as far as I could tell. All of a sudden, as I'm reading the Spanish, I lost control of my body in an absolute flood of consonants and vowel sounds that I've never made in my life. Practically every sound a mouth can make came flooding very rapidly from me. It was one of the scariest moments of my life, because I literally thought, this is the end, because I couldn't breathe, but I wanted very badly to. I thought I was going to die of asphyxiation, Eventually, of course, it ended. That must have just been the warm-up because something then even stranger happened. Somehow I managed to fall asleep. I remember the feeling of absolute emptiness like I'd never felt before. I woke up to the sound of singing. Very pleasant singing. Then I realized it was actually me. Now, I've never been able to sing in my life. I have a terrible voice and even to this day I can't reproduce the quality of the sounds I was making at this time. Maybe my judgment was off and I interpreted my singing as beautiful. But later on a nurse told me that I had a beautiful voice. Maybe she was lying, I don't know, but anyway, here's more. It wasn't like I was meaning to sing. It was like my body, something else other than me, was showing me how to sing. It was like I was sitting in the driver's seat of a self-driving car. Hands are on the wheel, but I'm just watching and feeling the car make its own decisions. I was singing what sounded like words, but not in any language that I know. One thing that was amazing was the level of focus that my brain was able to do. It's like nothing else existed except for the next note that floated into my mind. And that level of focus made it possible for my body to easily reproduce the exact note in my head with perfection. It really did feel like some sort of perfection. Perfect focus, perfect clarity, perfect fluid execution. I wasn't making any sort of decisions in this. I wasn't consciously doing anything. I felt more like I was watching my mind and my body do its own thing, able to see clearly how I was able to be manufacturing this song. I was half asleep, but still able to remember this. I don't remember how that ended other than later on I fought with the nurse so extremely that they had to inject me with something that put me out instantly. Story number 13. Spirits. This happened when I was seven years old. I used to live in a certain urbanization, which had a park where it was common for families to meet there and spend time together. Eventually, my family conformed to this kind of activity, and we'd go to this park every weekend or so. What I'll be talking about is the last time my family went to this park before we moved to a different urbanization. 
That's a strange word to use, people. To a different urbanization. I'm just going to say city from now on if it repeats this word. Before we move to a different city. As usual, I was minding my own business. As a kid, I would just simply be playing, go down the slide, climb the monkey bars, etc. Peak childhood stuff. However, once we started packing our stuff so we could leave the park, something caught my attention when I looked up to one of the fences that separated the park from one of the other surrounding houses. I could see through the fence two twins, a boy and a girl, with black hair, both of them. I assumed they were twins because they looked the same age and their faces were similar enough for seven-year-old me to assume that they were related. What caught little me's attention, and still does today, is both the expression that the kids had on their faces and their extremely pale skin. Both of them were smiling and their eyes were looking at me. Not at one of the parked monkey bars or the slide. At me. And I know they were looking at me because... That was the first time I experienced the most uncomfortable visual contact ever. Meaning eye contact. Both of these kids were looking at me dead in the eyes. What took me out of that uncomfortable exchange of glances was my father hurrying me up so we could leave. I remember that as I got into the car, I looked back at the fence where the kids were, and they were gone. However, what made little me shit himself was realizing that where the twins were standing was a house that had been in construction for years, apparently. Basically abandoned. I lived in this city for three years, or urbanization, and remember that I would have gone into this park on a weekly basis, so I would notice if that house had made any advances. I didn't for all those three years. I didn't tell any of my family members, not even my sister, who would already share her experience with me when she saw a ghost on the house that we used to live in. Same city. Till this day, I can still remember how both twins looked at me with their grins at the same time. At that time, I thought it was simply an exchange of friendly glances, but now as an adult, and with more experience and understanding and verbal expression, I can say that their grins weren't at all friendly. I'm assuming you mean an understanding and non-verbal expression. My Grand Aunt Helen My dad has an older sister named Eva, named after my dad's dad's younger sister who died very young and under very weird circumstances that nobody discusses, nor my dad knows. My grandpa had two sisters, Eva and one named Helen. Grand Aunt Helen used to believe very much in dreams, and from what dad told me, she used to predict things via dreams, just like me. When Grand Aunt Ava died, Grand Aunt Helen saw her in her dreams, telling her to tell my grandma, my dad's mom and her sister-in-law, that she'll come back. Come back in the form of the new baby my grandma was about to have, and that they'll give her her name. My grandma at the time had no idea she was even pregnant, and my grand-aunt Helen told my grandma, who then told my grandpa, and together went to the doctor, who told them that they were indeed expecting. My aunt Ava was born and named just like that. Many years later, my grand-aunt Helen was close to dying when my dad introduced her to my mom after they got engaged. And my grand-aunt Helen smiled and said to my mom that she'll make two strong fighter girls yet, and she'll suffer heartbreak and loss as a mother until those girls are born. My mom was a little creeped out by her, but smiled and thanked her. Nine months later, my mom miscarried a baby boy. Then a year after that, I came along, and I was a high-risk pregnancy, and my mom was worried about me. So she went to church where the head nun, who was a family friend of hers, sat next to her and said, I would be fine, and that I'm a fighter. Mom looked shocked at her, as, as I was told. But because those words reminded her of the words 
of how my great-grandmother Helen was speaking. I was born dead. I choked by the umbilical cord. And all the doctors and nurses were ready to pronounce me dead when my mom's very good friend who was a nurse on the team started shaking me while holding me upside down. She softly hit my chest to restart my heart. I was dead for 20 minutes before I came back. I was also premature, so I was stuck in the hospital for two additional months. My sister was born with no complications, thank God. But she suffered a lot as a toddler with pneumonia to the point that she was close to death. But she pulled through. Recently, while I was told the first story from my dad about his Aunt Helen, Mom remembered what she had been told by her, and they told me how they're being surprised and shocked by how true my grand-aunt's predictions about me and my sister both were. I believe we both face challenges, but the biggest ones are those that has to do with health, and I'm currently fighting to pull through. And every time I'm ready to give up, I remind myself of the words my grand aunt Helen told my dad. Story number eight, Ask Reddit. The house I grew up in was more what you would call haunted. You could hear footsteps pace back and forth on the wooden floors upstairs. You'd hear knocks on the floor ceilings and walls. Many other things. It happened so many times that it went from being absolutely terrifying to just scary. I got older and the activity died down to the point that ghostly happenings rarely even happened. Then in my twenties, Fred and I tried out a Ouija board in the upstairs. The creepiest place in the entire house. I'd used the board a good bit. But it's, I guess I seemed skeptical, but still open-minded at the same time. I didn't think we'd have any trouble getting it to work, though. Sure enough, the thing doesn't move an inch. For a good two hours straight, we kept asking questions. I feel kind of like an idiot, so we end up taking out a tape recorder and playing the board again. Asking questions and downloading them onto the computer so we could use filters and whatnot to see if we got a voice. We did this for hours, and again nothing. We completely give up on the board, turn the recorder off, we're having a sort of post-game talk about whether the board really can contact spirits and so on and so forth. We end up on the subject of whether there's a god or not, and in the space between him and I, and slightly to my right, in the same space someone's voice would have sounded like if they'd been sitting there at the table with us, we heard a male voice laugh, like it could no longer contain its laughter, like it had been trying to contain itself. It was very quick, very loud, and clear as day. It was maybe five ha's in a second's time. I know I'm not doing a great job at explaining this, but it sounded very condescending, like a rich snob might laugh at a peasant in some Disney movie. My friend stopped mid-sentence and with his eyes wide. I made him tell what he had heard before, and I would tell him, and he had just heard a laugh, and sort of did one to demonstrate what he thought it sounded like. It was exactly what I had heard. The reason I'm sharing this particular story is because to this day, I can dismiss everything that I heard and saw, everything my mom and sister described to me, every single thing, except the experiences I shared with other people. I haven't had a paranormal experience since, and my mom sold the house seven, I guess seven or eight years ago. I can see why people don't believe. I barely believe some of the craziest things that happened in that house. But I can't dismiss shared experiences, and I also can't dismiss separate people telling me that they've experienced the same things. So many stories and similarities over such a long period of time. My Pierre Cheney Experience I have two buddies. The three of us are avid fishermen. 
while myself and Dave, as we'll call him for now, they're active hunters and outdoorsmen. Over the last three months, we've discussed a trip up to property that I inherited in November, which is located in Grayling. I know the property and grew up going there. It was more or less just a matter of getting the money to do the trip. The time finally came to do the trip on September 16th. So, at 3.30 a.m., we packed up Dave's F-150 and headed north on I-75. Originally, the plan was to head straight to Grayling. But I heard of this quote-unquote ghost town in the woods, a little south of Grayling. So, naturally, I pitched the idea of stopping to my friends, which they excitedly accepted. Upon arrival around 10 a.m., we walked in the woods behind the cemetery, which was fairly nice. We momentarily got turned around, but found our way back to the main cemetery plot. We walked around, paid respect to the stones, and enjoyed the historical aspect. We go to the front of the cemetery, and this is where things got weird. We look across the cemetery and notice two things right away. One, every single tree in the cemetery is dead, while everything surrounding the cemetery is very much alive. Two, it is dead silent. There is no noise of the woods or anything else. It is simply deathly quiet. As we leave, we see a murder, which is a group of crows. Dave states that that's our cue, so we start heading to the truck. As we walk to the truck, we hear a scream from the woods, which caused us to sort of more or less hightail it out of the cemetery. Since leaving, all of us have been experiencing weird things. This is a fairly conclusive list of everything that we've experienced. Shortly after getting out of the cemetery driveway back onto a regular dirt road, my friend accelerates his truck and suddenly loses control, causing us to crash the truck into the woods. We were able to ensure everything's fine on the truck and back it out, and I would consider that fairly weird. Upon arriving home, all of us became ill and are still suffering from some kind of sickness close to a flu or some kind of cold. Most recently, I have noticed things falling off counters in my house, and I heard whispers at off times, which I've brushed off for the most part, before Dave's girlfriend informed us that an entity or something along those lines could have followed us home. My experience was something that I can't explain. When I was about three or four years old, I lived in a small apartment. For my personal privacy, I'm not going to say where. Smiley face. First, I'll tell you some little details. It was midsummer. My room is in a pea shape with a door at the bottom of the pea. The one window I had was completely closed. I had no pajamas on and I only had underwear on because of the weather, and my mom was in the living room watching TV about to go to bed herself. I was fast asleep when all of a sudden I feel a hand on my back. I was laying on my stomach. I jumped up because I didn't expect to feel a hand on my back. When I looked around my room I didn't see anything, mostly because my eyes were adjusting to the dark. I got out of bed and walked to the living room where my mom was. She asked why I was still up. I don't know how I responded because it's been 17 years since this happened and I was three or four years old at that time. After that, my mom walked me back to my bed and I slept through the night. Years later, when I was about 15 years old, my mom and I had a conversation about that apartment. She said that in that apartment, very weird things were happening. Some examples are, when my mom was done with showering, she opened the curtain, and when she went back and five seconds later, the curtain was closed again. 
The TV was turning on in the middle of the night. Weird clicking noises. We suspected that the house had a poltergeist. And when me and my mom were almost done with our conversation, I thought about it that night. And I can vaguely remember a black mass or shape standing in the corner of my room. But that could be a child's imagination. Why I wanted to write this here is because I still want to know what that could have been. Was it my imagination? Or was it the poltergeist? That's the end of tonight's stories, guys. Hope you guys had as much fun listening as I did reading them. And I just want to point out the one story about the dark lake and being saved from drowning not only by, you know, your loved one, but when you fell off the counter. I think that was the most neat story of this evening. I hope to read more like that, and if anybody has any stories to submit themselves, know that we are listening to the comments. And submit that story. Let me read it. it might be good. So as usual, See you next time. Story number 13. Flashing lights and scary sounds. While away at sleepaway camp, I had a paranormal experience that began with seeing odd flashes of light in the sky. And then while out in the woods at night, and even in an open field, I had multiple encounters with a seven-foot-tall, all-black figure, occasionally had white eyes. Someone else who's been there with me when he attempted to pull out a switchblade who claims it has red eyes, although I'm not sure how true this is. This creature stalked myself and two other campers, and even a counselor who helped us through this. I only came across it while walking outside at night. I thought I was crazy, of course, but even in the full moon, when you would be able to see details, it was still very obviously inhuman. I would watch from so far away occasionally, and if we would stop and stare or even notice its presence, it would hide itself behind trees, bushes, all that kind of thing most of the time. And the all-black figure was still very much visible when it was hiding even, and at least I could always feel like I was being watched. This all happened about a year ago, and it basically drove me to my breaking point. I've contacted the other people who saw it several times, begging them to tell me the truth of what happened so I could just come to the conclusion that I'm not insane. And what I saw was perhaps not real. At this point in time, I've distanced myself from them completely, and I text them only occasionally. In a lot of ways, it just felt like a weird camp thing. A lot less scary when you're not in the moment. Tonight, while looking out the window of my, my house, I closed the blinds, and as I'm doing so, I saw random flashes of light again. It isn't hot enough for it to be heat flashes, and I haven't seen anything like that since last summer. To be honest, I want to cry. I was trying to be reasonable and consider the fact that nothing like this has happened in a year, so why would it happen now? Also, considering I'm at my house inside, four hours away from when I saw stuff like that, I basically brushed it off and was completely fine, until I heard deep, raspy groans. I don't know how to explain it, but it sounded like a really bad imitation of a cow. Definitely scarier. I tried to ignore it, considering that it maybe could just be normal sounds from the woods surrounding my house. But it was getting closer to the point that I knew it had to be coming from my backyard. I learned the hard way that curiosity killed the cat so I locked my windows and put down the blinds, but I was just wondering if I should be more concerned about this. This took place in the past hour, and I'm just very concerned that this stuff keeps happening. I'm not very superstitious, and maybe I'm just attracted to the unknown, but tonight? Why? I was just chilling in bed, and it's like begging for my attention.
Zach Baggins Haunted Museum, Las Vegas. I went to the haunted museum with my girlfriend on December 6th of 2020. I want to start off by saying I have a very strong intuition with energy. I experienced many things at the tour. I saw a shadow figure when I thought it was a worker. I saw an apparition of a pale looking lady wearing a black witch hat and some kind of witch robe. I'm a male and when I was using the restroom, my hair slicked back with gel. I felt my hair lift up almost into a mini ponytail. My main highlight would be that I was in a room, and I can't remember which one, but while the host was talking, I felt a little hand hold my hand. I'm very intuitive, and I immediately felt and knew it was a little girl. I instantly felt really sad for her. I felt so much sympathy for this little girl. I felt as if she needed help or something. I told my girlfriend that I feel like there's a little girl with us, and I told her that she wasn't evil and she was really wasn't good either. In all honesty, I'm thinking that this little girl isn't evil, but she has to be a little bit crazy to be able to be in that house, if that makes sense. Anyways, this part is important to remember. After I felt the little girl let go of my hand, in a different room she tugged on my pants four different times. It was my right calf, at the exact same spot every time. This happened in the mirror room, the second time in another room, and the third and fourth time was within seconds of each other. There's a room where a worker dressed as a clown had to tell us stories and whatnot. At the end, he asks, Are there any questions? I asked him if he ever felt tugging at the pants. He stops and emphasizes that it's very common in the museum for people to fear their pants being tugged and pulled. He said word for word, There's a little girl here who's not evil, but is mischievous. I then told him that I already felt my pants being pulled twice at that point of the tour. The clown jokingly told me the girl must be following me because of my slick black hair. Now here's where it gets really interesting. There's a room before the box, I don't know, B-O-X with spaces in between it. I don't want to name the box for personal reasons, it's supposed to be one of the most haunted items. In the room before the box, there's a video explaining how haunted this box is, and that if you don't want to see the box, you can stay behind while others go inside and check it out. While the video was playing, I felt a soft tug on the exact spot of my right calf. I want to say three to five seconds later, my pants got tugged again, and this time it was with such force that it made me jump in front of everybody watching the video. Everybody saw me jump. I had the strongest feeling that that little girl pulled my pants so hard as a warning to not step inside that next room. The next couple of days, I couldn't stop feeling sympathy for this little girl. I prayed to God that if she really is a little girl stuck there, to please help her. But if it was something else, I just want to leave that up to God. Story number 16. Why I started locking my mirrors. Okay, so before I start this story, I just want to preface this that I practice witchcraft and I've been doing so for over a decade. In that entire time, I've never had any issues with ghosts because I know how to protect myself, or at least I thought I did. I'm not that familiar with types of ghosts or spirits, so if anybody knows what this was, please tell me down below. If you don't know, mirror locking is pretty much what it sounds like. Locking it like a door so spirits can no longer get in and out. From research, I found that they use mirrors to come and go as they please. A few weeks ago, around Samhain, or Halloween, I was talking to my coven about witchy things, and my one friend suggested that we tell our ghost experiences. I didn't have anything to contribute, so I just sat and listened to theirs. My first friend's boyfriend told us about how he was sleeping and woke up to the feeling of something pulling his soul through their bedroom mirror. My other friend said that she saw a face in her mirror, so I told them to lock their mirrors so it wouldn't happen again. The veil between this world and the next has been very thin this year, so a lot of people were having weird experiences in general. Since I do protection spells every so often, I felt like I was safe even though my mirrors weren't locked. 
my best friend, who is a Christian and really doesn't see eye to eye with me when it comes to witchcraft, also told me about a weird experience that he had when he was sleeping around the same time. He apparently had about four sleep paralysis experiences in one night and felt like something was after him. Won't go into that story since the rules of this sub say no sleep paralysis stories. The night after everybody shared their experiences, I went to bed. Nothing felt out of the ordinary. Then I woke up around 3 a.m. to get some water because I was feeling a little bit quote-unquote icky. I laid my head back onto the pillow to try to fall asleep again. That's when I had an intrusive thought telling me to lock my mirror. Usually when I have these intrusive thoughts, they're clairvoyant related. But I do admit that sometimes I don't listen. But as soon as that thought crossed my mind, a deep voice, clear as day, said in my ear, Don't even think about doing that. My head shot around so fast behind me and looked directly at one of the mirrors I have in my room. Needless to say, I didn't sleep for the rest of the night. As soon as the sun came up, I started making blessed water, holy water, but for wiccans and witches, and wrote locking sigils on all of my mirrors. As soon as I was done, I felt like I was finally alone in my room, and somehow that creeped me out more than the actual spirit talking to me. Story number 12. My true story from one year ago, somewhere in Wales. I was staying with family in an old renovated stone cottage that was hundreds of years old, built on the vast grounds of a monastery that was destroyed during the dissolution by Henry VIII. The cottage was nestled on the edge of these grounds with a few more modern holiday homes. And this was at the foot of a great hill where an old ruined castle stand guard overlooking the landscape. It was a beautiful scenic place with walking trails right on the doorstep. This house had been in the family for 80 years and we stayed there so I could help with the renovation during the visit. It's their second house and it's normally airbnb so this was our first and last stay here at this cottage. The spookiness began on the first night. I shared a room with my brother, as there was a lot of us staying there. He went to bed early. I went to bed around midnight. Trying to fall asleep, I heard heavy boot-like footsteps up in the lot and attic. The boot steps would walk above my head to the far end of the house, stop for 10 minutes, then walk back above my head again to the other end. This pattern would repeat for hours. This was a very distinct pattern, far, far too heavy to be any animal walking around. The pacing was deliberate, the pause between each step long enough to suggest slow, wide strides. This occupied every night we were there, and my brother heard it too. I did try to record the sound, but it didn't come out very well. I would wake up in the middle of the night and it would still be there, walking back and forth. After two nights of this, I casually asked Grandad if this house had a loft. It did, an accessible hatch over the stairs that would require a long ladder to reach, and his first response to that casual question was, why, did you hear something? I said yes, and explained what we had heard. He got a bit defensive and just said it was animals and rats up there. No small rodent type animal could make that noise that we heard that I'm aware of. One, two, three, four stars. Asterixes, excuse me. Final story from this trip that will be quick as it may have an explanation. On the final night, there was footsteps crushing on the stones out in front of the cottage around 11 p.m. This was a bit odd, so I checked out the window with a limited view and saw no one and no torchlight either. The footsteps faded away in the distance. Story 
Story number 14. My dead grandma saved my grandpa's life. My grandmother passed away in 2013 from pancreatic cancer. It was a long and painful battle, and at the end, she died in her home. My grandfather took care of her the entire time. He stayed by her side. He would get her up when she needed to use the bathroom. He bathed her, all of it. This was a very strenuous job, and by the time my grandma died, my grandpa started to have physical problems with the sheer exhaustion that he was just experiencing. One day after my grandma's passing, he was driving his car like usual and going towards a roundabout. That roundabout was right next to the graveyard where my grandma was buried. As my grandpa was going down the road, he started to have a heart attack and ended up crashing into the clock that was in the middle of the roundabout. He had an old car, so it didn't even have airbags installed. But this actually ended up saving his life, because when you have a heart attack, you need to get a compression or a hit to the chest hard enough to restart your heart. And that's exactly what his steering wheel did when he crashed his car. Now, the reason why everyone in my family believes that this was my grandma was because the next day after the car crash, my uncle went to visit my grandma at her grave. Context. My grandma's grave is built into a wall with a bunch of other graves, and right above all of them, there's a long piece of concrete that gives them some shade from the sun. When my uncle went to visit her, he noticed that a chunk of the concrete was missing and was on the floor and that chunk came from right above my grandma's grave. Mind you, in this period, my grandma and uncle went to go visit my grandma in the graveyard about every day. The reason why I didn't was because my family and I live in a different country. That piece of concrete did not fall before my grandpa's accident. They were certain of it. In my culture, we have a ceremony that we do 40 days after someone's death to make them go to the other side because we believe that souls linger on earth for those 40 days trying to finish unfinished business. And I believe this was my grandma repaying back my grandpa for all the hard work that he did for her when she was sick with cancer. She didn't want him to join her, at least so soon. I have a bunch of other stories when it comes to my grandma and all the things that she did after passing, but this is the most memorable one. My daughter's friend, Chelsea. My daughter is nine now and has no memory of this, but we do. We moved into a new apartment when she was around three or four years old. I'm not sure when it was built, but the aesthetic was 70s. And even though it wasn't up to date, it was one of the best apartments in my small town, especially that that small town had to offer. Shortly after moving in, my daughter kept speaking and playing with who she would refer to as Chelsea. We all just went along with it thinking that she had an imaginary friend was a result of her being an only child. One day, my daughter was just using the bathroom and I heard her talking to herself in there. I went to go check on her and she was just sitting on the toilet talking. I asked her who she was speaking to and she said, oh, an old man. As someone who's witnessed paranormal activity before, this freaked me the hell out. Some time goes by, and one night my daughter tells me that some man was talking to her in bed. She described him as being a tall, skinny man with a cowboy hat. My husband and I were watching TV a different night when our daughter was sleeping. We heard a little putter-patter of bare feet on the wooden floor and assumed our daughter woke up. We looked toward the hallway and didn't see her. So I went back to go check on her and I found her snoring in her bed. 
I got the feeling this was also paranormal, but my husband thought I was just being crazy because he doesn't believe in ghosts. A few nights later this happened again, but my daughter wasn't even at home. My husband followed the sound into her empty room. He still says it was nothing, but to this day I believe it was Chelsea. If I bring it up to him, he'll get weirded out and tell me to stop talking about it. After a year or so, my daughter quit talking about Chelsea, but it was something that I would tell my friends about when they would come over. My sister brought her friend over one night, and my sister started talking about the experience my husband and I had, and my daughter's old ghost friend. While she was telling it that the paper towel roll on the counter fell off just out of nowhere, that's what happened. It just fell. We weren't even near it. Another time my sister was over and she just brought my nephew, who was three at the time. He was playing in my daughter's room when we heard him yelling. We went in to make sure he was okay when we see him standing outside the closed closet door, yelling at the door. What? What did you say? We asked him who he was talking to. He said it was a ghost. He never went in there by himself again because he was too scared. I think a ghost of a loved one didn't like calling myself ugly. Disclaimer. I don't know if our house is haunted, but the house was built in 1978. And before the apartment block existed, it was farms. Yet the house was my maternal grandmother's and my mom's childhood home. And I, my sister, I guess I and my sister have felt various weird things from a warm protective hand on our back. And to my sister sensing a black figure in her room and weird noise when everyone's asleep in the house, building and neighborhood. So back to the experience. An hour ago, my sister, 16-year-old female, and I, 21-year-old female, were talking. I wanted her input on an idea I had, on how to start building up my educational portfolio in case I need to find a more remote online job. When Greek Quarantine, the sequel, starts in the following months and I can't find an actual job. She wanted to let me know that a guy that I used to date apparently dating my best friend and saw my sister yesterday. That was at her hangout spot and started flirting with another girl just in front of her, knowing that the news would reach my best friend. My sister thought that she saw the guy shamelessly cheat on my best friend and she was fuming about it. But they had broken up a couple of weeks ago, so it was okay for him to do that. He was a free man. Then the conversation shifted to why my sister has more luck with guys than me. She's cuter in my opinion. The weather today wasn't windy, so the curtain was just still when I went on to say that my sister has more luck because she's cuter, and I'm always the ugly friend. Just then the curtain blew from the inside towards the outside, like somebody blasted it out of anger, and then it remained levitating for four seconds before it went still, as if it never happened. Then my sister and I continued talking like it didn't happen, but my sister's bedroom door slammed shut and then I choked on my own spit when I tried to talk again. I had a coughing fit, which is now making my throat pretty scratchy. All that made me give up on the conversation and just went to the sunroom where my computer is, only to find my computer's screen open while it was black before. It was open and music was playing from my YouTube tab. And I was prior, or all of this was prior to having lunch. I was listening to 1930s jazz and I had stopped it, but now it was playing like it never stopped. It's happened many times that I leave my computer open and go do something else and there's music blaring from the headphones from the YouTube tab I've left open, like somebody pressed play on the playlist I had left closed. When I was seven, I was friends with the spirit. So to start here, it's a little somewhat necessary for background information about me. 
I'm currently 16 and living with my mother and my stepdad. When I was six, my parents divorced. My parents had shared custody. I would visit my dad on weekends once in a while. So a while after they divorced, my dad started seeing this woman named Sarah, who was a teacher. Cute side note, I refused to call her anything but Miss Sarah because she was a teacher. Sometimes when I went for my dad on weekends, he would bring me over there to visit, and like two times I stayed the night. So my very first time that I went there and stayed the night, we arrived and my dad and her were inside talking. They had me go outside to this little playground out back, where they could see me through the kitchen window. So I went out there with my little blue ball and played pass with myself by throwing the ball in the air and catching it. After a few minutes, this other little boy about my age came over and asked to play pass. I said, okay. We tossed the ball back and forth. I introduced myself. Hi, I'm Marshall. When I asked his name, he said, and I quote, Hi, Marshall. I drowned. Now, me being my seven-year-old self didn't understand exactly what that meant, and I said, cool. And we continued to play pass. After a few, I was called back in for dinner, so I said bye and ran in. Fast forward to the next day. I ended up being sent back outside where I met my friend again. I asked if he wanted to play pass some more, but instead he wanted to show me something cool. So my dumb younger self followed him away from the playground into the woods nearby, into this little body of water. I asked why he was showing me this, but he just giggled, and before I could do anything, my dad started yelling for me. So I ran back, and it was time to leave. Now, after I got home and everything, my mom asked how the weekend was. I said everything was fun, and I met a new friend. She was psyched that I made friends there already and asked him his name, which I told her the obvious. I don't know. He didn't tell me. But mommy, what does drowned mean? Obviously, I was seven, so she didn't explain it and told me never mind or something, but years later when I was 11 or 12, I remembered the weekend and asked her if she remembered it too. She told me that after I told her what I did, she called Miss Sarah and asked her about it. Miss Sarah told her that there weren't any kids allowed to be living there because of some freak accident. My mom researched it and found out that little boy drowned himself. So, I was friends with a dead boy. I had a paranormal experience, disappearing, reappearing object with possible deeper meaning. I keep a running to-do list all the time in my front pants pocket. I am obsessive about it, especially on Friday morning, September 29th, 2023. It was nowhere to be found. I knew it was safe and sound in my home on Thursday night because the last thing before going to bed... I wrote on it to buy mouthwash. Not finding it in its usual place, and after extensive searching, including even checking garbage cans, I gave up. On Monday, October 2nd, it showed up in the exact spot it was supposed to be in the front pants pocket that I had been searching through thoroughly. And I mean thoroughly. I was grabbing my new list to add an item and pulled out the old one by surprise. To me, this was a perfect 0% chance of me just missing it exactly in its expected location. I live alone, have no pets beyond an aquarium. Don't think the fish did it. I read on the forums. I visit many stories of things disappearing and then being found in exactly the same location where they were last placed. Of course, I half believe and half say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you're probably doing with me. I do believe this is the repertoire of the spirit world. But here's where my story gets a bit deeper. On Thursday, September 28th, 2023, I was the victim of an online scam. A clever scam where I thought I was talking to PayPal, a legitimate company that I do financial business with. But in reality, it was an overseas scammer that really wasn't PayPal. In correcting a situation, I was scammed out of a very substantial amount of money. I won't go into the complicated details, but point is, when I went to bed Thursday night, 
I didn't know this was a scam, and I had a note on that very to-do list to send them an additional very substantial sum. On Friday morning, I just grew suspicious and called the real PayPal and determined that this was all a scam. Now, the physical paranormal event, the disappearing, reappearing to-do list, that I'm 100% sure happened. Any further meaning behind this can only be that my honest speculation is happening. My late date, or excuse me, my late dad was always the financial astute and interested person in my family. I'm actually very financially comfortable to this day, not because of my brain's savvier effort, but because of my dad. I believed very strongly that he's been in a very active and involved spirit already since his death, and has always, just kind of always been very concerned and involved with financial things when alive. So maybe that was happening to me through him. Story number three. Entities in spirit dimensions feeding off of reactions and emotions, emotional energy. I went through some big shit lately in life. It all started a couple of years ago. I started meditation and had intense desires to see the spirit realms. I concentrated and analyzed my mind and tried to stop thoughts and tried to remove all emotions. I had addiction for dopamine release. I got off of this habit eventually due to meditation. Gradually I started seeing another dimension. A mental dimension with plenty of spirits of living and dead. Dead usually don't appear frequently. Lots of living spirits do. Usually these spirits appear in our dreams since our focus is fully on day-to-day -day activities. We ignore and we just generally reason these away. But these entities are real. They need this energy to survive. They get this energy from sexual activity, positive and negative emotions. Slowly I lost touch with reality. Now these spirits are a pretty common sight. They simply sit beside me, which I can see and sense sometimes, since they need food, energy, and took control of the brain circuitry that releases these chemicals. Every day this liquid is released in the brain, and these entities feed off of them. They attach themselves to you in another dimension, and feel like I'm losing my mind. They can even trigger your thoughts through feelings. They make your mind to fight with each other. They can direct you to suicidal thoughts, too. So I advise anyone to stay away from the spirits and avoid negative energy and addictive behaviors. Keep your mind busy with day-to-day -day activity or productive thoughts. Avoid places of negativity and conflicts. These spirits are as conscious as humans. They can read your thoughts, motives, and intentions. You cannot be dishonest to them since they are immaterial consciousness living besides and within you, knowing everything you do and predicting your movements and even creating habits within you. Since your mind, your inner dimension, is their home. Power Structure of the Otherworldly so in my culture, Indonesia, there are two types of supernatural beings, Jurig and Sesupa. Jurig is an umbrella term for low-tier creatures. They usually don a sort of humanoid and monstrous form, such as a woman in white, shadows, or a scary little girl. You get the point. Many of them are more mischievous in nature, like to disturb humans. Their powers are usually very bottom tier level. 
such as moving objects around. But they can't actually kill you. They can only scare you. But that is not to say that they aren't dangerous. Many of them like to lure humans to come with them to their world. Sesupa is an umbrella term for high-tier creatures. The word itself roughly translates to ancestors. They're more passive and don't like to interfere with humans unless it's necessary. They also keep all the jurigs in line. When they show themselves to humans, they usually have fantastical forms, such as giant forms of animals, snake, white tigers, crows, giant ancient warriors. A hybrid between human and animal. Wise old lady, you know. They guard places such as mountains, forests, beaches, old abandoned places, or even individuals, sort of like guardian angels. Their powers far exceed that of a Zurich. They can manipulate reality. Imagine hugging and going around in circles for hours. Summon the Jurigs to haunt you, or in some instances, can even kill you. Essentially, there's a hierarchy in the supernatural world, where Sesupa is the boss. Jurigs are their subordinates. Ever wonder why, for example, a person is haunted by a ghost, a Jurig, in house but when they moved to house B from house A, the haunting stopped. That's because the Sesapa in house A won't allow the Jurig to leave the house A to house B because they don't want to cause any trouble with the Sesapa in house B. I think the closest thing that I can see that sort of talks about this topic is the Insidious movie franchise. Has anybody seen this? Story number nine. When I was living in an apartment, I was pretty little, and my dad was gone for two weeks on a business trip. I was home alone with my mom. I was never scared easy, as I've always been in love with investigating the paranormal, yet respecting it at the same time. If I go into a room and I don't feel welcome, I don't stay. It just seems like common sense to me. I kept having nightmares all from what I could tell are the same night. I'd be sleeping in bed with my mom. I was young, young, and I woke up. And after that, a big clown would pop in and see me awake, and I'd wake my mom up and it would charge us and just slaughter us. The clown was emotionless with black and small eyes, had no emotion on its face, I don't ever remember seeing a mouth, but I know it had one. It was white and gray and severely overweight. At least 400 to 500 pounds. It was about the size of a door frame, so almost 6 foot 8. And it never made any sound verbally or physically by walking. It cast a feeling of dread, yet at the same time I got the feeling it just didn't want to be seen. I had a feeling it was curious and observant of me and didn't want to be caught or known. So I had this dream and I was terrified to do anything by myself. There was one more night before that my dad was coming home and I was terrified. I'd be sleeping in my own bed again. We went to bed. I fell asleep. I woke up right after the same dream for the 14th night in a row. Except this time I had that feeling of dread still. Something in my gut told me it was happening in real life now. So I closed my eyes and I pretended to sleep. I cracked them as far as I could while still looking asleep and positioned myself under my blanket perfectly to keep an eye on the door. I waited so long, but nothing happened. I finally started to breathe normal and then it did happen. The same exact clown from the same exact dream walked into the doorway, looked at my mom, then looked at me. It sat there silently, I'd assume making sure that we were asleep, then walked out. 
I never heard one ounce of sound from him, but I could hear the AC. I heard the front door open and close. I never went back to bed that night. The next day, my dad asked my mom why the front door was unlocked. She asked me if I unlocked it. I just said yes, because I knew I'd sound crazy. Story number 18. Strange Encounter in a National Park in Australia. On Friday, I left work at lunchtime to go for an overnight bushwalk to a remote campsite in a national park that's about 60 kilometers from my work in Canberra. I decided not to take a tent as I was planning to sleep in a hut that has a fireplace, as it's still winter here. This hut is about two kilometers walk from any fire trails and it can only be reached by walking along a narrow foot track that climbs a hill for about 45 minutes. The hut only gets a handful of visitors each year due to how difficult it is to find and reach. My car was the only one in the car park, and I never passed anyone else on the way. There's only one track in and one track out to this place. When it got dark, I started a fire in the fireplace and had my dinner. I was tired, and I decided to go to sleep around 8.30 p.m., as I planned to get up early to walk back to my car early this morning. Around 1 a.m. I woke up to the sound of a loud machine. Really loud. Like being directly underneath a helicopter or something. When I peered through the hut's window, I could see bright lights flashing around, lighting up the trees. But I couldn't see the source of the light, which made me think that they were above me. There was no way I was going outside to investigate, so I just sat on a camp chair, wondering what the heck was outside. After a few minutes, both the sound and the light stopped suddenly, like they had never even been there. There was nowhere for anything to land nearby as the hut is in sort of a heavily treed area. After a few minutes, I got the courage to go outside with my head torch and all I could see was some grass that had been slightly burned around the hut. Nothing else seemed to have been damaged or disturbed. I stayed up for the remainder of the night and left for my car just before daylight came. There's no way that a vehicle could get to that hut, and I don't think that a search and rescue would have a helicopter up at night in such a remote area. There's no Air Force bases nearby either. The National Park doesn't allow hunters, so I really have no idea what it was or what was even going on. I don't drink, use drugs, and I'm not on any medication that could alter my perception. Any ideas what that could have been? Has anyone else had a similar unexplained encounter, particularly around the Canberra in Australia? Story number 16. Please help me figure out this weird event. We moved in this house last year because my apartment burned down, and before this event, we'd heard sort of light movements or a sound like footsteps above us. But the floors are old, and sometimes when you move on them, a noise comes seemingly from above. So I never thought much of it. A month ago, I was smoking outside. My mom and son came outside to ask if I heard it. I didn't even know what it was, and they told me that they heard a sequence of very loud, very hard knocks from above the living room in my house. My house has kind of an attic space above it, but it's just for storage and insulation. I've never ever been up there. My uncle stored some stuff there a couple weeks before, though. All of our pipes are underneath the house or in between walls. I came inside and started playing a video game when I heard it took. Five very loud, very heavy knocks. Hard, like a cop would have, you know, be making if it was knocking on your door. I called a cop an it. As if someone was in the attic and stomping or using their fist to knock. I went into the living room and everyone was looking up at the ceiling. I told them I heard it this time. 
They told me the source of the knocking had moved a little bit. We were standing around waiting for it to happen again. It sounded to me like it came from between two rooms, one of which is the laundry room. So I went into the laundry room to listen. Sure as shit, the knocking happens exactly the same way, but it had moved even further from the first position and was right above the laundry room. It was a little louder too. My son started to get scared and I told him it was probably just an animal or something. We moved to the family room next to the front door because my family was a little spooked now. The family room is on the other side one of the walls in the laundry room. We were on our way out the door and my grandma was looking up and said something. Don't remember what exactly, but when it happened again, right above my grandma, as if you replied to what she said. The sound had moved again. It was right above us. We went outside and I called the non-emergency police because, well, I thought it's possible someone could have been up there. I didn't think it really was. I thought maybe it was an animal. The officer took a long time to get there, too. He went up into the attic and saw nothing. Not even animal poop or anything that would indicate the source of the noise. The whole event had us on edge for the rest of the day. It was just so loud and seemed to follow us in the house. We hadn't heard it before or since. Red Light Dot in the Backyard This happened around 2003 in my parents' home. They had a big backyard that ended in a small forest. Back then, the neighborhood was very isolated, so it was a few streets and all surrounded by forest. One night, a red light dot appeared in the backyard. We saw it when we were out in our front porch and a cousin was in the alley next to the house looking at the dark backyard. We didn't dare to go check because it was super dark and we were scared kids. But we called the adults and they saw it too. The light was about 150 meters from our house. It looked as if it was on the ground and would slowly lift up a little and go back down. It stayed there the whole night. My parents were also confused and scared to go check. They joked about it being an un entierro. There were legends about burial places where you'd see a light and it would lead you to find gold, the light being the spirit of who was buried. I would think it was a firefly, but I was used to seeing those, and they would glow green or yellowish and they would blink, not like a strong red. It also wouldn't make sense for a bug to stay in the same place the whole night and just hover slowly up and down in the same place. We decided that that's what we wanted to believe, though. That it was somehow a red, super bright firefly, walking up and down on a small plant. We went to check the next day in the morning and there was nothing that could have caused this. The area that we were thinking it was didn't have any bushes or anything. It was a clear patch, and we didn't see anything else. Then it appeared again the next night. My parents were baffled. I remember several people from the neighborhood and other relatives that didn't live there come to see it, all coming up with their own theories. My little cousin and I decided to go check, but after we had started walking down the alleyway, an owl scared us and we ran back for our lives. I remember a teenager also walking down there, but getting too scared to continue. I think it may have appeared a night or two more until it didn't anymore, and we never got an explanation. There were no lights in the backyard, and there were no houses to the sides that could maybe cause a light to reflect on something shining in the ground. If you'd ask me today what it looked like, it was like those red lights that cyclists use on their bikes, but dimmer. At the time, though, I had nothing to compare it with. Our neighborhood was poor. People didn't have devices that emit light like we do today, or it could be anything, someone with a small radio, a phone, a laser, or something like that. Glowing Green Eyes I was 12 or 13 years old, and my family and I went to my cousin's house in Oregon. He lived in a pretty big house, secluded on lots of land. It was surrounded by trees, but from the house, about 50 yards, there were no trees. 
The first floor of my cousin's house is all windows, so you essentially have a 360 degree view of the whole area. Well, during our stay there, my cousin and I decided that we would wake up at 3 a.m. and go down into his basement to play video games. His room is on the second floor of the house. 3 a.m. comes around. 3 a.m. comes around. And his alarm wakes us up. He and I get up and begin to go down the stairs to head to the basement. As we get to the first floor, the floor that's all windows, I notice a pair of giant glowing green eyes outside of one of the windows, staring at me. I stood there frozen as I could feel it staring at me down. My cousin saw them too, and rather than running back upstairs, he went to the basement. I noped right out of there, and I went back upstairs where I fell back asleep. I woke up a few hours later, when it was light out and went back downstairs. The eyes were gone at this point. I went down to the basement where my cousin was, and he was playing games. I asked him why he didn't go back upstairs, and he said it's because he always sees them, and his parents didn't believe him, so he just ignores them now. To this day, I always think about those eyes. It creeps me out still. A little more background. The moon wasn't out, it was extremely cloudy, but there was enough light out to where you could make out shapes and objects in the house. Where the eyes were, there were no bushes or trees, and would have had to been way up too high for a mountain lion to be. The only way I think it could have been a mountain lion is if it was standing straight up on its rear end legs. I also checked the area where the eyes were footprints or something maybe like that that could cause some sort of reflection no luck. My cousin also said the eyes weren't always in the same spot. The eyes were like glow stick green with no other colors on them. They didn't emit light, meaning there was no green tint inside the house, but they were super bright. It gives me the chills as I type this. Hopefully you all got some insight from me, as I've been thinking about this lately. Missing items in plain sight. I work with my mom. We own a little cafe. We've had this ongoing joke whenever things get misplaced that the previous owner has been in and taken them in the night. We honestly don't believe that. As long as we have had the place, everyone that works there has always commented, Oh, I thought I heard someone walk in then. But there isn't anyone there. Sometimes all of us will look in the front of the shop at the same time, thinking someone was there when there really isn't. This happens at least once a day, but usually multiple times a day. Back to the misplaced items. This is happening a lot at the moment, as in specific knives that are only used for certain tasks, just going missing and then turning up days later on the side. Now I know things can hide in plain sight, but Sometimes you can't see for looking, but this is becoming really, really frequent now. It's not as though we've put them back in the wrong place and then find them. We find them in plain sight, after days of items being missing, and then it appears in an area that's been heavily used by one of us, and been thoroughly cleaned down at the end of the day. So if it ever was there, it would have been put away. It's so odd, but the frequency of... It's just becoming more frustrating now. One of the ladies that works with us has made a comment today that there must be a gremlin working behind her moving everything. This lady's worked with me for over two years and she's commenting also that I haven't mentioned anything about it to her. She works opposite shifts to my mom, so they haven't spoken about it. Also, a full panini machine went missing. We got a new one and stored the old one away just in case anything happened to the new one, so we had a backup. I'm the only person with keys apart from Mom, but Mom wasn't even in the country at the time. It reappeared about three or four months later in exactly the same spot it had been stored in, but yet no one could find it for months. 
My mom thought I had thrown it away and I was lying to her. I'm not sure if this is relevant, but since the shop was opened 19 years ago, it's had three previous owners, me and my mom being the fourth. Two of the three previous owners have died whilst owning the cafe, and the lady that we bought it off sold it because she was terminal with cancer. Anyway, any thoughts or ideas on this would be great. Especially ideas to make it stop. Those would be most appreciated. The Last Goodbye from about eight years old, I've always seen things, but my parents assumed it was just my imagination. I suppose they were right to an extent, as I did have a very active imagination, which is kind of what brought me closer to my Uncle Harry. Now Uncle Harry, for as long as I could remember, was bedridden, and he couldn't really speak. But nonetheless, every time we would visit my Aunt Grace, his wife and I would find myself, or his wife, would find myself talking to him and playing games. I always had fun when we went to visit, much to the discomfort of my sister and other cousins who found him creepy. I can't blame them, we were all so little and had never been exposed to someone so ill before. As time had passed, we visited less as my uncle was getting worse as the years went on, and the fact that we now lived about two hours away made it difficult to visit at all. My sister and I had just started third grade at a brand new school. Now since we went to a Catholic elementary school, we would line up in the hallways against the walls to perform the end of day prayer. During the lineup, I was positioned in front of the band room, which had a large glass window on the door. I turned to look into the room and I saw my Uncle Harry in an all white suit, sitting in one of the chairs. I waved to him and he waved back. I turned around as the bell had rung for dismissal. My sister and I met my mom in the cafeteria where students picked us up, or where student pickup was, I think they meant. And we began to walk out when I stopped my mom. I told her that we couldn't leave, and she asked me why. I told her because Uncle Harry was here, and we couldn't leave him. I assumed he came with my mom to pick us up from school. My mom looked at me very confused and said, Uncle Harry was back home with my Aunt Grace. I fought her all the way home about this and described what I saw. She didn't want to listen. We arrived home and the phone was ringing. My mom answered the phone. It was my Aunt Grace. She had called to tell us that Uncle Harry had passed away that morning. She had been trying to call my mom. She was picking us up from school. My mom turned to me and put me on the phone with my aunt. I told her what happened and she said that it was my Uncle Harry saying one last goodbye. Ever since that day, my mom and her, her I guess my mom and her side of the family, never doubted when I saw or heard something ever again. Story number 18, Don't Carry Meat at Night. At the time, she had gone to visit a friend with her husband. What she did not know was that when she was leaving their house, her husband had accepted a bag full of mutton curry from a friend. Her husband did not believe in such stuff as only she was superstitious. Either that or he was oblivious to the lore of this rule, laughing my fucking ass off. Everything was fine until they got home. They just had an infant during that time. And the usual happy infant suddenly started screaming bloody murder, crying inconsolably. Initially, they thought that she was sick or hungry and tried to give her milk and water. The infant refused, cried adamantly. After a while, her little hands and legs started to swell up, followed by her neck and body. The relative panicked and called upon a neighbor. A is the name of the neighbor. I'm just going to call her Anna. Anna supposedly had tendencies to sense or see the paranormal. 
Anna soon reached her house and immediately asked, Did you bring home any food? And though the lady said no, her husband said yes. You could imagine this poor superstitious woman's horror when she found that her genius husband brought home meat. A request for the husband to throw the curry away, specifically out of the window. Afterwards, the infant immediately stopped crying and her swelling stopped. Now this is a peculiar story to me. As much as I don't doubt in the slightest that the paranormal and ghosts exist, this story made me slightly skeptical. I have to add though, it's common in my country that babies cry loudly if they're in the presence of a supernatural entity. However, my own explanation is that the smell or something that the curry could have done caused an allergy in the child. I'm not sure, but I've heard babies' noses and senses are more sensitive than ours. So perhaps there's something in that that could have triggered the infant. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's the only way to rationalize it without ruling it out as maybe a relative lying. I would like to give her the benefit of the doubt. I don't think she'd lie on purpose, but I do think that back then at her time, 60s or 70s, the superstition overpowered the rational and the science. Story number 14, Inexplicable Shaking. There are two incidents I've had in my life that I've never been able to explain. And really are what have kept me interested in the paranormal. These occurred when I was younger, the first around fifth grade, I think, the second probably late middle school. To give some more context, I'm nearly 30 now, yet I think about these things fairly often. The first incident happened when I was stretched out in the living room couch watching TV with our family wiener dog, Buddy, sleeping between my legs. On the end of the couch, behind my head, we had a wooden end table. I'm just chilling when out of nowhere, Buddy wakes up, trots onto my chest, and starts growling at the end table behind me. I try to calm him down, still trying to watch the TV, but he persists. So I turned my head to the end table and all of a sudden it just starts shaking and wobbling around on the floor. Absolutely nothing else was moving around me, just the end table. I stared at it for several seconds, fixated and unable to bring myself to react or to say anything. It stopped and everything was quiet. Needless to say, I got off the couch and went to my room, not really understanding what I'd just seen. Fast forward a few years and now it's my oldest brother and I just hanging out in the living room. I was on the couch again. My brother was on a chair. Out of nowhere, his chair starts shaking so hard it's moving around on the floor. It didn't move a significant distance, but definitely several inches in every direction as it shook. I stared at him in disbelief, and he looked back. I think he yelled, What the fuck? But that part's pretty foggy. And within 10 to 15 seconds, the chair stopped moving. Once again, absolutely nothing else in the room was moving during this time. So he ruled out any earthquake. And my brother was and is a heavy dude. Back then, he was easily 220 pounds, and the chair that he was in was one of those oversized ones where you could almost call it a love seat. I've never been able to explain either of these, and nobody else but my brother and I felt shaking or had anything paranormal that we know of happen to them in that house. I had one other incident in high school, but I can kind of try to explain away. I opened my bedroom door one night and my desk chair turned, seemed fairly deliberate, towards me and stopping right when it faced me. I freaked the fuck out, grabbed my oldest brother, and of course it didn't happen again. I tried to recreate it by opening the door quickly and the chair would turn slightly, but I couldn't get it to move like I did the first time. So this third incident is a bit more iffy, but still strange and stands out to me. Seeing dead great-grandfather, and him predicting me and my siblings. I was about six or seven when this happened, but I was staying at my dad's for the weekend, and I had this weird dream that I was in my dad's old apartment, when my parents hadn't separated yet. 
I was looking at the door entrance of the apartment and I saw this random old guy that I'd never seen before. He just stood there for a minute. Then a figure in a black robe phases through him and goes straight at me. Then I wake up. The next morning I'm looking at the pictures that my grandpa had around the house. And I see a picture and the old man is in it with my grandma. So I ask my dad who this was. He told me it was his grandpa who basically raised my dad because my dad's parents also divorced. And he told me that he would have loved to meet me and my siblings too. So the confused kid that I was asks another question. Dad, where is he? And to that my dad replied, he died before your older brother was born. I told him about my dream and he was surprised, but I remember my dad shedding a tiny tear in his face. But that's not even the crazy part. Years pass and I'm 13. I never really knew anything about my great grandpa, so I asked my dad some questions about him. And my dad told me some funny stories and great life lessons, but I remember him saying this. Did I ever tell you that he predicted you and your siblings before you guys were even born? I hear that and I call bullshit, but he tells me that he and mom visited him in the hospital once. This is years before he died. And when they walk in, they see him with a curious face. And my great grandpa asks them, where are the kids? My parents were dating for about two years now and don't have any kids. So they tell him, what kids? He responds, there was two boys playing together and a little girl playing with the doll. My parents are weirded out because they both knew damn well they didn't have kids yet, so they blew it off. 2002 comes, my great grandpa dies, my older brother's born. Then 2004 comes around and I'm born. Then 2008, little sister's born. I never got to meet him, but I always hope I could see him one day. Story number 17. I think my university house might be haunted. I go to a small Canadian university in Nova Scotia. I live in a townhouse complex with my girlfriend and our two buddies. My girlfriend and I sleep in the basement and our roommates on the top floor. Over the past couple of months, we've all started to notice some spooky stuff. I have a handful of experiences, but I'll just share a couple for now. My first personal experience happened just over a month ago. I woke up in the middle of the night around 3 a.m. and decided to go upstairs for a glass of water. As I'm standing in the living room alone, I hear what sounds like somebody breathing very heavily, almost panting right behind my back. I turn around to see nothing behind me and immediately freeze dead in my tracks. After questioning my own sanity for a second, I go up the stairs to see if my roommates were awake, but of course, they were not. One of our best friends lives next door in an identical unit, and she also has experiences that are super creepy. She practically lives alone, as two of her roommates didn't return to school due to COVID. She told us that in the middle of the night it sounds like someone's walking around her house and doing laundry in the basement. The laundry machines in this unit are very old and make loud bangs when you close them. This next experience happened to a, a couple days ago. My girlfriend, our neighbor, and myself were all studying in the living room while our cat was sleeping on the couch. One of our roommates was hung over in the bed, and the other was visiting his father. About two hours after studying, I started to hear the door to the basement creak open right around the corner from our living room. It happened quite a few times, followed by a couple of bangs and other noises. Initially, I thought it was one of the cats, and so did our neighbor, as the two of us both noticed the noises. We then noticed the cat was right beside us, shedding an eerie feeling in the room. To top it off, our roommate came downstairs once he recovered from the night before and asked us about the noises, saying that he heard them too. This last encounter happened last week. It was around noon and my girlfriend, neighbor, and one of my roommates were all on campus. 
I was studying alone in the living room, and my other roommate was upstairs. I went to use the bathroom and closed the lid to the toilet so the cat wouldn't try to jump in. I grabbed the cat, walked out of the bathroom, and within 20 seconds it sounded like the toilet seat was slammed shut. I practically shit myself at that point and went to go take a look in the bathroom. The seat was down as I had left it, leaving me confused as all fuck. Story number four. I had a scary, weird cuddle experience at 1.30 a.m. A little background is that since childhood, I've had my fair share of paranormal experiences, especially while sleeping. I've had one particular entity visit me in my dream for one year when I was in a different house. Never seen that entity again when I changed the house in the same area. Stuff like this. But last night I had the weirdest experience of my life. I was sleeping with my wife and I dreamt that my wife kissed me and went under the blanket. I woke up and sat on the bed with my lower body covered with a blanket. I checked on my wife, but she wasn't in the bed. That was weird. So if my wife was not in the bed, then who kissed me? While I'm thinking about this, a realization that my wife was outside in the living room, something started moving in the blanket. It was like a snake or a tentacle that started wrapping around my legs. I kid you not, I was freaking out at the same time, very calm because everything was smooth and non-aggressive. It felt like something was cuddling with my legs. I slapped myself just to make sure I was awake. And I was awake as daylight. Holy smoke, this thing moving and cuddling in the sheets was bloody real. As the thing moved from my thighs to my shins, I literally saw the blankets move with it. That's when I freaked out a little more, but not enough to stop it. I was still curious. I kept sitting on my bed while the thing moved to my shin. I felt it wrap around both my legs and just stay in that position, like a ghost hug. So cute. I moved my foot up and down just to check if it was something like sleep paralysis, but it wasn't. My foot was fine, everything was moving. I was moving. The thing was moving, and I was wide awake. But now it was getting freaky and I had to get out of it. So I slowly pulled the blanket off. Whatever that was that I couldn't see slowly unwrapped and went away. I got up, went to my wife, told her the story, and came back to bed. Woke up the next morning and here I am, still freaked out, hoping it was an act of love by whatever and nothing else. Story number six. Man at the Window I was raised in the rural south, where the shade from the forest cooled our house in the summertime. My childhood bedroom had a large window that started a foot off the ground and stood about five feet tall and was nearly three feet wide. When the sun was out, this window still placed an uneasy feeling in my stomach. Once the moon rose over our house, the window started watching you, waiting for you to drop your guard. What manner of threat it actually posed was questionable in reality, if any. But my instincts never really cared for that explanation, and I openly avoided it every night until I was finally asleep. Finally, the weather decided to switch from 90s every day, to a mid-sixties every day. The arrival of fall meant one thing for us every year. We would be raking leaves up from the year after school most days going forward. While picking up the leaves outside, I saw someone in a brown waterproof coat and camo hat staring in my window. I froze seeing this man staring into my room for several reasons. 
The first was that while my window was a foot off the ground from the floor inside, it was a solid six foot or more from the earth outside. His feet hung loosely and dangled on nothing like a bad Halloween decoration, but he was standing on nothing, as if someone had hung him by the neck from the roof of our house. I started walking away from him, just hoping not to give him any reason to notice me. Luckily, he seemed not to. I told my grandfather about the whole experience, and while he firmly did not believe in ghosts, he honored my word as a man that at least that's what I thought I saw. A few months later, I saw the exact same man at a gun show acting completely normal. I could see his face a bit better, and he had a scraggly black beard with white in it, and seemed to not notice me. Talking to my grandfather about it, he decided to try to talk to the man without mentioning the event, to see how he was, and he seemed completely normal. I still don't know what the fuck is going on, and I never got an explanation, but the anxiety of the window never left me. Story number eight. Did I die? Who is the lady in white? Am I just crazy? So to get a backstory, I'm a 25-year-old female and at the time suffered with severe sleep apnea to the point that I would stop breathing every 30 seconds for over a minute. I had not yet gotten my sleep apnea machine and I was struggling to sleep. And one night after not sleeping for days, I fell asleep. But this time it was very different. I felt like I just closed my eyes and I was surrounded by darkness. I could see this light coming out of a doorway. I decided to go towards it. When I got there, there was a lady in white holding me and guiding me through to what I believe might be the other side. All I could see was trees in a real warm light. I know it sounds cliche, but I felt so peaceful, like nothing could hurt me, and I was free from the burdens of life. I felt weightless, like I no longer was in my body. I soon realized I might have died. I thought, who would take care of my babies? So I asked the lady in white if I'm dead, and she replied, no. I asked her if I could go home. She told me that that was okay to go if I wanted to but it's also okay to stay, and everyone will be okay, so of course I decided to go. I woke up gasping for air, and it took me 20 minutes to be able to breathe normal again. My whole body was shaking, and my heart was pounding. I wasn't sure of what I'd just seen, if maybe it was just a dream, so I kept it to myself for many years, until one day, my friend just had a near-death ex- or my friend's sister, actually, had a near-death experience. They told me about the lady in white that she saw and how she asked her if she was dead and the old lady told her that she was not and she could go home if she wanted to, but everything would be okay if she chooses to stay. Just hearing her say those words made me cry. I realized maybe I did die or did she just have the same crazy dream I did? I don't know if I'm putting this out here hoping somebody will have had the same experience but it's not something I'd like to tell a lot of people. I know I sound crazy, it just felt so real. I'm just curious, has anybody else seen the lady in white? Or am I just crazy? Story number 11. Ask Reddit. Where I live, there's an urban myth about this bridge that's about an hour or so away from my house. The myth goes like so. Years and years ago, there was this little girl that would be dropped off at this bridge to swim underneath the creek every day while her parents worked on their farm. One day, she drowned in the creek, never to be seen or heard of again. Sounds like classic bullshit, right? I thought the same. 
Legend has it if you drive to this bridge, park your car on it, cut your lights and the engine, and then honk three times, the little girl will come to your car, doing a multitude of things to gain entrance. Supposedly, this is how her parents would notify her that they had really returned to pick her up. Anyway, my friends and I heard of this myth and we thought it sounded absolutely ridiculous. There's no possible way this could be real. So we drove the hour it took to get to this bridge at about two in the morning. We arrived at the bridge, parked our car on it, and cut the engine along with the lights. My friend who was driving honked the horn three times and we sat in the pitch black darkness, eagerly waiting to disprove this silly story. A few minutes passed and nothing happened. And just as we were ready to give up, we all heard the sound of something tapping against the metal, and it came from the roof of the car. Immediately, we freaked out and got the hell out of there. We were trying to come up with logical reasons as to why we heard that noise, but couldn't really come up with anything. We stopped at a nearby gas station to refill the tank for the ride home, but before any of us got out of the car, my friend yelped. I turned to him and he was pointing at his window and there was a small handprint there, too small to be any of ours. Regardless of that, I still took it as him trying to mess with me, and went to wipe it off as to say, nice try, except when I did, the handprint was still there. The handprint was put on the window from the outside. And that wasn't the only handprint. Every single mirror of the car had handprints on them, even the side mirrors all the same size and shape as the first one that we discovered. Suffice to say, I'm never going back to that bridge. Story number 15. My Grandpa's Guardian Angel I never met my dad's dad. Apparently, he kept very quiet about his life before he had a family. Six kids moved around Alberta and British Columbia and Canada before settling in A.B. We don't totally know what his lineage is, apart from a brother and maybe his father. But every now and again, my dad and his siblings would catch a glimpse. Him and my grandmother are Canadian immigrants, both living through World War II with my grandfather fighting for the Polish. Don't know much more detail about his active duty than that. My grandpa told me this story to his children a few times throughout their childhood, so I'll try and relay it the best that I can through my dad's recollection of it. We will call my grandfather G from here on out. It goes something like this. G boards a train somewhere in Poland. His history tells us the Poles got brutalized by the Nazis when they were invading. I think G was expecting to be traveling from a battleground that had been lost to the Germans to a home base-esque establishment. I apologize for my lack of war vocabulary. The train is filled with people, both Polish citizens and soldiers, and it's moments away from departing. They were closing shop and evacuation, and G notices that there appears to be a disturbance coming from the train station entrance. And after a couple of seconds, lays eyes on a group of Nazi soldiers encroaching toward the platform. Guns at the ready. Right before they open fire, and as the train doors are closing, a large white dog runs into the train car and tackles G to the ground. He was a pretty beefy man from what I can gather, so it would have taken some serious force. Not a second is spared between G hitting the floor and the Nazis opening fire as the train pulls away. G waits for the carnage to stop before getting up and noticing that most people on board had been hit with a couple dead. He doesn't have a scratch on him. After gathering himself, he looks around the cabin to try to find this dog, but it's nowhere to be seen. It wouldn't have been had enough time to get off the train, as the doors were closing as he was getting on. The way my dad remembers, my grandpa seemed certain it was a spirit manifesting itself as a big white dog that had saved his life that day. He wasn't a man that believed in the supernatural, so to hear this account from him carried some weight. If he had died, my dad and my five aunts and uncles wouldn't have been born, not to mention myself.
Story number 19, Chronically Haunted. I've suffered from insomnia and sleep paralysis in the strangest dreams and nightmares. I'm a super light sleeper. I've always been scared of the dark and I'm 100% the type that turns lights off and sprints to my bed. My sleep paralysis is pretty typical. I'll wake up and feel this darkness and pressure and panic. I don't automatically realize that's what it is. I'll usually think it's some sort of dark presence with malice attacking me. I'll try to scream at it, banish it the way I've seen in movies. But when I come out of it, I can recognize that it's just sleep paralysis. That being said, there are other things that have happened revolving around my sleep that I can't rightly explain. There are a few instances I can recall, but at the forefront of my mind was the experience at my grandfather's house. I lived with my grandfather for almost a year. For almost the entire time, everything was normal. But one night as I was sleeping, I felt something touch my foot. It's so typical, scary movie. But I swear I felt something wrap around my ankle. I had a toddler and there was a cat in the house, so I figured it was just one of them on my leg. I'm not big on being touched while I sleep, so I got angry and shook it off. And I felt my foot connect with something solid, kick it, and I heard it hit the ground. What happened next struck me with terror. An ungodly yowl. Not like an angry cat, like some sort of demon. I immediately sat up and saw some human-like woman crawling back and forth on the ground, looking extremely agitated. I scooted back against the headboard, looked at the window, and then back at the floor, but it was gone. When I checked the time, I saw it was around 4 in the morning. I couldn't leave the bed before the sun came up because I was terrified. When I spoke to my grandfather about it, he let me know that his mother-in-law used to live in that room and died of dementia. He said that she's haunting the house and was probably the woman I saw based on my description. I didn't get along with her daughter, my grandfather's wife. So I guess it kind of makes sense that she would want to ski, you know, scare me off. It makes me sick to think about it. Story number 14. Something was banging on my closet. This happened when I was 11. We used to live in a small three-bedroom apartment with my parents, and I thought I was lucky enough to have my own room, which I later realized was the worst thing that could ever happen. I used to have a king-sized bed, which if you lay on your legs, you would be facing the closet, which would be like a meter away from your legs or several feet away. One day I went to bed because I had school next morning. This was about 9 p.m., but for some reason, I decided to text my friend, so we started chatting, and all of a sudden, I felt like there's a heavy tapping on my closet. I'm still not sure if it came from inside or outside the closet, and at the same moment, a thousand shivers went down my spine. But then it gets even weirder than before. For context, I'm a Muslim, and we generally believe in demons and all that stuff. And Islam has a totally different take, you could say, on demons. It's believed that God created demons as the natives of the earth before humans. That they were massive pricks who killed each other, so God created humans and replaced us with them. But that doesn't mean that they aren't there. It's believed that they're literally living around us and they deal with basic human concepts like religion and family. So this is when it gets weird. I was sweating with fear, even though I was freezing, and the very loud tapping continued until a booming manly voice started reading passages and verses from the Quran, and the tapping stopped. For some reason I felt safe and secure but didn't peek outside my blanket, and it stayed like this till morning. Couldn't have been my dad because that isn't my dad's voice at all. 
and the tapping was coming from the direction of my legs, but the voice came from my right. Also, I want to add that we live in a small apartment. Everyone was awake besides my sister, so for only me to hear a voice that was extremely loud still confused me now. Nothing ever significant ever happened again in that room, but I never felt easy sleeping there. We moved out when I went to high school. Story number nine, Smoke Behind My Back. So hey, maybe it's just my mental illness or something completely different, but I was walking around in my house to get some water and when I turned off the light, kind of felt watched. What I feel like quiet sometimes. So I looked behind me and I actually saw like gray smoke behind me and it just vanished in seconds. I thought it was from a candle. Maybe I was just walking nearby and blew it out, but it's still burning. I should mention that this wasn't the first encounter with something like that. I often feel like being watched, being touched for some reason like my hand resting on or under my right shoulder. And the most scary thing that freaked me out so far was a doppelganger in the reflection of the mirror. It was like myself, smiling at me. At first I felt kind of strange because he, my reflection, smiled. So I thought that that was odd since I didn't even realize that I smiled, but then I noticed it had a completely different t-shirt on. The color was blue and I had black on. I just ran away from the mirror as soon as possible, freaked the shit out, but my mind keeps telling me that this doesn't make sense. So I was going back upstairs, looking in the mirror, and he was still there. Repeated this like three to four times till I realized it was just a hat on the wall. I still feel strange about this encounter, since I really thought a hat was my doppelganger. I also don't really want to believe that this was only a hat since I needed like multiple tries to understand that it's not real and I just saw a hat as a head with my face smiling at me. But when we talk about that smoke, no fucking clue as I said. Thought it was the candle next to me but it's still on and there wasn't any smoke over the candle itself. So maybe one of you has an explanation for this stuff. Maybe it's something that's attached itself to me or I'm just going insane. I have to admit, I thought at first the touching was my grandfather, since it started a few months after he had died. What I can tell you, sir, is, is sometimes candles will smoke and then stop smoking if there's something wrong with that wick. Spirits following my family since my mother was a child. My family has collectively had many experiences with the paranormal. It mostly starts with my mom at age five, when she saw a shadow man in the 20s style suit and a fedora hat into a church during service. She asked her youth pastor and teacher who that man was. Her teacher responded that there was nothing there. The shadow stayed for 15 minutes and got agitated when the pastor began to pray. My mom, who is now age 51, will still occasionally still see this fedora man. Two incidents when I was 14 or 15. Each a separate night. One night I was in bed. I felt like someone used both hands open palm to smack my feet hard under my blanket. It made me shoot. Like it made me shoot up, I guess thinking that it was my brother messing with me. Everyone was asleep in the house. Another time at the same location, I saw a tall, lanky, misshapen shadow figure at my door swaying. My room was so dark I couldn't see my hand in front of my face. But this shadow was darker than the room. The last most memorable incident was when I was a senior in high school. I was watching a jazz documentary in percussion class. 
There were a total of seven students, plus our band teacher in a large band room, spread out, watching in the dark. I was the only one in the chair due to a broken foot that I was alleviating because my teacher, who was on the other side of the room, told him so. Four classmates were with him, while two others were sitting on each side of me on the floor. The floor had levels, so if you kind of sit on them like sitting on a stair. Two feet behind me were hanging chimes. In the middle of the documentary, the chimes smashed together loudly like someone full force swatted them. My first thought was to look for someone, but everyone was in their spots and the two boys beside me never moved. I was able to see them constantly with my peripherals. The chimes had been standing up straight and not caught on anything since I had checked them earlier. They were moved to abruptly that. They were still swaying when we all turned to look. Let's just say everybody was uncomfortable after that. Something sinister I can't explain. I live in a small terraced house and have done all my life. My house is around 150 years old and was lived in during both world wars and many bombs were dropped around the area. I'm saying that as I don't know if that could be a significant detail or not. One of the first things I ever experienced was when I was five. This story was recalled to me by my parents and their friend, who was there at the time. According to my parents, they are very spiritual and believe in the paranormal very much, so it wouldn't make something like this up. I was playing in the back room and I was stood staring into the cupboard underneath the stairs. This cupboard was filled with coats and shoes. My mother asked me what I was doing and replied. Speaking to the little boy, he's sad because he's lost his mummy. My mother continued to ask me what he looked like. I pulled a face where my eyes were dragged down and my mouth was very drooped. This obviously creeped my parents out a lot, although I don't remember anything about that event myself. I knew that my parents don't lie about things like this. The next thing that happened, I vividly remember, as it only stopped a few years ago. Both me and my younger brother experienced this often. We would be sat in our rooms doing whatever we were doing, and then we would have our names shouted. But it didn't sound like either of our parents. And when we asked them why they shouted for us, they would say that they didn't. Also, we live in a terraced house. Our neighbors couldn't have been shouting us because our neighbor to the left was Polish and didn't even speak English, and our other neighbors didn't know our names. Plus, my brother has a very unusual name. It was only recently that me and my parents made a possible link between the two occurrences. My parents are genuinely concerned of what would have happened if they had gone towards this voice shouting for us. There's been a lot of other things happening, including footsteps, growls, and whispers, but most of them, bar the growls, occurred after my grandfather's passing a few years ago. We put these things down to our grandfather trying to communicate with us. Think I met the Grim Reaper. So this happened a few years ago, and I still couldn't explain it. I have my fair share with the supernatural, but this one takes the cake. I'm a college student who's living alone in my small apartment. One night I was awoken by the sound, and I looked to the side of the bed. There's this figure watching me. If I have to describe what it looks like, it looks like a silhouette of a hooded man. It's not black, but rather there's an absence of color where its body should be, if that makes any sense. Like lights just curve around it. I was shitting myself, to say the least, upon seeing it. Then it talks. But what's more scary than its deep voice is that it talks in Arabic. 
I'm from Asia, and only know a few words in Arabic, such as thank you and how are you. But despite that, I understand what it was saying. I remember thinking to myself, how can I understand a language that I don't speak very clearly? What it was essentially saying was that there is someone who wants to meet me. And from behind the figure emerged a 20-something-year-old woman wearing a flower-patterned dress. She looked at me. She smiled with the most sincere smile that I'd ever seen. She talked to me this time using the mother tongue, who told me to take care of my mother and my family, and basically giving me advice to be good all the while the sudden figure was just standing behind her. After she said her piece, she walked toward the figure, turned her back on me, and faded away. Then the figure was about to do the same. It turned its back, but before it faded, it laughed with this huge, bassy voice and said in Arabic, which still can understand. Don't do anything stupid. Then it faded away, too. After the encounter, I guess I passed out. Because the next thing I know was that I woke up and it was already morning. My mom called me, letting me know that my great aunt had passed away. On the funeral, I saw a photograph of her when she was still young. You guessed it. She was wearing a flower-patterned dress in the picture. Story number three, The Wiggler. This is an experience I've had about two years ago, and every time I'm outside to get inside my house at night, I can't stop thinking about it. It was late, around 12 or 2 a.m., sometime around then. I was dropping off my girlfriend at the time back at her house. It was raining kind of hard, but then stopped by the time I reached my house after I dropped her off. There's this Korean church across the road near my house, which is dimly lit. I'm looking at the church to get my keys to unlock the door, and there's a person that's at least six feet tall staring at me from the church in the dimly lit area, which I should add in. The light was illuminating this cross that was underneath the light, like anything underneath this light you can 100% see. But for me, because I'm at least a hundred feet away from it, it was a very orangish, old light. The figure that was standing in the spotlight that light was giving was still pure black. I could not see a facial expression or anything. After this incident, I tried to reenact this experience. I could see at least how human and lively they were. This figure was neither of those. My heart begins to start beating quicker because I start thinking to myself like, that's not right, and it wasn't. I'm still struggling to get the keys into the lock because I keep looking over and focusing on this figure. I finally have my keys in the door and unlock it to finally go inside. As I turn to see what that thing was, one last time, it was running towards me. Its arms were above its head and it was waving them, but they were super wiggly. I don't even know how to explain it. It's as if you were to strum a guitar string and the string waves and wiggles. Its arm were doing exactly that. So I guess this guy is saying that it was moving like a waveform. It's about 40 to 50 feet away from me at this point and I can still see no facial expression or anything. It's just darker than the night sky. I hurry up to go inside and lock the door. Scared to look out the window. It's the next day, still shocked and scared. Never seen it since then. I started calling it the Wiggler ever since then. It just kind of suits it. I have a similar story. Story number 10. Brought a ghost home. About four years ago, I was asked to dog sit in this huge house. I've been there a few times before, never heard or saw anything. However, this time on my last night there, I clearly heard steps in the bedroom above mine. The house is detached, 
so there's no way that it was the neighbors. I try to convince myself it's just the house settling, but the dog, who's familiar with every sound there, and was also sound asleep, jumped out of bed and looked up like, what was that? Freaked me out because nothing else happened, so I went back to sleep myself. Next day I went home and forgot all about it until strange things started happening. I was renting a room in the house at the time and had the only key so no way in without my housemates could get in, just wanted to clarify. I was keeping my window open at night, but had the habit of closing it before leaving for work. Suddenly I started finding it open when I got back. A few times my room smelled like men's cologne. Once one of the photos on the sill was misplaced. Another time, the string I used to hang my curtain was untied and just hanging on one nail. I've checked numerous times before that to see if it's loose, but it really never was. I can't imagine it just randomly untying itself. All this went on for about two weeks when I was called to dog sit in that house again. Don't think anything happened while I was there, but... When I went back home, it was all back to normal. Nothing else has happened since, except a few months ago, I was picking up that same dog for a walk. The baby's pram started shaking like someone was pushing it. The babies were in it, but were facing me, and I could see that they were both asleep and not moving. Once their mom walked into the room, it suddenly stopped. I asked her if she believed in ghosts. She was like, oh yes, you too think we have one, huh? Turns out everyone that she had mentioned that to simply laughed it off, but she'd often find her kids staring in the same direction and laughing, or the dog would just go to a random spot and start wagging its tail for no obvious reason. She thinks it's her grandpa. Whoever it is apparently means no harm, but it's still pretty freaky. Story number four, strange coincidence or not, not safe for work warning, you've been warned. I moved into this house in the spring, and it's a fairly new building. I live here with several roommates, but as far as I know I'm the only one with any of these experiences. To be fair, not all that much has happened. The weirdest thing is that I'll have a ceiling fan that's light will randomly turn off and on. But in a way, it's not completely random, because there's been lots of nights where I'll almost fight it because I'll turn it off and it'll switch right back on again a half a second later and repeat the cycle for a bit until it eventually stops again. The fan also will turn up to max speed. One night I thought perhaps there was something wrong with the fan remote so I took the batteries out of the remote only to have it continue to occur, much to my horror. To combat this, I turned the light on the fan as dim as it would go, so that when it does kick on, it doesn't always wake me up, but occasionally, and less often, it will turn on and then ramp up all the way to its brightest setting. If it were just this, I would perhaps say, freak electrical thing, but this morning I woke up to a rhythmic tap. I've had a house that had a woodpecker before, so I know what that sounds like. As is, the screens are on the outside of my windows, making it difficult to hit the window first. Actually, this tap sounded almost like it was coming right from my desk at the foot of my bed. Though, that desk is situated right by a window, so it also sounded like it could be coming from the window itself. As I mentioned, the tap was rhythmic, like a drumming pattern. For those of you who consider yourself visual, I'll do my best to tap the rhythm. Notation. Okay, your narrator's going to attempt this. It continued like this a few times, and would occasionally change the drum line slightly, but it always sounded like nails tapping out a clear rhythmic beat. I sat and listened for a bit staring and looking for something to make it make sense before I accidentally knocked something off the edge of my bed, which made a small noise, and then the tapping stopped. Pretty much the only conclusion I have for this at this point is that someone was outside my window. A 
potential accident caused by a demonic entity. My dad used to come home late at night, around 12 from work. This happened 10 to 15 years ago, on the same spot again and again. The road was empty, no one lived around. First night. My dad was coming back home late. It was on his bike. Suddenly a dog came in front of him out of nowhere. He lost his balance, fell down. It was dark and no one was around. He looked around to see if that dog was okay, but that dog had already disappeared. He came back home and he didn't think much of it. Second night. The next day when he was coming back, he suddenly felt that someone was sitting behind him. He turned back to see, but no one's there. After a couple of seconds later, he felt as if someone grabbed his shoulders and started jumping on the back seat. He moved his hand around, but no one's there. This activity continued. A car was coming from the opposite side, and that entity pushed him in front of that car with the intention to cause an accident. Luckily, that car's driver turned to the other side and avoided the accident. My dad fell down and was hurt badly. Still remember that night of him coming back home covered in bandages. A few days later he was coming back, suddenly his bike broke down. It wasn't starting. He tried hard to restart it, but it just wouldn't. He called my mom, explaining her about what was happening. My mom got scared, as she felt something was about to go down. She asked him to chant some holy prayers. He doesn't believe in all these things, so he denied. He said, if you're that scared, then you can chant all you want. He saw a van coming, and that person stopped by to ask him about what happened. My dad explained how his bike just broke down and it wasn't starting. And that person just tried once, and it started right up. Thankfully, he came back home safely. My mom tried to investigate it, came to the conclusion that it was a demonic entity, but couldn't find the possible reason of these happenings. Story number 11, Three Shadows in My Hallway. We had an Indian maid from Bangladesh. We always used to argue and have problems with each other, and she would always threaten me. I always watched videos about Indian doing some magic and scary stuff, and my fam wouldn't give her a pick of my little sis. She raised it because they feared of her using some sort of black magic on her when she goes back to her country. She lived with us for eight years, so she was kind of family too. One day we had an argument together, and she said that she will show me what she will do at night. I was kind of okay because I knew she wouldn't do anything, so I went to sleep. My house was a hallway. Interesting. My room and my parents' room in front of me, both connected to my sister's room, which is a glasses balcony, so it's a normal room. Never heard that term. You can enter her room from my or my parents' room through a door connected. So my bed was on one end of the room facing the door, so I woke up in the middle of the night around 3 a.m. or 4 a.m., and the light in the hallway was on. Pretty normal. Used to encounter a lot of ghosty stuff, so always used to wake up at 3 or 4, but this time was diff. This time I woke up at 3. Shadows emerged into the wall. Not like figures, but like three persons as shadows on the wall. So there's a shadow, but no person, if you know what I mean. Saw one at first. He was walking fast. Then he looked at me, waved his hand to another two that appeared right behind him. And they ran toward my parents' room. I was freaking out, probably the scariest thing ever. Who would come to my mind? The maid? I got up so quickly and ran to my parents' room through my sis so I don't pass the hallway and woke up my mom. Mom then woke up, still half asleep. I told her the maid did something to scare me. 
So she got up and took me to the maid's room to show me that she was asleep, which I which still, till now, I don't really believe. I don't think she was asleep. Because she was adjusting her sleeping. Position was, you know, when we got in. And then I couldn't sleep at all at night, obviously. When I was a little kid, my parents moved into a haunted house. When I was just a kid, my parents moved into a larger house to start a family. I had an older sister who was around 17 at the time, along with my mom and dad. There were four of us total. My parents decided on a white farmhouse out in the country, with an old decrepit barn and a few outbuildings on a large plot of land that we now owned. I remember having really bad night terrors about a tall man made of shadows. One nightmare I still remember vividly, after 12 years, was that my room was on fire, and I was sat in the corner of my bedroom crying as the tall shadow man stood over me and watched me. Spooky, right? Well, my father used to work the midnight shift for a prison about 20 minutes away from our house. And one night my mother woke up because she heard my dad come back home right after he left for work. So probably sometime after midnight, he walked down the hallway towards me and my mom's room. Our rooms were right across from each other at the other end of the long hallway. And then stop outside her open door. She claims that she called out to him, but he didn't respond. And that she couldn't see him despite having the door open and my nightlight shining out from my room towards the hallway. When my mom asked my dad about it the next day, he said that he never came back home. My mother also claims that she's heard footsteps when no one else is home. She was a stay-at-home mother. My sister and I went to school. That she has felt the bad move after dad left for work. I've had a lot of vivid nightmares at that house, but I don't remember a lot of them, and they stopped happening as I got older. My dad still feels bad about not being able to protect us from the evil ghost and tells me that he used to walk into my room and start pleading with an unseen force to leave his family alone. I loved living in that house though, and I was sad when we moved away. Looking back, a lot of weird things happened at that house, but I never really cared. I was more interested in playing with my little sister. I had a lot of nightmares and deja vu along with both of my parents. I've never asked my older sister about it, but maybe I should, I don't know. My parents' UFO experience, last weekend in western New York. They live in western New York, which is upstate, unrelated to the city. And they're really open to all kinds of supernatural stuff. My dad has reason to believe in aliens for reasons other than this encounter. But that's a story for later on. Might be a good time to add that my parents do not use drugs or alcohol. And they're very sharp as far as memory, cognizance, and intuition goes. I'm going to copy and paste a message my mom sent me about this experience, if that's okay. Just figured I'd put some feelers out there to see if anyone else has experienced something similar lately, or has an experience for them. Thanks for reading. And I quote, Last weekend we were coming back from Jamestown. Me and Dad saw a frickin' UFO or something. Between Randolph and Steenberg, there is a huge, really, really bright light blinking off and on in the sky directly in front of us. And it was falling from the sky. Except it was shooting directly downward. I thought it was a falling star at first. But after it blinked repeatedly, I thought, that's not a falling star. I even thought it might be a plane, but it was too bright and fast and going straight downward. Then all of a sudden, it was gone. Like mid-sky. And I thought that it must have 
have gone behind a hill or a mountain or in the trees. So right then I said, did you see that? Dad said, what the fuck was that? He said he was thinking the same exact things that I did. And at that same time, we both noticed there's no hills or mountains or trees. It was just cornfields and open space. It just disappeared. Next thing you know, it was directly behind us, mid-sky, and it shot directly upwards, back into the sky. I was looking out my rear view, and it lit up the whole sky like an aura all around. But the brightness of it was still really bright white. Dad turned around watching it, and it started following us. We had that same eerie feeling we had when we saw the Bigfoot. Story number 20 When I was a freshman in university, the dorm I was in had laundry facilities in the basement. As I was lugging my clothes down to the basement hall, I noticed that there was a hatch in the tile hallway that made a hollow and a reverberating thud when stepped on. Being a dipshit freshman, I tried to open it. No luck, though. The hatch was heavy and crusted over with disuse. Went upstairs, got a strong friend, and we lifted it together. Beneath it was near pitch darkness, but we'd just entered the age of flashlight apps for the phones. They didn't really have their own, so we lit it up and saw what looked like a dank, not that kind of dank, concrete shaft covered in cobwebs, dust, and weirdly wet everywhere. It extended underneath the floor in one direction, with a drop-off in about 15 feet. So we gathered a few more brave souls, set my roommate as a lookout for staff, and in case the hatch slammed shut on us and dropped in. We were surrounded by plumbing, and it smelled like it. We crawled forward and found that the drop-off was only a few feet, and there was a plastic chair at the base of it, presumably to help land and get back up. It looked like it hadn't been touched in years. After we dropped down, the ceiling stayed the same height so we could walk properly. It was a long walk, though, and ended with a metal door. Opening that, we found ourselves in what seemed to be the housekeeper's storage. Several expansive rooms of supplies, from toiletries to road salt to all sorts of cleaning and plumbing and electrical equipment. On the other side of the storage rooms, we opened another door and came out to the basement on the far side of the building. All told, no monsters, no chase scene, just dust and toiletries, which we stole a few of in case the dorm bathroom ever ran low, which it did. Made for an exciting nerf war when we snuck up on our enemies from behind since they expected us from the, uh, you know, being on our own side. Story number 11. Saw a very sinister entity at the foot of the bed. For context, this was years ago. But I decided I'd like to start recounting my experiences, and this seemed like a nice enough community to do that with. My boyfriend at the time and I were moving, so things were in boxes and the bed was taken apart. He always had insomnia but I usually fell right asleep. This night, things felt off. I was tossing and turning for a good 30 to 40 minutes. He finally asked what was up. Said it was nothing, but he pressed, and I finally said, well, I don't know, I just keep thinking he's seeing something in the shadows. He pushed for me to say more, which was unlike him, and I finally started describing this thing. It was probably seven feet tall, dark blue, almost black, defined large muscles and sharp teeth. He cut me off and asked, Is it dripping and slimy looking? I said, Yeah. Is it breathing really heavy and staring right at me? He said, Yeah. 
He said he saw it too, and he thought it was impatiently waiting for something. But then he didn't want to talk about it anymore. I found out later through a friend that knew him as a teenager that he had a weird history with a place out in the country called Stone Church. She described him as a shy kid that didn't have any friends, kind of emo and desperately wanted to be liked by the cool kids at school. She said for fun, one night they went out to this abandoned church that was supposed to be haunted and did something like Bloody Mary or play with the Ouija board. Sorry, I don't remember the specifics. And crazy things started happening. At one point, the door swung shut and locked him in a room. She couldn't get in for a few hours, but when he came out, he seemed different. This was not the guy I knew at all, by the way. She said the next day he was forever a changed guy. He was super charismatic and made friends everywhere he went. They were like his followers. Until she mentioned it, I never really realized how much they seemed to worship him. He refused to talk about it, and she clammed up. Didn't want to say anything about it anymore after that. Story number 10. Strange figure in front of the bathroom. At first, I want to say that I used to be highly interested in the paranormal since I was young but still pretty skeptical about it. Sure, sometimes I see shady figures in the sides of my eyes, especially while working at my desk. Also, I could swear that I saw some figure reflecting in the window above my desk, but that could have been some illusions that my imagination made up. Or sometimes our Amazon Alexa is activating itself, saying things randomly while nobody was in the same room as her. Most of the times, we didn't even talk at all, so there's no way that it misunderstood something that we said. But it could still be some technical issues, though. Also, you can hear some sounds in the house from time to time, like footsteps or something knocking against the walls. But that could possibly come from the neighbors next door. I noticed that you can hear them talking or working on their house from time to time. Lately, though, some incident happened to my girlfriend, and we really couldn't explain it. She needed to go use the toilet at night. While she sat on the toilet, our toilet is looking right at the bathroom door, and in the middle of the door is made out of frosted glass. Suddenly, some figure fastly went from right to left, right into the bedroom. She said that she was pretty shocked. Couldn't be me, since I was already sleeping. Plus, she described it as taller than me and also incredibly thin. Somehow like it was a human figure, but kind of disproportionate. She just saw it for a moment, and it was very blurred because of the frosted glass. But she said if she had to describe it, it would most likely have been an absurdly tall woman in some white dress or something like that. She was so terrified that she wasn't able to come out of the bathroom so she's decided to call me to wake me up. I searched the whole house, but there was nobody around and no sign of someone breaking in or stuff like that. So it wasn't me. It surely wasn't the cats. But there also was no stranger around. It was like it came out of nowhere and gone right into nowhere. My girlfriend swears that it was no illusion, and by her reaction that night, I totally believe her. Story number five, a blue being. I was 22 and very spiritual at this time. I had recently met a shaman by chance who helped me with my anxiety and sleep paralysis. He also taught me how to meditate, so I started really getting into meditation. One night I was meditating for hours, listening to Kid Cootie and smoking a little. I was really focusing on my fear of death. Every breath I released felt like I was a little bit closer to something. Hours went by until the meditation brought me so much euphoria that I knew that if I released that breath, I would die. Sounds crazy. But if you know that feeling that meditation can bring, specifically in your head and spine, 
you can probably relate. So I did. I released it. I put my trust in God and the universe. I was like, okay, if this kills me, I'm good. They got me. Obviously, I didn't physically die, but I felt great. Like a new person, so light and at peace. It was almost five in the morning. I was meditating all night. So I went to bed, and I don't know how long I was sleeping, but when I woke up, it was still dark outside. And Kid Cootie's song, Embrace the Mountains, was playing. It was playing everywhere in my head and all around the room. I sat up and standing right next to me, right through my bed, was a giant blue being. She was completely blue, skin, eyes, hair, all the same color blue. Her hair was in locks and floated up above her head. She didn't say anything. She stared into my eyes. No facial expression. She actually looked kind of frightening, but I knew my heart was okay. So I rolled over and went back to sleep. Never seen her again, but the experience touched my soul. I'll never forget it, because I know it was real and purposeful. Every once in a while, I still search through old literature, Hindu art, Egyptian art, ancient aliens, anything I can for a clue on who she was. I haven't been able to figure it out. Has anyone else seen her? Ghost kisses me in my sleep again. Like a month ago, something similar had happened. I was asleep, and that night was one of the most disturbing nights of my life. The lights were on when I was sleeping because of my past paranormal experiences. I was extremely tired that night. When I was asleep, there was someone kissing my neck. It was real as hell. I wake up because of that, but because I was very tired, I went back to sleep even though I was scared. Then the same thing happened as I slept and I woke up again. That night I was waking up every five minutes because of this neck kissing and going back to sleep like I had no control over what was happening to me. It occurred throughout the night. I was waking up and going back to sleep, the kissing happened and everything all over again. The kissing was very, very wet neck kissing, very passionate kissing, like somebody's lips I felt if somebody was kissing me from behind. It was 100% real, at least 100% real feeling. It felt real good and I still remember it. And whenever I woke up, there was no one in my bed, but I felt a presence there. There's no way that I'm dreaming the same thing after waking up every five minutes. And the dreams don't occur right after sleeping. After that, something very strange happened, which just still makes me cry because of how unsettling that it was. Someone said that a ghost has fallen in love with you. I know it sounds like movie shit, but this is real. I didn't tell anyone because you'd think I'm making this stuff up to look cool, but it happened again and I can't freaking ignore it. After hearing that phrase, I didn't go back to sleep. I was scared as hell. Now it's so late that I'm just scared. Last night I had a similar experience in which a ghost with a big tongue, and it was very big, it had no face, kissed my neck, and it was real. The funny part is, I've never been neck kissed before to be even knowing how this feels like. And in the dream I was enjoying it, and even moved its tongue to the other side for my liking. I was fucking enjoying it. This time, it wasn't feeling scary, I was just enjoying it. A short yet terrifying account. I live in a bungalow, a one-story building. My room is at the back of the house and directly opposite is a window with the blackout curtains. Now this happened a couple of months ago, but back when I was having trouble sleeping due to stress. 
Anyway, I had just gotten home from college, and I had had such an exhausting day, so I came to my room, removed my shoes and my socks, and laid down on my bed. Now, because it was daylight out, while I was still getting in, I didn't think to close my curtains. I woke up at some point during the dark looking at my window, as I had fallen asleep by accident, to find a strange shape peering through. Now, because I was tired, I had just assumed that I was seeing things, so I got up and put on my slippers, went into the bathroom to splash some water into my face, so I could see a little bit better once I had done this. I had returned to my bed to look outside the window, only to now see the strange shape, quote-unquote, had moved slightly to the left toward the neighbor's garden. However, instead of it being an odd shape, it now looks rather like a head. Now, what makes this scarier is that it was solid. It wasn't transparent. It was like it was there. I knew it was facing me. Although it had no facial features, I didn't think it could be human, as it didn't have ears, hair, or anything like that. Yet I knew it was somewhat intelligent, so I could feel it looking at me with intent. My nan had come into my room checking in on me, and I told her that I was fine and she left me to my own accord. For some reason during this conversation with my nan, I had momentarily forgotten the immense fear I was in moments ago. I looked through the window, only to find this creature was completely gone, vanished. That's the end of tonight's stories. As usual, hope you guys enjoyed it. Hope you can leave a like and a comment. Push this algorithm along for me. And see you later. Story number two. Coworker and I saw a ghost in daylight. This occurred around 1990 at Clark Air Base in the Philippines. While I was stationed there as a radio operator, I worked in the building 829 High Frequency Receiver Site. The building was surrounded by the antenna field, so it was clear all around. It was located about a mile off the main road. Not everyone had cars back then, and many people just took the base shuttle bus and walked down the road to the building. It was not uncommon to see people walking up and down the road during shift change. I picked up my friend Derek from off base, since we were both living off base at the time. It was around 18-15 hours, and we were halfway down the road heading towards the receiver site. Usually, if I saw someone walking toward the building, I'd give them a lift the rest of the way in. So here we were, driving on that road. Not full daylight, but you could still see everything. There was no grass tall enough to hide someone. As I'm driving, I see a person walking toward the building. So I think to myself that I would give this guy a lift. I could see the person pretty well. It was just a male wearing a white shirt and blue jeans. As the car gets within 50 feet, the person simply vanishes in front of my eyes. I was too shocked to say anything, and I was not about to say anything to my friend in the passenger seat. Then Derek says, Did you see that? Where did that guy go? I responded, Yeah, I did. I wasn't going to say anything, though. So I stopped the car, and we both got out to see where the guy went. Nothing. There was no one else but us and no one else walking down the road at all. We got back in the car and drove into work. Later on, I kept saying that we saw a ghost, but Derek refused to admit it. He would only say that he saw something, but would not say that it was a ghost. That was my only visual sighting at Clark, but there was another unexplainable incident that happened in that building. Story number 16. Angel says hi. I was at a cabin with maybe a dozen other people, mostly friends from college. 
We're hanging out outside and there's a storm in the distance, so there's an occasional flash of lightning as it rolled in. I'm sitting at a picnic table on the porch with maybe four other people, talking to my friend, Scott, who's seated diagonally across from me at the opposite end of the table. Somehow the topic of angels came up, and her and I started talking about the history and theory of angels across Catholicism and other religions. Changing her name to Sarah. Thought it was maybe a dude, so I called it Scott. Sarah and I are pretty much the only ones interested in the subject, so we're leaning in to talk to each other and nerd out, basically, on everything else at the table. They all had their own conversations. We're sharing stories and talking about this idea that run-ins with angels can be quite common, but the experiences and interactions are so subtle and nuanced that the only person who experienced it can really understand how odd it was. And when they try to explain the story, it sounds like just a typical event or an odd comment from a passerby. As we're talking about this idea that angels reveal themselves in ways that seem to hide in plain sight, and they're not noticed by others, even when it's right in front of them, a bright orb the size of a head flashed between us, causing both of us to jot him back. Sarah and I looked around confused because no one else at the table seemed just phased at all by this orb that just burst right in front of us. I asked if anybody else saw it, and the only response was another friend saying, Yeah, there was a bright flash of lightning. It was definitely brighter than earlier flashes. We both dropped the subject, and shortly after it started to rain, so we all moved inside. Later in the night, Sarah invited me outside to share a joint. Once we're away from the group, all she said was, So you saw it too. We both know that wasn't just lightning, right? I agreed, and we both kind of chuckled and changed the subject because we knew we were on the same page in what we saw. It was an angel that heard us talking about him and just popped in to say, Hi. Story number 17. Toddler Sees Tall Figure Backstory My grandpa was a big lumberjack-sized man, and sadly he passed away before any of us, his grandkids, had kids. I used to be in sales, so we'd have random days off in the middle of the week. On one of these random days, I asked my cousin if she wanted me to watch her daughter. We'll call her G. So she didn't have to take her to daycare, you know. She accepted. And so I went over to my aunt's house in the morning and she was still sleeping. So I laid on the sofa and I was watching TV. G and I were the only ones home. But after about 30 minutes of me watching TV, I heard running in the back hallway as if several people were charging around. I muted the TV and it stopped. Figured it must have been background sound or something from the TV, so I changed the channel and shortly after it started up again. I was freaked the F out and ran to go get G, so we went to, basically got the hell out of there. I woke up and woke her up. And she was excited to see me. I wanted to show some of her dolls and I was like, sorry kid, we gotta go. So I'm quickly changing her and putting her shoes on and she was babbling the whole time and suddenly got quiet. I was staring at the corner behind me. And then she pointed with her little finger and smiled and said, He's tall. My heart almost fell out of my ass. I heard that saying before, excuse me. My heart almost fell out of my ass. I grabbed her and the one shoe I hadn't put on yet, got my purse and ran out the front door. As we're driving off, I called my cousin. She didn't answer called my aunt and she answered and I frantically told her about what happened. And she said, I don't know about the running, but yeah, Pa's definitely still around. She said that as if it was nothing. Needless to say, I didn't offer to go over there alone again. Also, kids seeing things creeps me out. Also, also, this isn't the only unexplained experience I've had around her. Story number 14, 
childhood hooded figure. So this was something that happened when I was six or seven, and until this day, I have no explanation for what happened. So it was during September, a day before starting school, and I was in bed, because my mom always wanted us to sleep early. So, at literally 9 p.m., she was still watching TV, so from my bedroom I could see some light coming into my room. To prepare myself to sleep, I always used to play with plushies, and as I was playing I feel a shadow on my face, like someone was standing in front of the door. I immediately think that it's my mom or dad that caught me not sleeping, so I pretend that I'm asleep. I open my eyes and I see something standing in my doorway and it's wearing a long cape with a hood on, but it's short. So I assume it's either my mom or brother trying to see if I'm sleeping, because it's standing there for far too long, so I confess that I wasn't sleeping, and the thing doesn't talk back and still doesn't move. So I'm like, maybe it's a weird shape I'm seeing from something hanging on my door. And as I'm thinking that, this entity moves closer. So I close my eyes and open them back to see if I'm hallucinating and it moves closer again. At this point I'm scared, so I try to hide behind the covers and I see it at the edge of the bed, literally next to my head, and I notice that it's wearing black gloves and it puts its hand on the wood of my bed and inches closer to my face. So that's when I hide under the covers. I know I wasn't dreaming. Because after that, my mom closed the TV and I heard her go to her room. I was so convinced that it was a person that I even told my brother that I know it was him that came into my room to scare me. But he denied it and told me it was probably mom. The thing is, this happened a few days after I found a dead bird on my window and my dad's family are known to use black magic. My mom always suspected that the house was haunted. And I've had some experiences when I grew up, but never a full figure. Only something touching me or something moving. Story number 12. Hearing a familiar voice. We've been living in our cute little house for almost three years. It's peaceful and cozy, but it's most definitely haunted. It started with noise coming from a spare bedroom that's used as a tattoo studio. Things would fall and we would hear crashing sounds or things sliding across the floor. When you'd go in the room, everything would look normal. We'd hear the occasional footsteps on the stairs. Well, I'm home a lot. My fiancé works different hours and has a social life, and I like to stay in. I began hearing him calling to me when he wasn't home. It started off with me being downstairs and I would hear him call out to me, Babe! Hey! I thought he came in through the side door and I didn't hear him so I would answer. After I got no reply I would go look for him only to find that he wasn't home. At first I thought I was just crazy, but I realized my dogs would lift their heads up and look as if they heard it too. I began to worry me, it began to worry me, and when I would be asleep and be woken up by my fiancé speaking to me, he wouldn't be there, it began to become an everyday occurrence and I was starting to just want to question my own sanity. My mother and I went on a trip to Maine, and while on the trip I was sleeping, I was shook and awake by my fiancé asking what time it was. I was half asleep and grabbed my phone looked at the time and answered him, only to remember that I was on vacation two states away from him. After that happened, I decided whatever it was had to go. I'm a bit witchy, you could say. So I began burning sage and asking kindly to be left alone, offering to allow whatever it was to stay if it could please stop bothering me. Eventually, I decided to take another route, and one day I yelled as loud as I could, Enough is enough. Get out of my house. All of a sudden, the house got really quiet. And then it sounded like the house took a huge breath of air and let it out. Almost like a sigh of relief. I've never heard it again since that day. Story 
Story number two, Preparing for a Haunting. I feel like Angela from The Office when she says, I don't actually have a headache, I'm just preparing. My boyfriend and I don't have a haunting, yet we're just preparing. Yesterday we discovered a man murdered. Well, let's not be too crazy about this. We discovered a man murdered his girlfriend and then committed suicide in the apartment unit directly below us. I came home to a swarm of police officers, and I definitely knew there was a problem when I saw the coroner's vehicle backed up to the curb, preparing to load up the remains of the people inside the apartment. After speaking with the officers, we learned that the two corpses had been laying in the apartment for approximately 24 to 48 hours before they were discovered. We were incredibly disturbed to think that we were going on with our lives as per usual, gaming, listening to music, watching movies over the weekend, while something so horrific was lurking just below. I realized I had been having trouble sleeping the last two nights, and I had a general feeling of unease and eeriness while being alone. And now, I'm pretty sure that I know why. Later, after speaking to a neighbor, she didn't really succeed in helping my already disturbed head when she told me matter-of-factly that when the bodies go undiscovered, their spirits linger and people nearby will experience feelings of unease, such as what I had been experiencing. I also have heard that victims of violent deaths as well as angry spirits will stick around the place in which they died. Well, the man in the situation obviously was an incredibly angry and violent individual, and I feel so sad for the woman that lost her life at the hands of that monster. This is more getting this heaviness off my chest than anything else. Please delete if not allowed, or has anybody reading this ever lived in a place with a history similar to the story I'm sharing? This place has a suffocating heaviness to it now. Meditation and the Paranormal A couple of years ago I met this guy in one of my college courses who said he could quote-unquote read people and see quote-unquote auras. He was a friendly guy and I'm generally curious so I would hang out and talk with him between our classes. I started doing some meditation sessions led by him. Nothing intense, just very basic meditation techniques. However, I seemed to be unnatural, as he said. Things like focusing on my third eye instinctually. Meditation sessions lasting near to an hour, but only felt like ten minute tops. He started saying that you can do a lot more while meditating. Naturally, I was curious. So one night after a long meditation session, I was beginning to ground myself. Before coming back, I just thought to myself, this stuff actually works. Send him some kind of message. Fast forward to the next day. I meet him between classes as normal. Totally forgot what I did the night before. Because I thought really nothing would happen anyway. But, first thing he said to me was, I had some really weird dreams last night. I was in the middle of a dream and all I heard was your voice calling to me. And all I said was hello. I was stunned and I didn't really know what to say. Because the time he woke from his dream was the same time I finished my meditation session at 1am. This didn't really creep me out, I just really thought it was a coincidence. Because I was and still am skeptical about the paranormal. However, what did creep me out is what began happening after this. I started hearing voices while meditating. Weird feelings of being drawn towards these noises and voices. Then things began to escalate. I began experiencing paranormal activity. This would be a whole other huge story. This did really creep me out and I decided to stop meditating altogether. Then a couple of weeks after ending my meditation sessions, all paranormal activity stopped.
Story number 10. Ghost played with my hair when I was younger. So this was a couple of years ago. Not too much like around five or six maybe. So when I was younger, it took me some time to fall asleep. So I would just stare at the ceiling and think about different stuff. And I share a room with my sister. She's younger though, and I heard her sleeping, so it wasn't her. And I also have two brothers. But they were two years old at the time, so of course they were sleeping, and my bed was higher up the ground, around one meter high. So I, that night, I was waiting to fall asleep. And suddenly I hear someone in my room. I don't remember that anybody opened the door, though. And it was an adult. Whoever that was, was pretty tall. He or she didn't have to use a ladder to reach me, so it wasn't a kid. So at first I thought that this was my mom or dad to check in on me if my sister was sleeping, or to open the window. So I pretend that I was asleep, but it was really dark, so I opened my eyes, but I only saw a shadow, not a face. Of course, because it was dark. And it was really close to me, and I thought that my mom, but it wasn't. That thing took some of my hair and started brushing them on my cheeks, like with a paintbrush. So that weren't my parents, because why would they bother a kid in the middle of the night when I'm supposed to be asleep? And I asked them, and they said no. Plus, they usually sleep as soon as my brothers fall asleep. So later that thing went to my legs. The ceiling was low there, because there's a roof that's, like, lower. And that thing, fat there, perfectly straight. I believe they mean sap. That part was also around a meter tall, so an adult should, like, sit down or, like, kneel down there to be that, like, thing, swaz, standing up straight there. Sorry, guys. The writing is brutal. And after that, I don't remember a thing. And I know that it was real. It wasn't a dream. So that was a ghost, right? Hard to say on it. Story number 20, Strange Things, happened to me when I was five. Hey all, I'm from Iraq. I'd like to share a few encounters that happened to me in my old house. We had a small house, no bedroom for me, so all of us slept in our parents' room. Also, terrorism was a thing back in 2005, so we were all scared. I'd stay awake all night on all kinds of scary sounds, footsteps, things falling, all of that. Sad thing is, parents never believed me. I also had this nice toy car that I had a protective bumper I got as a gift from my aunt. The second day I woke up to some piece breaking off the bumper until three days later the whole bumper's gone. Also, I wasn't the type of kid that breaks his toys though. On one scary night I was awake as usual. Nobody ever believed me on that one. I saw two small white figures running above the closet. I swear to God it was real, it's glued to my memory, all of these above, but this last one will truly shock you. One night, the sounds got very loud, my parents woke up, dad grabbed a lighter and his AK-47, it was from his army days. Shit got real, remember we lived in a very stressful location with crimes and terrorism. He went to check it, he searched the house, nothing, oh man, it must be fucking ghosts. No wind whatsoever that we live in the city. I was and still pretty sure that that house had something in it that really scared me. Fast forward ten years later, we moved to our new house. A calm house in a nice neighborhood. Violence is 99% gone. But here's the twist, ladies and gentlemen. Every single nightmare I have now takes place in my old house. That somewhat lives inside of my head. Just what the fuck? because it was already demolished, though, after it was sold. I think nightmares appeared more right after it became equal to the ground. One of my many scary dreams involved me waking up in the house a few times. Also, one of them is our old house replacing our new house, which scared me shitless. Anyways, now it seems to have faded from my memory somehow. But I hope in the end it's all bullshit. I 
I need help figuring out what happened. If you live in the northeastern part of the United States, then you know that a huge snowstorm came in this week. Well, I was at my boyfriend's house and we couldn't find his puppy in the backyard. We kept calling its name, but he wouldn't come to us like he always does. In fear that he somehow got out of the gated backyard, I grabbed my snow boots, ran to the back door that's in the kitchen. To note my boyfriend was standing by the back door looking for the dog and his dad was at the front door talking to a postal delivery driver. We were the only three inside the house. I put on one snow boot and then hopped from one side of the kitchen while putting on the other boot. As I slipped on the second boot, my foot slipped under the, from underneath me because my boots were still wet. I landed hard on one knee. My other leg flew out in front of me. I then landed on my butt and I knew I was going to then fall backwards and land on my head. In that moment I felt someone catch my upper back and shoulders with their hands and then squeeze my shoulders. It kept me from falling backwards and slamming my head against the tile floor. My boyfriend was standing in front of me and has a broken foot so he would never have made it in time to catch me so I assumed it was my boyfriend's dad. His dad asked if I was okay and what had happened. I didn't think anything of it and laughed off my bruised knee. Later that night, my boyfriend's mom came home from work and I was telling her how her husband saved me from a bad fall. My boyfriend then cut me off and said that his dad didn't come into the kitchen until after I fell and that he didn't know what I was talking about. We even confirmed this with his dad as well and he stated that he saw me sitting on the floor and came to check on the dog no idea what I experienced or what could explain what I experienced. All I know is that I fell hard and that whatever happened to save me from possibly getting really hurt, I don't know. I can't explain why I felt someone catch me or they squeezed my shoulders after they caught me. Can anyone explain the experience or does anybody have a similar one? Something or someone crawled on me while I was sleeping. Story number 10. So the other day I decided to take a nap after I got off work. I don't nap often, maybe like twice a month if anything. And I've noticed that when I do nap, I can never fully let my mind shut off. So when I quote unquote fall asleep, I'm never in an actual deep sleep. I feel like I'm somewhere between asleep and awake. Still aware of my surroundings with my eyes closed, if that makes any sense. Well, when I was napping on this particular day, I felt something crawling up the edge of my bed, and it made its way over my body. I was laying on my side, and I had a blanket up to my chin, so I couldn't see what it was. But it felt like a man, and at first I thought it was my husband as he had gone to the gym and thought maybe he came back, and he was just maybe messing with me. But as its head got closer to mine, it kept making a loud breathing sound, and in my sleep, I remember I could see my room and I was basically barely going to take a peek at it, and it looked like a man wearing a white mask. It kind of reminded me of the Jason mask, but I couldn't really tell because my vision was like when you're barely opening your eyes, you can only see a little bit and it's kind of blurry. I could feel his weight on top of me, and I kept feeling the breathing on me, and then the thing or man started trying to suck on my ear, and I could feel the sensation, but at this point I realized I was in sleep paralysis and I couldn't wake up. I kept pushing my body to try to wake myself up and finally I was able to. And when I woke up for real, I looked and there was nobody there. And my husband was still at the gym. I know it's super creepy, but for some reason I wasn't scared at all. Also, my dog was napping next to me, completely passed out. And I feel like if it was something bad, he would have sensed it, woken up and barked. Story number eight. 
sleep paralysis and car with hallucinations. This happened last Thursday. My fiance and I were driving up for a medical appointment and I decided I would stay in the car since the appointment was for him. Anyway, we said, see you soon. He went in and I turned the car off and locked it. I was fully aware and conscious this whole time. I was just staring out the window when I heard this slight high-pitched buzzing in my ears. This wasn't like the normal high buzz I heard sometimes. So I focused in on it and as soon as I did, I heard a voice talking. The voice wasn't speaking to me, but rather just speaking in general, I suppose. As soon as I started to hear the voice, it felt like I was being pulled into sleep paralysis. I used to get it almost daily in high school, so I got used to that feeling. I was able to pull myself out of it, and I thought, maybe that didn't just happen. So I focused on it again, on that sound of the voice, and I went fully into sleep paralysis this time. I was conscious, but could only move a part of my body, and really couldn't at all, not even my eyes. I was obviously scared because this hasn't happened in quite a while. I could feel myself sort of panicking internally when I heard the car door open and shut. I was still in paralysis at this moment and figured it was my fiance getting back in the car. I had a slight doubt that it could be a stranger though. After that thought, a hand grabbed mine and held it. I physically felt this. I figured surely it's my fiance then. I was able to turn and look at him and say, are they all done? He was looking down at his phone and he finally turned up just to look at me and it was him but without eyebrows or glasses. His face looked like his but it was an uncanny valley aspect. The pure shock and terror of this woke my whole body up for real this time and just looked around. No one was in the car with me. He didn't come out for another 20 minutes. Anyone ever experienced an event with a shadow person? Just some background info on my situation, which occurred when I was around 10. So the house I lived in with my mom, dad, and occasionally my five siblings, we had all experienced one thing or another. So when this event I'm about to be describing happened, me, 10, was in my brother's room, 13. We were chilling around. He was lying down on the floor by his bed and I was playing with a yoga ball, maybe 10 steps away. He had been talking, but he had stopped. I just thought he was tired. I played for five minutes, then looked over at him and I froze. Above him, floating, was some sort of black mass and he looked as if he was choking. His eyes were bulging out of his head and his face was turning red in color. I yelled to my mom to come up and I was crying. She came into the room running and as soon as she saw him, she ran and got her Bible and started reciting something from it, which must have worked as the black mass soon subsided to nothingness. But not before us hearing my brother let out a demonic deep scream. He then laid there with his eyes closed for a while. He then sprung up, panting, trying to get his breath back. We left that house the same day and stayed with family, but it seemed as if we could all still see the dark shadow. We couldn't tell if it had followed us or if it was the trauma, but to be safe, we went to a priest to get the house blessed, and we had an exorcist perform on my brother. His eyes rolled back into his head, and he started talking in a voice that wasn't his. We couldn't tell what he was saying. He seemed good after that was done, though. He returned back to himself, and our house now has such a light atmosphere, and it feels nice and cozy. I'm not sure what it was that we were all getting targeted by, but it was for sure evil. Story number six, Ask Reddit. 
Not something I experienced, but the one of many reasons why my parents, a Hindu family, believe in the seers of our religion. We have lots of stories like this, and this one stood out to me in particular. My dad's best friend growing up in India was always a cautious boy. The reason for this is because his parents consulted a seer to know their fate. The boy was told that he was destined to die young, by cause of water, and this fate is bound to his soul. In an attempt to circumvent this, the boy's parents had his name changed and ordered him to stay away from any forms of water. They thought this had ultimately changed his soul. Names are a pretty big deal in Hinduism. My dad and him had big plans then to leave India during college for greener pastures. They left for Germany and later the United States together. However, midway through college, my dad's friend had to return to India for a family thing. My dad proceeded to America alone and had a family. He then had a business trip back to India and thought, maybe I should visit my old friend. He went back and searched for his friend. The town elder said he had died 20 years ago at the age of 22. The cause of death, drowning, trying to save a child caught in a flood. I think the child survived, so his sacrifice wasn't in vain. I can't explain how the seer saw this or even could know. The seer saw that this boy would die both young, dying at 20, he's very young, and by water, he drowned. Both of which were correct predictions. I want to believe it's merely a coincidence, but there's way more stories like this than my parents have. People say it's just a coincidence, but story after story, I begin to wonder, could the old religions have been onto something? Story number four, tall, black, hooded shadow. My mother lives in a weird building. The basement is a little creepy because it's dark. You have to go into the basement to go throughout the garbage. So basically you take the elevator to the cellar. On your left hand side it's like a weird space where other tenants can store their stuff. And to your right is the laundry room. Keep on walking and there's a door that leads to the garbage room. So my daughter and I took the lift to the cellar. Right when we're getting out, I look to the right and for a split second, I saw a really tall guy. Everyone is taller than me, I'm like five feet tall. Anyhow, my daughter had one bag that, and I had boxes on my hands. I saw the guy and I thought it was a tenant fixing his stuff, and possibly the cellar. My daughter and I kept on walking and I told her, Hey, keep the door open, a guy's about to come out, be nice. So my daughter looked back and no one was there at all. Hmm. I told her, well, that's weird. There was a guy there with a black hoodie just standing there. He was breathing really hard too. I assumed he was lifting boxes and probably tired. Because that's how it sounded. Question. Did he take the elevator while we didn't look? Nope. Because my sister called me right at that moment. That moment that I was talking to my daughter about the guy saying, Hey, wait, I want to smoke a cigarette. Can you wait? I'm in the elevator. My mom lives at the 20th floor. So, yeah, there was a guy there, and I saw him. I don't know who he was, but my daughter says it was a shadow man. Don't know what that means, but I do know one thing. I can see things that I can't explain. And hear things that are odd. Whispers. Don't know who that guy was, but he looked really dingy looking. Story number five. Who was that? So this morning I woke up to my phone dinging. I had a fraud charge on my card told myself, fine, 
This is how we're going to start this day. No worries, I got you. A few days ago, I changed my curtains from lavender color to red. There was too much light coming in. Anyhow, my bed is right next to one of my windows, and I have a drawer thing for my clothes. So I'm calling my bank to talk about the stupid charge. I walk toward my kitchen to feed my cats. They were making too much noise, probably because they were hungry. So I walk back to my room and get some clothes to change and start my day. While I'm pulling out my bra, I see the shadow on my window and I'm like, what the f fucking creep is trying to look in at me? I share a room with my kid. I'm an adult in New York. Rent prices are not cheap. So I tell my kid, hey, look, there's a man in the window. She got up and opened her eyes. This is the kid talking now. Mom, that's just the shape of a building. It's stupid. It's not a ghost. This is me. No, that can't be, because the houses are short. And who's going to be outside in this weather with only a t-shirt? This is the kid. Let me take a picture and look outside. It's probably an antenna. It's okay, Mom. Don't freak out. Just move the curtain. Me. Okay. So I moved the curtain. Went to go get coffee and came back to the room. My kid said, Mom, there's too much light close to the curtain. Then this happened. Hey, the shape is gone, kid. What the fuck? Mom, now this is creepy. I moved the curtain again and again. Maybe there's a stain from a fabric softener or something. Nope. So now I'm working from home and I'm shaking. My kid keeps on walking in and out of the room to the living room. I knew there was something in this apartment. Story number two. I'm pretty much convinced that my house is haunted. So when my family built this house in the early 70s, it was all perfect. But then my great granddad died. Nothing much happened. When I was a kid, I had a small room and I always felt watched while I was in there. One night I even felt someone sitting on my bed. I was too scared to look at this person, so I just stared at my wall until I fell asleep again. That was when I was five or six. After that, I moved into another room. Nothing similar ever happened in that new room then. But recently, things started to happen. Objects started to disappear. I find them in various places. I see shadowy people and figures. A few weeks ago, my mom and I had a strange and chilling experience. She came home from work and was on the first floor. I was on the second floor and heard her yelling. I'm home. When I wanted to open the door to the staircase, I heard a feminine scream, you know, as if someone would be in pain. I ran downstairs because I thought my mom was hurt. But when I saw her, she said, You didn't just scream, did you? I shook my head in fear. She told me that she heard it from upstairs, but I heard it from downstairs. A few days later, I talked to my sister about paranormal stuff happening in our house. Turns out, we both hear the steps that are sometimes in the attic. Thought it might be a raccoon at first, but then we listened to it again. They were masculine steps. Sounded like military boots. Since we all talked about it as a family, it got worse. I woke up a few days ago with the feeling of someone choking me. I always dream about death every night. Feel watched with every step that I take. I honestly don't know what to do anymore. We already had a priest coming here and we saved the whole house correctly. I think... I guess I'm just thinking about moving out with my sister and my mom. Whispers from Another Dimension I've never been one to really believe in ghosts or the paranormal. I always believed there'd be a logical explanation behind any door alarm or flash of light. Well, that changed when I was camping several years ago on a beach west coast of Vancouver Island. I was in my tent fast asleep having a dream. 
Nothing too notable there, but I woke up from the dream to something very strange. So much so, I felt the need to write it into notes in the app on my phone. And this is what I wrote. Reading through what appears to be text from a book, quote unquote, as much as you can trust any 40, something you're old except at 43, because at 43 something happens, repeatedly reading that same text over and over about three or four times, and then out of nowhere I'm woken up by the sound of a soft female voice. Derek. It should be noted that the reading of the text felt like a dream, like I was reading through a book, but the voice seemed to have been from outside of the dream. It sounded like she was right outside of my tent. Such and such beach, August 28th, 2016, just before 3 a.m. Now for years, I didn't think pretty much anything of this event. Until recently, I picked up a book called The Haunting of Vancouver Island, found a chapter on a beach just around the corner from where I was camping. The author had an experience so similar I couldn't help but get chills down my spine just reading it. His speculation was the beach was haunted by the ghosts of the passengers of an old steamer that sank just offshore back in 1906. The steamer was named the Valencia, when 136 people died, including 17 women and 11 children. To this day, I still get goosebumps thinking about this, and it's really opened my mind to the possibilities of another dimension where spirits roam. Forlorn in Iceland I recently had an amazing opportunity. I went on a student trip to Iceland. We had a mini bus and an awesome guide who drove us around, told us history and regaled us with epic tales from Iceland's poems. We were on a whirlwind tour seeing as much as we possibly could see in one day. We stopped at a small Catholic church in southern Iceland. It was not on our itinerary, but our guide said it's her favorite place, so we stopped. It was a small white church on top of a hill. The view was spectacular, a clear view to the horizon in all directions, with some hills off in the distance. The modern version of the church was white with a steeple. It had a small cemetery to the right of the property, and behind, and to the left, stood the original grass-roofed church. Inside was a humble church with a beautiful mosaic of Jesus on the wall. We wondered about the small chapel while listening to our guide speak. I found myself in a corner where they had a small rack and prayer candles. I didn't know much about the Catholic faith, and I found myself wondering why people lit the candles, whether they were sad or missed loved ones. What joy or sadness does those lit candles represent? At the moment I was overcome with emotion that weren't my own, I wondered back rather, wandered back outside and stood near the graveyard. I looked at the dramatic scenery again, this time with grief and sadness as I took in all I was trying to take in. I felt a sense of endurance and pride. My experience was interrupted by one of my traveling companions. It was time to go. I didn't really get a chance to process much while traveling, and I cried myself to sleep silently in the hotel room that night. I asked our guide if people had experiences there, and she said no. I've not had an experience like this one before, nor have I since. I'm not psychic or clairvoyant, and I've never considered myself to be a sensitive either. But something shared with me that day. Story number 21. This freaked me out. And I feel and think that this is a perfect place to tell the story. So this isn't directly my experience, but it's two separate experiences that happened, or rather I happened to hear about, and kind of freaking me out too. So to start, my, my, my brother, very young, still in the crib, would always tell us that there's oo-oo's is what he called them. He was literally one or two. Now we figured that he was talking about shadows. 
because in the daytime, he'd point out the oohs, so we thought nothing of it. A couple of months of these oohs, we put him to bed one night, and around 30 minutes after, we hear him crying. I woke up my parents, got out of bed, and we go into his room. He's somehow under the stretchy part of the bed lining, but the bed lining is still perfectly wrapped around all four corners, and the dog seemed off. Now, my brother was 16 when I randomly had a thought to ask him what those oo-oos, what they really were, and did he even remember them? And he told me yes. They were short shadow figure things with long beaks for faces. Now, many years after my brother's encounter, I was in high school. I was hanging out with my friends who never had met my brother because of the age gap, and we were talking about ghost experiences. And one said that he would see these figures walking around the neighborhood, and he only lived a mile or two away from me. I was being instantly interested, so I asked them what they looked like. And he said, yeah, they were little short black figures with long faces like a bird. And I was shocked. I told him what happened with my brother, and he didn't believe me. So I introduced my brother a couple of days after. And he told him, and yeah, everyone got freaked out. Nothing happened to me, but just hearing the same description from two people who don't know each other is absolutely creepy as hell. Story number seven. Haunted Front Door. I live in the Philippines, and here... Wakes for the dead are usually done on streets, especially if you don't have a budget to rent a funeral place. Back when I was very little, every time a wake is being conducted at our neighborhood, our front door always slowly opens. Being a try-hard cool kid, I always believed that it was just the wind, so I didn't have any problems with it. Ten years later, I'm 20 years old, and it still happens from time to time. And one morning, I was getting ready to head out for a midnight party. Right before I unlocked the door, I remember that I didn't grab my keys in my room. Three seconds after I walked away from the door, it opened slowly with a four-inch gap. I looked at it astonished, thinking, how can it be? I am 100% sure it was locked. Slowly walked near the door, and that's when it closed hard, right in front of my face. I got chills, and I decided to call my friends to just pick me up as I was alone in the house. I don't want to touch the door anymore. While waiting for my friends to come, the door keeps on opening and closing hard, and I'm sure it's not the wind, and I'm also sure it's no person. I was alone in her house and all my family members are out on vacation. I was sitting on our couch looking at the door and doing it over and over again. After 20 minutes, I heard my friend's voice outside, so I got a little bit relieved, only to hear knocks and my friend say, open the door, Chris, it's still locked. I grabbed the doorknob to check if it was, and it was. We replaced the door now because it got destroyed after a massive storm hit our place. And somehow, I still don't feel safe about it. I woke up to my husband's abnormal grinning in the middle of the night. It didn't feel like a dream. So one evening, I, a 28-year-old female, was woken up by my husband moving against me. Now he sometimes does this in his sleep, or sometimes if he wakes up a bit hot and heavy, he'll move to gently wake me up in the morning in a sexy way. It was still dark out, I sleep with the blinds open, and it was still dark in the room, so I knew it wasn't morning yet and I was tired. I shrugged him off a few times and then we went to and then when he kept at it, I told him that I was tired and rolled over to look at him. When I rolled over, he had this grin that stretched across his face in a really abnormal way. I 
freaked out and tried shuffling away, but he pulled me closer and laid my head on his chest in a comforting manner. But the, but the ob obliviousness, or obviously with this, just freaked me out. I didn't feel like that. He then just made three little shushing noises, which he'd done before, and stroked my hair. I was convinced it wasn't him, but I didn't want to look at his face again. I was so scared. It seemed like I was... Like I stared at that wall in front of our bed for ages before, I guess, falling asleep again. When I woke up in the morning, I told him about this and asked if he did all that. He said no, it was a dream, and he did notice me getting restless in my sleep and making huffy noises, as though I was crying but without the tears, so he moved closer and tried to comfort me. It just felt so real and oddly scary. I had a hard time believing it was a dream. His grin, just not possible and very menacing. It felt like it was this fake version of my husband doing things he would normally do. It just felt wrong. And I woke up, and I was dreaming wrong, but I really feel as though it happened. Story number 18. Hangman in a Hotel. When I was 13, my school orchestra went on a field trip to New York City. It was a fun field trip, until we got to the hotel in Manhattan. The room I was assigned had three other girls, and it was uncomfortable, but I didn't know why. It was unnaturally cold, but before I could adjust the room temperature, we were told that we were going to dinner in Chinatown. I left the room with my roommates, and I forgot about the room. After dinner, the girls in the orchestra got together in one of the girls' rooms. They talked about girl stuff. They were talking about which boys were cute, and when they asked me which boy I thought was cute, I drew a blank. I got bored and went back to my assigned room, which still felt unnaturally cold and uncomfortable. I told myself that it was just my nerves, because I was with a bunch of schoolmates I hardly knew anything about, and I was in New York City. Soon my roommates returned, saying that they were kicked out and told to go to bed. That night... When my roommates were getting some sleep, I couldn't sleep. I tossed and turned, and around two in the morning I turned towards the window. I noticed that the curtains were brighter, and to my shock, there was a shadow of a man hanging from his neck by a rope. I gasped, stifling my scream sitting up. The other girls asked me what I was, you know, what was wrong, and I told them what I saw. They opened the curtains, the window, and one of them poked her head out, looking around. She told me that she saw nothing. She closed the window and the curtain, went back to bed. I turned my back away from the window, thinking I was just crazy. The next day we left New York City, after visiting the Statue of Liberty. I was relieved to go home. I didn't talk to anybody on the bus. I tried finding the hotel recently, but it's gone now. I don't know who the man was or why he hung himself. Story number four, range time. A few days ago, I purchased a new firearm and installed some accoutrements. I'm extremely impatient and wanted to try it out. So as soon as time was available, I made my way to the range. Due to work scheduling, I wasn't really able to get to the range until about 9.30 p.m. Range closes at 10. It's an outdoor range that has lights that can be activated to shoot at night. Per range rules and protocol, I signed into the range book and observed no one else was signed in. A cursory observation of the range verified this to be correct. The range is a field with berms, approximately 15 feet high, acting as dividers. So I turned the lights on, set my targets up, and began shooting. Part of mine and most shooters' personal protective equipment includes hearing protection, of which I have electronic hearing protection. 
For those who don't know, this hearing protection amplifies ambient sounds when there's no gunshot. As the sound of a gunshot erupts the amplification of your hearing, it ceases immediately, consequently protecting your hearing. As I'm about to take another shot, I hear it. I hear loud, fast, heavy steps in grass, weeds being brushed by as if sounds of someone was running behind me. I'm in such a fright I immediately turn around with my firearm in a high pectoral index. The side of my firearm is pinned to the side of my chest, dominant elbow at a 90 degree angle. Firearm pointed at an approximate 45 degree angle at the ground, preparing myself to be greeted and or potentially be engaged by something. Indeed, I was greeted by nothing but a dark, seemingly empty field. Quickly, I reached for my pocket flashlight capable of illuminating the field, which confirmed what I saw. When I turned around, nothing, not a car, animal, or person in sight. I think my 15-month-old niece can see someone. I've moved into a new house, and I've been here for about two months. The house is about a year old and a fairly new estate. It's cute seeing my niece grow and learn new things every day here. She's even started to walk and become more responsive. Past few weeks, I've noticed that she's started staring at nothing like an empty wall or corner of a room, laughing, then saying, hi, and then waving. I sometimes think that she just learned how to say hi and is just waving because she thinks it's fun. But when she does this, she keeps going back to the same area that she first said hi to and laugh and wave again. It's a bit weird, but it doesn't scare me because everything seems harmless. Tonight, though, she pointed out to one of the photos on the shelf of my grandfather. I think she started to notice the details and everyday things that she's never really cared about before. My grandfather passed away back in 2006. He was a lovely, humble man. She was pointing to his photo and saying hi. So my mom got it down for her. She started kissing his photo and hugged it which we all thought was so random but really cute. Then she walked away with it and put it in the corner that she normally stares into. Everyone was like, oh my god, oh, that's so cute. Meanwhile, I was there thinking, hmm, not sure if that's cute or kind of freaky because of what I've seen her do. Though I do take comfort in knowing my grandfather was a good man. Maybe she was seeing my grandfather. Maybe he waves at her and she's responding back. Well, it better be him and not someone else because we can't afford to move again. Floating item in the bedroom. I always think about an experience I had when I was 11 in my childhood home. The house was brand new. We were the first to live there. It was built when I was like three. I never got any strange energy from the house and the entire neighborhood was a new suburban development. One night I was walking down the hallway past my room when I happened to peek into my room through the doorway. At the time there was a vase of flowers placed in the center of my nightstand when I happened to glance into my room through the open door. I saw one of the flowers from the vase suspended in midair next to the nightstand, about a foot away from its original position in the center of the table. It was floating, unmoving for about a second, until it dropped to the ground. I was frozen in fear and my stomach dropped. All kinds of alarms went off in my head. I felt exactly like I had caught someone red-handed, the type of feeling you'd get if you happen to see someone doing something they're not supposed to be doing. Immediately, I bolted to my parents' room, who, of course, did not believe me and dismissed it. To this day, I always think about that one instance. 
I've never had any other abnormal experiences, and I'm definitely a skeptic. I'm an agnostic scientist who's pretty quick to dismiss and explain away all quote-unquote paranormal experiences. But that one really threw me for a loop. Before anyone asks, it was completely out of the realm of possibility for the flower to just have fallen out of the vase. I didn't see it fall, I saw it floating in mid-air. It fell straight to the ground after that. I did all types of experiments of dropping the flower, etc., but with the circumference of the nightstand and the small size of the vase, it was impossible for the flower to have fallen a foot away from the nightstand instead of falling onto the table. Story number 10. Witnessed grid lighting in the sky, followed by a thunderstorm. It was 2017, and I cannot forget that evening. I was standing on my patio just outside of an apartment building that backs up to a small concrete retention pond. There had just been a thunderstorm, and the sky looked so magnificent that evening. It was just dusk, still a good bit of light, but not quite dark outside. Sometimes after a summer storm, the sky can appear a greenish-blue color, I'm trying to describe the conditions as best I can, but my boyfriend at the time came out into the porch to join me and were visited by the strange color scheme in the sky. I looked over to the northeast, across the retention pond, and noticed a vast pink and purple hexagonal shaped grid pattern covering a large portion of the sky. I had to double take to see what I had just witnessed. I immediately turned to my friend and asked him, Do you see that? Their eyes were wider now, and they responded, There's a grid covering the sky. It went on for what seemed about a minute or two. I was so confused about what I was seeing, I asked my friend again, Are you messing with me? I could without a doubt see a pinkish-blue grid covering the northeast portion of the skyline. It was incredible. My friend saw the exact same thing. We were both 100% sober at the time. I researched this a bit, but can't find anything relevant. I have recreated the image from memory using an AI drawing app, Crayon. The outcome was almost identical to what I saw that evening. This truly blew me away. At first, I assumed it was some kind of ball lightning or a possible weather phenomenon. I just can't say what exactly I experienced. I think about it often and would greatly appreciate any feedback. Has anyone else experienced this phenomenon? Story number 15. Sleep Paralysis I, a 19-year-old female, just had sleep paralysis for the first time ever. Always have heard of people who have had it and whatnot, curious if anyone knows what the cause of it is. Is it going to happen again? I don't know, just a little spooked. Context. A little before I was getting ready to fall asleep, I got scared and turned my phone light on. Sometimes I do that because I, quote unquote, feel like something is there, kind of in the darkness. Usually it's just me psyching myself out, and I'm usually able to turn my light back off. But eventually I found myself turning it back on after a few minutes of having it off. Again, I didn't think too much of it because usually I'm fine. Anyways, I finally drift off to sleep and my whole body goes into like a state of shock. I could just feel chills all throughout my body and it came in waves. But it was significantly stronger at some points. So I kept praying to God to get whatever it was away. Eventually it stops. So I opened my eyes, assuming it's over, and next thing you know, I'm seeing what looked like an older lady floating in my closet, but when I saw her face, it wasn't a face, it was just kind of blackness. Once she turned towards me, she started reaching out to me. At this point, I'm freaking out, trying to move, scream, do whatever I can to make it go away, but I couldn't move or do anything. 
Seconds before her hand could touch me, another arm from the floor grabbed the lady's arm and stopped her from touching me. And when I looked again at my closet, the spirit that grabbed her from touching me was holding this lady like in a bear hug, keeping her contained. The other spirit, or whatever it was, was dressed in white, but their face was covered in like a hijab, but their mouth was also covered. So I could only see their eyes. Then I became unparalyzed. Story number 19. There's footsteps with no body walking around my backyard. I have a few friends over, and we went outside after dark just to smoke some cigarettes on the back porch. We kept hearing footsteps outside, but when I shined my flashlight into the yard, nobody was there. The footsteps came really close to us. All three of us heard the same thing. One of my friends went out later by herself. She said she heard it step right in front of her, got close enough that she could hear breathing, but nothing was there. It's not 3.30 a.m. My other friend is outside again, and he's still hearing footsteps, too. Is my backyard haunted? What could it be? One of my friends are just, I guess you could call them a native. And she says, it's not a skinwalker. I live in Arizona, where there might be skinwalkers. Because nobody here is drawing one of them in. I'm ordering a Ouija board next month, and I'm going to try to communicate with the entity later. Bad idea. I'm really hoping that it's a good or a neutral entity and not something I have to worry about. As a kid... I was really afraid of my backyard at night, so it's possible the entity has always been here. Or it might be my late brother. What are your thoughts? Should I put a line of salt outside my patio door? Other thing I'm thinking is somebody might be living under my patio. That's the end of today's stories. As usual, I hope you guys drop a comment, leave a like, and suggest this to other folks, so that way we can keep spending these evenings together. Alright, see ya. I think my grandma or grandpa came to check on how the cakes turned out and my camera's AI feature caught them for a moment. This happened only a few minutes ago. I had just taken out of the oven my freshly baked vanilla and cinnamon raisin cake, and I wanted to snap a photo of them to send to my best friend and my aunt. My camera had the AI option activated, because I forgot to disable it after my outing on Friday night. So, as I turned my camera towards the kitchen table... The AI sign showed one second and the food sign since I snapped a picture of the cakes and the next when facing the kitchen table and the kitchen door, and it showed the person sign. The person sign appears when an AI feature detects a person's presence. The thing is that I was alone. My parents are and were napping, and my sister was in her room studying. My aunt is working at her boyfriend's family farm trying to finish before sundown and the rain comes. The house is my mom's and my aunt's childhood home, and my grandma lived in it since 1983 up to 2017 when she died in her sleep in her room, otherwise known as my parents' current bedroom. All of us have experienced something that might be considered as a presence either by feeling a hand on our backs, shoulders, or heads, as I gave mention before at other posts. But never on camera or radio, although my computer at times opens by itself in the middle of the night or day when it's in sleep mode, but I don't think that has anything to do with a ghost. I found it odd. Didn't feel a presence. And the person sign remained for a moment when I placed the camera in the same spot again a second or so after I realized what had happened. And it showed nothing. If there's a ghost after all, I think it's either my grandma or my grandpa, or both of them keeping an eye on us. 
Maybe they, she, or he wanted to see how the cakes turned out. Story number five, Time Loop. When I was young, like grade four, I think I got stuck in some sort of time loop. I literally remember it like it was yesterday because it was so profound and odd that it just never left me. I was in class sitting at the back right-hand side of the room. The teacher's desk was on the right side wall but the teacher was standing down in the far left corner, standing at the projector. I needed to ask her a question, so I got up from my desk and started running. Bad, I know, but running around the desks to go get her. On my way, I passed by the teacher's desk as I ran by. I looked down at her car keys on the desk and took note of them. Just a weird kid who noticed stuff. My head moved as I ran forward and my gaze stayed fixed on the keys for a second. Then I looked back forward, just about going to continue running toward the teacher, but out of nowhere I went back. All of a sudden I was running past the teacher's desk again, and noticing her keys again. Then it happened again, and again, about three or four times. By the end of it, I was so extremely confused and thrown off that I stopped running completely and just stood there, stunned, almost off balance, just completely baffled because I swear I just ran past that desk four times. The whole thing only lasted maybe five seconds, just repeatedly running past the desk and noticing the keys. People in class laughed at me because I seemingly was totally normal as I ran past the desk and then just suddenly stopped, looking totally dizzy and confused. But at my age, my brain just couldn't comprehend what had happened. I didn't know of time and space and odd things like that, so I brushed it off. Maybe a hallucination. But it's bothered me every day since. Weird experience when I was in fifth grade. When I was in fifth grade, my dad and brother went to Michigan to visit my grandparents. I didn't want to go. My mom was staying home anyways, so they let me stay with her. This is only relevant because some people might think it was a video that my brother was just watching. I was just chilling looking at my phone when I heard a little boy's voice say, Hey, and giggle was followed by a woman who was also just starting to giggle. I distinctly remember being paralyzed with fear. When I was finally able to move, I just got up and ran to where my mom was sleeping. I woke her up and she listened to it and was like, what is that? I said I didn't know, and she listened even more for a bit before falling asleep. At this point, the giggles and the hey, hey, were like super loud. But then they stopped, and I never heard it again. I brought it up to my mom a few years later. She says she remembers that, and it was probably just a coyote. Coyotes can make superhuman-like sounds sometimes, as well as some of the birds in this area, I guess. But I've never heard them say, hey, or giggle. I know I didn't just make up what I heard because this is an isolated incident. Strange enough, though, because I've went about her just crying about all these weird noises, and none of the events really stuck out as memorable to her or me. Just this specific one. Never happened to me again, and no animal noises sounded similar to that night. Honestly, when I type it, the story seems really fake because the fact that kids giggling and saying hi is just so cliche in ghost stories. Makes even me think it's not real. I also live in the Appalachian region, and it's not really that relevant to any sort of folktale or urban legends, but I thought it was a cool experience, and I also thought it'd be nice to hear from people interested in this topic. A Cry Behind a Closed Door And my bird. I was invited over by some friends to play some board games one day. 
It was late at night and it was raining pretty bad. We just finished a round of cards against humanity. One of the friends starts talking about ghosts and her experiences with them. She then tells all of us that there was a girl that lived here before that took her own life in the closet next to the bed. She told us that sometimes when she sleeps, she can hear a soft cry coming from the closet. It's been a while, so I can remember if she said that she experienced anything else, but that's what stuck with me. She said, if you put your head on the door, close your eyes, and listen very carefully, you can hear her cry sometimes. Well, that's exactly what I did. Nothing happened for a while till everyone walked out of the room to go get pizza that we ordered. I closed my eyes and one last time before I was going to give up. And I heard her. It was a whimper, like a very, very soft cry. A cry you would do if you were around people and just didn't want anyone to hear. I immediately jumped up and went to go tell everyone and they were all shocked. One by one they tried, but no one heard a single thing. Everyone gave up so I went back to the door. After a couple of minutes I heard her again. Such a soft cry. She was heartbroken. Put my hand on the door and felt so much energy. It's something I've never felt and won't be able to explain. Excitement? Fear? Both? I'm not even sure. I moved away from the door. Hours pass. We're headed home. I wanted to check to make sure I wasn't just hearing things before I left. I didn't hear her. We went back to my home and talked about it. Such an interesting experience I've been through. This is just scratching the surface of my experiences. Seeing. This has been bugging me for years, and I still have no answers, so I decided I would share. When I was a kid, talking five years old, I used to see weird, colorful shapes flying in my room. It sounds crazy at first, but listen. At the time, I was sharing one room with my parents, and I had a separate bed. And it was right next to the wall, opposing the windows. I always hated going to bed because I could never fall asleep, and I would just stare at the ceiling, sitting in the dark for hours. This was my everyday routine for a while, until one night something different happened. I saw three shapes, a heart, a square, and a circle in the colors yellow, red, and blue entering the room through the windows. The windows were not open, they just passed right through them. The shapes were bright and neon-y. They were flying close to the ceiling, one after another, and they just went across the room and disappeared through the wall that my bed was next to. I wasn't scared, however I was so, so confused and weirded out. I decided I wouldn't tell my parents. My dad is more into paranormal stuff and aliens, so I had high hopes that he would believe me. I stayed up for the night to see for myself. But I felt as if I'm not meant to say anything about the situation. I just had this gut feeling, if you will, that this whole thing is just a little secret and I'm not supposed to share. And since at the time I wasn't scared, the shapes were doing anything wrong, I don't think, and I had no problem with keeping it to myself. Now I kind of feel sorry because it was really interesting, and it would have been nice if I had more proof of this happening with my dad as a witness, but it's whatever. So after the shapes kept coming for a few nights, they suddenly stopped. The last night they came, they didn't do their usual thing. And the difference is that they turned colorless, like grayish, which now I interpret as their end. Former King of Dreamland In the spring of 84 or 85, I was five or six. In a vision, I was picked by a pair of dream spirits. A black man and a doll-like girl approached me in a white void. They said they needed me to be the next king of the Colorado-area dreamland, as their old king had reached his limit of time that he could rule. As they continued, they explained it would be a three-month reign, as they needed me to fill in until the next queen was old enough to handle it. 
Then the old king paraded out to meet me and hand over control after the king had disappeared. I was led to a walled city called the City of Children's Dreams. It was a safe haven to keep adults' dreams from mixing with the dreams of children. And I guess you could say it was to keep their dreams pure. The two dream spirits started to take me on tour, but I felt compelled to jump off a cliff and onto a four-poster bed. That fell to the ground from quite some height, awakening me just as I hit the ground. For the next three months, every night my dreams were of the same land, which drew its strength to exist from me. Then I would feel compelled to jump off the same cliff every night and fall back to earth. As this went on for the three months, my strength began to falter, necessitating the city to shrink, and it shrank until only five houses remained. Then the girl that they had talked about took over from me. She was strong enough to last a year and a half without the city shrinking. I truly believe it was some form of an astral plane of existence, and that the book Little Nemo in Dreamland was at least partly based on the writer's time as a king of Dreamland as a child. Feeling a loved one's presence after death. Not safe for work slash extreme language. You've been warned, because I'm going to read it as I write it. I really need some help here, because from a scientific perspective, I don't know how much this could be put down to hallucinations. I've felt my sister's presence before, and I've heard her talk to me, and it seems real as fuck. And this is just after all the ugly stages of grief. It's not when I'm constantly upset. The fact is, skeptics just keep me second-guessing myself, and it feels like mental torture. Mental torture to constantly try and think is all in my head? Is it real? Is it hallucinations? Help me out here. I wish they would understand people have legitimate reasons to believe in an afterlife, because it's disheartening hearing that it's just a coping mechanism, and people just believe because, hey, they want it to be true. A man told my mom that she needs to accept her daughter's gone for good and that she's full of confirmation bias, and I punched the guy when I saw him. It's just condescending. Now he has her second-guessing everything, telling her it's because her mind evolved for this shit and how we're all insignificant in the grand scheme of things. This shit, I'm not kidding. It's kind of what someone thought would be a good idea to tell a grieving mother. I can't go on not believing. She's just a pile of disgusting ashes now. Screw this. She had a good life. This is all you've got. Bullshit. She was nine. Barely even got to live a life. Scientifically, there's still some sort of criteria for hallucinations, right? I really hope when I feel her that she's here, that it's the real deal and I'm not just having my mind playing tricks on me. I don't know why assholes have to ruin one thing that's actually comforting and has been helping so far. Story number 16. Ask Reddit 1. Got an answer. It happened recently. This week, actually. I was walking through some woods. I don't live near the woods. It's just somewhere far from my house. And I felt a little off, and some strange things were also happening, such as birds suddenly flying away, bugs suddenly going silent, things like that. I decided to turn back as it was pitch black. I pretty much knew where the exit was, but I was worried that I'd ventured too far into the overgrowth. The trails were not very well worn, and it felt far from civilization. Eventually, I started hearing some leaves crunching. I thought it was just plants underneath my foot, but it wasn't in sync with my walking. But it was kind of trying to stay in sync, as if to trick me. I called out, but no one responded. Feeling creeped out, I got a little jog on, 
eventually finding a path that led out of the forest. But I felt like something was right behind me, and I was checking over my shoulder quite a lot. I've always been a little bit uncomfortable about walking alone, but at this moment felt straight up paranoid. It was then that I saw it, on one of my routines back. I checked my eye and I caught something. It was something quite wide and quite short, with a metallic body and a circular hole and window, a different colored spot in the middle, too dark to really tell. It pursued me slowly and I bolted out of there. It seemed to be trying to communicate in some strange garbled noise, but I wasn't going to stick around and find out. So I got home, locked all the doors and didn't sleep much. Not going back there in the dark anytime soon, that's for sure. Story number 11. Story. The earliest encounters I can remember was in this one specific house. This house was fenced in and had a large gate enclosing the backyard. It was two stories and the front yard was a bit overgrown. It was all we could afford at that time, but we made do. The family consists of my mother, older brother, younger sister, my father, and myself, obviously. I had been there three at the time, so a majority of these encounters would come from my mother and father. The first week was uneventful, but after that, things most certainly wouldn't be the same. My father kept getting locked out of the house, despite no one being home. He'd also have fits of sleep paralysis, occasionally seeing something walking around his room. My mother would hear footsteps in the hallway and on the stairs. Much less quick and little steps of a young child, but more of a stomping sound like someone was pissed off and decided to stomp up the stairs with his heavy work boots on. Occasionally she'd hear a woman talking to her youngest, my sister, and she would see an unusually large amount of insects in the house, despite the fact that she's a clean person and always makes sure that everything is spotless. Once she had struggled to get the large gate to close, Mind you, she's a pretty strong woman and this gate was rather stiff and heavy, but once she got it closed and turned to head back inside, she heard a loud crack. She turned to find the gate wide open as if a bull had rammed into it. The weather was good, no rain, no powerful winds, and this sturdy gate that she had latched shut had somehow been thrown open within an instant. Story number three, Mysterious Knock. When I was 24 years old, I went and visited my old college roommate at his mom's house. His mom was an antique dealer and had a lot of really cool antiques throughout her whole house. The house was on a lake and my buddy and I went swimming with a bunch of friends. We all got out and we were going to shower we get ready for a festival that we were going to that night. There were three of us getting ready, and it was my turn to shower. The other two were sitting in the front yard in lawn chairs. I go in the house and head to the basement bathroom to shower. Right next to the bathroom was a room filled with vintage dolls. It was extremely unsettling, but I just looked at them all and then showered. I got out and I was doing my hair in the mirror, when I heard three distinct knocks on the door. I called out, just a minute, and opened the door, and about five seconds later, to my surprise, no one was there, and there was no one in the entire house. I walked upstairs and saw my two buddies out in the yard. I went out and said, whoever knocked on the door can go shower now. They both looked at me and asked what I meant told them about someone knocking three times on the door when I was in the bathroom and asked if anybody else was home. They said no. I just kind of dropped it. I'm 37 now and still remember how distinct the loud knocks were 
as I was standing only a foot away from the door when they occurred. I don't know if it was a spirit or something attached to one of the antiques or what, but still gives me chills to this day. Story number 18, Ghost Hunting. I would watch ghost hunters with my dad, and haunting. So when I grew up to be really into ghosts and the paranormal, no one was surprised. The high school I went to had a paranormal society that you had to be, I think, either a sophomore or a junior to join. So the second I was allowed to join, I jumped on the chance. The club was ran by our school police officer and had been around since probably 2012. I joined in, I think, 2015 or 16. And given his status as an officer and our club's good reputation, we got to go to some pretty cool places. One of them was an abandoned jail in northwest Indiana. The one John Dillinger stayed in, also the site of the Public Enemy movie. And I think that location was my favorite. We'd load up into one of those smaller school buses at like 7 on a Friday and get there while it's dark outside. The jail's windows had cracks and it was very run down. The front part of the building was maintained as almost a museum, but once you were past that, it was just straight nightmares. The whole night we saw shadow figures and caught orbs on camera and just had a lot of fun. At the end, I ended up getting a little gift, I guess. We were sitting in the commons area for the prisoners and I felt something really sharp go against my leg, hard enough for me to yelp. There was no scratch on me. No scratches on my jeans, though, but it did sting. I figured I was just paranoid, but still told the officer what happened. He too thought it was strange. When I went home, there was a scratch across my leg. Maybe this isn't the scariest story, but it's one of my favorites. I usually like to say I got stabbed in jail because that makes it seem more interesting. Should I share some more experiences? Story number six. The Loud Bang. Ten months ago, my friends and I went ghost hunting at an alleged haunted hotel. We were hoping to get a few good stuff on camera and a digital recorder. Little did we know we would get much more. We decided to do an EVP session in a room belonging to a prostitute that lived there in the early 1900s. Nothing extraordinary happened there. We got a few faint voices on a digital recorder, but it could have just been nothing but white noise. We were getting bored when suddenly I received a phone call from my wife back at home. She claimed to have heard loud banging on our window outside her bedroom. At the time, I truly believed that the entity we were trying to contact was responsible. By some supernatural force, the spirit of the prostitute traveled all the way to my house and pounded on my window. I recorded this entire event on camera, too. Months later, I returned to my rational thinking, believing it was just sheer coincidence and it was probably some bird that ran into my window. However, just last night while searching YouTube, I came across a channel belonging to a paranormal group from Chicago. Years before my experience there, they did a paranormal investigation at that same haunted hotel. While in the same room belonging to the prostitute, they claim to hear loud banging on the window. This has to be more than just a coincidence. I truly think I came into contact with an intelligent spirit there that can manifest as a bird or something that's capable of pounding on windows. Story number five. My first true experience with the paranormal. Just a little backstory on me is that I truly love the paranormal and always have. I've been a close follower of the spooky and weird ever since I was a kid. That being said, I never really have had a true paranormal experience. 
I've dabbled with Ouija boards and gotten a little bit spooked from that. It maybe saw a shadow or two, nothing super verifiable, but the other night I had something happen to me that I'm really having a hard time explaining rationally. I was laying in my bedroom with my girlfriend, just having a casual conversation and letting my feet dangle off the bed. Mid-conversation, I felt a full-on tug on my foot. Having just recently put my son to bed, I was expecting him to be standing there, wanting a glass of water, something he often asks for around bedtime. Turning around, I was just staring straight out the doorway into the hall. There was nothing there at all. Following my puzzlement, I hear something all parents dread hearing. The child screaming. I rush into his room and see him sitting straight up out of his bed, tears streaming down his cheeks and pointing to the corner of his room. I ask what's wrong. All he replies with is, Something is in the corner. It's a monster. I start to react a second because I too just had an encounter, but I put on my parenting hat and reassure him that nothing was there and to go back to sleep. I go back into my bedroom where my girlfriend and I are a little bit shaken, to say the least. These two events happening back to back like that absolutely cannot just be a coincidence. We tried to debunk what had just happened, but came up short. Story number 17. My Paranormal Experiences so back in July last year, I used a spirit box app because I was bored. My coworker said that it was legit. I first used it when he was around and I couldn't understand anything, but he looked scared. Well, that weekend I had the house to myself and I was in my room. I've learned to make out the sound of someone touching my doorknob and that's what I heard. A few weeks later, I have the house to myself again. And I was in my room again, but this time I heard walking in the hallway. That night I used the spirit box app again and the first thing I heard was my name. Now I'm using another spirit box app that my coworker told me about, and like a week ago me and him made out the word run. Also the employee bathroom that has a urinal that's used to not flushing by itself, it's automated. But one month it kept doing that and just randomly stopped for months. Starts back up last month, but one night I'm sitting in the bathroom trying to avoid people on break and it flushed by itself 10 plus times. I should note that the first month that it did this it would only happen when I leave or enter the bathroom. This was a message I sent to my friend explaining my experiences and a few days ago something else happened at work. I was messing with the shelf since I worked the night shift at the grocery store. Basically, I was in the aisle of a coworker and I heard a whisper directly in my ear saying my name. I know it wasn't my coworker, because she's a nice old Christian lady. Story number 13 Shocking Experience. My husband and I were door dashing one night around 2.50 a.m. We got an order that took us out into the middle of nowhere. The pin on the map showed us the address that was leading into the middle of a crossroad. To the left and right of us was nothing but abandoned service roads, fields for miles, and electrical towers. There wasn't a single person nor house in sight. We were confused, so we called the person who the order was for and it went to voicemail. In the guy's voicemail was the sound of an air raid siren and a guy screaming, help me, help me, there's a tornado, we're gonna die, save me, please. The man screaming more frantically as the voicemail goes on. There didn't seem to be an end to it either, so I just hang up. I looked at my husband for a minute in complete shock and call again, and it's now 3 a.m. The dial tone that you hear when you're waiting for somebody to pick up was different. It changed and made a screeching sound as it went on to my husband, and I noticed that the street lights were off around us. At that exact moment, we both got the feeling of a dead
death shiver down our spines at the same time. So we left, went home, and didn't go back out. When we got home, I got an unknown call on my phone. I didn't answer it, but it felt like it was linked to what happened earlier that night. I think that someone was trying to sacrifice us at 3 a.m. in a crossroad. I don't know. But it seriously felt like we crossed into another dimension that night. As soon as we got away from the crossroad, the feeling of death left. Nine-year-old seeing paranormal experiences. I recently moved to a house in Salina, Texas. We're originally from the New York and New Jersey area. Me too. And have been here a year and 10 months to be exact. I have three kids and one of them who's in second grade is starting to experience paranormal things. Yesterday she saw a black cat, the TV flickering, and our 16-year-old Yorkie with a halo that we had put down about a week ago. She mentioned she's seeing a man with a white tie in my office. She explained that she doesn't necessarily see figures, but spot or white spirit-like objects. She was crying frantically, but I convinced her that God will protect her. She slept with us and even woke up in the middle of the night and was saying out loud, Leave her alone! She was protecting her sister. This was a lot to take on one night. She's even saying that she feels cold and hot at different times and signs of her stomach being upset. When she was barely five, she asked a lot of questions about God and the afterlife. I honestly think my daughter has a gift. However, I believe with that gift comes good and bad. We know someone who's also gifted that's going to talk her about what's gonna, what she's seeing and what she's feeling. We're not afraid. We were instructed to sage the house immediately, but I was wondering if anything or anybody had any thoughts or ideas. Perhaps others that have experienced similar or the same things. Story number 19. Something is inside the house. A couple of years ago, during COVID-19, my brother had to be brought to the hospital as he had almost OD'd on drugs. This meant that I was completely and utterly alone in the house. It was around 2, maybe 3 p.m. in the afternoon, and they had been gone for a couple of hours, most likely running tests on my brother's blood levels. I don't know medical science. Smiley face. Anyway, I was upstairs in my bedroom and all of a sudden I got this rather eerie feeling. Yet, I couldn't place it. So I checked the house, just out of, I guess, boredom. Anyway, the house turns out to be completely empty, apart from me and my pets. So I go upstairs and laugh it off as a moment of madness. Only seconds after that, I heard the loudest and I can only describe as a blood-curdling scream that anybody could ever hear. In fact, it sounded so impossibly loud that I can't imagine it really being humanly possible. The whole thing about this scream is that it was my mother's voice screaming my name. So, naturally, I rushed downstairs, fearing the worst, only to find, in complete shock and terror, that the house was completely empty. I was rightfully terrified, so immediately I ran outside of the house and checked to see if any of the neighbors had heard the terrifying scream. Only as I asked, I got puzzled looks. And this has always freaked me out ever since that had happened, but I'd just like to know what was impersonating my mother and why. Story number 12. Did anyone have this happen when they were younger? I'm 19 now, and I live in Florida. I grew up in Illinois. For as long as I can remember, there was a thing that I would always see in my peripherals, or just 
barely get a glimpse at whenever I'd be outside or at my basement. It was always a tall woman, maybe seven or eight feet, that would either stand next to a tree or behind me, and every time I'd go get a full look, she would be gone. I'd see her almost every day because I loved playing outside. One time I got a very good look at her. I was playing in the snow in my backyard and fell on my back. I saw her face, a very skinny white woman with no eyes, or dark eyes. Couldn't tell because when I shot up she was gone. Ever since then, I would see her hiding in the trees or peering through the door in the office inside the basement when I would watch TV. I was always so scared of her that ever since I saw her in the hallway outside my bedroom, I've slept with my door closed. When I moved to Florida when I was 15, I stopped seeing her until, I guess, around April when I was 17. I was walking my dog at sunset, and around the neighborhood, it's trees to hide the train tracks and the paths. I noticed her standing in the entrance to a path watching me, so I quickly walked home and looked out my bedroom window. I couldn't see anything. This woman or thing has frightened me my whole childhood, so I was wondering if anyone had, and had any answers about what I could have been seeing. Story number 12, also titled Story. When I was playing outside alongside my siblings, I, being a little boy, liked animals and dinosaurs, so I had this T-Rex toy that looked like one of those older renditions of the T-Rex where its tail dragged and it looked like Godzilla without the dorsal spikes. Our mother had called us in as it was getting dark out. We went inside until I realized I had forgotten my toy. I went out to go get it and I saw an outline of the toy. I went to pick it up only for it to crumble and fall apart. It was dirt in the shape of my dinosaur that was concerned, or that I was being concerned with. I walked back inside, but little did I know, that was nothing compared to what I'll experience later. Later on, when the sun was out, my mother had to go to work. Me being a bit of a mama's boy, I decided to look out the window, waving at my mother as she walked to her car. When she turned around, I saw something slink out of the bushes, following her all the way to the car. A snake, twice her size. My mother's five foot nine, so the snake was around eleven feet in length, and it was all black. She got in her car, and the snake had turned around and slithered back into the bushes. I briefly turn around, hearing something in the hallway, then turn back around only to see it staring back at me. I back up from the window as it too backs up into the bushes. I have no memory of this, but my dad told me how occasionally, when he'd go check upon me, he'd see me sitting in a corner almost in a trance. When he'd ask me what I was doing, I'd simply turn to him and say, The old man told me to. Story number six, questioning experience. When I was three to four, my family and I lived in an old historical house. I grew up in an area in Illinois with an underground railroad system and historical coal mining. The night my mom gave birth to my little brother, my dad stayed home with my sister and I, and we were off to bed. I woke up in the middle of the night by a ghostly figure the ghost looked like a ghost you'd see on Halloween, like a sheet with cut out eyes. Nothing but darkness behind the eyes. I wasn't afraid. I didn't know I should be afraid. I started asking the ghost questions a three-year-old would ask a ghost. Like what was relevant in my life? Are you pregnant? Do you have ghost babies? The ghost explained to me that he was a male. He didn't have ghost babies and he would keep visiting me, but... If he were to keep coming back, I couldn't tell anybody. I told him I was going to get my dad, and he tried to convince me not to. Couldn't contain my excitement as a young child, so I excitedly went into the other room and fetched my sleeping dad. When I came back with my dad to introduce him to the ghost, he looked around and underneath all my furniture, 
the ghost was nowhere to be found. I never saw that ghost again. My question is, what kind of spirit asks a child to keep that kind of thing a secret? Did it have bad intentions or possession in mind? I told this story to a friend of mine recently and she pointed out how strange it was. I'm just trying to make sense of it. Story number 11. Comment your opinions. Man, I'm just speechless. Dogs in my neighborhood in a radius of around 100 meters keep on howling after 11 or so. I usually sleep by 1, until that time I hear them howling time and time, sometimes continuously. This thing is happening for a long time, too. A month ago in front of my... I saw like 5 or 6 dogs, and they made a circle and kept on barking as if someone was standing in the center. It was around 12.30 a.m. Another day I had my earbuds on with the song playing and I heard someone calling my name. It wasn't like I heard it, I felt it. Right now while I'm writing this, I'm getting goosebumps, getting the chills. While I'm in my room, it feels like someone is walking through my garden, which is separated by a wall from my study room. Once, I even saw my mother going from door one to door two through the TV room. She didn't return from the door two, so I just went in that direction but couldn't find her. So I went through door one and found she was asleep in that room. The TV room has three doors and the third door connects to my study. Once my mother saw a towel floating in air through door two and she thought it was me, so to catch me she called out to me. I said yes from the third door, and my parents were stunned. I went to door two and saw that the towel was lying on the floor. My father instructed me to go to sleep at that moment. Chocolate from the Sky I'm in Turin, or Torino, Italy with the Erasmus Exchange program, and yesterday I was on an escalator exiting the metro station at the Dante stop, and there was a man before me, his bag and jacket closed. He was about two steps away from me. As we approached the end of the escalator, suddenly a chocolate plaque fell out of nowhere, missing my head by a few inches. I was shocked. I instantly thought that the man before me had somehow lost it and grabbed it and run just to give it back to him. Thank God the guy spoke English and he said that he hadn't lost a chocolate plaque and joked that this is just a present for me by the gods or the universe. We both looked up and around us to make sure that someone wasn't looking for the chocolate. And then we parted ways laughing at this odd incident. So I returned to my hotel room exhausted because a long day, you know, just baffled by this chocolate and the shared incident. So I share this with my roommate. She couldn't believe it either. We opened the chocolate, and as we ate it, I realized that it had berries in it, which I'm allergic to. I rushed to go get my anti-allergic you know, anti pills, or anti-allergy pills, and then I timed my reaction, just in case I needed medical attention. My roommate is studying the package, and she realizes that the chocolate has expired in October of 2022. Shocked once more, I'm left wondering, how did that chocolate plaque fall from the sky? No one was out in the balconies around the area, and no one was looking for it. Story number three. Man, this question has me recalling several very odd events that happened to me in my bedroom, specifically as a kid growing up. To keep on topic, there was this one time my parents left me home alone when I was only about seven. They were next door by the neighbor with my little sister for a birthday party. And I had asked if I could head home to play with my toys, since I was bored. It must have been about an hour into my playtime in my bedroom when I felt the atmosphere change. 
My ears popped and my hair stood on end as I quickly turned to my door to fully expect seeing somebody enter my room. You know that change of silence that you can hear if you close your eyes and you have somebody exit and enter a room? I can't explain it in any way better than that, but that's what I felt. Not thinking anything about it, I resumed playing with my Lego bricks. But thinking somebody was home now, I made my sound effects, explosions and such, soft into a whisper, so I can be more aware when somebody came home. In that bedroom I had this blue poofy-like carpet, and I'll never forget this, but as I whispered to my little Lego games, I got that eerie feeling again. I was sitting on the floor and can hear slow footsteps starting from behind me, walking to the side around the front of me. Being on carpet, it was this muffled-sounding footstep, but it was no less than a foot away from where I sat, as it walked in a circle around me. I was back across the street in a four-year-old girly birthday party in a heartbeat. Unknown Visitor While Pregnant When I was about five months pregnant with my daughter, I was getting ready to go to sleep. Had a show on and I was zoning out. So I clicked off the TV and got comfy, but felt like someone was staring at me. I opened my eyes to see a man standing at the foot of my bed, leaning on a staff. He looked like a desert traveler, a turban, a cloak, the whole shebang. The part that threw me was when he realized that I could see him. He straightened up and had his, oh crap, look on his face. I threw the blankets over my head and started smacking my ex awake. I had him get up, check the entire house and the cameras. Wish I still had that footage because you could see me having a very noticeable reaction to something. Alas. This was in 2016, and I've moved a couple of times since. Two months later, I was in bed again. Room was blacked out, and I was ready for a third trimester nap when I noticed a white ball of light floating down my ceiling, towards my stomach. When it touched me, it felt like I was dead dipped in the most amazing pool of water, and my daughter kind of shook, you could say, like crazy, before she settled down. Story number eight. Anyone remember playing with an identical copy of themselves as a kid? I have a pretty decent memory. Obviously, it isn't perfect or anything, but recently, I completely floored my parents when I told them I remember going with my mother and my grandmother to visit my father in prison. He did a stint that was a couple of months. And I remember seeing him in his blue prison uniform and how my mom and grandmother would hold my hands and swing me back and forth a little as he walked. I was three at the time. I didn't even realize that I knew he had been in jail until I brought it up one day. I distinctly remember one night that we stayed over at my grandmother's place. I was maybe five at most, and she had this creepy-ass collection of stuffed animals hanging from her wall by nails for some godforsaken reason. They looked fine during the day, but scared the shit out of me at night. Never liked spending time with her overnight because of them. One of the reasons this stands out to me now is because of the missing twins. It's the only thing I remember that were on different pages about, you could say. He had no problems with the creepy little fuckers. Conked right out bedtime, no problem, and in fact, I remember just staring at the little bastards in the middle of the night as he was absolutely passed out beside me, dead to the world. So there it is. There are other memories, of course. But that has always been the one that stuck with me the most. I've never brought it up with my family because I don't want them to think I'm some kind of head case. Story 
Story number seven. We should always believe our children. Don't take their voice away. I think when you do that, and when you dismiss them, it makes them more vulnerable. I also like to share a bed with my son for this reason. My husband wanted him in his own bed tonight, and you know, not very long after, my kid was like calling for us. So I got him out and I changed his diaper, and as he's laying on the floor by the crib, or I'm changing his diaper and he's telling me about, what's that under the crib? I asked him about it. I asked if it was mean or friendly, and he said friendly. Thank God. But the point is, we have to help our children and build them up and let their voices be heard and treated with respect, just as we would want to be treated ourselves. I think love, especially from a parent, is the strongest shit. It's my most absolute hard boundary. No means no, don't fuck with my kid. I've had my own paranormal encounters as a child, and when I was a child, they were much stronger and scarier. But as I've gotten to be an adult, they're not as scary or strong, but I think children are fresh out of the spirit realm. So they're going to be having a stronger connection and be more likely to see things that we don't. After all, I voice texted this. I'm now sleeping in a bed with my son and I'm going to go to bed myself. Good night. Good night. Unexpected Visitor Story number 17 In 2012, my mom was dying from acute lymphoma. She was in the hospital due to elevated platelets and fever. I was at home, walking towards through the dining room toward the kitchen, when I saw something sitting in my mom's seat at the head of the dining room table. At first, I thought it was my mom but the person was male with black hair, dark skin. Kind of looked like my uncle, my mom's brother, but I knew my uncle would never visit us. I realized who it was, and just as I did, the person disappeared. Dazed, I continued to the kitchen when I saw someone sitting on the back step in the backyard. It was the same person, and after a few seconds he disappeared before my eyes. This person died in 1989 from the same illness, all the way in Japan. He shared the same skin and hair color as my mom. One would think that seeing him would make me happy, but I wasn't, because I knew why he had come. He came for my mother because she was dying. This unexpected visitor was my grandfather, her father. A week later, as my mom was dying in her bed, he did come for her as did my dad, whom died four years prior. I felt their presence, and when one of my aunts asked my mother if they're here, here slash there, read it as one word, my mother confirmed that she could see them. Think I may have a ghost. So I moved into a brand new house. Land was an old farm, apparently. And since we had moved in, we had odd things happen. First thing I noticed, it's some items being moved. Like put the remote down on the table, come back to it, and it's moved to the middle. On the baby monitor, we see orbs at night that just disappear in front of the camera. I walked past the door and saw something stood in the hallway. So... Walked back only to see the dog staring into the hallway as if she's looking at someone. My Alexa speaker responding to someone and asking for music that's happened several times. However, today I was on my own in the lounge. The device was in the kitchen. Baby is asleep. Nobody else in the house. The Alexa sparked to life and said playing something stupid by Robbie Williams on Amazon Music. Now I freaked out like, how's this switched on? I've checked with my partner and she's not done it remotely. And if she did, it would have gone straight to play music and not said, now playing, etc. 
I've checked my ring camera and nothing is triggered. I've then checked the Alexa voice recorder and you can hear a very faint, almost distant voice saying the song. I don't recognize the voice, the other thing to note is that my phone battery went from 81% moment before to 21% after this happened. Story number 15. Ask Reddit. I was about 17, staying the night at my brother's and his girlfriend's place. I slept on the floor in their room because the apartment was unbearably cold. It was December or January or something like that. My brother claimed for many years to have paranormal activities occur around him, claiming to have lived in haunted houses and seeing ghosts, things like that. Anyway, it's the middle of the night, and I'm woken up by a scratching sound coming from somewhere in the apartment. At first, I think it's the cat, but she's in the room with us. I'm overwhelmed by the most intense, full-bodied feeling of dread and fear that I'm beginning to cry. I can't explain it, but the fear was so intense that I thought I was going to die. The scratching continues. I mustered the courage to lift up my head. Remember, I'm lying on the floor. And I look towards my brother's bed when I see a dark humanoid outline sitting at the end of the bed. I'm in full panic mode and quickly hiding my head. My brother's girlfriend wakes up a few minutes later, also feeling quite scared. She later told us that she saw the shape of a foot of the bed or rather saw a shape at the foot of the bed and felt like someone was sitting there. Pretty creepy stuff. Story number seven. Please, I need someone to explain this. It started when I was nine and I'm 20 now. My grandmother died and it was the first time that someone close to me died and during months after that, I saw her face every night in my closet. I don't think that it was the paradiolia because it was a bit glowing in the dark. You know, like when you're looking to the sun or a light and then you close your eyes? You can see some colorful shapes. It was exactly like that. Obviously, I was terrified by that and I made a lot of nightmares because of it. One night I couldn't sleep, so I told everything to my mom. I was crying and I said, Granny, I love you, but you're scaring me right now. And it never happened again. I've never known why it was happening. It wasn't some sleep paralysis I've had some as a kid, and it has nothing to do with it. I could move, talk, and do everything. I don't think that I have any kind of gift unlike some people that were telling me because it never happened with someone else. As I said, I'm an atheist and don't believe in spirits, but I'm okay with the possibility that it could exist. I've just never found any evidence that could make me think that, except that strange story that I can't explain. My fiancé and I have had a strange experience with an abandoned house. So my fiancé and I live in a very rural small town in central Virginia, surrounded by towns and counties that are very similar to ours. There aren't many things to do here, so we typically drive around just to get out of the house for a bit. Three nights ago, we're driving through a surrounded county and over an extremely backwoods road, very few houses, no other people out, pretty much dead. And we got to a stop sign and needed to make a right turn. Straight across from us was an old house. The windows were boarded up, it was decaying somewhat, and it looked as if nobody lived there for a long time. We both, almost in sync, just stopped what we were doing mid-conversation in turn and looked at this house. The door was slightly cracked open and it was pitch black outside. The sky was very cloudy, so no stars or moon, and the nearest house was a few miles behind us. I felt this horrible, heavy feeling of dread come over me. I thought it was just because we were alone out in the middle of nowhere with a scary looking house, but my fiance and I just kept sitting there looking at this house. 
We made a turn a few moments after. We had probably sat there for three to four minutes at this point, and he told me that he had never felt that way the house made him feel. A scare very easily. So coming for me, it wasn't worrisome, but he's the opposite. Now, for the past three days, we cannot let go of this house. I think about it and the feeling that it gave me constantly. I try to push it out of my mind and we both start dreaming about it. Story number six. The doll waved goodbye. Years ago, I had an ex, and we shared a love for the spooky and paranormal. She would often go to thrift shops and secondhand stores and buy anything that she felt looked old and creepy and possibly haunted. She picked up a little doll that had tattered hair and the plastic was all worn and yellowed from age. She would swear to me that it was haunted and that it would move its arms on its own. One day she calls me on FaceTime saying the doll was being weird and she was holding the doll and lo and behold the doll actually moved its arms. Now my ex had a reputation of trying to prank me so I didn't really even think much of it at the time but it was fun to go along and be spooked, you know? Months later I'm dog sitting for her while she was out of town and I go to let the dog out and I notice the little doll on the shelf with both arms down at its side couldn't help myself and taunted a little and said, All right, go ahead. Just me and you. Raise your arms. Nothing happened, of course, and I continued with my dog's sitting duties. As I left, I was putting the dog away and turned off all the lights, and I happened to look at the shelf. The doll had its right arm raised, as if saying goodbye. I'll never forget that. Demonic Experience I had a dream moments ago about a lady being killed by a few students playing with a gun, possibly by accident, but I forgot the details as I woke up. Anyway, I was in a state of semi-consciousness and acutely aware of my surroundings when I felt a spiritual presence and with my eyes still closed, I saw a being made of TV static coming directly from outside, and it seemed like it was directly coming from me. It passed right through the wall, and in third person, I saw it float around my chest. I feel like it was a sort of demon attack or an attempted possession, as I felt a negative, fuzzy feeling in my chest. I immediately started to pray, but was forgetting what to say, but managed to get coherent in thought again and repel the evil spirit and demon. I'm a non-practicing Christian. I was baptized Catholic when I was a baby, but used to go to a Protestant church with my older sister when I was in my early teens, and eventually just stopped going altogether. When I was little, I was slightly sensitive to spiritual activity and had several encounters with the paranormal. I've had a very few similar experiences to what had just kind of happened, although it's been a long time since the one before this one. Story number 14. Ghosts, Spirits, and Language. A while ago, I joined, confusing, out of curiosity, oh, I joined out of curiosity with paranormal investigators. We went to an ancient castle where I and some local residents experienced some weird stuff, like feeling watched. A suppressed atmosphere. Some people witnessed shadow people, and some heard growls. Local residents are not really open to talking about their experiences in the castle. Oh, it's an Irish castle, and the place goes back to the Bronze Age. The investigators placed a few devices to record, video cameras with motion detectors, and a few other things. Anyway, at one point, one of the floors... Their rainbow-colored device thingies went bananas in the red. One of the investigators used a memo recorder and was asking questions in English with intervals of silence. 
Replaying the recorder was clearly heard a response. It sounded like a tormented growl. Found that very interesting. Other than all that, we experienced no other things. But, as per the same investigators, they did kind of catch other interesting things another time. Story number 16. Yellow on Yellow. Back in 2004, my son and I were on just with my aunt driving back to my parents' house. I felt tired, so I fell asleep in the front passenger seat. I had a dream there was a small yellow pickup truck in front of us, when suddenly the driver slammed on their brakes, making us crash into this truck's rear end. The yellow truck had a yellow smiley emoji face on the back. I woke with a gasp, sitting up in my seat. I was reassured by my aunt that everything was okay, and I said, as long as we don't crash into a yellow pickup truck with a happy face sticker on the back, we'll be fine. But she asked me what I meant by that. I told her about my dream. She looked skeptical. You'll see. When we get the... We'll see it. They crossed out letters here. An hour later, a small yellow pickup truck turned onto the highway we were on. And when the truck got in front of us, we saw the happy face sticker on the back of the truck. There it is, I said to my aunt. I asked her to keep her distance, but at some point we were near the truck again. Sure enough, the driver slammed on their brakes, but we were able to avoid crashing to the back of that truck. My aunt drove around the truck and sped away, leaving the yellow truck behind. Story number six. I think my deceased dad saved my life. This happened quite a while ago, and several years after his death. I should mention that my dad was a heavy smoker, and the family car always smelt of cigarette smoke. This was before the dangers of smoking were really publicized, and I always associated the smell with warmth and security. Neither I nor anybody else in my family smoke. I was driving home through the village where I used to live. It was broad daylight, and my mind was on other things. I wasn't really paying attention to what I was doing. I abruptly realized that I was approaching... Strange spelling. Approaching a treacherous T-junction far too fast. It was one with poor visibility where you really needed to stop to check properly for traffic before pulling out. I went to stop on the brake pedal, and it was already mostly to the floor, and at the same time, the car was filled with the smell of cigarette smoke. The car did have an emergency stop in the nick of time, and as I took a deep breath and unpicked my fingers from the steering wheel, I heard his voice say, Now concentrate, you daft bat, which is exactly the sort of thing that he would have said. So thanks. Dad, I miss you. Story number 13. Two creepy encounters in a row. So I'm in the Navy, and me and my co-worker recently moved into a military housing apartment together about two months ago, and everything's been fine so far, except for this weekend. Due to our shifts, we tend to be home at different times, and this was the case both yesterday and today. Yesterday, as I was home sitting in my room with my door cracked open, I saw a dark shadow flit out of my coworker's room out of the corner of my eye. I also had a funky feeling ever since I got home that day, but dismissed it because, as I said, we had been there two months already and nothing had happened. Now, what happened today is what really freaked me out. So once I got to my shift to report for my shift, my coworker asked me how I was able to get there before him. When I asked him what he meant, he told me that he got to the apartment about 40, yes, 40 minutes after I had left, but he had thought that I was sleeping because he heard breathing coming from the room as if I was sleeping in my bed. In addition to what he told me when I left the house today, I also had another weird feeling in the back of my mind that someone or something was about to whisper my name as I was leaving.
my blue shirt. I was packing my things to head to my college city for my residency, and due to the overwhelmingly hot weather that came out of nowhere, I had to unpack my summer clothes to take with me. I chose my best shirts, and as I was refolding them, I would try to think about the outfit options trying to measure for how many days these outfits will last me when my mind drifted off topic, as it usually does. When my mind went back to the current topics, the war in Ukraine, climate change, my country's economy, and about my future, I wondered about what's become of us as humanity when I started mechanically folding my shirts. And I picked up my blue shirt. My blue shirt has letter prints on it that I usually weren't able to make out or tried to. I bought it from a Chinese thrift store, and I knew it really wouldn't make any sense since many times the shirts have grammatical errors or the sentences are just gibberish. I pick up my shirt to take a better look at it and see if the sleeve length is good and the weather, and I saw the shirt's letter print, and weirdly I could make it out, it wrote. What we think we became. And I froze. I found it very, very odd. Strange Midnight Biting Incidents A few nights ago I was peacefully asleep when I suddenly woke up in the middle of the night. I felt an aggressive biting sensation on my forearm and something had a tight grip on it. Panicking, I began shouting for help as my mother was in another room, but to my horror I couldn't open the door or turn on the light. After what felt like an eternity, my mother rushed to my aid. However, when she turned on the light, there was nothing there. We checked behind the furniture in every corner of the room, but there was no sign of an intruder or any logical explanation for what had just occurred. To make matters even more unsettling, a similar incident happened a few days later. This time, it was on the palm of my hand, and when my mother arrived and switched on the light, my hand had turned slightly red, as if it had been affected, but there were no visible marks or injuries. These inexplicable events have left me baffled and frightened, and I can't help but wonder if there might be a supernatural explanation for what I've experienced. Has anyone else encountered something similar? Or have any insights into what could be happening? Story number 19. Ghost Encounter Back when I was a little girl, maybe around four or five, I remember being at my stepdad's apartment with my mom and two stepsisters. Me and my stepsisters were playing with the computer when we heard a thump in the closet. This closet was located right behind the computer, but a wall was separating the closet from us. Anyways, we peek over to see a Halloween decor scarecrow peeking out of the now very open glass closet. It was facing us and leaning out sideways, like it was purposely looking at us. Of course, we screamed and called for our parents that were sitting in the balcony having a smoke. I know it might sound silly, but I'm very positive that it was a ghost or spirit because this apartment was frequently engaged with paranormal activity. Like drawers opening and doors slamming and footsteps in the middle of the night when everyone was asleep. I think about this so often. Not that I'm scared anymore, I'm just wondering if it was an encounter or something along the lines of that. The St. Louis exorcism case was a mentally ill kid, probably autistic, having meltdowns. Since nobody knew what was going on with him or how to handle him, they called the church in a last-ditch effort, and the church said that he was possessed. And then the folklore was born. He threw his desk on the floor in a rage. If you've ever seen autistic kids rage, a skinny autistic kid could bring a bookshelf down if they try hard enough. The folklore said that he threw it onto the ceiling. He scratched himself bloody in a self-harming episode. 
Folklore said Satan scratched him. He screamed and growled the same Latin language that he heard the clergy using. Folklore said he was speaking in tongues. All this tells me that he was having a meltdown, and since autism was just starting to gain recognition as a condition in the U.S., they didn't know about it yet. Lots of children in history going back to the Middle Ages were called possessed because they had mental or developmental problems. Before you argue, I'm autistic, I'm a specialist, and I've spent years researching this case. 